Hello, Texas, and welcome to the 2024 HCS Arlington kickoff major hosted by Optic Gaming. We are live and kicking in the glorious eSports Stadium Arlington, gearing up for the first look at our teams in this brand new season. Now, my name is Lottie. I am going to be your desk host today in this fabulous, fabulous arena on this glorious desk as we're overlooking the most incredible stadium that I have honestly seen dedicated to eSports. I'm not alone, though, up here. I do have Wes and I have Tony. Gentlemen, my expert analysts, Wes. 2024, we're back for a brand new season. I am so pumped. How are you feeling? I'm so excited to get this tournament underway. It feels like it's been forever since the last event, the big world championship that obviously FaZe took, but we've had a lot of team changes since then, a lot of practice, a new starting weapon, a ton underway, so I think the meta is going to have shifted. Yeah, there's a lot to be excited about and a lot of changes coming. But I got to say, Tony, there's a change in the wind here. I feel like with 2024, I think we could start to see some climbers from the bottom ranks that we saw last season. Do we still have the same teams in the top fighting fit for the throne? How are you feeling about the competition? I mean, as of right now, I'll keep it as the same top three, but there's a lot of teams that are knocking on the door of greatness, and I can't wait to see what they have in store for us here in 2024, starting here at Optics House. Me too, but before we do get into the new season, let's do a little bit of a rewind, because 2023 was magical. We had some incredible moments, some, I mean, jaw-dropping Halo, actually, uh, quite frankly, towards the end of it in the World Championships. And Wes, when you look back at 2023 and that season, what really kind of comes to mind, do you think? I think it's the ups and the downs, right? When you look at the banners that are, are to our left here, Optic, Phase, SSG, Optic, Phase, everybody got their chance to win a title, but that big World Championship at the end was where we saw the best Halo played of the year, and that was FaZe doing it in dominant fashion in that grand finals. That championship was something special to watch, and I think all of these teams want to have more success this year. I think two's not enough for Optic, one definitely not enough for SSG, and FaZe have expectations to sweep the entire season, so I'm excited to get these tournaments underway this season. Yeah, it's, it's colorful across all of the results here, and one thing that stands out is not enough SSG winning there. And Tony, what do you make of this team right now coming into this 2024 season? You excited to see what's going to be on the plate? I really am. SSG made some big changes and have some big expectations ahead of us. And I promise you, one tournament, that is not what their expectations are. And I don't think they're going to win more going into this year. SSG are the team to watch out for. And we'll obviously talk about that a lot later on. We certainly will. We'll dive into all of that. But of course, like you mentioned earlier, at the end of the 2023 season, we saw an exceptional world championship. FaZe just rewrote the history books. The way that they managed to take that world championship was something that I think everybody will remember forever. Uh, resetting a bracket and then eight maps straight clutch those moments was something that i think even those four up there didn't really expect to be doing something like that yeah i think all year round we we kept making the comment how the winner's bracket finals was the most important series right because it gave you such an advantage in that grand finals FaZe were really the first team to dispel any of that, and what a time to do it in the World Championship. They go down 2-0 in that series, if you remember, and then the dominant eight games that came after. What a special just rise of the occasion that those champions are. There's a reason that they're three-time World Champions, and they're looking for a fourth in 2024. They certainly are indeed. Well, let's bring it back to 2024. New season, and of course, a lot of changes, roster updates being one of those, and there have been some big ones. Let's kick things off, though. Uh, Clutch, while I got you, Optic Gaming. I'll be here I all mean, day. Our home, I know you will. <laughs> <laughs> our hometown heroes right now, Optic making a huge change on the back of last season. And Dead Zone, formerly known as Penguin, coming in for APG. That is going to be Mixy. How are you feeling about that huge, huge change? I'm pretty mixed about it. I, I, I love Dead Zone as a player. I think he's an incredibly individually skilled player. But the big thing is, is Optic had so much success. They won the first World Championship in Halo Infinite. And they had so much success even afterwards. Looking at the banners, they won two tournaments last year. They found themselves in the grand finals of the World Championship. Yes, they got second place. They felt the need to make a change, which was surprising to me. But that tells you that their expectations are higher than second place at Worlds. It's higher than just winning two of the majors this year. They also have expectations to win every single tournament. Does Penguin get them? Dead zone, I'm sorry. That opportunity? I think so. I think. Dead Zone is going to fit very well on this team. The thing for me is, is can they find the level of consistency that they once had with APG? 
Indeed, that is the question. Is it an upgrade? Is it too early to tell? Well, I'm sure we'll find out by the end of this weekend. Now, I've got to ask you, Tony, about SSG. Another huge, huge change. And not only that, a historic change. This is the first time we've seen an EU player being picked up in North America. And also, a huge change being picked up outside the top three as well. Legend coming in for SSG. What does this do to the dynamic of that roster now? It speeds them up. Let me tell you, man, Legend is an absolute champion in the making. He, he is the real deal. I know there's a lot of people on the outside that are probably questioning the move bringing in Legend, but if you know Halo, you know this was the move right here. Watch out for the combination of Legend and Bound on the battlefield because it is going to be dangerous. I've, I've called them Le Bound for a reason. <laughs> they are so fun to watch. I call Legend LQ and... What we saw from this man last year on that quadrant roster was a player that could rise to any occasion. I truly believe on this SSG roster, Legend will be able to compete, compete for the world MVP this season. This player is special to watch, and it is unprecedented that SSG went out and found a foreign player to come over and play on one of the best teams in the world. I think they have a talent in their hands, and I cannot wait to see this roster in action. So, so excited. Excited about that BFF journey with the duo of him and Bound as well, opening up so much space and control. And then, like you said, Legend is such an incredible player, and I truly don't think we've seen the best of him yet. But with SSG, we might just find that out very soon. Well, also, in terms of the ripple effect, though, these two changes have had a huge effect on Quadrant. And back over to EU, it has been so, so difficult. Clutch, you know, with Quadrant, how hard is it going to be to regain from the amount of change, the amount of trial and error they've had in the offseason? It's going to be really difficult. I, I, I think that they're going to struggle this year. And I think uh, fans of this team, they had so many last year, they're going to have to lower their expectations because this is not the same roster. This roster does have a lot of upcoming talent. Glory is one of those players that really surprised me last year with a ton of individual skill and what he was able to do for Na'Vi. But this quadrant roster is used to getting top six. Sika and SLG placed top six so many times last year, top four even. I don't know if they can have that same level of expectation. They're gonna have to prove it to me this weekend that they are still a team to be feared. Yeah, I'm right there with you. I, I think that's that's a perfect way to put it. I think Quadrant are definitely a new team, so new expectations need to be had for them. You know, like you said, bringing in glory. Best best move they could probably make during the offseason, but wasn't enough. Then you reunite Snipe Drone and Sika, and even that wasn't enough to win you that qualifier and get you the number one seed coming out of EU. So I, I, I'm right there with you. I think Quadrant are trying to find the right formulas, and it's going to take a little bit of time. It's impossible to replace a player like Legend. There's not another Legend out there, so Quadrant life without Legend is going to be difficult. Life without Legend certainly will be. But I do have also other things to talk about, which is competition inside the competition. And for me, it's a bit of a race, a horse race, if you will, the dark horse race of this competition. And there's three teams that I do have in mind. Complexity, Rebellion, and Native Gaming now coming in, of course, in business's place with the open bracket. And yeah, it's, it's just an interesting concept, I think, to have teams who you do want to watch out for, but right now they're gunning for each other's spot of who's going to cause the upset. And Wes, when you look across these three teams, who's really kind of taking that first place spot in this Dark Horse race? For me, it's complexity. The fact that they were the first team to really form and get to the grind, start scrimming. They had a boot camp coming into this event. You don't see a lot of teams do that anymore. Back in my day, boot camps were a real thing that happened just before every event. Complexity are taking this very serious, professional work that's going in to this tournament. I expect a lot of them, and that player precision on their team is a true superstar in the making. I've had my eye on him for a couple of years. This is the team that he needs to make the statement, I am here to be feared. Tony, who would you say is the scariest right now for you? Give me Shopify Rebellion. I mean, we, we are here on land. And when I think of those four players that are on that team, I think of individual skill. I think of objective efficiency. I think of a team that's ready to upset the waters a little bit. I think Complexity is a really great choice, but I got my eye on Shopify Rebellion. This is one of the most dangerous teams in this tournament. Now, talking about truly dangerous teams, I have to bring up, of course, the big three. And my big question is, are the same big three from last year, are same big three coming into 2024. I think they're definitely the three best teams, but you got to put Sentinels in that same tier. What Sentinels was able to do in the second half of last year was absolutely incredible. They rose to the occasion. They created the upsets against some of the big three consistently. So the fact that Sentinels was so confident in the roster that they had, that they stayed true to themselves, they stayed with the same team, they believe in-house they have what it takes to win championships, 
I love this, the fact that they stay together, and I do think that they are in that first tier of the big three. I think we are now looking at the big four, and then can anybody create an upset outside of that? Hey, we're pushing, we're pushing the whole, you know, branding a little bit further now, because I think Sentinels are squeaking their way in here into this conversation. Would that seal the deal for you this land to see how well they do, and if they do continue that consistency we actually saw in the qualifiers in the offseason too? Yeah, Wes, when you're right, you're right. Uh, as of right now, we have to give them the top three teams. We have to show them respect to the top three, and Sentinels are right there. But I will say, a lot of teams are knocking on the door. A lot of teams are right there. And after this land, maybe there will be an upset in your big four. Like you said, that complexity roster. Like I said, Shopify Rebellion and many more want to get in that conversation. They already are. Yeah, the thing about the big three, the big four, hardly ever do they actually all place inside the top three and the top four. Usually somebody's getting upset at these Halo tournaments, so I would not be surprised if the complexity of the Shopify rebellions of the world have something to say about that first tier. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm so excited. We have a ton of Halo action coming your way, folks, and you will also be rewarded if you do watch. Make sure you get your tabs open because you guys can get your hands on Twitch drops. Watch for three hours across the weekend to get your hands on all of these incredible incredible goodies and I've got to say I'm gonna to have to open tabs up on my surfers here because these are looking absolutely fire so make sure you guys are tuning in at home tabs open across all of our streams if you're wondering where to watch you can catch all of the action on two of our different casted and gameplay sessions here we've got twitch and YouTube available for you guys and two streams covering all of the Arlington major action so you guys make sure you get your hands on those twitch drops I know you like them I know you do chat I know why you're here I know you like to have that uh, and of course all of the Halo action alongside it as well there's a lot on the line here this weekend folks not only is it pride of place to get a very Sheesh. very good head start to the season but the money is pretty good too two hundred and fifty thousand dollars on the line first place takes home a hundred K and as we go down the line the money is sitting pretty so yes a lot to play for here as well now another thing we need to discuss is what Friday means and if you are new to the HCS you know that Friday is pool play day we have four different pools a B C and D and our big question heading into this is the pool of death. Which one is it? Looking across the four here, Wes, we kind of decided pool C was potentially that pool of death with just how mixy the competition might get. Yeah, for me, it's pool C. Obviously, I don't think it's the best matchup in pool play. You're looking at complexity versus optic later on. But Sentinel, Shopify, and Proton, if you're the open bracket team looking at pool C, you are terrified if you go into that. You are almost very likely to be out of this tournament, I'll say. Because these three teams, I all expect inside the top 12, two of them inside the top six. Shopify and Sentinels is going to be a banger of a matchup as well. Proton, no pushover with a lot of veterans, are going to have a very difficult time being forced out of this pool as well. I've got to say, Tony, Shopify Rebellion here, your top for the Dark Horses. I do think that they're going to be feeling pretty confident about Pool C going up against Sentinels, who are the weaker of the big four. How do you think Rebellion right now should be feeling confidence-wise? They should, be, they should be feeling extremely confident. I mean, they've matched up against Sentinels multiple times, and they almost split the difference almost every single time they've matched up, including multiple Game 5. So I said it before, and I'll say it again. You are the most dangerous team here in this tournament. If there's one team I don't want to see that is a top six, top four contender, it is Shopify Rebellion. And if there's one team Shopify wants to see in their pool, it's Sentinels. It's the, the lesser of the evils of the top four teams that we know Optic, FaZe, and SSG, and Sentinels to be. So when you see Sentinels is in your pool, this is everything you want to Shopify as far as creating an upset and an opportunity to advance first in your pool, something that those guys don't get to do very often. This is the reason this team was formed, was to win this series. Can they get the job done here in this best of five? Well, the reason we're here up on this desk is to see all of the matches coming our way today and take a look at this schedule, folks. We have a jam-packed one for you on Friday, kicking things off with FaZe Clan versus Quadrant. After that, Sentinels versus Shopify. We've got FaZe up again, taking on Ascending Baseline. After that, it's your hometown heroes versus Bittersweet. Space Station versus Foe coming up shortly in the evening. And then last match of the day, we do have Optic Gaming versus complexity to round things off and keep these fans in the building but a lot to look forward to well I'm also looking forward to something else that we had last year too which of course is something that we need to round off the 2023 season with and before we do kick it off here in Arlington we do have one more official thing that we have to do for the 2023 season FaZe Clan, they certainly stole the show back in Seattle. They managed to take up that World Championship, that World Championship trophy, and the prize pool to match it as well, but they were only missing one thing, the rings. 
Folks, please welcome your 2023 Halo World Champions. Seattle, it's time for Championship Sunday. Hello, Halo fans, and welcome back to your World Champions. Ladies and gentlemen, it is that time again for your Halo World Championship Grand Finals. Let me hear you. Face Clan! Okay, to shut the door. We got the sharpshooter, Royal 2. Might be a championship Look winning. at him put his opponents Triple in the choke hold. It's Snake Bites. Followed up by the man, the demon. It's Renegade. Next up, the player with ice in his veins, Frosty. Kill. Coach Royal One and Face Clan will be your Halo World Champions. Yeah, we are back, Halo fans. And as you guys saw, we had a, a historic 2023 season. And now it's time for our ring ceremony to highlight our world champions, FaZe Clan. But to help me do that, I want to bring the eSports lead to the stage. Make some noise for Tashi. Thank you, Blaze. Uh, first, just want to say thank you, everybody. We had an amazing year two of HCS. Thank you for being here as we kick off year three. And thank you to everybody watching at home as well and just being part of HCS. You know, we do this for the community, for the players and the fans watching. So thank you guys for being part of it all. Uh, next, want to, of course, show some love to FaZe Clan, the organization. This is their first world championship in Halo, and we'll see if they can repeat this year. Now, of course, though, the players in the match and the coach, what more can be said about these guys? They're some of the greatest Halo players of all time, and their accolades speak for themselves. So, Blaze, let's give out some rings. I think it's time to give out some rings, everybody. Coming out first, show some love to the coach, Royal One. The sharpshooter himself, Frosty! <laughs> Give it up for the captain, Snakebite! <laughs> Coming out next, show some love to Renegade! And now to round off this World Championship squad, give it up for Royal Two. <laughs> Officially Royal Three rings. <laughs> now let's get everybody here towards the center of the stage one time. Everyone here, make some noise for FaZe Clan. Now, it would not be a world championship without a world championship banner. So can we get the drop there? And let's blow the roof off the Esports Arena one more time for your 2023 world champions. It's FaZe Clan!
a huge congratulations to FaZe Clan, your 2023 Halo World Champions, and rightfully receiving their rings on that stage. And for some of them, a third one in the collection, and for Renegade, a second. I've got to say, that is just unbelievable. The accolades on that stage, just un insane. It's really hard to compute, I think, the way that these guys have carried themselves in their careers and to see it happen once again. And they're getting on as well. They're not young. They're not that young anymore. <laughs> they're getting on, Wes. It's, it's pretty incredible. They've been doing it for so long, and the fact that they are still on top shows you that they are truly some of the most special esports gamers we have out there, right? And and the fact that they, the professionalism, I feel like they do it with each and every time, the way that they carry themselves, the fact that they still have that grind, that passion to continue to push themselves for more is what's the biggest asset and attribute, I think, that brings the their accolades and all in into one. And it makes sense that they've had the success that they've had. I'm very excited for this year for these guys because if they can continue to build on this legacy, they are pushing the boundaries of something unprecedented with a fourth potential world championship. Completely. I mean, they've done it in so many different ways now, Tony. I mean, resetting the bracket, eight, map, eight maps straight. They did it the hard way. What way do you expect them to potentially try to do it this, this year, this time? Well, I can promise you they want to do it through the winner's bracket. They want to <laughs> make the road easier for them. Last thing you want to do is drop down that low. but. It, it's not going to be guaranteed. Luckily, like Wes said, they've been putting in the work. They keep coming in hungry every single time they see them, and they're the number one seed going into this tournament for a reason and looking to go back to back. Well, gents, it's been a pleasure. I'll speak to you a little bit later on. Folks at home, everybody in the stadium, we are just about ready to go. We have FaZe versus Quadrant on the main stage to kick things off today. Your 2023 kickoff major here in Arlington starts right now. Series, bro, man, I've missed you. Missed I've missed you. It's too, great man. to be back, man, on this main stage. So good to be back. I think everyone's kind of has, has the same energy, right? We saw everyone at the hotel, everyone coming into the venue this morning. Everyone is like, it is so good to be back, and we have a fantastic series to kick the season off with as well. Yeah, what better way to start things than with the world champions? We've just seen them pick up their rings on the main stage, full of energy, full of smiles, as you would expect. But now it's time to get back down to business and defend those titles. And they are going up against a squad who made history last time they were on this very stage. Exactly right. The same exact building we saw Quadrant make European history. The question is now, with quite a different roster, can they do the same thing? Yeah, it's an interesting question, isn't it? This is a very different quadrant than what we saw at this time last year. This is the number two seeded European team coming into this tournament, which to many is a surprise in itself. But yeah. also, this is no longer a French quartet. This is a team made up of two French players, an Irishman, and an Englishman. Exactly, big changes that were made there. You might have seen Glory picked up early in the offseason. A lot of faith put in him, right, to replace a player like Legend, not easy to do. And then late in the offseason, very late, just before the roster lock, Snipe Drone comes in as well. The question is, can they both slay as much as they need to to keep Quadrant at the same level that they were firing at last season? Yeah, I think all eyes are on Quadrant. They want to obviously impress here in Arlington. They want to maybe put some of the, the questions to the side and say, hey, we're still as talented as we ever were, and we are still here to do Europe proud. But as we take a look at the series layout here, we're going to start off with King of the Hill on Live Fire. Let's talk a little bit about the world champions, because it's only right that we do that, Andy. This is the team who is pretty much the blueprint now in the Halo Championship Series. 
uh, excuse me, Halo Championship Series. It's been a long off-season. <laughs> and everybody's looking at what we can do to match FaZe, to beat FaZe, because they are the yardstick. Exactly. Any team change that happened within the top four, top six was put together purely to take down this FaZe roster. Make no mistake, if you made a team change in the last three months, it was to make sure that you can dethrone the world champions. That's what they will look to do here. Let's keep in mind, though, FaZe Clan coming in not only with world championship rings on their fingers this morning, also the number one seed because of how solid they have been online as well. And my question to you is, we know the FaZe Clan, probably the hardest working team, one of the hardest working teams in Halo history, you would say, away from the game as well as in it. My question to you is, do you think they have an advantage before a bullet is even fired here with the new settings, the new maps? just because of how hard they work. I really do. We heard from Snakebite here as we get ready to load into map number one. We heard from Snakebite last week. He said we spent a lot of time looking at every single game type, everything that was nuanced. And guess what? One of the first maps that he brought up was Live Fire because how different this map is playing on the new settings, of course. Not only Bandit play, also QT back green. Lots to look out for. And we'll have to see if the work has been put in as they stress test everything they needed to all off season long. Here is the place that they will get to test those up against Quadrant in game number one. A new settings, new Hill rotations, new equipment, a new season is about to begin, everyone. And we have such a beautiful way to start it as well. The World Champs going up against the history makers here. It's going to be FaZe Clan taking on Quadrant. As we said earlier, of course, a marker, an opportunity for FaZe to put down another flag and say, this is how we look this season. Of course, in this very first series of the year, they're going to want to come out and make a statement make sure that they're going to remind people just how good they are. Well, here we go then, everyone. The Bandits are about to sing for the first time, and we're starting off for the point of view of a man that you can never be disappointed to watch. It's, of course, Frosty. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to year three of Halo Infinite and the Halo Championship Series. Bandits on your screen here. The first time we're going to get to see this starting weapon and the entire new suite of settings here on land play. Well, we know what to expect from FaZe Clan World Champions. We're going to say it 100 times until they're dethroned, but Quadrant, this is a big test for them, but a test I think they will be welcoming here, Andy, because of the fact that they know they're going to have to match up against teams and beat teams like FaZe if they want to progress from what they did last year, and also they have to test how they match up with their new lineup. We mentioned the two Frenchmen, Snipe Drone brought in to try and fill the boots of Legend and Glory. Individually brilliant, still has a little bit of an experience, though. Good pressure so far, Lynn. Quadrant, just about 90% done on this first hill. They've kept Royal 2 silent here on the sandbags with a sniper rifle. However, though, finally, two kills do go down. Oh, boy, what a way to start the day. Well, is it going to be good enough, though? Three dead for Quadrant. FaZe Clan step into the hill pretty much for the first time, but they do have a lot of power on this side. You saw that that sniper rifle was down. Renegade also, I think, picked up that camo momentarily, gets the trade bottom middle, and will put the numbers back into the favor of FaZe. So even though it's a great start from Quadrant, how many times have we seen FaZe late break on the hill and then take the first point home? And four dead again with the two staggered dead. This should be a face hill. Look at the timing. Look at the patience there as World 2 held it on sandbags the entire time. They wait for the push on green and now only seconds away from taking the first hill. Seconds away. Maybe time for one more push. Looks like Quadrant might be thinking about giving this one up and rotating to try and get tower control for that next hill. FaZe aren't going to let them do that, though. And I tell you what, they've just broken through. However, Frosty and Royal 2 will shut that down. There will be three dead for Quadrant, and it will be 1-0, the first hill going to FaZe. Back to back, four dead. you got to compliment FaZe there once again on the timing, the patience, as they knew exactly how much time they had. They also win the rotate, which is most important, right? Quadrant trying desperate, maybe, for a last second push on that hill, and by doing so, the kills stack up in the favor of FaZe. They have an easy push onto tower, and that's why you see now Quadrant on that back foot, looking to get numbers back on the map. FaZe out slaying right now at this point in the game, 14 to nine, make it 15 to nine off of that kill as well. And my goodness, I gotta say it right away. You notice in that first battle, bottom middle as well, does the bandit ever look clean on land, right? You're gonna see a lot of different looking battles than we did in the past two years of Halo Infinite. Well, Quadrant do manage to get that break and now they're moving their attention towards the camo. Of course, a new power up for this season here on Live Fire, which it's something that promotes positive movement, which we love. It's a one where you got to use it. You have that finite time window to make a play with it. And at the moment, all the plays are being made by Quadrant on this second Ooh. hill. The double kill here for Seeker. He gets the flank. He also picks up the camo. Last two players alive are in his aimer. And he's going to call those ones out to his teammate as it looks like Quadrant get that power up and now have a little bit of map control too. Very nice job here also, of course, on the key door ledge to get top middle. Very nice route to be able to use this camo. Might, might even catch two players off guard here and cuts. Very nice work here from Sika with camo management. Or he gets that first kill. That's going to be his job on this team as well. Be that entry fragger. Be nice Ooh. and aggressive. Ooh, Sika. He took the hill. Ends up looking unembarrassed, but it could have quite easily gone the other way there. Quadrant get the clean break, though. 
could have been more embarrassing indeed. Three dead there for just a second again back to back here for Quadrant finally putting some nice points up on the board again. The question is, can they make sure not to repeat their same mistakes? Can they hold for these last few? Yeah, it's just about discipline here. They've got tower control, they have snipe, a couple of body shots here, and this will be the hill being taken, and that's exactly what it is. So, one to one now. Quadrant answer back. And with four minutes left on the game clock, now we move to one of the new placements of the hill. We're going back towards the garage, but in that pit. Three dead here for Quadrant. This World 2 is going to be pushing back again. We're going to hold Snipe here. Three shots left in it. And you got to think, oh boy! <laughs> the green box spawner uh. did not have much of a chance. Take a seat, Royal 2, connecting on the shot. You got to think Quadrant, though, at this point. They're maybe thinking, goodness, if we just didn't let that first hill go, we'd be up 2-0 right now. Yeah, I mean, it's it's the, the margins, though, right? We always talk about it. By the way, that shot from Royal 2 is the equivalent. We get slapped in the face instead of an alarm clock in the morning when you right. first wake up. Immediately upon waking up. Yeah, yeah. it's not nice. Snipe drone, though, that is a <laughs> nice grenade as two players will fall. And you'll see a, a little bit of a numbers advantage here for Quadrant. FaZe Clan coming off the respawn over at back green. You have to wonder if that QT is going to be in play at the moment. But... Early on here in the Arlington Arena, I'm just saying I'm pretty sure I'm hearing a, a Quadrant chant breaking out. You are indeed. Quadrant uh, maybe uh, picking up some fans last season without a doubt, despite the fact that they also beat Optic on this main stage. So quite, quite a surprising chant. If you we're, might uh, just shut that down immediately. <laughs> if, we're, uh, if we're honest, quite a surprising thing to hear in the Optic Arena. However, as you said, Quadrant fans getting loud here already in this first series. Yes, yeah, this is a very scrappy hill, though, at the moment. You can see it's trade for trade. However, as I say it, two kills without response for Frosty and gets damage, which turns into a third kill for FaZe Clan. So a big play from Frosty puts Quadrant on the back foot. FaZe should be able to step in. That's essentially a four dead, a little bit staggered here, but that will be time for FaZe. Ooh, World 2 somehow, despite hits the slide, but almost gets caught out, somehow stays alive with sandbags, which paves the way now and maintains position for this snake bite camo grab. Let's see what he can do. One camo piece by the looks of things. Oh, oh, oh. Gets spotted out momentarily, but oh, I was going to say. Might have got taken out in that situation, but instead stays alive and gets two. So perfect use of the camo, especially under pressure yeah. in that situation. A trade with the camo, not really ever what you want, but even, even with the power-up, if you get a two-for-one in that situation, you're buying time, right? right? And that's exactly what Snake Bite did. And he almost got away with two, to be honest. Glory. Yeah, big win there from Glory in the back of the base. That'll be two dead for FaZe off the hill. moment. And they'll take a look pretty neck and neck here on this third hill. And Quadrant putting up a very good fight up against FaZe in this first game one. They certainly are, but the fight has to be not just a good one, it has to be one that you're winning. You have to put these games on the board if you have advantage advantages, especially against a team like FaZe. But at the moment, Quadrant are just trying to get numbers back on the map here. You can see FaZe have full control, but the first pick again in the team fight goes to Glory. It's equaled out, but that gives a little bit of space to make some progress on this hit one try and break. Ooh, very good pre-net here. Comes Snipe on the push. Very nice double sandbags push. It does pay off for Quadrant. We'll see if they can maintain. Renegade gets pushed back as well. FaZe was on the doorstep of their second hill. Let's see if Quadrant can maintain control. Here comes Renegade. Yeah, Renegade only has to hit one bullet, though, and it might open things up. Instead, he hits two. Royal 2 gets one of those kills. However, it's a two-for-two two trade, and all of a sudden, this is getting a little bit dicey. The QT is in the hands of Quadrant as well. They got out, they got back in, and now they might be able to hold off this push. It's pretty much Frosty as the last player to make a play here. He gets one, but is it enough time for the rest of FaZe to push this hill? I don't think so. Look, look, they're flying in right now. Here comes the push. Here comes the push, but it's not in time. Quadrant will get the second. And now they're up two to one here, and FaZe Clan are three dead as well. Wow, and it's three dead as well. Frosty there wins a very nice battle as he pushes Rat Tunnel against that SLG 1v1. However, he just didn't have all the ability to move all the way in, and in the end, Quadrant clutches it out. Glory picks up a back whack, and the killing spree as well. And just like that, the slaying difference has been reduced from what was a seven kill lead to now just a one kill lead. 43 slays for FaZe, 42 for Quadrant, and Quadrant leads with two minutes 10 left in the game. Well, Glory's gonna have a bit of a surprise here, but he's got the weapon to deal with it. The only problem is he doesn't have any ammo. However, look at Snipe Drone backing him up. There's Seeker as well. And with this new hill, holding that back tower in the tower is where you want to control on the map. You can get shots down on spawners. You can keep your teammates alive. And at the moment, FaZe Clan just trying to get numbers back on, but Snipe Drone's not letting it happen. Very nice work from Snipe Drone. As we said, the latest addition to this team so far, he's shown up in a big way. Not only do you have Quadrant leading the game, they also just took over in the Slay department as well. They lead in kills for the first time in the match. Score. A little bit of a surprise for Snipe Drone as he jumps back up, but survives. The repulse put him into a position to do damage, but now the push is coming in back tower. It looks like FaZe are starting to win a few individual battles just when they need to, but the numbers get evened up momentarily. However, then all of the kills fall in the favor of FaZe. It's a four dead for Quadrant, and it's off the back of the camo pickup here from Snakebite. Enormous moment in this game. You might say the game rests truly on this next push. Take a look at the board on the bottom. FaZe absolutely has to hold off this push. This game either goes 2-2 or it goes 3-1 right here. 
Snake Bite has the ability here to overextend a little bit as well because he has that QT. There's the kills. Off at the back of his damage. It's four dead back to back wow. now for Quadrant. They aren't able to get out that spawn. There's one more opportunity for them maybe to get back on the map as a squad and push on this hill, but phase are locking this down. It's also high risk because guess what? If they all in this push again, they're going to be in a big disadvantage coming up again. And now they already started here. Come the pieces are crumbling. It's already two dead. This will be a face hill. It's going to be a face hill without a doubt. All players fall from Quadrant. It's three back to back, four deads. And now we have a game tied up at two to two as we head to top middle. If you were wondering just how much work FaZe had done in the offseason, they talked about specifically, as we said, Snake by talking about the strats on Live Fire and how differently it plays with the Bandit, with the QT, with the New Hills. Just take a look. A beautiful three back to back to back four deads in a row has now put them in the lead for the first time in a while. Worrying thing here for Quadrant as well is they don't have tower control. They're going to have to take a few seconds here to maybe try and win a fight in and around the tower before even thinking about hill time. Trying to flip the map onto FaZe Clan so they can hold it down for a little bit longer than the 10-15 if they approach from the A side at the moment. But Snake is going to have to back out. Good damage coming in here from Quadrant. Trying to get that chase down and get that kill secure. But Snake Bites, he's got his skates on. Big progress here already from FaZe on this hill as well. And I just mentioned at the 46 kill mark, Quadrant had began to outslay FaZe. That has been flipped on its head as you'd expect based on what we just saw. FaZe is once again leading by 10 slays. Good shot from Royal 2 as well. Not easy to outshoot SLG when he's in tournament form. Glory though, he's wrestled the sniper rifle away, but look at the hill time. He has to turn his attention towards that hill. Seek with a double. Glory trying to buy as much time as he can and manages to do so. Survives and keeps the sniper rifle. It's only one bullet, but in the hands of any player who wears a Quadrant shirt, regardless of what roster it is, you know he can put it to use. See what he was able to do here. Needs to try to stay alive. So far they do get the one kill that they needed. Eyes on camo. Eyes on camo, but also look, Quadrant have flipped tower. They have control of tower now, but then the flank comes in from Frosty. So they have to be careful here. By that camo coming up and the timing on it, they have to commit bodies that way, which allowed Frosty to wrestle away this tower control again. It's a brilliant play from him. Quadrant now on the back foot once more. Really well timed, also really well placed shot, unsurprisingly. He comes back for more. Frosty picks up the kill, and the slays will continue here. Renegade stood inside of this hill with a camo, though, and look how close FaZe are to closing this out. Just a few more moments until they go on three to two, and it's exactly what they will do. We go back into the first rotation of hills. We're back towards the green hill, back towards where we started, and FaZe have a one hill advantage. And what did we say when the transition back green, right? I said this is going to be a big moment in this game. FaZe has ran with the game since then. Let's not forget, only a few moments ago, they were trailing two to one in this game, and since then, they have been absolutely dominant now, outslaying by 12, leading by one. 50 seconds on the game clock, and already leading on progress in this hill as well. Yeah, it looks like FaZe want to try and play for the hill as well. They want to win this one 4-2. to two. Not really thinking about playing the game clock quite as yet, and I'm not surprised to see that, just based on the fact that this is more than enough opportunity and time in this game for Quadrant to have multiple pushes. But now you're seeing Renegade start to come to life. Frosty oh joins him as well. It's three dead for Quadrant. Glory first spawner as well, and they are trapped inside of A. What late game composure coming in from FaZe Clan. Actually, composure doesn't even feel like it's doing it justice, right? What late game perfection coming in from FaZe Clan here. 35 seconds left, already about 60% of the way done on their fourth hill as well. Looks like they're going to want to end it on hills rather than time, as you said. But there's the pick from Glory. It's going to allow Quadrant to move out at least. There's another one coming in from Snipe Drone. That's three dead for FaZe Clan. So just when you thought that maybe this is the moment we might be talking about this game getting closed out, Quadrant have broken. They're inside of this hill, and there's still some work here to do for FaZe. See if they can do it. 25 seconds left. FaZe, as you said, not playing time, going for the hill. Let's see if it bites them. Quadrant still with some hopes here. Rule two, bottom middle. Doesn't take too much damage from those Ooh. grenades, but it's enough for Seeker to re-challenge. He's 23 and 20 in this game. Renegade gonna be challenging from back tower as well. Good damage coming in. Seeker needs to survive here, but here comes a flank. I think it's actually spawners coming in from the garage. And Quadrant have to step out. They have to play for these kills. Here's the push, double push coming in. Snakebite also stays alive. They do not trade. It's a huge push to get two dead for Quadrants. Snipe Drone gets one though. SLG ties it up. Two for two on the map, Royal Two gets one, and now they're gonna try and burst in. It's Snake Bite who's trying to play for these kills. Two seconds left on the game clock. Glory. And it is gonna be Glory who steps in oh. at just the last second. Quadrant cannot leave this hill, or it will be a FaZe Clan game. All eight players up. How does this battle go? Last moments. See, he gets one. Frosty gets one as well. Glory's still inside of that hill. Is anyone gonna join him here? They step back in at the last second. They are still inside of this hill quadrant. 2v2 on the map. Here comes Frosty. Does he have any help? Snipe Joe's still on the hill. He's still on the hill. He dies it. And he sends us into overtime. Unbelievable. He took the hill. Well, I've had a lot of coffee this morning, but let me tell you, that woke me up more than anything. 
three to three, Quadrant still with a never say die attitude. Everybody stacking inside of that hill. And even though it took everything that they had, we have more games to play. We have more hills to cap. Next hill wins. Unbelievable. How about that from Quadrant at the very last second getting in twice to force us into an overtime. And this is just game one of the season. We saw some of the great series we'd ever see last season. And I'll tell you what, we're starting off in just the right way. Wow. What an introduction to year three this is. Face Clan have control though, for now. Two dead here for Quadrant. It's going to be staggered spawns as well as SLG will also fall. FaZe Clan I looked a little bit ticked off, I think, with how that last play went. How many times do we see FaZe win that play, by right. the way? That is the FaZe playbook. Close game, close moment, perfect push, win game. Not against Quadrant. 3-3 three to three here still. 136 on the game clock. That was back-to-back -back three deads from FaZe against Quadrant. And that's what's given them this progress that you see on the bottom. Already halfway done on what will be the game-winning hill. However, some kills start Ooh. to fall in the favor of Quadrant. Snakebite just calms things down a little bit, though, with that double kill. He's on a killing spree. It's five without response, making it a triple kill. And talking about calm things down, it's Snakebite who steps in and uses every ounce of his experience to flush Quadrant out and take control of this hill. That could do it. What does Quadrant do here? One push left. That's it. Snakebite gets another. Damage being done. This should be FaZe Clan closing out game number one as Royal 2 and Co. really do step in. They will finally close out game number one, but boy, oh boy. I mean, I'm going to be honest with you, didn't expect that from game one. Did not expect that from game one at all. FaZe wins in overtime despite outslaying 100 to 76 in game number one. A lot of credit due for Quadrant in the objective department. Also, a lot of gameplay to look at there from the FaZe side in terms of a game that was not close in the slaying department. However, certainly close on the scoreboard to have a Overtime in that fashion for game number one of the season. I don't even know what that sets us up trajectory wise for where this season will go. <laughs> but what a game number one to kick off your Arlington Major. Yeah, I mean, it's a, an amazing game number one. And once again, just kind of steps to the rhythm of what we saw last season, right? Just insanely close games back and forth between teams. And even though Quadrant come up short, They've shown that they can hang with the best in the world, right? And it's an opportunity for them to, to maybe step up a little bit in game number two. One thing that was the standout for me, though, is the stat that you put out there, right? They were outslayed in that game pretty heavily. And looking across the statistics, something that's a little bit of an anomaly from what we've seen last season, SLG 17 and 32, not the slaying performance we usually see coming in from Norwin. Certainly not, especially with a number like that. Unsurprisingly, only one player there going positive on the side of Quadrants. Actually, Sika, who manages to go 27 and 25. We actually just saw Sika there, and I think when you think about what he might be as he's staring off in the distance thinking about, it might be that first hill, to be honest, because guess what? That's a very different game if Quadrant can close out that first hill, but both teams showing that they've done their homework on how Live Fire is playing currently with the Bandit, with the spawn system. You could tell a lot of big control, a few back-to-back, -back, three, four deads for both sides. In the end, it will be Faze closing it out in overtime, but a lot of credit due for Quadrant's late game move there towards that hill. They had snipe, uh, excuse me, snake bite back green. Glory gets in with one second left. On a second opportunity, they get in with less than one second left, zero on the clock to force that OT. But now they need to refocus up, right? It always had to be one game at a time against FaZe for Quadrant. So they need to make sure they don't let themselves dwell on that game that could have been a win in a few different fashions for them. They need to now focus up, get ready for game number two. It's Slayer on recharge. Yeah, a really interesting game type, right? I mean, FaZe, we've seen them win so many game fives throughout last season, which was kind of their almost the, the statement of authenticity, right? Game five, we go to recharge, we go to Slayer, right. they win it. And that usually put them into the later rounds of the tournament or even won them tournaments of points. But Quadrant as well, they got some pretty good history on this. For you, uh, right at the back end of last season before the new season took place, the first Bandit event that we saw on LAN, you know, they won one of the craziest game five tournament winners against the XNAVI lineup by one kill when they were down 49 to 48. Yeah on Slayer Recharge. So there's some great history here for both these two teams. Great kind of things to lean back and remember, get yourself hyped up for this kind of, uh, this moment, especially for Quadrant, you won down, just showing that you can win big games on this game type. But for FaZe, I think they see Slayer Recharge and a lot of the time they kind of smile because yeah. they, they just know this is a game type they're so good at. Yeah, historically, of course, a, a map that they've been good across multiple game types. Slayer, of course, going to be in that pool without a doubt. I agree. For the Quadrant side, I think what they need to be able to do is just focus up, realize we played a really good game there despite getting out Slayed, right? If we look at the actual game in terms of forcing it to OT, multiple kind of clutches there towards the end of the game. I think there's a lot to be proud of from the Quadrant side. And if you're a Quadrant fan, you're simply hoping hoping that they realize, okay, game number two, everything to play for, we know exactly what we need to do. Let's see if we can tie this series up. Yeah, and it's just about finding that rhythm, right? I think it's gonna be something that we're gonna be seeing a lot of on 
in some of these maps and modes, it's like finding a rhythm as a team, especially when it comes to Slayer. You play a fast-paced King of the Hill game, and then you maybe have to just put your foot on the yeah. on the brakes a little bit when it comes to Slayer. Of course, we've seen some of the changes as well. You know, Recharge Slayer is one of the game types that hasn't changed too much, yeah. which is a, which is a, probably a good thing for both these teams. You know, we are still kind of looking at the spawns. Is there going to be something funky that goes on that catches someone off guard? But this is a game type that both teams will have enough reps on that they should feel comfortable on it. It certainly should. I think on the Quadrant side as well, they need to realize, okay, all we need to do is make sure we focus on just how much control we allow FaZe because there were several times where FaZe had three back-to-back to back four deads in that game number one. And I would say one of them was certainly uh, on that push when they're trying to get to mud. You might look at that on paper. Certainly we're lucky to be from our vantage point with observer mode, but it looked like that third push was gonna buy them a lot of trouble for the next spawn as yes. well. And it did, it cost them quite heavily. So in Slayer, I think they need to, because they don't have the timing pressure of the objective. Of course, they will have timing pressure of other items on the map. However, I think they need to make sure they don't let FaZe get things like 10, 12 kill leads here. Focus up on making sure you're not going for dead not giving full map control to a team like FaZe. Well, it looks like both teams are ready now. Everybody's locking in to get into game number two. Of course, FaZe, if you're just joining us, win the first game of the series. Live Fire King of the Hill going their way, but boy, it was close. And hopefully, we'll be saying the same thing as far as boy, it was close when we get to the end of map number two here. That's the question. As we saw from Quadrant there, they're up to par, however. Some early game cost them, as we said, throwing away that first hill off of a beautiful timing push. FaZe looked like they knew exactly when they needed to arrive, almost uh, Gandalf-esque in the way that they arrived to that first hill. Precisely when they meant to, and they take the first hill out from Quadrant. You have to think, it could have been a much quicker game, and a much very different game if Quadrant had taken the first hill. So I think Quadrant's going to put a lot of stock in this opening strategy on this game, right? If you go something like four or five dead, you cannot let the phase train kind of continue the momentum off that game one. I think Quadrant needs to arrest it early on. Yeah, I think one thing that's important for, for Quadrant, not just in this game type, but maybe highlighted in this game type is Snipe Drone. I think Snipe Drone is going to have to play a really consistent anchor role for this team. We know that Quadrant like to play at a high pace. It's what we saw from them all last season, right? Legend was the one who would, you know, put up those statistics, clean up the damage to put them in situations where maybe it was a kind of a 2v3 and even it up just for 2v2s on the map for those eight seconds or so before everybody got back in and can kind of back up that push. And I think Snipe Drone is going to have to play a very similar role. If damage is output by the rest of Quadrant, he has to be in a position, if that player is low, to keep them alive, but also transition it. Maybe phase winning a 1v1 into a trade on the map, right? So I think Snipe Drone's performance and his positioning is going to be vital for the success of this roster. It really is. And I think one thing I liked that what we saw from Quadrant was when they had control in that game, number one, it looked really solid, right? You saw things like Snipe Drone holding down nests, holding down boxes, making sure to clean up the one shots very quickly, very efficiently at back green. I think sometimes when you have a game like that where a team, as we take a look at the Snakebite SLG head to head here from the Let's see, pre-Worlds versus World. I had to get my head around that for just a second. Pretty close here, both players hovering right around that 1.0. Yeah, I mean, they play very similar roles on their team. Uh, a lot of people who might know SLG through history maybe know him as more of a, you know, the sniper guy. He was when he was a little bit younger. He was yeah. always, he, he was hitting the flashy clips, and boy, can he still do that. But he transitioned into more of an all-round player, especially last season. He's a much more selfless player. Will put himself inside of the objective. He will be putting down damage and shots. He'll be the one who goes in first alongside a buddy and won't mind taking the death as long as the trades come in and it creates a little bit of space for them on the map. So that's why those two players, you see statistically extremely similar. I always love to point out, by the way, Snakebite does the same thing, but to do that and still be positive in your KD yeah. is exceptional. It really is. And as we said, Snakebite, a man who has just breeded excellence on this team as we get into game number two. It's going to be Slayer on recharge off the rip, and we'll see what this team's able to do. Here comes FaZe Clan, trapped in Whirlpool for just a second early on. Yeah, pretty slow start actually here yeah. from FaZe on their opening strategy. Nobody overextending, everyone just waiting for a little bit of damage, and it kind of works out for them, because even though it looks like they didn't quite get the camouflage, I'm pretty sure that one player from Quadrant either got away or got that burn, they have full map control, and they have a lead here. So very interested to see how that was actually played by FaZe. Yeah, it looks like based on what we're seeing here from Observer, we did see a death right around the stacks, and that certainly could have been a camo burn. Based yeah, I think it was sniped right Certainly, down. based on the fact we haven't seen a switch yet, that would indicate a burn on the camo. Now we're going to Renegade here with the shock. And FaZe will happily play at this pace, right? They will wait until the opportunity for a pick comes. Especially with this weapon in the hands 
of Renegade. One headshot for him, and then you'll see the Accelerate if you push. They're happy to just wait, just wait for the damage, and then off the back of it, try and turn wow. one kill into three or four. There is that kill. Five to one the score here. Quadrant not really able to get on the map as yet. Got to be a good feeling for Renegade and Frosty when Renegade goes and checks Attic and he sees Frosty. He goes, hey, and then they go back to Cold Stairs and, hey, good to see you again. They have perfect timing on the double team there up at top goal to pick up what will be their fifth kill. And an early four kill lead. This is exactly what we said. We didn't want Quadrant to let happen if you're a fan of the Quadrant side. Already quite a good start here for FaZe. Soji makes the play here on Whirlpool. But we'll be taken down once more. And SOG having a little bit of a struggle at the start of this series. You could say that about pretty much every player on Quadrant as they're all in the death screen right now. Nobody yet to, three players, excuse me, yet to register kills on the map. And that is a, it's a concern, yep. <laughs> to say the least. Without a doubt, nine to two now. And FaZe once again just showing their off-season prep and how hard they've worked to be ready for these new settings across all these maps and game types here. An excellent start. Ooh, my goodness. That was just about probably the minimal damage you needed from the Bandit plus a grenade to get that kill so quickly on the stairs. And that'll be one kill going to Quadrant. But guess what? Now Snake White has the shock, which isn't much more help. Seeker does get away with Camel. Let's see what he could do. Maybe bring this game back within reason. Yeah, this needs to be a camo play that isn't a trade for Quadrant. He needs to be able to pick up one player without taking any damage, stay alive, and be able to be part of the next push as well. There is the first kill. And that isn't traded. Now they have that opportunity. Frost is going to fly in and look for the trade. Does get it. But two players from FaZe Clan still in the death screen. So you have to say that maybe the camo created an opportunity here. But FaZe have played it in a way which hasn't let the Quadrant Steamroller kind of gather any momentum. It's one or two kills that got a little bit close. And then FaZe have taken full control once more. Yeah, really good counter there, as you say, from FaZe. Game will now come within eight kills. But still a sizable lead for them to have two full spawn rotations of a lead. If you take a look at the early on highlight stats, going to be Frosty, of course, five and three at this stage in the game. Glory still yet to register a kill here as well. A long way to go, of course, but at 14 to six, the pace of this game is certainly something to note. Very slow, very deliberate from FaZe. Even with this impressive lead, I think they realize that risk management is what they want to try and do here. They don't want to make a mistake. They don't want to let Quadrant get back into this with a three, four dead, because that's where that lead disappears extremely quickly. You see three dead for Quadrant again. I think you put it perfectly. I think risk management is a fantastic way to describe FaZe's approach to these games, their approach to professional Halo, as we talked about kind of how they look for excellence in these game types. It is always about risk management. 18 to nine now for the phase side as they continue creeping on. And it's just like you said, Mark, they are very happy playing at this pace in a Slayer. They will continue to pick you apart no matter how long it takes. We are just about four minutes into the game. However, they still have double their opponent's kills. Two will fall! Oh. Renegade grabs the shock and evens the tides out just a bit. I think he got a double kill just before that, and Renegade went, how dare you? Just ripped his head off. Glory gonna re-challenge here. Glory should be able to get oh, this kill, but it's still what? gonna be wow. traded out in an awful situation there for Renegade. Just comes out comes out of situations like that with trades. Yeah, and also I got a big give sh huge shout out to Renegade there because he pl Oh no, no, oh. no, 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 no. SLG with a very cheeky back wagon and angle change to hit that onto Frosty. A nice play from him to keep things certainly interesting, um, but on the scoreboard still quite out of hand. It's 22 to 15. Could get even bigger that lead as well, because Royal 2 has a camo. However, Seeker knows he's here. You can hear the bullets being fired across. Everybody knows where Royal 2 is, but not quite where Royal 2 is. Was, we swear he was just right here. Trying to go for the stick. I like this play from Royal 2. No reason. Like we said, risk management. There's no reason to push that, even though he probably could have had the opportunity to fly in the doorway. 23 to 16 now. The game is far from over, just about to be at the halfway mark, and Quadrant keeping things at least within comeback potential. I mean, now they're within striking distance, right? And bear in mind, they didn't have that last camo. So this is a really good period of play here for Quadrant. Everyone's got on the board. Everyone started stacking up kills. But more importantly, they haven't been traded out. It's been two kills without response, three kills for one. That lead is starting to disappear here for FaZe Clan. Quadrant very much back into this one. Nice timing here from Royal 2, despite the shroud. We'll see if Glory should not be oh, able oh, to oh, get oh, away oh. with it. And he does, and I tell you what, curious how the phase side is feeling after that one because what was just a nine kill lead is now just a three kill lead. Let's get into the first listen in of the season with phase clan. That's so G lucky. Uh, I could be wrong. Yeah. Screen armor, screen armor. Back glass, please. SLG, SLG. Ew, ew. Shock seven up soon. I can grapple this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Back, 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 I think I hit him with an eight. Pushing, pushing, down. Two attempts, two attempts, two attempts. One's going batteries. One's going batteries. I'm going to play with my man. 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 I'm
I'm going in red, John. Yeah, yeah, right, I'm running, running, I'm running away. Okay, 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 I think shot should be up now as well. I can grab this. Kill me, kill me, kill me. I'll come, I'll come. Where's Camel, guys? Camel now. I can make up the top And then looking for one. Bellage, 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 watch out. I grab I grab the class, house, guys. Dude, top A, top A, top A, back, John, careful, top A, top A, Bellage. They might have shock, it, it was Dude, dude, he's killing me. Oh, yeah, top A, top A, I'm shooting him back, guys, two bomb here on me. Nice, good help. I'm helping him here, I'm 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 here, Yep. Matt, you're oh, all blue. All blue, blue tunnel, blue tunnel, blue tunnel. Hey, so nice, John. Nice, John. Dude, put some pressure on. Push all right, on. I'm gonna walk out. I'm leaving. I can't. I'm leaving. You're good. You're good. Be back blue. Yeah, 100 yeah. back blue. Yeah, yeah, I'm in BR. The old one. Yeah, one C plot. One C plot. Are you? I see nothing back blue. Yeah, they're, they're, I think they're three long ones. Bond mid, bond mid, ready. Bond mid, bond mid, weak. Bond mid, weak. C plot, C plot, triple, two C plot. Two. I'm gonna die. One's one, one long one, two, two weak chip sack. Yeah, triple, triple. I can't kill. Shoot, triple, C plot. What's our triple? What the fuck? What's our triple? Yeah, we can't do much. We can't do much here. Yo, I'm pushing along on for you guys. Yo, top eight to be our as well. Let's run, let's run. C steps, bottom. C steps, one hit. C steps, one hit. Neither. C steps, one hit. Yo, bottom BR on me. I'm going triple. Bottom BR. Bottom BR. Bottom BR. Neither bread. Neither and C steps. Nice bread. Nice job. Nice job. On it, bottom in on bread. Nice kill, guys. Good shit. Good shit. Yo, trap. Can we trap? Yo, pressure. We should pressure. Yeah, already one bottom A. We trap. We trap. We trap. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, pipes, okay. yeah, two bottom A, two bottom A. Yeah, they should all be A, guys. Should all be A. Yeah, I'm clear. Two, 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 two hell and max, really. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. Two hell, two hell. Hit, hit him, hit him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, John's yeah. Took a dead man. Top A, John's top A. John's top A, John's top A. 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 Top A, John's top one in, one in pipe door? There was a million again. Nice, Brad. A million percent guys. I think he would be here, bro. Yeah, he's stuck out. Yeah, bottom here, bottom here. I'm done, I'm done, I'm done. I'm top glass. C-Pot weak, C-Pot weak, C-Pot weak, C-Pot weak, C-Pot weak. Push along. Shock's on re, shock's on re. Long, weak too. I'm doing back damn, bro. Beat John, beat John. Bottom here, bottom here. Sure, sure. Shock's out, shock's out. Yeah, two bottom here, guys. One's absolute. Sure, I think there's one. Oh, triple. Cam on 10. Bottom here, one hand on corner, bottom here, one bottom here. Trade for this cam. Bottom here, this trade. Top here. Cam on 5, cam on 5. All right, cam on 5. Yeah, man, I got your cross. We play for Cam. Everyone is up here, everyone is up here. I'm going long haul with John for Cam. Long, long, two on John. I got one, I got one. Long, 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 one red. As we come out of the comms, the game has completely changed once more. And Andy, uh, with a score of 44 to 34, over a 10 kill lead at this point for FaZe, it's all about how that grapple changed the game. It really, really did now. 46 kills on the board for them, only four kills away from closing it out. And it was 17 to 7 in favor of FaZe, then 24 to 22. Quadrant brings the game all the way back, but just like that, now an 11 kill lead, excuse me, a 9 kill lead. With only three to go, 47 on the board for FaZe Clan. What an absolute beautiful play of Camo Control coming out of Renegade with that triple grapple to lock it down. And this is just now the closing stretch oh, for them oh, as they oh, hit 48. It's not an easy perfect to hit from, from, from Renegade, but he does it anyway. And the little run that Renegade did go on with that camo and that shock is what put FaZe into this position. Is two kills to go now for FaZe to go two up in the series. Big credit to them. You heard during the listen. It was a fantastic one, by the way. We'll have a time to break that down during the game. But now looking for these last two, excuse me, during the post game. But just two kills to go for them as they had beautiful collapses and just control as well as pressure. These might be the last two on your screen. Yeah, should be able to just flood in and get trades at least in this situation. Frosty gets one. Seeker, no shields and probably hoping that he doesn't see Frosty in the next few seconds. Unfortunately for him, his teammate will fall first and FaZe will be up 2-0 to zero with a 50-43 to 43 win. Once again, FaZe, despite having their backs against the wall in the mid game, that's the second time we've now seen this in the row on our first series. Backs against the wall, they throw away essentially a 10 kill lead in the mid game. But you have to love the way they're able to bring it back together. You heard Royal One also continually saying, even though they were only up by about six after that mid game, okay, here we push again. We continue to apply pressure, really knowing exactly when they needed to slam down the gas pedal, continue to apply pressure, and it worked. And Renegade, as you said, with the shock and the camo putting on a show, and he just has complete control of those peaks. And even when we saw he should have been dead back blue, doesn't only, he thought he was gonna trade there. Instead, he gets the entire kill and stays alive back blue. And that kind of summed up really the second half of the game for FaZe Clan. Yeah, very impressive stuff from FaZe. And we mentioned how the grapple was so influential, right? It was, yeah. if Renegade doesn't have the grapple to get out of the situation where he was no shields in the first place, he doesn't go on to grapple the camo. He doesn't go on to get the shock. He does, all of these things, the domino effect, just, Again, just great decision making coming in from Renegade, which is why he ends up with 15 kills and just the nine deaths. Frosty, by the way, 17 kills for him, 14 deaths alongside it, but everybody doing the work required for FaZe. On the other side of things, a little bit of a slow one for Glory in that game, but you feel the game was maybe lost 
just around that one kill, right? Yeah. You know, they make the comeback and then Renegade gets away. They don't get the cleanup on that damage. And well, we know what happened exactly after that. Absolutely. Also, Renegade, credit to him. Also, the shock peak that he had there on the pipe store was really nice. You could tell he knew exactly how much kind of extra bit he had as he wall glitched, really, and just using all the collision that was on that side to pick up that kill as well. But as we said early on, 18 to 9, let's not forget, FaZe was up by a huge margin, despite shots like that coming in. And I tell you what, Quadrant, once again, just about tied at the 25 mark, but FaZe just absolutely dominating. And you have to say, the grapple route that came in from Renegade was quite a standard one, and as we'll have a chance to look at these last highlights. And we'll talk about exactly what he did, but this was really just him putting on a show. Yeah, this is just Renegade, right? I mean, if you give the guy a shot cry for it's, it's terrifying enough. If you give him a camo as well, yeah, for, forget it. you pretty much don't have an opportunity to strike back. This is a... Uh, what it's going to look like, though, for the series layout, 4-3, 50 to 43, a close series, but only one color on the scoreboard at the moment, and that is that of FaZe Clan. CTF Aquarius as well, I would say, if you're Quadrant right now, it's probably the game type you don't want to see, because this is, yeah. uh, you know, this, this has been one of FaZe's best game types in our history. It really has, and I think we're lucky to see Renegade's player cam right now. His arms folded, and I think his attitude is, uh, let me know when the game starts. We'll go ahead and do that again. He looks very cool, very calm, very collected on the main stage, and just another day at work for Renegade. We should talk about that grapple route while we have a second. It's a pretty standard one, however. Really big play, as we said. He's on battery. He's just trying to stay alive. He actually grapples to long haul, stays alive somehow one, one shot. Then he actually grapples from long to actually to Hydro, to Plasmas, to clean up a kill. And that kill got cleaned up early, so he drops stacks, grabs the camo, and then goes on essentially to run away with the game. It's a very nice play, but as you said, CTF Aquarius is what they're doing, looking down the barrel of. Get ready for that game number three. They're going to be ready to go quickly, and you have to think if they continue to play at this pace, they should be able to close this one out. Yeah, they should be able to indeed, and FaZe looking dominant. FaZe looking like we would expect them to yep. coming into this season as well. You know, we said to everyone who's watching, we were talking to each other, we were saying, like, the, the work that FaZe have put in, are they ahead before a bullet has even been fired? Well, after the first couple of games, it yeah. maybe is a contributing factor as to why they are looking so good, alongside the fact that they're really good at Halo. Very good. Individual players. So it's, it's going to be a tough road for everyone to take yeah. down. But I think also, you know, we're giving a lot of plaudits to FaZe, understandably, they're two up in the series, but there were some big questions about where is the ceiling for Quadrant now with this new lineup. And I think they've proven that they can still hang. Yeah. Maybe they need a little bit more time, a couple of events, whatever it might be, but there's still a lot of promise and a lot to be happy about for Quadrant in these games. It's come down to the wire in that first game. That second game, they make a huge comeback, but just one play, one camo doesn't go their way. And before they know it, they're two down in the series. But we always say, Andy, that's the margins, right? Yeah. If you want to win tournaments, if you want to beat the best in the world, the margins have to go your way. Yeah, I think if you're a Quadrant fan, there's actually a lot to be excited about based off of this series so far. And I don't let the series scoreboard to fool you, despite the fact that FaZe has controlled really the big beginnings as well as the closings of the game, that has led them now to a 2-0 series lead. You have to say, if there was any questions about can this Quadrant roster hang with the best teams in the world, we've seen really good, not just moments of brilliance, but comebacks in both of these games, one and two, where you had to put together a very, very good string of plays against the world champions to do that. So already I think Quadrant looking very good and indicating that they might have quite a high ceiling however face so far getting the better of them in the first two. Yeah, and I think one of the contributing factors as well to the fact that phase of two up is they've shown a huge amount of respect to Quadrant as well. You know, yes. the, the way that they played when they had that small lead at the start of that second game, they kind of didn't want to put themselves in a position where they went three, four dead because they knew that Quadrant had the ability to turn a three, four dead into a 10, 12 run kill with that response. So I'm kind of liking what I'm seeing as far as discipline is, is concerned from FaZe early on in the season. You know, this is the first first matchup on the se of the season. It's pool play. You know, there's a lot more bigger series to come for them throughout the season and throughout this tournament. But that level of discipline, if you can install it in the first series, the yeah. first time you step on the main stage, that's what makes them so good, right? It's being able to flick that switch and yeah. go into tournament mode, go into game mode. It's true, and throughout Halo history, there's very few teams that early on, say, in brackets or pools, if you look at their gameplay and there's big holes in terms of the strategy of the consistency, there's very few teams like that as we take a look at the open pit here. A lot of teams looking forward to maybe make their way over to this side of the station, of course. They can the, see it. Yeah, they can you, see it. You can see you can in the distance. It. It's, it's, almost, uh, it's almost perfectly placed where if you do well enough over there, you get to come over here to the main stage. But as I was saying, it's very rare in history that teams that have a little bit of big gaps and strategies that they go on to win events or go on to place higher than their expectations. And I do think that installing that discipline early on in the event is something that FaZe will do so well historically, and they're doing it here yet again. I love the idea, by the way, if you're not a wrestling guy, you need to become a wrestling guy. So these references... I'm working on it. I'm, okay, fair enough. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying. But you know, like people win the Royal Rumble and then they point at the WrestleMania side? Yeah. 
I think we could do something like that here. Like you come out of the open bracket, Ooh, you point at the just, main stage. Oh, yeah, yeah, I like it. I like it. Just it's not too It's not too far of a walk, but I tell you what, it is a grueling bracket to get here. The bracket much longer than the walk. It you, is a Royal you can see the main stage. However, you've got to get through a lot of talented teams in order to make it over here by Saturday. And if you're lucky enough, maybe even by Championship Sunday, we'll have to see what the open bracket produces here at the Optic Major. And now we're going to lock back in to game number three here on the main stage. Quadrant versus FaZe. If you're just joining us, FaZe, the world champions, up 2-0 to zero in the series. However, very close mid-games. These teams have been tied at the mid-game of both game one and game two, giving us quite a series so far. We'll have to see if FaZe can close it out here in three games. And you saw a little snippet there of SLG chanting it away, as he always does, trying to get his team back locked in and maybe trying to get himself locked in as well. A little bit of a quiet start to the series for him. Snipe Drone's ready to go as well. And I think Quadrant just stepping away from the stage there for a few moments just to reassess, just to take that moment, get that breath, and really try and make FaZe work as hard as possible for this series win is one of the smartest things they could have done. They don't want this to be a 3-0. They want to win this next game. They want to send it the distance, and they're going to do everything in their power to make FaZe wait and see if they can put them on the back foot. An interesting moment there. You saw Snipe Drone just on your screen. Really an interesting moment in his career, right? Because historically, he's just been regarded as one of the top players in Europe without a doubt. But now, big shoes to fill on this roster. And of course, they picked him up for a reason. As we said, a late pickup in the offseason, installing him as the fourth and final player on the roster to see if they can even match or beat the heights that they hit last season. Game number three, CTF Aquarius getting underway right now. Here we go then. This is the opportunity for Quadrant to get a game on the board, but they're going to have to beat FaZe in one of their historically best game types. Aquarius captured the flag. Of course, we do have a, a couple of different changes, a couple of additions. We now have an overshield, Ooh. which is going to be jumping up P1. So watch out for players controlling that. It can be a complete game changer, and it's Quadrant who are going to control it first. Great movement coming out of glory there. Almost hits the shots as well onto Royal 2 as he hits the slide towards the Shroom Stairs. That, though, will lead to an early grab, as you say, for Sika of the Overshield. Let's see what he could do here with the flagpole. Yeah, maybe an opportunity to run this one as well. A couple of kills being picked up, and also spawns on the P side means that he can force this. He's got the Overshield to work with Ooh. as well, and he wins that battle. Where are the other kills coming in, though? He has to survive, so cannot continue this run personally. And it looks like FaZe survived for just long enough to make this a little bit of a contesty, kind of difficult to run one here for Quadrant, and one that should Ooh. be go home, but... Cheeky little touch. Yeah, Quadrant, have a... Go with it. Interesting battle there, bottom middle. We'll get a chance to break that down in just a second. We got to see how this flag returns, if it does, before we do so. Two dead here for Quadrant. Should be a return here. One v one between SLG and Frosty. A couple of sticky grenades. Going to help him out in that situation. Although SLG did manage to turn a kill onto Renegade while all of that fight was going down. So kill prioritization coming in from SLG. Exceptional in that circumstance. But that flag has gone back home. Now you're seeing Face Clan start to inch up the map. And Royal 2 with a double kill means it's time to go here for Frosty. Three dead SLG was your last player alive, ensuring that those base spawns will be coming in as well. Maybe a split to Fridge. No, all players are actually going to be spawning here in the back of the base. Only one player in Fridge. However, they're going to push out Fridge regardless. We'll see how this push goes, if he's going to be able to make some pressure here from the gen. Also, it's a really smart play from Quadrant. They turtle up inside of the base, knowing that they needed to get numbers back on the map. But as soon as they got a pick on the P side, if that was their exit, you cannot just sit in the base. You have to try and take some map control again, especially with this overshield coming up. Now, this is a worrying moment, though. Frosty behind you, getting the flag out. Has oh, a line aside man, the overshield, wow. but SLG deals with him, sends him to the death screen, and see he gets another OV. Three were dead. Renegade was the only player alive. Sika, as you say, his second overshield of the game, his back to back, they've controlled so far very well. Good timing on those kills. He's going to have to win both of these, but with the help of the overshield, should be able to do so. Now he does hit the drop slide he didn't hit on the first run. We'll see if he can take it home. Yeah, this should be a cap. This should be a cap going for Quadrant. They have some kills, they have some map presence, they have Seeker all the way across as well. The staggered spawns coming in, another trade comes in for Quadrant. Nobody in position to stop this one for FaZe, and wow. Quadrant will strike first. Seeker also hitting very three very important drop slides during that flag run. Won't necessarily be a record timing run, but it certainly is up there with the best. That's just about as fast as you can run the flag here on Aquarius, and really nice movement coming out of him. You could tell based on the last moments of the run, if he doesn't hit all three of those slides, there's no way that flag is going back at that speed. Still two dead for FaZe, make it three dead though for Quadrant, four dead for a second. Four dead for now. Two overshields, though, is the score. to zero in favor of Quadrant at the start of this game. And that's why you've probably seen the score in the way that it is. The amount of damage the Seeker was able to do in the back base. Picked up one, two kills. Then he was running. It took a bit of extra damage while he was doing so as well. 
But Fades are trying to show now that they don't need an overshield. They just need map control and presence. They have that flag all the way back, but they haven't got a huge amount of kills to go alongside it at the moment. They have to be careful on what they prioritize here because there's a lot of Quadrant players still alive. We'll see if they're able to bring this home. If they Frosty wins that 1v1 versus SLG earlier, certainly that flag would already be home. Flag now pulled, both flags out. Yeah, this is a counter cap opportunity because Frosty's last alive here momentarily for Faze. So he has to control pink. He has to stay alive, do damage, and make sure that this doesn't become a 2-0 game. Instead of maybe being a 1-1 game. Quadrant in position here. Royal True trying to bait these flags at the moment. And he's going to be able to get a touch. Good shots there from Glory as well. Two players dead for the like side. That flag will return and it goes in just in time as well. Sika trying to get maybe a pull if he could. In the end, that flag will finally go down. And now tied 1-1 one one here. By the way, FaZe also outslaying by a small margin. It's 28 kills to 25. One of those situations you can pick apart a little bit as Glory gets the next overshield. That's three in a row, by the way. Four quadrant now, and the game is tied up at one to one. Touch comes Ooh. in, three dead for FaZe. We'll get back to what I wow. want to talk about in a second, because there's something more important happening. That's that flag moving, but they haven't dealt with Renegade, and the damage that came in from that grenade on bottom middle allowed Snakebite to be in the game. Huge from Snakebite there. Glory wins a very important 1v1 again. However, okay, that's okay. essentially three dead. Yeah, I mean, it, this is the second time it's happened. This is what I was going to talk about. Quadrant have left one player alive for FaZe without putting pressure on them twice in a row. It's cost them a flag cap. Yep. That tied the game up at one to one, but now it's cost them a cap of their own as well. One player still alive, not accounted for, has hurt them twice. It does feel like in this series there have been moments like that where Quadrant will go, oh, wait, let's see, almost goes around the block on the right side. That will be a trade in the end from Snipe Trode and Renegade, only moments away from maybe getting the back whack instead. But it does feel like there's already a lot to look at in terms of the tape department for Quadrant, right? Moments where they were about to run away with the game and just at the last second, they don't apply the right pressure, as you said, to that fourth player. Glory trying to overextend on the P side here, trying to see if there's any phase members in front of him. Can't find anyone for now. However, we'll find that he's getting some shots in the back. Snake bite flies out. Damage being done by a teammate to try and keep the numbers even on the map. Exactly. As we find ourselves now with the 2v2. Flag has been pulled here by FaZe, but you can see the Royal 2 is trying to just buy time for Snakebite to get in a position to help him before they even think about moving this one forward. Good damage, they're coming in for Snakebite as well. Tied 1-1 one to one here, half of the game has been played. Ooh, very nice, into the pitch oh, up oh, too! Oh, 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 oh. Beautiful stuff from Snakebite, this one could go. I mean, he might be able to get a touch on this and wow. keep it going. One play from Snakebite, and again, I have to say, a misplay. Again, not accounting for Snakebite. They knew he was in the fridge. Why are you flying out in a straight line? Just try and get a little bit of damage before you're doing that. And you kind of gift him two kills in a situation where it really should at most be a trade. Overshield coming up as well. Snakebite trying to make a decision. Do I try and stop this counter cap coming in? Do I put pressure on the overshield? He's got decisions to make, and he's making some good ones right now. Should be an overshield grab for Frosty off screen. We'll take a look at that in just a second. Almost wins a battle on the back of the base as well. Frosty does grab the overshield. Peace shooter in hand as well. Flag is still moving, though, and he's going to have to be careful about what decisions he makes. Snipe Drone's going to escape. Should be able to jump in for a return here, but he's taking damage. Zeke is going to be there as well. Frosty gonna... gets one. He's going for the return. The touch comes in. They throw it out to the front of the base. Royal 2 gets the kill. Quadrant will fall, and that should be a comfortable return lane, as you say, for FaZe. Wow, look at that timing. Very, very slow and patient from FaZe, and it's just another repeat of the same story we've seen all series long. Able to now lead 2-1 to one in the game with five minutes left. FaZe just, again, it's almost surgical the way that they're putting these plays together, constructing them on the fly, but everybody knows their role. Oh my goodness, Snakebite with the peak shots onto Glory. Wow. Had no right to even be in the position he is. He has no right to be alive right now, but Absolutely not. he was. Beautiful. As Snakebite and I, have just a few weeks ago, were talking about the Bandit on land, and the first thing he said to me is that jiggle peeking will be important, and that was the, a beautiful display of how you can peak shot someone with this single shot weapon and absolutely just put down tons of damage that, as you said, you may have no business doing. Beautiful damage, beautiful shots from him. So again, a very close game between these two teams. But it is FaZe Clan who have their noses in front as we just kind of passed that five minutes left in the game. Snipe Drone has information. But he's going to find out his two players coming out of that with a trade will do him absolutely. But I've got to say for Quadrant, considering they've controlled the majority of the overshields in this game, they've had most of the power on the map. Being now two to one has got to be a little bit disappointing. Definitely on top of that, also being outslayed right now by seven. It's 55 to 48 in kills. And as you say, with, with the power-up control that they've had so far, two out of the three over shields, those numbers should look a little, a little bit different on paper as we now hit the four-minute remaining mark. Big win in the base, though. Royal 2 tries to turn his attention back to capitalize on the damage that was done by Snakebite. Glory going to fly in, wins that fight against Royal 2 as well. Flag has been pulled here. 
as FaZe try and get control as the overshield comes up as well. Now these kills are Big. vital because not only could this turn into an equalizing flag and tie the game up here for Quadrant with the overshield, there's an opportunity for them to slay back to back and maybe think about double capping. It really is here. Let's see if they can do it. They did just get two additional kills. This flag should at the very least go. Lots of damage coming on the shroom stairs. SLG very glad he had an overshield to bring to that battle. And that flag will go in. Quadrant in the same oh, fashion. Oh. oh boy. And as we said, it's a perfect reversal. This bandage just provides opportunities, excuse me, to turn on people. And somehow SLG comes out not only with a flag cap, but also with another kill as well. Ooh. Almost breaks an angle, but Renegade with a beautiful response to it. Still three dead for FaZe. This is the worry, though. I said this might not just be one cap. It could potentially be two. FaZe on the back foot, but these kills vital. They will stop this flag progressing up the map and should be able to send this one back home pretty comfortably. Quadrant find themselves four dead. Three minutes left on this clock. Flag return. As FaZe Clan will control the midpoint on this map, Frosty finds himself a heat wave as well in his new position of bottom middle, and he'll be able to lock down the car side now. I think anyone coming into the series probably didn't have their bets on the fact that Quadrant would be tied with FaZe at the midpoint of every single one of these games. They have been neck and neck. The question is, will history repeat itself in this game number three as Frosty picks up a very clean heat wave battle? Glory, though, picking up the battle from um, the kill, excuse me, from bottom middle. I don't know if anyone would have had Quadrant matching FaZe essentially at the midpoint in every single game so far. We're tied 2-2, two 2.30 two, two left on the clock. Royal 2 just got absolutely melted. Just stepped, stepped across the front of the base and... You can see how quick the bandit does damage, right, when your yeah. team's shooting. Two more players from FaZe to deal with. Information's going to be collected here by Seeker, and importantly here for Quadrant as well, with the Overshield coming up in 15. The fact that they're on the car side probably means Respawn is back base. They're not going to be in the fridge. They're not going to have an immediate line of sight. And now oh. Seeker moving in to take down Royal 2. Is this the opening for them to get another Overshield? Overshield popping as well. What beautiful shots from Seeker. Can he do it oh again? My another God. perfect killing spree from him. And moments before this, I was about to say, I am loving watching what players were able to do with the bandit if he gets another one here. I swear oh he picks my. up another one against Frosty. Snipe Jones got himself an overshield and Quadrant have momentum. Fate Clan, two dead in this game with one minute 40 left on the clock. SLG gets one. Glory gets a train as well. As just in the last moments of this run, it's looking like Snipe Jones sure. should be able to run He's this one. Go. Takes a step, start step, tries He's to force it in. Gets oh, it. and he gets it. It's three new to Quadrant. Oh, boy, right on the doorstep as well. You have to think there was only one player alive to even stutter step on the gen against one player. Risky. They do get it in the end. 120 left, and off of the kills and the damage and the overshield control, they will lead by one. Renegade, wow. though, with a reversal oh, oh, onto Glory, oh. and all of a sudden the kills mean more. Snake bite. He's got this one back home, and a counter cap has come in from FaZe. It's three to three, and for everything that Quadrant did, FaZe immediately break the momentum and maybe have just broken the spirit of Quadrant as well by equalizing with just under 60 seconds left. Has that been the story of this match or what? Just when you think Quadrant's going to start to pull away with something, FaZe has already have a flag back at their gen. It's great counter, great slaying control coming in from FaZe. 47 seconds left. Might see overtime here. Roll two. And Frosty get kills though. And wow, wouldn't this be, like you say, the story repeating itself. FaZe are moving a flag. They have it back across. They are in a position dead. to maybe steal this game away once more. 30 seconds left. Frosty's here holding things down with the heat wave. And Quadrant again at the death. Find out that FaZe win games in the last minute. They absolutely do. Unbelievable. Another run, as you say, they back to back. What Quadrant feared most when leading three to two, of course, would be a back to back double cap. 12 seconds left on the clock. I mean, is there even anyone in position here for Quadrant? I don't think there is. Stay by. Slams the door shut on the base. It's a desperate overextend from Quadrant on the pink side with just one second left. FaZe will close it out. And again, FaZe just have something about them where they play till that final whistle. And boy, do they win so many games in those last few seconds. I honestly cannot believe what we just saw. The fact that you have an ending like that, you were kind of teeing it up. Will it be the same exact thing that we saw? And man, with Quadrant leading with, I believe it was 120 left, they're leading by a flag. For that game to instead end in regulation off of perfect plays from FaZe once again tells you about the clutch factor. It feels like regardless of the point that FaZe finds themselves, they'll just do the math on what has to happen in order to win the game in the late game. That's exactly what they did. And it looked like that might have been a Quadrant W. 60 seconds left on the clock, essentially, leading by a flag, and somehow face back-to-back flag gaps to end the series in three games in what was about to be a pretty fantastic rally and comeback, an extension of the series from Quadrant. It actually just ends in a 3-0 for FaZe, and that 
all the effort, I would say, will be long forgotten, right? FaZe is going to just say, okay, let's go on our next, and Quadrant has a lot to think about. Yeah, I mean, it's a close series, but like you say, the only real result that we care about is the 3-0, and that does not sound close whatsoever. I just think it's fascinating, like, we go back two minutes in that game, Quadrant pick up an overshield, and I'm talking about there's an opportunity for them with the kills they have to maybe think about double capping themselves. Yeah. And ironically, what happens at the end of the game is FaZe pretty much double cap to win the game. It's it's just what FaZe do. do. I, I can't put it any differently. It's it's just what FaZe do, and they do it once again. They do it once again. It feels like, it just for whatever reason, the late game for FaZe, and I think it's a really respectable quality. There's a lot of professional sports teams throughout the history who had a similar quality. When something about that clock ticking down in the last few moments of the game just has the communication perfect. They know exactly which steps they need to take to play it perfectly, and they continue to execute, as you see the scoreboard tell, the same exact tale. Four to three in game number one with a late game grab on the hill in overtime time 50 to 43 despite being tied right around the 24 mark and it's four to three despite trailing three to two with a minute 20 left yeah i mean you look at those those scores in the games and it's you know it's, it's almost identical you know four three four three 50 43 it's the margins the illuminati like, stuff going on exactly there. it's it's in, it's incredibly close but it's not close when you get to that final result and that's kind of what quadrant have got to look at right you got to turn those close games into wins and I will say there's a lot to be positive about for Quadrant. There is. Uh, uh, some really good moments for them in that series. And I think that uh, there's going to be a lot for them to work on as they walk through this uh, this tournament and get towards hopefully Championship Sunday once more. But for FaZe Clan, it's, uh, it's another fantastic result. A great start for them. 3-0 to zero is going to be the series result as we head over to the main stage with Blaze. is with Frosty. Thank you so much, Onset and Brav. Texas, give it up for FaZe Clan as they kick off year three with a W. Frosty, you guys take down Quadrant 3-0. You know, it was, a, it was a quick series. How did y'all get that one done? What was the game plan coming in here? Uh, honestly, just getting our footing back. You know, first tournament of the year, it's been a long off season, um, but we're back to it. Uh, we're just kind of getting a feel of being back to land, especially with the Bandit first tournament of the year as well. So we're just getting our footing. That's about it. There you go. And so now, as you said, it's a new year, and it's a lot of new changes here in ACS, especially when it comes down to the map. Now, live fire is a lot different than it was beforehand. I feel like that's where you guys probably had a little bit more of a struggle with them. What are some of the changes on live fire that uh, that, that you guys are, are seeing here? How do you like it? Um, honestly, yeah, the new hills make that uh, map and mode way different than before. I'd say that was one of the things we struggled with a lot whenever it initially got changed. Um, but. Uh, us winning that is a good sign. We've been working on that specifically a lot, and uh, that was a good win to get. There you go. Now, as you guys are here, we did a ring ceremony on the stage, and I got a chance to talk to you about it. But how special what it was it to get that third ring, and how does that ring compare to the rest of them out there that you got? Uh, it definitely feels really good, especially with this team. Uh, obviously, we had a lot to prove with the new pickup. Uh, but, I mean, yeah, it feels good. Uh, nice little uh, confidence boost going into this tournament. All right, lastly, what do you want to say to the FaZe Clan fans out here that's been supporting you in the venue and at home? I mean, shout out to you guys as always. Shout out everyone here. Um, hopefully we can make it a good event. Um, and let, yeah, let's make it a good one to start off the year. You heard it here from Frosty. Let's make this a good one to start off the year. Lottie, I think we at the right start. Take us away. Thank you so much, Blaze. You're right, a very hot start on that stage 3-0 from FaZe going up against Quadrant there. I think right now my takeaway from that series is the ice that FaZe have. And I want to dive actually into what ice actually means, I think, for that team. I think that, that kind of sentence is thrown around quite a lot. That team's so icy, etc. For me, it's the determination to win, the will to win, no matter how difficult it may seem, no matter how much the odds are stacked against you. That is something that FaZe have had since the inception of this team, and they continue on. It really isn't over until it is fully, fully over. We've seen so many iterations of that from them. But again, Quadrant really, really kind of pushing back on them, but FaZe, that ice, it stands strong, Clutch. I mean, really impressive from this FaZe roster early on in this tournament. Yeah, one of the best attributes this team has is being able to close out these close games. So often do you see teams push other teams, take games from other teams, but in these close games, three to threes, it's going into overtime, the Slayers are going down to the last kill, maybe not this time around, but, but the games one and two in this series were very winnable games by Quadrant, but that's, I feel like, when there's a minute on the clock and the game's tied, when you see FaZe in the map, you're like, this is over. It's almost Tom Brady-esque when it's like, oh, Tom Brady's getting the ball with, with 
30 seconds left. Uh, it's a tie game. This game's over, right? This is what it feels like when I watch FaZe play in these close games. When you beat them, it's traditionally in a little bit dominant format because if it is close, for some reason, they have that next gear. They have that yeah. next level that they elevate to and they close out games so well. They certainly do indeed. They really do dig deep for that next gear. I want to talk a little bit about Quadrant as well, especially in this first map. And Tony, back on Live Fire, we just saw moments ago in the highlights, the, the kill ratio, 100 to 76, obviously getting out Slade heavily Quadrant, but the efficiency for their objective work was there. And we saw that for the rest of this series too. So what does that tell you about this Quadrant roster, especially going forward in the Major? Yeah, I think Bravo brought that up uh, really well. This team is, is, you have a lot to take away from it that's actually good for Quadrant. I know, I know you just got 0-3 and obviously, you're doing it up against FaZe, who are heavy favorites, but, you know, peel it back. Like you said, you only, you're outslayed by 24 kills, and you only end up losing by one hill. You keep it that close. Going into that game number two, going into the mid game, you were just as close, and even in that game number three, you had overshields over FaZe, you were slaying out really well, you kept it really close. Eventually, almost like you're about to close it out. Like, if I'm Quadrant, there's, there's some decent stuff to take away from that, and you have a long tournament ahead of you. These are things to take away from it, but it, it just always will make me think, what if they had Legend in this series? And, and no offense to any of the substitute players that are playing alongside Sika and SLG this season, but I mean, is Legend a difference maker in some of those four threes? You bet your ass he is. And unfortunately, they're not going to have Legend anymore, so you got to find ways to win some of these games. And as the stats come up, Lottie, this series had some close games in it, but these slays, and the overall series score was not close. Yeah, when you look across the stats table here, you are noticing quite a deficit when it comes to Quadrant. And it does make you question, with Legend, the firepower that he brought to that team, the kind of iciness that he also has against some of the best in the world. What is missing from that Quadrant roster? And it really is that kind of the, the comfortability, the breathing room that Legend brought with him. I do think that there are some really great things for Quadrant to work on. It wasn't a complete and utter destroyed series by any means. They kept it very, very close, but I do think that the firepower is certainly missing, and they need to dig deep to find that room to create on, on, on the maps and create that space. It's got to be a group effort, too. Nobody's going to be able to replace Legend as an individual, especially not inside the rest of Europe, right? So Quadrant's going to have to figure it out and play a little bit better of Team Halo, more efficient Halo than they have in the past. But, I mean, looking at those stats, and especially Game 1, Renegade had a really poor Game 1 statistically. He started to pick it up in games two and three. When Renegade start, like, has that bad game, that's when you have to win because you know Renegade's going to wake up in the middle of a series at some point. He might have had the worst KD ratio in this series, but I expect Renegade to play much better throughout this weekend. As Frosty said, that was about getting our feet on the ground. Let's get back to lane. I expect FaZe to play even better in the series up ahead. I will say, he may not be legend. I was pretty impressed with Seeker. That man, mm. that man wasn't missing Seeker's a shot. Seeker's nice, dude. He, was, he wasn't missing a shot, but like you said, it, it, even that slow start from Renegade and the assist he was able to put up, uh, even with that, it's tough. It's, it's, a t it's a tough matchup for Quadrant. Let's watch out for them going forward. Let's give them a chance. <laughs> Indeed. I, I do know, though, on the other stream, some crazy things are also going down. And it's 2-1 right now to foe against Native Gaming. So we're looking at Europe once again going against North America. And of course, Native Gaming coming into businesses spot in pool play. Uh, and actually, business are now back in the open bracket where uh, excuse me, Native would have been. So that's also a little bit surprising here. This Native Gaming roster we haven't talked about too much yet. How are you feeling about out then the likes of APG collect on this team. What is going wrong for them? What's not gelling? That's the problem here. I love the roster, but everything I see from them, it's been pretty poor. And, and they just, for some reason, have not been able to figure it out. And when you haven't figured it out at all before the first event, when you get to the first event, you're kind of hoping that maybe we're just better on land or maybe we're tournament players. That's a bad place to be for this native gaming roster. Now that you're down 2 1, that's an even worse place to be. I have major concerns about native gaming's tournament lives here this weekend. Foe, this would be a big win for them. A, a nice confidence builder. Having the number one seed in Europe is good, but beating a strong American team, a top 12 team in native, I think that that's a great start for their tournament. I have to say I completely agree there. And honestly, my worries for Native Gaming don't come because of the score line against Foe currently. You're looking at Foe on the other side in Europe. They were beating Quadrant. They come in as Europe's first seed. Like you said, Clutch, Foe have been on fire in the offseason and are coming into this with the hopes and dreams of Europe on their shoulders. How excited are you about this roster in pool play and looking at this kind of welcoming we're seeing for the majors, Tony? 
I'm really excited about this faux roster. Jimbo has done a great job of finding young talent and really kind of molding them and kind of setting them up for success. You saw what he did with Glory and how well that team looked like last year under that Navi banner. We, we see now what he's been able to do with, with the Mighties and even Wutum as well. He finds this talent. He kind of just puts, a, you know, gives the Jimbo spin on how they should play the game. And they look good every time we see them. They're looking better and better. And now look at them against Native. They're looking very good. And they also do have an addition that was taken from Quadrant, or in fact, actually lost from Quadrant because Quadrant did drop Chick. Chick goes now to Foe and he's finding a new home. And it's, it's interesting to kind of see that rivalry start to progress because he's now beating his former team that were really making history last year in this very room. Yeah, I guarantee you when Foe saw that Chick was the replaced player, they were like, absolutely, we'll take some <laughs> yes. chick on our team. Maybe he hadn't been performing well since the bandit starts or whatever was going on with Quadrant. We don't really have great insight into that. But Chick, yeah, we know him to be a good player. We'll take him. And like you said, Tony, picking up a player like Wutum, a mouse and keyboard player that is on the rise, that has a ton of individual skill. And let me tell you, as a mouse and keyboard player myself nowadays, the sky is the limit for the opportunity that a massive keyboard player has compared to controller if you're able to control your Spartan well enough and hit the shots. It seems like Wutum's doing a good job finding his place. The number one seed in Europe is no pushover, and they're giving Native everything they can handle in that game four. They certainly are. It's going to be very interesting. I'm excited to see how that one actually does pan out, and we'll give you updates as we do get those scores in. But it has been phenomenal so far this morning at this major. I am very excited about what we have coming up next. And on the main stage coming up next, we do indeed have Sentinels versus Shopify Rebellion, the game we were talking about in the pools. And I'm so, so excited that this is the one we're going to be seeing. Oh, actually, I did have a, a wonderful Corey in my ear to, to let me know. Actually, Fo just won that. They fully took that Ooh. entire series against Native. So, yeah, Native Gaming, they will fall to Fo. And yeah, I think they have a lot of work to do. A lot of VOD review going on later today. I know they do have another match uh, ahead of them yet, but that one's going to sting. That one's absolutely going to sting. But looking at Pool C, Sentinels versus Shopify, very, very good match coming up. And I just I kind of want to quickly get your ideas of how you think that was going to pan out. I think it's going to be a close one. I think Sentinels will take it because they've showed the consistency that I spoke of earlier on the desk about them. But Shopify was put together to win this series. A ton of individual skill and cycle mental suppress. I mean, Soul Snipe, everybody on that team is an up and coming player that has the individual gun skill to be able to keep up with Sentinels. It'll really about, be about can they get the snipes in their hands because you know how prominent players like Valcated and players like Spartan are going to be with their focus onto that snipe. You can't let Spartan get that snipe or the game might end shortly after. So I'm very interested to see how the battle and the focus for these power weapons are going to be because those power weapons will determine the winner of that series. They certainly will indeed. Do you think this is going to be a banger on the main stage coming up next? It absolutely will. This is the matchup that you guys are going to want to watch out for. As far as number one, number two seeds in pools, you got pool D and pool C. Make sure your butts are in seats. Well, I'll tell you what, Halo fans, it is so good to have you joining us here in Arlington. We're going to head to a quick break. When we come back, we do indeed have pool We'll see Sentinels versus Shopify Rebellion. It's going to be electric in here, and we'll see you right after the break.
guess what? New year means a new optic scuff design for a new controller. Check out this sexy design. It's a nod to the original OG logo and a great way to rep the green wall. Choose between the Reflex for PS5, the Instinct for Xbox, and the brand new Envision for PC gaming. Guess what? Scuff saw your comments and they're now selling the base plates separately for the Envision and the Instinct for $29.99. Sorry, I'm kind of busy. Kind of not. Leave a message. Yeah, the mega rev boys here, cinnamon. Flow tastes sweet like cinnamon. Open up doors, I'm a gentleman. View top floor, I'm still staying ahead of them. Running on fumes and adrenaline. Do what I do best. Huh? Can't rush in like a roulette. You can't name a better duet. Huh? Don't ask questions. Trying to figure out what sound. Don't worry about what next. Just know we got now. HCS 2024 Kickoff Arlington Major is presented by AMD, Scuff, and Corduroys. Welcome back, folks, to the 2024 HCS Arlington Kickoff Major at Esports Stadium, Arlington. And what a gorgeous, gorgeous stadium we are in right now. The lights are shining, the players shining even brighter, if you would believe it. We've had an absolutely incredible match to set the day off. Some crazy things also happening on the other streams as well. But the next one is going to be one to watch out for. Incredible match coming up against Sentinels and Shopify Rebellion. But joining me to talk all about it, I do have Wes and Walshie. Walsh, it's so good to see you, dude. So, so good nice to see you, to too. This is you. fantastic seeing you, Lottie. I just, it's a pleasure just to be on this it. desk with you. Oh, my gosh. Who Stop it, you. Back up here. <laughs> <laughs> I miss Tony Stop already. It. Stop <laughs> it, you. Uh, we do have some really fun things to talk about, and, of course, with this match getting set up. But we have also pool updates to get through, as well as some schedules to talk to you guys about. And we've got some amazing matches coming your way today because all of the pools have been exceptional, the way that they've worked out in the offseason. So we've just had FaZe versus Quadrant. That was a 3 and 0 up next, Sen versus Shopify. Later on, FaZe takes the stage once again against Ascending Baseline. Optic, the hometown team, they're going to be in the building at 4.30, going up against Bittersweet. SSG takes on Foe a little bit later on, which, by the way, Foe did just take down Native Gaming. And Complexity versus Optic to round off your night. So loads of stuff to look forward to. We're going to glance 
of the pools as well to remind you guys at home who is going up against who in what pools and how those ones have shaken out. And for me, the pool C has been the pool of death so far, which is the one we're going to be coming to. And Clutch, what exactly was it, remind folks at home, about Pool C that is so exciting and th the competition thriving within that? I think you got to talk about the talent that's on every roster, right? You're looking at you're looking at even Proton Gaming, the third seed, with players like Gilkey on their team. Players that have been there, done that, and like have had the success and been in the top six and the top four. They know what it takes. They have the individual skill. My big worry for Pool C and why it's the Pool of Death, do I think there's going to be a ton of upsets? Not necessarily, but I think that the open bracket team that finds themselves in Pool C is going to find themselves packing up their bags shortly after. Yeah, you can look at it as either a pool of death or a pool of opportunity because Ooh. as you look at some of the, you know, you look at like Sentinels, they aren't as strong, let's be real, as Space Station or FaZe when you look at these top three CD teams walking this event. However, they are still very scary. We're going to have to see how scary they are at this tournament. Indeed, very scary indeed. I think uh, there's a bunch of teams that could be coming up and uh, shocking the world at the moment in time. But I've got to say, this first match that we're going to be seeing here with you, Walshi, is probably the most exciting of the day. Sentinels versus Shopify Rebellion. This is going to be an absolute banger, and I truly think a bloodbath on that main stage. We're going to kick things off talking about Sentinels, though. On the side of Sen, they have been very, very consistent in the offseason. I've really enjoyed the fact that this roster has stuck together. Now, Wes, do you think sticking was the right move? I do. I think that this team really captured something at SLC last year when they were able to get second. And with that momentum, they played pretty consistent from that point on. They took down FaZe twice at SLC. They have beaten some of these other top three teams that we call the juggernauts in our league pretty consistently. Like, they're trading series with SSG and Optic and FaZe, and that's where you want to be. You want to be in the mix. You want to have a dog in the fight. Sentinels have that dog in the fight. They have a ton of individual skill. They believe in what they have in-house. I love what we saw from Spartan very shortly after Worlds last year. He came out on Twitter and says, we will not be making a team change. They stayed true to that, because when that happened, I was like, maybe you're not making the change. <laughs> <laughs> maybe you don't know what's going on behind the scenes here, buddy. Yeah, now, um, but, but usually something happens. A teammate gets yeah. an opportunity that's on your team. You, like, someone gets an offer or, or all of a sudden, things aren't going your way once the bandit starts. So you find a way, like you find a need for a change that we saw happen even with the Quadrant roster, for example, over in Europe. That's not what happened with Sentinels. They stayed true to themselves. They believe what they have in-house. And I love the idea that they're going to run it back this year with amb ambitions of having a banner hanging from the roof at some point. They certainly do have those ambitions, and I think the confidence to stick together, like you said, speaks volumes, I think, heading into the season, especially with all the different changes that a lot of teams have capitalized on, you know, Walsh. Yeah, and I can speak from experience being on some rosters that have stayed together for a long time. It instills that confidence for your team to grow in a position like that. No longer are you looking at from scrim to scrim, like, all right, are we gonna make a change, or do I need to play a little better today, or whatever it is, you get into a growth mindset saying, how are we gonna you know, build together, what are we going to do to make small changes? You're able to make those sacrificial plays we need to and just grow together as a squad. And on the opposite end, I spent my entire career <laughs> <laughs> making team Down changes. Down in the ring, you're just fighting for your life yeah, every practice. Absolutely. <laughs> Hurricane, Hurricane Ola affected me, Hurricane Hines affected me, everything under the sun. I had a new team every two events. And <laughs> let me tell you, that is stress. Yes. And that stress, like Dave said, you don't, you feel insecure going into like every single scrim almost like I have to play lights out or is it my name being called next? So that can weigh on players and that can create a lot of drama and friction amongst teams. The fact that they are professional enough to have done what they've done as far as sticking together. I love the idea of that, of that for Sentinels and let's see if they can use that to grow and become a professional team that can compete with the world's best. Indeed, uh, luckily for Sentinels that trade window is firmly closed right now and they're feeling pretty good on that stage. <laughs> but looking in another window, of course, window shopping with Shopify Rebellion, these guys are looking to take down Sentinels. They're looking to cause a huge upset right from the get-go. Well, she, we've seen so many different versions of talented rosters, right, come and go, especially in the past three years of Halo Infinite. What is missing from these teams? Teams to not be hitting the next level or breaking top four. Do you see this team having that opportunity? I do see them having this opportunity. I mean, when you ask what's missing from those rosters, I've talked about this before with we when we've talked on the side, and it's this consolidation of winning talent or just this the this veteran leadership of who has been there, done that, won multiple tournaments, and it really ends up being consolidated on a few rosters, or a lot of those players have retired now these yeah. days. And so are they going to be able to pick up enough 
from each other? Are they going to take learnings from past teammates? Are they learning enough from having someone like Best Man as their coach to bring this to the next level? Indeed, I think a lot of it lies on also execution of what you're trying to put out, right? It's a, you have a game plan, but can you execute that game plan well? Can you can you adjust and reel it back? Because when it comes to like execution, it's all right. Are they going to hit their shots? Yes, they're going to be scary good. Now, when things start to go against them, are they going to be able to mitigate those losses? Are they going to be able to, you know, not have a squad like Sentinels turn that into a double cap? Instead, just let the one cap go, get some control across the map. That's where it's going to be really the true test. I have no concerns about them when things are going well for them. Right. They are going to be doing just fine. Right, Wes, I want to say, when you're looking upon this roster, why should we believe in this roster? I think this roster has the most individual skill outside of the top four, and I think that that was the goal for them. I think they looked around and said, what we're doing isn't working. We need to figure out a way to be able to compete with the four best teams in the world. And in order to do so, gun skill is what's going to be the most important. You got to have that gun skill box checked before you start going into, hey, are we preparing for tournaments well enough? Is our strategy good enough? Because those top four teams, they will run you over with just pure gun skill. Shopify have done what it takes as far as getting the first step done and saying, let's get four players that can compete in some of these gun fights that are going to be against the Royal Twos, the Stellars of the world, because not many players can do that. They have the four individuals, I believe, that can win those individual fights now it's about can you can you play good team efficient halo against the world's best which is the hard part like Dave said it's all easy when you have control of the map what are you doing when you are on your back feet what are you doing when you don't have control in order to regain control that's where the good teams become great well, I wanted to ask you about game changes on these rosters because game changes, I do feel like when you're down to the wire and you have a very even competition, they can be that difference maker. They can be that next step to getting that win between a loss. So for you, when you look upon these two, who are you really looking at? I mean, it's hard when you're looking at something like Sentinels to not list out Spark. He's kind of that, that emotional leader. You look at him playing so incredibly well. And when I'm looking over at Shopify Rebellion, it's got to be suppressed in this case. It's tough to choose between him and someone like Cycle as right. they're coming through in situations like this, but I think these guys are these top slayers on the squad. You see when they're going off, you hear when they get double kill, you see in the player uh, you know, cam, they're just screaming out, saying double kill, next kill, what are we doing next? Yeah, indeed. And I've got to say, you know, you're looking at the up-and-comers, and you mentioned a couple there as well, Cycle. But I've got to say, up-and-comers are also a difference maker, and they can also actually push their way through the season and start becoming the game changers. And you're looking at people like Mental and Cycle Clutch, and what did they have in order to kind of will a series in the way of their team? Yeah, they got the gun skill, right? The thing is, is can they do it consistently across a best of five? Can they, they all make a play in this series? Both of those players, and even Suppress, will make individual plays, but it doesn't matter if you win one game, you got to win a, a best of five here. So can you consistently play well across that best of five is what I'm looking at. That level of consistency isn't something that I think those guys have showed that they can put on against one of the best teams in the world. I think experience is a big thing. And I think now that we're in year three of Halo Infinite, they've started to get a ton of experience under their belt against these teams. They haven't created those upsets yet but they know what it's like to go to battle. They know what it's like to go to war and come across as the losing factor. Have they done enough to learn from those mistakes and figured out a way to capitalize in the moments that they know that they will have opportunity? Well, the on paper exciting series of the day. We'll see exactly how this one goes down. So, so, so insane, these two rosters. Who will make it out and who will fall short? We'll find out right now. Let's meet your teams.
It feels so good to be back on land with some of the best teams in the world on that stage. We've got Sentinels up against Rebellion, and this one's going to be tasty. Definitely a tasty one. Really difficult to try and call kind of which team is going to take advantage here. You heard what the desk was talking about. Such amazing players on both sides, and they know each other very well because of the qualifiers. Yeah, I think they spoke about, you know, players to watch who are going to be the difference maker that we have, we've seen Suppress, we've seen Spartan, but there is a lot of talent on that stage. It's almost too much talent to be on one stage, and we've got to settle it. We can only have four players walk away from this series as the victors. And if I'm kind of a guy who has to try and lean one way or the other, you've got to go with the higher seed, you have to go with Sentinels. But Rebellion, they have been a bogey team to the Sentinels roster throughout those qualifiers. They've matched up in about four series against one another, and Rebellion, they've done so well time and time again, particularly in Slayers. Well, you speak about series and how important they are, but series layout equally so, and we had a look at them a little bit earlier on, and this one, sort of, it's a mixed bag for both teams, but Rebellion can be quietly confident here. Yeah, I think when I saw the series layout, I was starting to lean towards Rebellion because they have an objective game they're very good at, but on the other side for Sentinels, they haven't lost CTF Imperium against Rebellion. They haven't lost Strongholds against Rebellion. So they've already got two objectives on their side. The big one, though, is going to be that Game 5 Slayer Solitude. If we get that, without a shadow of a doubt, it is Sentinels' best game type and best map. So we'll have to see whether Rebellion can get that far first and foremost. It sounds to me like you're, you're talking about Slayer Aquarius being a very pivotal game in this series. and. One that has to go the way of Rebellion. It has to, and they are kind of bettering Sentinels when it does come to those Slayer modes throughout the qualifiers in particular. But we are going to be starting off with CTF Imperium. Now, Sentinels, they have beaten Shopify already in the qualifiers. They know how they play it. And we've seen what Sentinels could do on this map. You give Spartan that sniper rifle and you give him free Roman sword, he is going to destroy your entire team. So if you are Rebellion, you need a counteract to that. Maybe that could be mental. Maybe that could be cycle. Just have someone with their sights set on Spartan. Now, when we talk about Sentinels, the death touched upon it. This is a team that stayed together through the offseason. With Rebellion, this team formed very quickly when they heard the bandit changes. So many players that can hit their shots, they can win their 1v1s, and that's going to be very important against Sentinels here. Yeah, I think the fact that they did form so fast, it was very clear that they knew they wanted to be teaming with these players, and there's been team changes here or there where they featured on certain rosters with one another, so it's not like it's a brand spanking new team and they're going to struggle with chemistry. The chemistry is going to be there for Rebellion, and Sentinels need to be concerned about that. This is not an easy start for Sentinels where they can just breeze through pool play. They are going up against their hardest matchup in this pool to kick us off here. And I want to talk about the player on the side of Rebellion, Soul Snipe. Left his long, long time teammates in on Native Red, has now branched out to play on his own, play with Cycle, Mental, and Suppressed. And how big a player he could be for this team. Sometimes you do just have to move on to try and get past that kind of plateau that you've been in for so long. How long was he at, you know, a top four player, but couldn't quite break into that top three? This is now your opportunity with a brand spanking new roster to try and prove what you're made of. And if Rebellion can take down Sentinels here in this series, suddenly we are looking at them as a top three team, right? Sentinels are the third seed coming into this. They are expected to be getting to that top three. So this is almost a chance to slay that giant if you're Rebellion. And they have what it takes. We've seen it in the qualifiers. Yes, it's online, but it gives us a slight indication of what they're capable of. Souls like really hoping to be the Justin Timberlake to the NSYNC situation. He breaks off and he goes on to have a flourishing career. But on the other side of things, we're looking at Lethal on our screens, Dan. He has been so experienced, so good all last season, and he'll be looking to have an even better season this year. And what's interesting, I mean, a lot of Lethal's career, certainly throughout Halo Infinite, it was he was the objective guy. He was the dirty player. He was the one who was just going to get things done but wasn't statistically incredible. He's actually been stepping up. He has been the guy for Sentinels so much, so often. He can put up that damage. He can put up those numbers. And he is the big-name player that we knew he was capable of being in this game. Sentinels come at this, looking to right some wrongs in the past, looking to solidify themselves, not only as that top four seed, not only to push themselves even further, they want to be in the championship conversation, and Rebellion want to spoil the party. CTF Imperium is going to be game number one. I can't wait to jump into it. Can't wait to jump into it, and I'm sure that Sentinel is going to be aggressive off the rip like they always are. Shields up, weapons hot. 
We're rocking and rolling here. Sentinels do like to use Spartan as just kind of a, a watcher, an overseer at the start of these games. He'll grab sniper, sniper Rifle, try and get some indication of where the other team's going to be, scout them out, and then provide that information to the rest of the team. Ooh. But he has already lost all three of his members, so these shots are crucial just to try and keep Rebellion back a little bit here. Metal has a snipe on the other side. He picked up two. Rockets and overshield for Cycle. Recognizing he has to slow things down, hoping to hold the halfway line here. Really apply pressure to Sentinels. We're on the back foot. Falke is going to be the opening pick, and that means Rebellion have an opportunity to push forward. Yeah, once he gets his shields back here, he should be joining the rest of the team because they've got that pick, but great damage from Lethal from Snipe side. He had his eyes trained on top banana. He knew Cycle was going to be staying there, and Rebellion, they're not getting too aggressive yet. They don't want to throw themselves at Sentinels, find themselves going two or three down, and then losing the map control that they gained right at the start of this one. They have given up a little bit of map control. Cycle will disappear over towards Sword. Mental in there too, which means both fresh spawners are going to be a little bit isolated and alone. Two kills go in the favor of Sentinel. So that opening start that Rebellion had, overshield, rockets, sniper rifle picks, and it's their flag who's the first one on the move. It all gets overshadowed, and I wouldn't be surprised if it's Boo Boo Doo Boo who's picking up the flag as well. He has been the flag guy for Sentinels as Spartan. Doesn't quite send Mental off the map, but he does get the kill. All the meanwhile, there is Boo Boo Doo Boo, and yet again, he is the man who has the plan, and he gets the flag into the base, and Sentinels take the lead. You talk about efficiency, both these teams have 10 kills but it is Sentinel to take the lead. Absolutely clinical when they have the advantages to press home and get the lead. Throughout qualifiers, Boobidoo had over double the flag grabs of anyone on his team. As such a player who has always been known for his aggression, I'm not surprised, getting behind enemy lines, pulling that flag when necessary, but he needs the support around it, and it was all from that sword control that Sentinels regained off of Rebellion, and as soon as they had that, the spawners had no chance for Rebellion, they had to let it go. Rebellion on the back foot once more. Spartan is taking control of the opposition training. Happy to stay alive for now, get his shields back after getting an initial bit of damage. Lethal's gonna drop down runway, but straight into two guns. Mental soaring forward. Kills have gone their way. We're hearing some rockets explode in the background as well. Overshield will evade one rocket. Ooh. Will get shut down. Three down for Rebellion. Flag gets returned. The map will split for now. But Mental's got hands on flag, and perhaps little, little more than a distraction. Yeah, Lethal did get a nade towards it, which should just delay the flag from being pulled. But a big kill from Soul Snipe, followed up by Mental. There is a chance here for Rebellion for a flag pull. Try and get that down long haul. If he can get it there, there was maybe an opportunity. But Boo Boo Doo Boo from Top Tower is doing some real work here for Sentinels just to keep that flag from moving. Boo Boo soars forward. Off the top tower. Flag will get sent home. Return. They will still hold up. Slender lead. Metal's got snipe. He's been descoped and pressured. Spartan on the other side. We're gonna have a little bit of an old-fashioned snipe off. Like the Roy Borg and snipe down of old. This time, it's gonna be Spartan and Cycle. Or Metal, excuse me. This one slowed down. Both teams recognizing that Damage on this map can be pivotal. This is perfect for Sentinels. They're more than happy for it to slow down when they have a cap advantage. And it's similar to what we saw during qualifiers, that Rebellion could get the slays, they could get the map control, but when it came to the actual flag runs, they just weren't able to kind of get it down long haul. They weren't able to really give themselves a chance. But Mental now, just keeping Sentinels back, trying to regain a little bit of map control with these body shots, but they have to start pressing their advantage at some point. Seven minutes, 45 left on the clock, so it's not too much of a rush right now, but Mental needs help from the rest of the team. They need to be saying to him, look, they're trying to take Sword now, give us a body shot so that we can get aggressive on it and regain it for ourselves. Valiant have three players positioned over towards Tower here. Bubu is trying to get some information, will receive a body shot. Mental will send them back home. Another body shot, double kill. Sniper goes down, more ammunition for Mental to put into the magazine as they now finally start to venture forward, but they've been pinned back for so long and much of it, their own doing. Mental 11 kills at the moment, finally gets control of Sword and this is their chance to try and take control of the map. All you need is one headshot here and it will allow Rebellion to push up. 
But with Boo Boo Doo Boo holding that assault rifle, it's not going to be as easy. You heard the overshield getting popped as well. It's going to be Soul Snipe grabbing that one. And now Rebellion should try and press forward. Looks as though Boo Boo Doo Boo is behind enemy lines. Again, that's all he does. That's what Boo Boo is known for. They have to take him out first. You can't just let him sit there for too long. But Rebellion, they see that Sentinels are using this distraction to their advantage. Boo Boo continues to be a nuisance. And three go down for Rebellion. They didn't take care of Trouble. Now Trouble's coming back to bite them in the backside. Boo Boo Doo Boo soars forward with the flag. Is finally cut down by Soul Snipe. But Lethal's got hands on. He's already pushing it forward. Rebellion in real trouble of going down by two. And that's one of the things statistically, even though Lethal's not usually the guy to grab the flag, he is often the guy to put the flag back home. As now Sentinels 2-0 up here. Six minutes remain and Rebellion don't look like they have what it takes to score a flag at the moment. And Sentinels can play even more defensive if they would like to at this point. Completely in control now. Game number one. Mental with Bulldog in hand, sitting under bridge. Tries to lock in Falcane, will manage to do so. They've had kills, they've had map control, but they've just been a little bit too slow. And I think the Rebellion would have come into this series layout and they would have seen that it was going to be CTF Imperium to kick things off and they know it's not one of their best game types. I'm fairly certain they didn't even win it once throughout the four qualifiers leading up to this event. And again, it just comes down to that objective efficiency for me. You can see slaying-wise, they have the power, but even the Bulldog not taking down lethal there. Great work just on top tower to try and stay alive and use the support of his teammates. Baron with Snipe. Looking to provide some cover fire for Boo Boo Doo Boo, but unfortunately, none of the members of Rebellion are going to expose themselves to the long scope. Eventually, Body Shot connects, lethal on hand to apply the finishing touches to that kill. They've got control of Rebellion's courtyard here. Good time to get control as well. Overshield, Rockets coming up. If Sentinels can grab this one, it might be all she wrote for Rebellion. Could argue this is Rebellion's last chance to get back into this game, but they are pinned at the moment into the baller. And they are going to be collapsed on. Good nades, though. Good defensive nades coming out of Rebellion. They do take down three members of Sentinels. But all the meanwhile, it has allowed Rockets to go into the Sentinels' hands. Rebellion, though. Soul Snipe. Overshield to work with. And it has to begin now if they want to come back. Four minutes 20. Seems like a good amount of time. But when you are two flags down and you've yet to really get the flag moving, it has to happen soon. Rebellion and Sentinels splitting the power on the map then. Soul Snipe's in trouble. Soul Snipe is no more. So they've cleared him out of the base. That's happened time and time again. Anytime they've really threatened to get something going, Sentinels are so good at getting back and clearing players out of their base. Yeah, that's the big difference. When you saw Boo Boo Doo Boo get in behind enemy lines, he wasn't cleared up. He wasn't focused quick enough. And then Sentinels used that distraction to push up, push through green, and then work with Boo Boo Doo Boo. However, when Rebellion have got a player behind, they've been on their own and they have been targeted by Sentinels. And now with 3 minutes 37 left on the clock, it's looking more and more likely that this is going to be a Sentinels opener. By the way, 20 kills now for Falcated. We haven't mentioned him yet. We haven't mentioned what an incredible player he has been throughout Halo Infinite's lifespan. And he could be one of those key factors for Sentinels going forward for the rest of this tournament. Rebellion playing against four very talented players and now very quickly playing against the clock. They have got to get a buggy on. Or well, they'll find themselves down by one in this series. We spoke about how important the Slayers was going to be, and we can see that already. Well, that has been Sentinel's downfall throughout the qualifiers, is they have struggled a little bit in Slayers. That's the only reason why I'm kind of focusing on that game two and five. But with the amount of control we've seen in this game, it's a good indication that we know LAN's going to be different to online. I mean, Lethal doesn't have to take a monitor to an office all the way down the road. Instead, he can just play with the rest of the team right next to them. And that's going to be a huge difference maker compared to the online tournaments. But with 2 minutes 30 now, Sentinels, they can kind of play this one however they want. If they want to play a little bit defensive, if they want to sit back with the sniper rifle, they can do so. It's Rebellion who have to do something. As this is why you give Spartan the sniper rifle. I was really wondering whether Lethal's co-workers in the office miss him. Has he given them a sick note? I say, where's Lethal today? <laughs> Where, where's that guy with the monitor? Why hasn't he turned up? Soul Snipe. Looking to turn up here. Currently sitting at 11, 8, and 18. 
Nobody on the side of Rebellion really able to put together much in terms of the slays. The Sentinels have had much of the control of this game, number one. Yeah, I mean, Sentinels out slaying them 62 to 46. At the moment, it isn't close. And it allows them to play in this way. Lethal has the overshield as well. And Rebellion, and this is the this is the, the part of the game where you start to get to the acceptance of, okay, we're losing it. Let's start to think about map number two. You can see Soul Snipe again is the one who's desperately trying to get into that flag. He's actively trying to pull it. But every single time, he's already lost a teammate. They haven't been able to all push up at the same time. It's almost just been one by one like lemmings they've been taken out. Suppressed. We hate the Harrop Bonds, but we spoke about how he could be the difference maker. Currently sitting at 7, 6, and 21, having a game to forget. A couple of kills do go in the favor of Rebellion, though. Perhaps an opportunity to get one flag on the board, even if it's just a consolation. In defense of Suppressed, he has been the first one to try and get as close as possible to the likes of Soul Snipe when Soul has been getting aggressive. But he's just got there that second too late. Soul Snipe's already dead, and then he was finding himself in a 1v2. Flag is on the move, 45 seconds left. So this is Rebellion's real last stand here as the flag has gone down. Longhorn, Sentinels, they are on the back foot a little bit. But is this just too late now as Suppressed finally gets the kill? And that's going to be three dead. It's a 1v1 on the map for now, but the flag already well and truly given up on. Well, here we go, 27 seconds. What have you got left? One last push, one last hurrah. Mental heading towards Sword then. Ubu Dubu throws down a denial grenade. He's taking a little bit of damage down to one shot now. Falcate situ situated top tower. There is an opportunity in the gap over towards Long Haul if Rebellion can send numbers down that way. But they have really got to get close to this flag because they're running out of time. Down to five seconds, cycle will soar forward, but will not get close. No, four dead. Sentinels take game number one. So there was a last ditch attempt from Rebellion as they finally get that flag across the map, but it was just one of those where Sentinels, they almost let them. They were sitting back, 45 seconds left. Eh, let's just allow that flag to go. Make sure they send enough players back to support that flag. We regain map control and we just have to make one last stand. We're not gonna allow them to push through easily and it is a very comfortable 2-1. Looks closer than it was because the Slays 74 to 58 in favor of Sentinels. And I'll tell you what, Falcate and Boobadoobu, 24 kills and 23 kills for both of those players. And those are numbers you want when you come into a tournament. When you're in your first game, you want to see your big game players hitting those shots and making sure they're on fire right from the get-go. And what I want to talk about is the game management from Sentinels in that they got that first flag cap, they didn't push forward, didn't just throw bodies forward, they, they waited, they were structured, structured, and they sent numbers forward at the right time. We've seen their very first flag cap, both teams had 10 kills apiece, but it was them who took the lead. I think have Sentinels done their research on Rebellion and the way they play Imperium? Yes because they know the tendencies from Rebellion. They know the mistakes they were making. There was a couple of times where Rebellion would try to push over bridge and they were getting cross shot. As soon as they got that one kill, Sentinels knew they had that map control. They took sword, you give Spartan sniper rifle, and then off the rip, you're just gonna see players on spawn getting body shot and either forced back into their spawn, or it's a headshot to just give your team the extreme advantage. A very impressive opening for Sentinels here. And speaking of the opening, it was actually Rebellion who got all the weapons and the overshield. Was. They, were, they weren't able to put anything together. They stood still. We've seen sitting top banana putting lots of damage down, but not really pushing forward, not pressing their advantages. Well, Slayer Aquarius is going to be game number two. Now, Rebellion are 4-1 up against Sentinels when it comes to Slayers in general from the qualifiers. So it, Sentinels have, qual have struggled a little bit on those Slayer modes when it comes to the qualifiers, but again, it's online, so we can only take it with a pinch of salt. You know, it's not going to be the be-all and end-all. However, it has to happen here for Rebellion, we feel, especially going into Stronghold's live fire for map number three. And what is it about Aquarius that you see Sentinel struggling on? What is it they're not doing right? Maybe they're playing it a little bit too slow. And what is it that Rebellion have been doing right? I think it's just, in general, Sentinels are a very structured team. And as soon as a team disrupts that a little bit, whether it's kind of getting behind dodgy spawns or whatever, Sentinels struggle a little bit, maybe a, a little bit of panic here or there. Whereas Rebellion are a team who like to play on the fly. They like to adapt. They like just to run around in a unit. And that could happen here if Sentinels aren't careful. And we spoke about firepower on the side of Rebellion. We didn't really see it in game one. One, but game two, we're looking at Suppressed. He finished 11 and 21 or so in that last game, and he needs to pick it up if they're going to stand a chance here. I, I think Slayer Aquarius is a good map to try and make up for it, though, because it's very fast-paced. You can just kind of roam around a little bit if you would like. So I wouldn't be too concerned, because we know that Empyrean can be a very tough map if you're on the receiving end of it.
having a look at the up and coming stars then and their overall kd 1.07 versus a 1.05 so both positive and both looking pretty good with their kdas as well these two players are pivotal in anything that rebellion do good i think both cycle and mental are fantastic players and the more experience they get the more we see them on the main stage the more likely they are going to be improving and the more likely we're going to be see them getting to the later stages of tournaments as well even though they're one nil down in this series this could very easily be a full five game series for me with how things are going but it all has to start here if they go two nil down then okay maybe i'll start to chalk it up but rebellion have a real chance here well you spoke about how game one was a worry and a concern for you and maybe they thought the same thing themselves that listen game one's gonna be a struggle we'll try and do what we can but our series might just start in game number two well, aquarius for sentinels a lot of it is going to be down to the starting strategy. When we were watching VODs for both of these teams, we had seen that Rebellion typically get the better starting map. They did it on Imperium. They were able to get the, the power-ups. They were able to get the power weapons. Can they get the overshield here? This is the big fight. Suppressed can't put it into his chest, and Falcated goes down. Is anyone going to be able to pop it? Soul Snipe has it in his chest. What can the Soul Man do then? As he heads towards top car, all three members Sentinels at the moment spawning up towards the generator area and lethal back face trying to create some space. The overshield will go in, but he's faced by two guns, really needs some help and some support. But eventually, it comes through the shape and form of mental. Falcade down to no shields. This is the perfect opening from Rebellion. But yet again, it's Rebellion with the better starting strategy. We notice tendencies as the Sentinels kind of lean a 3 1 split on a lot of their maps. Spartan goes just to check out one side while the other three work together for either a power weapon or a power up. Whereas Rebellion, they like to send all four players at times just to ensure they get that power up. They've gained the overshield, they've gained the opening here, and they find themselves up by four, make it three. It's not a massive lead, but at least it's something here for Rebellion. Rebellion with the noses in front. Lead restored to three. Numbers advantage on the map. Two members positioned over towards the car side. Soul Snipe will get... A little bit of damage received from a team grenade and lethal there to help put him in the grave. Cycle now, last man standing, and this is the time where we may see momentum start to shift. This Rebellion a little bit isolated in the closet. And lethal looking to change the angle to change trajectory here. Mental 1v1 with lethal. Lethal expertly backs away and isolated that 1v1, didn't expose himself to that second player. And help on hand to go down. It's textbook from Sentinels. Yeah, this is where Sentinels could really start to take control of the game. The structure that I was talking about with the next overshield num now coming up. If they can grab this one, if they can have this map control and Rebellion get stuck on some spawn cycles, but it's Mental who gets the next overshield. And this could be the downfall for Sentinels. If they're not able to get these consistent overshields, it will allow Rebellion to keep this game scrappy. It will allow them to keep being aggressive and trying to just get some flanks on the go. And it will disrupt the Sentinels' attempt to try and be a structured side. Cycling and suppress, suppressed combine. Pick up a couple of kills. Mental. Almost got ninja there. A Spartan <laughs> sword over the top of him and spared his blushes as his teammate was there as well. That was pure trust. That was like a trust fool. It was like, I know someone's here, but I'm just running and I trust you'll be able to get them for me. You think the call it was, there's somebody jumping over me right now as I keep soaring forward, but <laughs> double kill for Mental. Locked in. Boo Boo in the fridge. Has got three members of Rebellion soaring at him and his life was cut short. Now you can see Rebellion really have Sentinels on the run. I think another reason why Rebellion seem to be a better Slayer side than Sentinels is just look at the players. I think Rebellion have more deep grown Slayer to... players. Players who had to kind of make a name for themselves by getting those kills, by getting on the board, by being added to a team as someone who could be a high kill player. Whereas Sentinels, you know, you've got player like Boo Boo, like Lethal, who have been such incredible objective players at times. I think Rebellion are just teetered slightly towards a Slayer-focused team, but that could be their downfall throughout the tournament because, of course, you are going to be playing three objectives in a best of five. Spartan down to no shields. Lethal receives a little bit of damage on his path towards P1. It will be Lethal who was dispatched. Rebellion's lead continues to grow. But you can see they're really playing in tandem. They're set up almost like a buddy system. But I also don't think Rebellion are scared to be running in as a solo. They are confidently moving around the map. 
halfway to challenge a 1v1 if they see it, and that is probably frustrating Sentinels a little bit here. 34 to 21, Rebellion well and truly in charge of this game. They just have to make sure they don't allow Sentinels to get an overshield to get back into the game. It's gonna be yet another one. I mean, I'm starting to think we're looking at 1-1 already with how things are starting to play out, because now Rebellion can once again get behind enemy lines, and this time it's Cycle with the overshield to just traverse the map in any way he wants. Boo Boo almost turned on Cycle, but experiences blushes. Does lock in that kill. It's all about overshield control, and Rebellion have really had it. And without it, Sentinels just haven't been able to get the height that they need in the map. A few times they've been able to get to kind of top P and top car, but there's always been a Rebellion player there waiting, banking a nade off something so they can initiate that damage, and then the other teammates will come through to clean things up. Even though it was somewhat close to begin with, it's really starting to run away with it now. And sure, the heat wave did some damage there, and Mental should be there to clean it up. Again, good communication from Rebellion. It's really looking like a matter of when, not if, Rebellion tie up this series. Two members of Sentinels positioned over towards the fridge. Spartan all alone towards Yellow Closet. You can see they're looking for poke damage. Something that they can push off. Instead, they receive a little bit of grenade damage and have to back away. I also don't mind this from Rebellion. Even though they have a massive advantage, they are not getting carried away with it. They are being patient. They are saying, well, let's not just give Sentinels kills while they have a little bit of map control right now. Look at the time. Overshield up in 15 seconds. Let's actually launch an attack closer to when that's going to come up. Because if we win the team fight, we also win the Overshield. And most likely because of it, we'll win the game. Five more to close this one out and tie up the series. Make game one a distant memory. Almost erase it from the record books, and yet another overshield goes the way of Rebellion. It was a good start for Sentinels, and that's all it was. As Rebellion set their sights on tying up the series, they really didn't look back after that second overshield grab. I'm not glad we pointed out that it was such an important matchup for Rebellion and such an important slayer for Rebellion, and not only have they been able to actually pull off a victory here, but it's going to be a dominant one, which will just put that confidence back on their side. They're not going to be too worried as we do get confirmation. Shopify take game number two, and we're all tied up one to one. And we do, in fact, have a series on our hands. Sometimes, you know, on a Friday, you can get some clean sweeps, but we knew Sentinels and Rebellion, they faced each other so much throughout the qualifiers, back and forth as they go. And it's going to be the same here on LAN mentioned a very important word there, confidence. And it must be flowing through the veins of Cycle and Soul Snipe. 15, 6 and 8, 14, 7 and 1. You look at Suppressed, who also bounced back after that pretty difficult game one. And Mental was there, thereabouts, popping up with a few assists as well, 11 to be exact. So that's the perfect response to game number one. But there was nothing, no sort of structure available for Sentinels. It was what I was worried about coming into this game too. It's not like they can't be structured when it comes to Slayer Aquarius, but they were never given the opportunity to. They didn't get an overshield, for goodness sake. If you're not going to get the overshield, then that is just going to constantly give the advantage to the other team. But it was the way that Rebellion moved around the map. They always had eyes on someone else. There was always that kind of support work once the initial damage had been done. They weren't scared to die as long as they did enough damage and they knew a teammate would clean it up. I mean, Rebellion are really just agents of chaos, right? We've seen that in Slayer on Aquarius. They don't give Sentinels a moment to breathe. They're spawning them by themselves, they're trapping players, they're isolating them, and they're really, that was their playground in game number two. It was their playground, and now they need to use that advantage they just found themselves in, the confidence in those individual engagements, and say, how do we put this into an objective game now? Can we play that same way whilst we're also moving around and getting the objective work done? It is a stronghold, so that does lean towards more of a slaying play style. However, Sentinels haven't lost a stronghold against Rebellion so far in the qualifiers. It is one of Sentinel's better modes, and Rebellion need to be aware of that. But sometimes when you get qualifiers, and you know, some see some teams will see them as kind of scrims, as practice at times. If you have a bad game and mode, you are going to be practicing it a little bit more, and Rebellion would have been able to go over that VOD, watch why Sentinels are good, and perhaps they can counter it. Well, we're going to four at the very least. Strongholds Live Fire up next, an oddball recharge will be our game number four. You tipped about at, the, at the start of the series about how important Slayer Solitude was going to be if Rebellion can get there, and we already seen almost staking Sentinels in that game too. But Strongholds Live Fire, they have some important players do Sentinels in this game type. Sentinels just need to be 
off the rip, trying to take down Rebellion and get that opening strategy on board because we've already seen Rebellion have kind of led the way when it comes to opening strats. And if you go too far behind in a Stronghold game, you do start to struggle a little bit. Sure, Live Fire a little bit more open than some of the other Stronghold games, so you can get back into it. It's not going to be like a Solitude game where if you lose the opening strat, you may have lost the entire game. But I think Sentinels know that they have to have a strong start here. Just try and shut down this momentum a little bit from Rebellion. Well, you spoke about how Rebellion like to send all four members a certain direction and how Spartan is generally a player who likes to scout and then touch tight with his teammates, maybe he gets the top middle, but is it important now they've already lost the opening starts off on game one and two that maybe they alter the strategy a little bit? Yeah, it's going to depend on which side they spawn on live fire of where they're going to head it. We've seen two different strategies. I can go into that a little bit later, but head to head between Falcaton and Cycle. I mean, Falcaton is an unbelievable player. I think he is one of the most underrated players we have in the league. We will bring him up time and time again, but he just seems to go under the radar a bit whilst he's doing disgusting things. But Cycle's the new blood. He's the new boy. He's the guy who really could be making a difference for Rebellion at this tournament. We've seen in game one how important Falcade was. Of course, when you get heavily beaten in game two, it's very hard for you to have that same sort of influence on the map. And Cycle looking to push his team forward here in game three. What is it you're looking for from Rebellion here to maybe succeed what they had done in the past in the qualifiers? Again, it's disrupt the structure of Sentinels. It's not allow Sentinels to set up and start spawn killing you and control how you're moving around the map. Instead, you kind of make them second guess themselves a bit. If traditionally, let's say you had A and B and they know you're going to be kind of heading towards C because of that, Go the other one. For, let's send one other player. Do it as a distraction. Go for a little bait and switch. Try and do something a little bit different to try and disrupt Sentinels here. Because Sentinels, are, for me, have always been a team that want to play kind of traditional Halo. If I'm Rebellion, I'm like, screw that. Throw, throw away the traditions. Let's try and play a little bit different here so that we can surprise them. We've seen in the past with teams like Quadrant and Faze towards the latter stages of the year how they like to play Stronghold sort of on the move. Get A and B, keep rotating, let them spawn A, we'll take C so on so forth until you eventually get a triple cap and lock it in tight. Is that something that we're expecting to see from Sentinels or are they more likely to hold two and, and keep those two for themselves? I think Sentinels would like to try and hold two. I think if they're given the opportunity where they are out slaying Rebellion significantly, that's when they start to move and groove and they can force that rotation that you're speaking of. However, if it's slightly closer in the slaying department, maybe we'll see Sentinels just holding on a little bit stronger. Any advantage if they have the two strongholds. But that's if they are in control. There is a real chance the Rebellion could be the team that is constantly on the move, always making Sentinels second guess themselves, and they might be able to get some good stronghold points because of it. Rebellion, this team was assembled to not only compete in these series, but to beat the likes of Sentinels, to put their names in the championships conversations. So Press got the opening pick, Soul Snipe and Cycle Fall. B for Rebellion, C and A for Sentinels. Ooh. Two members converge on Falcay to shut him down. Well, I was going to say, I think maybe Sentinels would have been happy that they got the A spawn because they do tend to go camo side, try and take C, so they have two strongholds right at the get-go and they ignore B, then control that side of the map, get the sniper, and then they get camo. But the way Rebellion countered it with the bottom middle push, it meant Sentinels were kind of caught off guard a little bit, and now it's Rebellion instead who have that control that Sentinels were so desperately searching for. Press linking up with his camo player in cycle. Last soul snipe though. Camo is going to fall and not even get a trade. That's a blunder. And that's one he would really like to have back. A and B in control of Sentinels now. Sniper trying to lock onto that player's scoreboard. It's a swing and a miss. Snipe rifle will change hands. So Sentinels in control now. They have B and Z. They know the team's at A, but they are surrounding them at the moment. It's a good kill from Soul Snipe just to ensure that this isn't going to get out of control and Mental also follows one. So Sentinels, they tried to press, they tried to squeeze, but now they're going to allow Rebellion just to trickle through their fingers a little bit. And this is what I was maybe a little bit worried about. Are Rebellion just going to be sneaky enough to get out of some of these traps that Sentinels try and set? A and B for Rebellion. There was a numbers advantage on the map for a moment, but that's been cut away. Pressed, eyes trained over across sandbags. Looking to provide cover for Soul Snipe now. Lethal's gonna be the first point of contact then. Lethal wisely backs away, recognizing he's in a fight. That's pretty unwinnable. 
That distraction was enough from Lethal as two members from Sentinels get towards B, close the distance, and convert. And they've lost a stronghold along the way, and this is what Rebellion are good at. Pushing you towards one and taking another. Cycle on pillars, expertly jiggle peeking, but Falcade's not interested in that song and dance. Locks in a kill. So annoying when players do that on pillars as well, and you know full well you can do nothing about it except just call out and hope there's a teammate to follow up. If you don't have a grenade, especially as Falcated, getting that initial damage with the beatdown and using the QT just to escape. QT control, very important here on Life Fire as well. You need to have someone who is confident enough to get aggressive, do damage, but then also reactive enough to instantly get out when you know that you are threatened by the damage the opposition's dealing. Looks though that kill from Falcated was on the camouflage players. That's going to be burned. But it's another one that Rebellion have managed to pick up, but two that they haven't had a major influence on proceedings. One player trying to convert B, but he's all alone. Falcate's going to step in and make it a difficult task. Not only that, but get the reset. It was a momentary triple cap, but Rebellion now looking for C. Yeah, that was a little bit of a decoy, I think, from Rebellion to ensure they were able to get out of any nonsense. They send one player towards B to force players to actually have to fight it. But then they captured A and C on the other side. This is what I was talking about, disruption. Disrupt the norm. Don't allow the traditional setups to happen. But Sentinels, they react very well. They focus and they target. They all push the same thing to regain said control. Alcade absolutely frying right now. 10, 2, and 3. Cycle will fall, as will Soul Snipe. Sentinels remain in the ascendancy for now. It's Boo Boo Doo Boo sitting inside B with Snipe. Has information as a player position towards Big Door. He's gonna back away and wait for teammates. He does really not want to be the first point of contact as he retreats towards Nest now. Enemy He's impressed with a little bit of poke. Gets information but decides to back away and two kills have gone the way of Rebellion, they have a, a slight numbers advantage. It looks as though they're trying to rotate towards C. Yeah, notice how Boo Boo saw the kill feed, saw that players were kind of going down and it allowed him to grab that QT. He was worried initially that pushing it might leave him vulnerable, but it didn't matter in the end. Rebellion were quick out of Big Door after they got their initial damage, and now they can try and get some control of their own. But great trades coming out from Sentinels at the moment. They're not allowing Rebellion to get any sort of control. <laughs> Sentinels playing this one by the book. Absolutely perfectly so far. I mean, there's a reason why they are 6-1 and one in qualifiers on this particular map and mode. They do not struggle on it. And they've been able to beat Rebellion every single time they face them on Strongholds. And you can see that the structure that they play with is really working in the moment. Even the attempt at disrupting it from Rebellion, it's only minor time that they're gaining off the back of it. Yes, they'll get B and C for 5 to 10 seconds, but then Sentinels instantly all send themselves towards one of the Strongholds and then regain it yet again. It's almost been most impressive. There doesn't seem to be any sort of hesitation. They all know exactly what the game plan is and they're executing it perfectly here. Rebellion will finally get some control, B and C, but again, Sentinels will step in with the camouflage now. Spartan hoping to have a bigger influence than Enemy team one of his predecessors score. who picked it up. Lethal will fall. Falcated though. On C then, Boo Boo situated there as well. You can see the difference between Aquarius and Live Fire. Aquarius, which can be a little bit more hectic, where we were unable to see Sentinels get any power-ups, but suddenly when they're on a map where they can control it a little bit more, it's camo after camo, and then it just helps them with the continuing factor of controlling the game. So Rebellion, they can even lean towards the camo at times because they are constantly trying to get the strongholds. If they give up camo, or if they give up the strongholds to try and get camo, then they're going to suddenly get three cats. So it's tough now for Rebellion. They are so far behind, and Sentinels are firmly dominating this match. Real rock and a hard play situation for Rebellion. Not contesting the camouflage, really just hands a win condition over to Sentinels. But when you contest it, you're already down in, on the score, you're already down in caps. And that's what we're seeing here. Boo Boo position sandbags. Beautiful Hail Mary will connect over towards B. Soul Snipe will try and convert B. He's alone for the moment. Mental with the snipe will pop the shields of one as he continues to drop the shoulder and jiggle and weave his way. He is cut down though. The Sentinels have passed over the 200 point threshold. Rebellion will get some semblance of control though.
The exciting thing with Strongholds is it's never over. How many times have we seen comebacks? And if you can get a trip cap here and force Sentinels back on spawn, disrupt them a little bit so they kind of don't know where their left and rights are, then you can get back into this one. You're 100 points down, you're in control at the moment, but camouflage has to be a focus point. Not only do you need to control these, but you need to have someone who is thinking about getting that camo in 15 seconds. Because if you give it to Sentinels, they will once again find themselves forcing their way into either A or C. Valiant have B, and that does give them opportunity to go to A or C. They're on the doorstep. As you can see, the pressure is telling. Rebellion really have to try and throw bodies towards B now. It's getting a little bit desperate. I do like that you use the word pressure, because that's exactly what Sentinels have been doing all game. It's pressuring Rebellion off spawn. It's pressuring them when they try and make a move. If Rebellion all moved through bottom middle, Sentinels had a response. They had players that were having eyes on them. They would do that initial damage. They would back off and then they would switch and allow someone else to finish off for them. And again, look at the kind of swarm of Sentinels players. They hear the call out, the Rebellion at a C. They try and challenge it immediately. Yes, OK, C is going to go into control of Rebellion on this occasion. But for the most part, Sentinels have made it work this game. Rebellion threatening to get a triple cap. Two members of Sentinels will go over to contest back tower. Boo Boo was there to do enough damage to get a kill, but deciding to give up C, recognizing that perhaps Rebellion will come over to cut him down. Instead, looks to contest B. Lethal back green will be able to capitalize on the damage already done. More damage put down, but not aware there's a player positioned over towards Ness. But kills will go 2 2 split. And no doubt Soul Slide will look to contest this. As Ethel continues to try and capture it, tries to pick up the damage that was already done, but Mental was there to shut it down. Wise to it. And now Rebellion is starting to grow in confidence. He's got the QT, does Mental, he gets himself out of dodge. Yeah, this is where it's starting to get interesting. This is the kind of disruption that Rebellion needed. And they were down by, like, what, 10 kills, but now it's 54 to 53 in favor of Sentinel. So Rebellion right back into it when it comes to Slays. And they have had a great period of time where every single time Sentinels have tried to focus on a stronghold, Rebellion have been there. Rebellion have had that one player to be a nuisance. And now they can take control. Now Rebellion can st start to dictate the pace here. And Sentinels need to have the answer. Sentinels have to open the playbook. What have they got? Because it's now them on the back foot. Rebellion starting to have it all their own way. C starting to be converted. Mental's looking to get close to get the trade. Lethal will shut that one down, but Soul Snipe is there to continue to apply that pressure onto A, and another trade goes in, and Rebellion continue to hold A. And I said it's not over until it's over. A 100-point lead is about to be closed by Rebellion, and now this is where Sentinels, will they begin to crack a little bit? Will they begin to shake and wobble, and Rebellion can just kind of push them over with a little finger? C will be taken. Sentinels regain some control. A massive kill from Spark because if Spartan lets rip, if he's the one who's shouting, it's going to regain that confidence for the rest of the team, as now they are putting points on the board yet again, and QT back in the hands of Sentinels. The escape route is going to lead them to back green, but kills are going in Rebellion's favor. Spartan has got to play this one as clever as he possibly can. Cycle hits a massive body shot, and that's going to put him in retreat mode here. A and C for Rebellion, and our Sentinels starting to wilt. Starting to wilt a little bit, but couple of key kills, just making sure the Rebellion don't gain too much control, but Cycle from behind. If you can catch that flank, if you can stop that one player who's trying to get behind and try and grab a Strongholds off you, it does wonders for your team because then this happens. You have the player advantage, you get that extra bandit in your hands, and you get that extra damage, and now Rebellion take the lead here, and Sentinels, they need a reply, and they need it fast. Rebellion hold. How good will the hold be? Do Sentinels have the answer? The opening pick goes the way of Rebellion. Cycle gets another one onto Spartan top middle. And Sentinels have one more push. Time dwindling down. Sentinels nowhere to be seen right now as they try and contest B. Rebellion win game three. What a comeback we just saw from Rebellion. They were down, they were out. It was like 200 to 80. But this is why we love Strongholds, because it is never over. All it takes is one shift of momentum. Rebellion get gained control, and Sentinels, they just couldn't wrestle it back. And now Rebellion go against the grain. They go against the favored game types here.
They weren't able to take Sentinels down in any strongholds, just no matter what the map was during the qualifiers. And now they take the lead here. And I think that is going to be dejecting for Sentinels because they were so far ahead, Jersey. That's the word you, you use, dejected deflation on the side of Sentinels. We've seen a little player cam on Boo Boo Dubu and he did not look impressed. They know they've let that one slip through their fingers. I mean, Shopify Rebellion were down in slays by about 10 when we saw Sentinels in control up by about 100. Rebellion ended that up by 14 kills. They had an unbelievable comeback and a crazy amount of kills in that passage of play. They gave up all those camos to begin with. They weren't able to get them. Sentinels cruising. That's when you start to put your feet up a little bit, thinking this one's done, this one's dusted. But this is what Rebellion do. They disrupt, they get behind enemy lines. And as soon as they penetrated, as soon as they got that final break they needed, they took control and they pinned Sentinels to the ground. And now they find themselves 2-1 up in the series. Confirmation of what we've seen then. Game one, 2-1, two, two Sentinels. But it's been all Rebellion from there on out. And now we head to Oddball Recharge, and Dan, I know you've got some stats for me. This is great for Rebellion. This was the one objective I was confident they would be able to take. They haven't lost it throughout the entirety of the qualifiers. 6-0 and on Oddball Recharge. That is amazing news, and they also beat Sentinels on this during the qualifiers. This is one of their better maps and modes. As we know, though, that can change when we get to land, because we just saw the exact opposite, where Shopify Rebellion were able to beat Sentinels on one of their better game types here. But Look at the smiles on the faces now of Rebellion because they know how close they are. They are just moments away, one map away from causing an upset here and taking down Sentinels. Sentinels more than capable of flipping the script here. But you rightly speak about smiles on the faces and no more than best man sitting behind them, coaching these boys and they're on the cusp of beating the team that they set out to disrupt from the very start. I mean, what a coach to have as well, best man. Uh, He's been there, he's done that, he's been on this stage, and I think if you've got someone with that kind of characteristic behind you, he can always hype you up, even if you find yourself 100 points down in a stronghold. I wouldn't be surprised if he's the one saying, hey, what are we worried about? Nothing. This one's not over, all we need is one break, and suddenly this game is ours. And that was uh, an incredible comeback from Rebellion that I'm sure we will have to re-watch time and time again, because not only is it all about Rebellion and how they broke into it and they regained control, but you have to look at the crumbling effect of Sentinels. As soon as they lost that structure, they couldn't put it back together. It's like they lost a few pieces of the puzzle, they were searching around the ground, can't find them, and you have to give it up. Stronghold is very quickly being one of those game types where if you've just hit the 200 point threshold, it's almost a dangerous lead to have. You get a little bit comfortable, you think that you have the game won, oh, we just need 50 more, this game's done and dusted, but you spoke about that one break Rebellion got the break, and then the hole was equally impressive. I mean, just to throw another statistic at you as well for Oddball Recharge, we haven't seen Sentinels beat Rebellion on any Oddball game type throughout the qualifiers. So Rebellion should be winning this one if you're going to go off the numbers. And certainly when you play these tournaments online, you do take it with a pinch of salt, but you still believe in yourself. You still will be saying to your teammates, hey, we've beaten them on this before. We know how to play. We know what they're going to do. So let's just do it again now we're a LAN. They say online results mean nothing. It's untrue. They don't mean everything, but they definitely mean something. I remember Rebellion have a really good starting strategy on recharge as well. They sent two to kind of trippy box to challenge the players. They send nades over towards Whirlpool as well. But that's depending on what spawn they're going to get here. But they will get a chance to have both spawns because we're going to be playing Oddball. We saw in the qualifiers that it was Rebellion who had the better starting strategy, and here we go. Triple Box is where they send players, but it's a great response from Sentinels, almost recognizing it, sending several players to Whirlpool to shut down the control that Rebellion try and get. They managed to get their hands on the ball as well. A lot of damage being done by Suppressed here. Wow. Now, Rebellion have a gold pipes set up. Did ball Sentinels overcommit to Whirlpool to try and Enemy stop what we've seen ball. from Rebellion previously? That's the real question, because Rebellion, ball all the meanwhile, while Sentinels Enemy heavily swayed that way, they're able to get camouflage, they're able to get ball control, and now Soul Snipe just waiting for his moment to pounce onto Spartan, and will get the kill, and should be able to help his teammate for two. Alcade throws in a couple of grenades, down to no shields. Great nades. Almost evaded that final grenade as well. Was able to put down a little bit more damage onto the camo player, but ultimately Soul Snipe has played this one expertly. 
Bold. Ball has completely rotated out of gold pipes and now over towards blue. Bold. Rebellion looking dangerous here. It's almost like they are just kind of living and breathing from that previous game. You know adrenaline's going to be in their veins for sure. Wasn't a break opportunity for Sentinels. They didn't go for a little bathroom break to try and disrupt anything either. As our Sol Sol Snipe just going to be holding back a little bit. Watching over this ball, it's an early lead for Rebellion, but Sentinels have been able to climb it a little bit. They've slowed it all down. Now, if Sentinels can get ahead, if they can start to pick apart Rebellion, you need to start to reassert some dominance here, win a couple of individual engagements, try and destroy that momentum that Rebellion have been able to gain. Lethal's got shock. He's got information that there's at least one long haul as he sees Mental's toes. Fires one shock rifle shot, second one will connect with the body. Lethal just not able to apply the finishing touches onto that kill. And unfortunately, this setup is going to be completely broken wide open. And they have not played the ball, have Sentinels. And this really is going to be an open now, now for Rebellion. Not only because they have ball control, it's camouflage too. And Suppress just needs to be listening to his teammates. Camo being on any map is always such a very important moment for you as a player because you have to be productive with it, but it doesn't mean you have to be too aggressive. You can wait. You can use your invisibility to your advantage. And he's done just that. He was patient. He made sure that the Sentinel's push didn't really account to anything apart from a play ball. And look at that shroud as well, just to protect any spawners over towards A are not going to be able to see that ball guy trying to get away. Back-to-back -back camouflages for Rebellion. They hold the lead. They hold the ball. Two members of Sentinels positioned over towards Tower. Suppress recognizes the information has come his way. He's going to try and get away, but Enemy Spartan cuts him off in the pass and gets that kill. Has the ball. ball immediately thrown down as Rebellion realizes it's going to be a slay off. Two fall apiece. Ball still situated towards long haul. Booba Dubu down to no shields as he tried to clamber towards grapple. Ball. The ball back in the hands of the soul man. You're in a pretty good position. If you can shut down Booby Dooby throughout this game, he is the ball guy for Sentinels. Uh, like four times the amount of ball time than the rest of the team throughout qualifiers. If you can consistently kill him first, then you know full well that you're going to be in a pretty good spot and not allowing Booby to get anywhere near that ball. And three are dead now for Sentinels, and Booby is that last remaining player, and he's going to desperately try and stay alive. Unable to do so, but does go out at least with a trade. But it's a 59 to 21 lead at the moment for Rebellion, and they seem firmly in control. A significant lead. Enemy has the ball. All over towards pipes. Sentinels will get hands on. Ubu looking to provide cover fire for his ball carrier. Lethal dropped down towards batteries, and that was ill-advised. As it was straight into the welcoming gun of Cycle, and yet another camouflage goes the way of Rebellion. And you can see why Rebellion are unbeaten on this map in mode throughout the qualifiers, because their camo control, again, similarly to what we saw in Slayer Aquarius, with their overshield control, it is persistent, it is consistent, and Sentinels haven't really been able to have anyone to challenge it, because again, Rebellion have been the team that are ahead in the objective. On the Slayer, they were ahead on the Slay, so then they could work with it. Now they're ahead with the ball time, so Sentinels don't even have a chance to go to that camo because they have to be thinking about the ball. Beautiful trigger discipline the ball. from Cycle. He chases one player down but might have chased him to his death. Lethal was there to provide cover for his teammate. Ball will get played. Suppressed, taking no risks here as they have a significant lead. Oh, and look at this. He's just delaying now. Frustrating. Almost gets the kill onto Spartan, but that keeps two players at ball uh, at blue whilst that ball is spawning, allowing your spawners, allowing your teammates to regain control over towards batteries, and then you stop any sort of ball time. So those few seconds, they can be crucial. Soul Snipes in pipes. Spartan's on double stack. Done some damage, but unfortunately for him, Teammates were not there to capitalize on it. He loses his life. Boo Boo trying to get the trade from here. It's an awkward fight inside the shroud. Two men enter, one man leaves. And it was Boo Boo towards Long Haul, down to no shields. He has some scars and scrapes, but he will survive. As they now make a push towards Pipes, hoping Rebellion have no nades for this. They don't even need them. They have enough damage with the shock rifle. And that chain damage was significant, and it was punishing. 
with your Sentinels here, you really want to get the shock in the hands of Spartan and allow him to start kind of leading the way with the initial damage so the rest of the team can go off the back of it. More ball time suppressed, maybe gets up. I don't hate it, I don't hate the risk, but now the rest of the team, they need to go off the back of that risk. They need to get a little bit defensive. Don't allow Sentinels to gain control of pipes here. Otherwise, they get the setup, and that's good from Cycle. Rebellion, they're just playing this so well. They're, they're, they're always in a two. They always have someone to support them right now. What do Sentinels have? I know what they don't have. That's time. Four seconds to be exact. And they're not going to get close enough as Cycle will lock in round number one. One round away then from taking down Sentinels in pool play. And you heard it on the desk. We knew that this pool was going to be close. We knew there was going to be some good games. And Rebellion looking to try and upset the higher seed of Sentinels very early on here, Friday in Texas. But it's not done yet. Similarly to Strongholds, you always got a chance to get back into a game with Oddball with a round resetting as the fight for Camo goes down once more. And it does seem like Sentinels are far more comfortable when they spawn on the opposition side. They really struggled when they spawn over towards A, but the C spawns just allows them to play a little bit more different. Falcade was baiting the camouflage, caught between two mines of going and securing it for his team. We're just waiting and watching, and he done the ladder. Didn't get enough damage on the Soul Snipe, and Another camouflage goes the way of Rebellion. Ball tossed out. Soul Snipe says no, 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 and tosses it right back in the window. The ball. Ball. Rebellion have got control of pipes. Spartan's been cleared out. And that and means has the ball. some semblance of control for Rebellion. And it was a very small thing from Soul ball. Snipe. Had he not grabbed that ball, he would have and got that kill, but he knows full well he had teammates coming into it and said, actually, we and can get a little bit of time here if I catch this, and maybe I get the kill alongside my teammate. So again, it's a risky play, but I think it is a smart one. It didn't really pay off in the end, but I love that he attempted it. But well, we speak about the margins, right? If he gets that kill, but the ball falls down towards batteries, he has to jump back down and then rotate the ball back up. Instead, happy to sacrifice his life to try and get some ball time. Speaking of, Lethal's got hands on and is starting to take a little bit of a significant lead here. Just about closing the 40 point threshold. Somewhat of a slow game for Spartan in the moment, six in 15. If he can start to get back into it and find himself on top in some individual fights, then there is still a good chance for Sentinels in this series. But they are up 43-3 to in this round, so a really strong start. Notice they gave up the camo at the start of the game so that they could get that strong start with the ball and then force Rebellion to try and break a setup. And I would say that's one thing Sentinels are better at than Rebellion, is the setups in general and the breaking offset setup. So Rebellion just need to make sure they don't allow Sentinels to get in that position too often. Another camo. Another camo. Enemy and another one for Rebellion. This is going to be frustrating for not only Sentinels, but Sentinels fans watching this. Wondering where it's all going wrong when it comes to the power ups. Prioritizing instead to get ball time. And they have 60 seconds now. And it's important to know they're winning this round. And with Spartan having a game like 8 and 16, we know how likely he is to catch fire at any given time. If you're already winning the round, it's good things coming if Spartan can catch that fire. Yeah, you feel like Rebellion kind of have to get it done here with the 2-0, otherwise you allow Sentinels to regain that momentum and that confidence. But without the camouflage, Rebellion might struggle to break these setups, so it is imperative they keep getting them. So perhaps Sentinels need to start thinking about at least sending one player to maybe contest it, but then you naturally leave open your defense. So it is a difficult thing to try and juggle here on recharge, especially when you have that ball control. Cycle not able to get that kill in the end. Both players just knowing on no, being on no shields there, you have to back off and hope a teammate can really help you out. Sparring over towards heaven, will get fired from Cycle. Lethal was there though. Three kills go in favor, making all four dead for Rebellion for a moment. And this is much better from the Sentinels. Lethal listening so well. It's incredible, really. Every single time you see a player that is one shot, Lethal pops out of nowhere just to put a bullet in the head. The communication from Sentinels letting him know. Again, there's, there's, there's one more. Ears to the ground and making sure that none of these no-shield players are able to get away. It is cleanup crew at the moment for Lethal. What was it Lethal was doing in the office? Was he playing Halo or was he doing janitor work? He's on an absolute cleanup situation at the moment. He did request that we have some plants and a water fountain on the main stage, but unfortunately that was out of budget. And now we're all tied up as Sentinels show signs of life. 1-1 one, one here. And round three will be the decider. And again, I'm gonna say it, Rebellion, 
they have to get it done here in Oddball. Solitude is not where you want to go for a game five against Sentinels. And I guess I'll go into that later if we do get there. But right now, Rebellion just have to focus on the task at hand. They do have the better spawn that they had from previous, but it's a different starting strategy from Sentinels this time. But again, it's Rebellion who get the better of them. All four down for Sen. And Rebellion's Seaside spawn start is so powerful. They have gained all the tools they could have wanted. Now suppressed. He has, the ball. he has the shock to work with, but just needs to escape here, and he's able to do so thanks to the camouflage. Suppressed is a very important player on the map right now. Ball with that camo and shock. And he, has the ball. he can really cut away the numbers that Sentinels have when they push forward. Lethal's got a pick on the cycle. Fubu's gonna soar forward, two shock rifle shots. Will not find the face, now his position's been given up. Ball's been played 30 seconds of time, and that's valuable. What a difference maker that could have been though, if you'd hit that initial shock rifle shot, suddenly you've been full shields, and oh, that's gonna be a nice double from Soul Snipe. Just waiting for the player to come round. Easy shot onto the plasmas. And Rebellion again, just able to pick up that ball off the spot, and no player from Sentinels to stop them initially. Boo Boo is gonna be in gold, but he's quickly shut down. Sentinels just need to wrestle back this control quickly. Don't allow Rebellion to get too much of a lead here because then Rebellion can start to do what they did in the first round and start collapsing on you wherever you're spawning. Arcade was good for one. Lost Spartan in the process, though. Enemy has the ball. Now it's Sentinels' opportunity to get hands on ball. Boo Boo will take some initial damage as he tries to rotate it towards Long Haul, but Suppressed dives forward and happy to take the trade. Just to eat away at the clock and force Sentinels to make some plays. The ball. Plays have been made. Spartan has hands the ball, happy to milk it for as long as he possibly can before the Rebellion numbers get close. I think this is what Sentinels need. They need everyone to be playing the part of the ball here. One thing you don't want to get sucked into is Boo Boo thinking he the he's the ball guy as all four members of Sentinels go down and then trying to grab that ball just in desperate attempt to try and get some time on the board and then allowing Rebellion to get the player advantage off the back of the kill. But now with all four dead, Rebellion do have the player advantage as Suppress gets the double. It's a perfect and he has the camouflage and Rebellion now halfway there. It's been the story of this series. Enemy halfway to power ups, power weapons, but more importantly, it's been the power ups. Camouflages and overshields have more often than not fallen to Rebellion. And that's not by accident, that's something that they've worked on. Soul Snipe hits some beautiful shots to shut down Lethal in the blue pipes. As the Shroud Screen pops up, Cycle's taking no risks with this ball. He's opting to play it instead. 62 to 11. And it's a long road back for Sentinels here. But it's a play ball, and look where Rebellion are. Oh, they're back over towards Batteries, because once more there is Soul Snipe just to buy time for his teammates so that they can control that side of the map. Okay, Mental has fallen, so it is going to be a tougher fight here. But Cycle is in a spot to maybe clean things up. But Boo Boo catches him off guard. But if he goes down, which he does, it just opens up even more control again for Rebellion. The confidence these players have in the 1v1 situation. Even when they're down to no shields, they back themselves to hit the final shots that are required. And they've been massive. Ball dropped. Ball was picked up, but Suppress loses his life. Mental's got hands on. Three members of Sentinels positioned over towards A, making all four members now. At 70 seconds and climbing here for Rebellion. They're almost home. Yeah, this is kind of last ditch saloon for Sentinels with some of these pushes now. If they find themselves three or four dead, they might not get another opportunity at pushing for this ball. Two have gone down. Cycle though will hold with Suppress. Spartan tries to push it, should get cleaned up and will do so. But at least they stopped this ball time. But great aids again from Cycle. And he can now just run away. He can get this ball to the other side. He knows they're spawning over towards Elevator. There is a real chance that Rebellion could hold and win from this point. Sentinels continue to push from the Whirlpool. Grenades doing so much damage. Cycle doing so much damage. Three dead. Lethal, the last man on the map over towards Batteries. Cycle has that information and continues to hold the ball. Lethal oh. gets close and gets the trade. That is a big trade from Cycle, though. He had no ammo. He had to reload, and that does give Sentinels a slight lifeline here now. But they can't afford to slip up. Camo is going to be up. But they, ha they can't go for it. They have to go for the ball here. Gets close to the ball. Spartan gets the stop. He's got hands on, but what way has the camouflage gone? Lethal's down there, but he's died. Three members of Sentinels have fallen. Boo Boo nowhere near the ball. Camouflage goes to the chest. Not that they even need it. As Rebellion continue to hold, requiring only now four seconds to close out this series, and they will win the series against Sentinels.
And what a series it was from Rebellion. When they looked like they were down and out in the Strongholds game, and they come back, and ever since, and they didn't look like they were going to ever drop that series. And you can see on the other side for Sentinels, they know that they've let that one slip. They were the favorites. They came into this as the third seed, the highest seed in this group. For Rebellion, they shift things over. And I wonder what Soul Snipe's thinking about that one. You were talking about, you know, leaving his friends, his longtime teammates to form this Rebellion roster. Well, it seems like there may be some new blood here in the HCS, and a lot of our up-and-comers are certainly shining. Rebellion put themselves in the conversation. They take down the third-seeded team in Sentinels, like you mentioned, Dan. And it's dejection on the stage. You can see it on Spartan's face. They were the favorites. But this wasn't an upset. This was something that could be expected. These two teams have locked horns before, and there's been very little between them. I think in Rebellion's eyes, no, it wasn't an upset. They probably came into this saying, we can beat them, we have beat them, why can't we do it again? It's just an upset on paper. As overall, Rebellion outslaying Sentinels 104 to 95 in the end. 32 kills for both Cycle and Suppressed as they put on a show. But I think we know, I think they know, this series was won in that Strongholds live fire game. Had they not been able to win that one, even if they go into ball and win as expected, we then go into a Slayer Solitude. And when I tell you Slayer Solitude is Sentinel's best game type by far, Rebellion will be happy they didn't have to go there. Get it done in four, and it's a 3-1 victory in the end in what was a very impressive turnaround because that could have been so different had Strongholds live fire not seen the same comeback we witnessed. And we've seen on Imperium, it looked as though we were seeing the right sort of Sentinels team. They did everything that they needed to do. It was textbook at times. They held the map and it was like, all right, this is probably what we're going to expect all series long. But after that game two, particularly even game three, that stronghold was so important. So important. I think they know full well that it's just one of those scenarios where if you do lose some of those games, you have to come back swinging. And Rebellion will be delighted with their performance. Seeds don't win series. Rebellion do. And Blaze has got an interview on the stage. Take it away, fella. Thank you so much, Shurs. Texas, give it up for Shopify Rebellion as they take down Sentinels and move on in the bracket. I'm on the stage with Billy G, a.k.a. Mental. And my man, you know, how did you guys get this series done? It was a 3-1 victory. And you guys going up against one of the only teams that did not make a team change this season. How did you guys get it done? Uh, we knew they are going to be really uh, practice, well practiced going to this event. Uh, the map pool wasn't the best in our favor. Uh, pit's probably one of our weaker maps, so uh, we had a close pit. We still could have won that one, so after we lost it, we're like, you know, it's whatever. We shook it off and knew the next couple maps weren't as bad as pit for us, so uh, yeah. There you go. And so now, as I know, you know, me and you got a long history, and you are a dominant gamer, and you have been for years. Talk to me about this new shop of our Rebellion team, and how does it feel to play with these guys, and do you think you could do big, uh, big things with this roster? Yeah, I've never been more confident uh, going to an event with the uh, roster in Halo so far. Um, I got, uh, you know, Soul Snipe and uh, Suppressed on the team now, and those guys are GOATs. So last year, uh, we lost them some close matches. So I think we, we kind of combined the, like, the two of the teams. Uh -huh. And yeah, super confident going to this event with this team. Uh, they're great players. There you go. And my last question is about Coach Best Man. It's another season with him. What has he been doing for the team? Uh, a lot of behind the scenes work. Uh, Best Man's like, uh, you know, he's known for being a pro back in the day, so he's got a lot of knowledge, and he's helped me uh, uh, improve as a player, I guess, throughout the year, throughout Halo seasons, because, you know, I came from different games. So yep. he's helped me a lot personally for this team. He's helped a lot. He's very vocal with this team. Um, and, yeah, this is I hope this is our season. All right, I hope it's your season two as well. That's going to do it for me and Mentor on the stage. Show some love to Shopify Rebellion. Lottie, take us away. Thank you so much, Blaze. Shopify Rebellion with the first upset of the major incredible turn of events for this team. And what a confidence builder and booster for these guys to take down a team like Sentinels. And I love a full circle moment. You know this. And when we talked about the pools, we talked about how Shopify really could shock the world and potentially take down Sentinels in this roster. And the fashion in which they did that was extremely impressive, to say the least. Clutch, what comes to your mind when you think back on this series 
and how things really start to unravel for Rebellion as it, we got to the later parts of the series. Well, things unravel for Sentinels because I feel like in Game 2, they didn't get a single overshield. In Game 4, they didn't get a single camo. And that's what happens when you don't get power-ups and you're playing against those guys. I mean, that is a very talented roster. They did such a good job of being on top of those power-ups and putting them to use. I mean, that Slayer was where they got their feet back in the series because Game 1 might have been a 2-1 score and Mental said it was close. It did not feel close. It felt like Sentinels were in the driver's seat the entire time, but something changed in that game too. They win the opening break, they get those over shields, they're able to use that to just get that snowball rolling, gain your confidence and find your footing in the series. And with that, I really think that confidence went miles away. You saw the gun skill on Shopify really start to stand out towards the end of the series. It really was interesting because this first map we're watching right now, Walshi, it was really showing Sentinel's experience. And you're looking at players like Falcated, who the silent assassin having such a good game alongside Boo Boo, etc. And things just started to just devolve for them. And it was really interesting to see how Shopify started to capitalize on that. What do you think went particularly wrong for Sentinels? It's hard to pinpoint that. Like, on one hand, you'd like to say, oh, so-and-so wasn't having the best game. Like, Falcated, he was playing incredibly yeah. well, despite his team losing in this cases. Yes, you could argue that maybe Boo Boo, Lethal, Sparty were all getting shut down at different times, but by no means was Sentinels playing bad. They just straight up got outplayed. Like you said, they got out-rotated. They lost as many power-ups as you possibly can. I'm going to challenge that. I think Spartan had a really poor series, yeah. in my opinion. And then statistically, and honestly, Spartan known for being one of those guys that you can trust in those one-on-one -on -one gunfights to give your team that man advantage. Cycle was shutting him down in those one-on-ones. Nope, there's not a lot of players on this planet that I believe win that many one-on-ones against a player like Spartan. It felt like consistently Cycle was getting the upper hand. He gave his team so much opportunity. And as we take a look at the stats, a player we haven't even mentioned yet, Soul Snipe, really having an impact on this series with the 53 kills. Uh, and, and I think that it really was going to take everyone on Shopify having their moments, and I think they had their moments and took full advantage of them in those last three games. They certainly did have their moments, but I think another thing I want to touch upon is the support the team had from one another. I think at times, especially in that oddball, we really started to see Sentinels look a little bit lost on the map at times, not being able to pick up or capitalize on power-ups, equipment. It was all going in the hands of Shopify, and I truly do believe that was because of the fight that they had with one another, the duo system that they had, the partnership. They were able to support one another, deal damage, make sure they clean up kills and bait and switch effectively. That was so beautiful. Something that you would expect out of some of the best teams we have in the world. A lot of those camo fights, especially in that second and third round, you could tell Sentinels were realizing that they weren't getting some of the power-ups. So you would see one of the players for Sentinels go for it. But like you said, Vlad, it was always multiple members of Shopify focused on acquiring that power-up, and they always had the numbers advantage and the damage advantage to get that power-up. And those camo players made so many different clutch plays to get them the margins of victory that they had. Yeah, and I also felt like there was just zero hesitation from Shopify Rebellion during those games. A lot of times when you see these teams that have been together a lot longer, someone like Sentinels, they start to get in this comfort zone. They're always used to fighting two-on-ones. They're always pushing together. However, sometimes when push comes to shove and you get in those chaotic situations, you have to not hesitate, not be afraid, just charge out and take a fight and win something for your team. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Well, I'll tell you what happening in certain different parts of, uh, of this beautiful arena. We do have the B stream going on, and we have Complexity versus Bittersweet. Some highlights from that gameplay as well. And Complexity, another team I'm really excited to look at and their journey in this major and how they're going to perform. I really do think this is going to stamp a kind of precedence for this team going into the season and how good they truly can be. Will they be a team to upset some of the best in the world? We've seen Shopify Rebellion do so so far in their pool, yeah. but when it comes to Call, they have an abundance of talent on this roster. Yeah, and of course we go to complexity, highlights, precision is the first <laughs> two clips you see. That guy is an animal, and when he is playing good, he's going to give complexity every bit of strength they need to try and compete against some of the best in the world. Complexity, a very strong team, as you see them up 2-0 in this series, just based off the highlights. I mean, they are going to be 
a threat to this Optic Gaming roster at the end of the night, the last series of the day. That is going to be the banger of Pool Play. Indeed. I've got to say, you know, we're going to talk a little bit more about complexity and dive deeper as we get into this day. But Walshi, when you look at Ryan Eve right now, I think it, it was interesting to hear what Mental had to say about the confidence he feels with the team he has currently now. Obviously, going off of a roster post with Ryan Eve, losing him in the mix, he's still feeling really good about it. But Ryan Eve, all, always having the pick of the litter, right? No matter the odds, no matter what happens to him on his roster, he might have got left in the shadows there, but he always manages to find and claw his way back on a fantastic team that must say a lot about him as a leader yeah I think it says a lot about him as leader having a good pulse of the current uh, players on the market just knowing all right this player's underrated this person has the potential to to grow in and become a, a top pro yeah Ryan's one of those guys that has always had a good eye for talent right he's always when you play against someone like, when I play against Precision and matchmaking, I'm like, <laughs> Yo, this kid is the truth. He does not miss. He does all the right things. He makes great plays. Ryan's got that same level of, of intuition on, on noticing a player's tendencies and are they good at playing, like, core high-level Halo. I think he's put himself together a very strong roster of underrated players that just needed an opportunity. And we'll see with this opportunity here in Arlington, can Complexity take advantage of it? Yeah, and I expect complexity to continue doing well. One thing I was talking about earlier today with Elamite was it was a little different back in like maybe like the Halo 2, Halo 3 days from online results compared to LAN results. Nowadays, those have gotten a lot closer. You're not going to see a team that's, you know, dominating just purely online and then come to LAN and not be a factor. Instead, you're going to see FaZe and Space Station. They're winning all the open qualifiers. And guess what's going to likely happen this event? FaZe or Space Station are going to make a huge <laughs> run at potentially taking first place. Hold on a second. What about Optic? What about Optic Gaming? Optic well, yeah. as well. Our you got to learn how to play the crowd. Yeah, you got to learn how to play the crowd. But Hold I mean, on, uh. they got to win with the open qualifiers and I'll shout them out. True. <laughs> that makes I a lot like of that. sense. <laughs> I get it, Walshy. The logic's there, but I Fair think enough. the logic for the fans, no, nope, that ain't the but one. But yeah, no, for complexity, like I said, they've, they've placed very strong throughout these yes. qualifiers. And no surprise, they're going to play very well in land here. Very excited to see how they will continue to go on throughout this major. Coming up next, though, on the main stage, we will see again FaZe Clan, your 2023 world champions, going up against Ascending Baseline to see if they can take top of their pool going out of Friday, waiting for that open bracket team. We're going to head to a quick break right now as we go over this open bracket to see which teams are willing themselves onto that main stage into pool play tomorrow. It's going to be an absolute banger coming up next, and I'll see you right after the break. This is the world's most advanced processor. In entertainment, its rendering speeds render other processors obsolete. It drives the future of autonomous driving. Powers cloud services for billions. Helps change the course of climate change. Connects communities of gamers anytime, anywhere. And uses AI to accelerate disease detection and cures. We make the world's most advanced processors. But only with your vision can we advance the world. AMD, together we advance. Hey, guess what? New year means a new optic scuff design for a new controller. Check out this sexy design. It's a nod to the original OG logo and a great way to rep the green wall. Choose between the Reflex for PS5, the Instinct for Xbox, and the brand new Envision for PC gaming. Guess what? Scuff saw your comments and they're now selling the base plates separately for the Envision and the Instinct for $29.99. Big up the cocks here. Sorry, I'm kind of busy. Kind of not. Leave a message. Yeah, the mega rev boys here, cinnamon. Flow tastes sweet like cinnamon. Open up doors, I'm a gentleman. View top floor, I'm still staying ahead of them. Running on fumes and adrenaline. Do what I do best, huh? Can't rush in like a roulette. You can't name a better duet. Huh? Don't ask questions, trying to figure out what sound. Don't worry about what next, just know we got now.
we've got Jimbo from Foe joining us. Uh, come all the way down to London to have a chat with us because yep. you have had probably one of the most turbulent off seasons. I think it's quite some time. It's been an absolutely wild one. Stressful, beyond relief, just crazy one. But great, but great. Don't get me wrong. Well, there's a lot of stories to tell. Uh, there, there is an is. absolute ton. Before there we is. get into it, do you want to get a coffee? Heck yeah. Let's get caffeinated. Coffee acquired. Let's go back to, say, Blackpool Europa Halo event. You guys had a very good performance. You did come up agonizingly short in that final against Quadrant. One kill. One kill. That was the difference. Split across the map. Sniper to Jimbo. Jimbo gets the first kill with a shock rifle. Shots onto two of the players. The collapse coming in. Slays come free. Oh. Three down. 49 48 in favor of Narvi. 20 seconds left. The HCS 2024 Kickoff Arlington Major is presented by AMD, Scuff, and Corduroys. Hello, folks, and welcome back to the HCS Arlington Kickoff Major here in Texas. And I am so excited to be here. First one of the season, back at it at Major One with Wes and Walshie on the desk. And lads, oh gosh, have we had some heaters to begin with? We've had a pretty weirdly close 3 0 to start off the day. And then, of course, we just had an upset from Shopify Rebellion against Sentinels. Who would have thought they would get it done? 3 one. That is crazy to me. Honestly, I thought we were going to go game five. I was actually willing it to go game five, wasn't I? I was hoping for a game five, but like, I'm always on. hoping for a game five, especially when you have two of the best teams in the world going at it. Unfortunately, Sentinel is not playing well enough to get that done. You know that they're going to be kicking themselves, but they still can advance in the winner's bracket from pool play. And when they do, whoever's the one seat that they played that first round is not going to want to see Sentinels. Yeah, very, very true. And Rebellion, I think a lot of teams might be fearing the way that they have come out so far. The opener of the weekend for them has been pretty lights out, Walshy. Yeah, very much expected now for Rebellion to come out number one in that pool. It's kind of their pool to lose at this point. Yeah, I'd be shocked. Yeah, I would be very, very shocked as it, uh, if anything else happened other than that. But let's take a look right now at the schedule to see what is coming your way for the rest of today. We've had two matches so far. On to the next. It's going to be phase once again up against Ascending Baseline. We also have Optic Gaming versus Bittersweet, SSG versus Foe, and Complexity versus Optic Gaming. We're also actually going to be finding out a little bit more about all the meta changes that have happened coming into this season and what those mean for the competition. So loads to look forward to, folks, for the rest of 
today. Let's also take a look at the pool updates because we do have scores coming in as we're heading into the action on the main stage. As you can see right now, pool A, nothing really changing there. We'll get to the ascending baseline versus phase match very shortly. Pool B, Foe did take that one against Native Gaming. That one is a little bit of a shocker to me, just in terms of the talent on the Native Gaming roster. I was expecting something a little bit more than a, kind of a sweep there from Foe. And then Pool C, Shopify Rebellion, the upset with Sentinels. Pool D, Complexity versus Bittersweet. That one ended in Cole's favor, as we saw in some of the highlights, the 3-0 sweep for them as well. So lots of scores coming in and lots more to look forward to as well. But back on our main stage and back on the desk, we do have next the World Champs back up again on the main stage. And they're going up against Ascending Baseline. And I've got to say, I fear for Ascending Baseline after what we saw this morning. FaZe are kind of notorious for slow starts. And um, it wasn't as slow as I think a lot of people were expecting. I think Quadrant were hoping to catch them off guard a little bit. First one of the tournament, first day in. A lot of them have really weird sleep schedules. Maybe they could have got something in there, but just didn't happen, the 3-0 sweep. That might be scaring Ascending Baseline just a, just a touch. Yeah, I'm expecting FaZe to uh, be stronger and stronger as the event goes. Friday's usually not their strongest day, and if you're gonna catch them slipping, it's probably in that first series quadrant, not able to win a game, but some of the games were close. Could give you some promise, but that's the worst I think we see Renegade play. And that being said, I think he still went like plus eight or nine in the series. Uh, so that's the expectation that I set for Renegade uh, after what he's been able to show us over the past couple of years in Halo Infinite. So I'm expecting FaZe to come out a little bit hotter. Frosty said this last series was about getting their feet on the ground back to it. This next series is gonna be, all right, we should be locked in. We need to find that dominant form rolling into Saturday, into the bracket play, and into Championship Sunday. Yeah, so we're looking for a bit of a spark here out of phase, a little bit of dominance, I think, on that main stage. And while she just to seal the deal off for their Friday, that would be the utmost confidence heading into Saturday when you're waiting for that open bracket team and also heading into the championship bracket. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a lot of these ones are going to be kind of like this this test for phase to see how bit like how hard are they winning these series? Are they winning a flag game? Is it 3-0 in flag? Or are they winning the game by 3-2? When it comes to a Slayer, are they winning 50 to 30? Or are they winning 50 to 40, 45-ish? Right. Now, regardless of the result here, phase are already looking so good. So I'm not as worried about them. I don't think that they're going to try to force a steak dinner on game two or anything like that to, to, to prove any sort of point. If, all, if anything, I think this phase roster has proven that they're like less efficient against these kind of teams. <laughs> like they try to over slay a little bit. They don't try to end the game as fast as they should or as dominant as they should because they're almost playing with their food in a sense. We've seen them go to game fives with teams that they really have no business going to game fives with in the past. I feel like they play to their competition and they really don't wake up until championship Sunday or late in the bracket on Saturday. This team has been through so much throughout their history as competitors. I mean, they've been doing it for 15 years or more at this point. It's very difficult to get up for every single series, although you have to make sure the job still gets done. Yeah, you do indeed. You can see right now in the, you know, the graphic there, objective excellence for all of last year. I will say coming into the, the uh, preseason, excuse me, with some of the qualifiers, a little bit shaky on some of the objective work. And I think that could be just, you know, some of the jitters in terms of some of the changes, the bandit starts, equipment kind of changes on maps, and also rotations being a little bit different as well. But Walshy, when you look at, you know, the work that they have put in through the qualifiers, still being able to be consistent, you know, winning quite a few of those qualifiers and coming into first seed, that's impressive in itself and obviously does pave the way for an incredible weekend hopefully for phase yeah i mean it's, it's no surprise these guys have been putting the work for years now throughout halo 5 till now like they've been at the top for so long they clearly have a regimen and a practice schedule that works and they aren't letting off the gas like these guys have cemented themselves to some of the top players of all time and this can continue to get better and better well we'll see if they have a full tank half a tank or quarter tank on that main stage in just a moment going up against this powerhouse of seem to be a ferrari uh, is going to be ascending baseline now wes a taste of greatness for spytomic previously monster um but, you know, he had tournaments with SSG in the qualifiers. He won a tournament with SSG in the qualifiers. And that taste of greatness, what can he take from that with that experience and bring to the rest of his team, do you think? I think when you play with great players, you learn how to communicate. You learn how to rebound. You learn how to reset in some of these difficult situations and maybe take back advantage of map control a little bit cleaner. I think a lot of the rookie teams, a lot of the up-and-coming pros really struggle when they're in those disadvantageous positions. You very quickly, when you play with FaZe, when you play with 
SSG, you very quickly learn that, all right, this is how they, this is how they treat these situations. They know exactly how to slow it down. You take little things from these situations that they were applying while you had the opportunity to play with them, and you can bring that to the, the rest of the team. When I was on SSG and we had this success, this is what Stellar and Eco tried to tell me what to do. Like, this is how we coordinated being stuck in a terrible position. They're able to get out of that. Hopefully, Spytomic's able to bring that to this team because they're gonna need a lot of it in this phase series. Agree with that fully, Wes. I think you essentially learn some of those good habits and how to break out those situations, but also at the same time, you start to lose some of those bad habits you have. Sometimes playing with like the number one squad, they're gonna say, don't ever go there, don't do this. You're like, I used to always go there. All right, That's all right, I spot. won't. Like sometimes it takes like <laughs> that ego check from like one of the top teams or top players to maybe break you out of a bad habit. Indeed, well, we'll see how this one shakes out. I know that the main stage is ready right now. So folks, phase versus ascending baseline, meet your teams. Man, does it feel good to be here in beautiful Arlington, Texas, where the vibes are immaculate, the crowd is electric, and let me tell you, that food is... Enough about that. No, we, we're here for Halo. I'm why not be reckless, AK? Why not be casting? And for the first time on the main stage, I got my man active with me, mouse and keyboard expert, former competitive player dating all the way back since Halo 2, and one of the best analytical minds that I've had the pleasure of working with. Tim, how you feeling today? I'm feeling phenomenal. I think this is going to be an incredible series. FaZe, honestly, coming out real hot, and what a better place to have my first main stage cast than an optics house. This is gonna be a phenomenally electric series. It really is, and speaking of the series, we're taking a look at the series layout. Capture the flag on Empyrean. Going to be our game number one when we watch the number one seeded phase, your reigning world champions, going up against a very hungry ascending baseline. Talk to me about what you expect to see out of this matchup. I mean, they talked about it on the desk. This is going to be a very difficult series for ascending baseline, but honestly, Monster, he comes in with some incredible online performance. If he can translate that to LAN, which I think he can, I think this could be a great series. I think he's learned a lot. I think we're going to see that here today. I feel like it's only a matter of time before he does translate that into some great land performances here. But man, what a match we have to go up to. Your first matchup against FaZe. Right. And mind you, this is the first time we're seeing them here in this tournament. Your first match is you warming up against the reigning world champions. Well, welcome to the big leagues. There couldn't be a higher mountain to climb here for ascending baseline, but we'll see if they're able to get to the top phase, like you said. With that series against Quadrant, a 3-0, they've got that warm up in. They're ready to play, but ascending baseline, are they prepared for this? They're, like you said, this is their first matchup today. Well, they better get ready, they better get ready quick, because Empyrean, game number one, two snipers on the map. Don't forget about those rockets sitting towards the middle queen and overshield, really important, especially when you combine that with a shotgun now over toward yeah. the sword room? Where did that come from? Absolutely insane. That bulldog inside a sword makes sword such a prominent area to control, and you see, it's gonna be Spy Tomic on your screen. He's got the snipe. He's gonna to go top tower. A very defensive play here already from ascending baseline. Trusting Spy Tomic with this sniper. He's gonna to have to make a play, especially as Frosty was able to get away with that overshield. And 
not sure exactly where he went, as you see on the screen, Renegade gets himself a kill when Frosty coming in out of nowhere, but Spy Tomic is going to live, and he's gonna hold on to six bullets, that is seven, make it five, he plants one onto State Fight. What a beautiful shot by Spy Tomic, and he stays alive with Sniper, this is such an important position for him, he's gonna be able to take control of the map, and if he can get another pick here on that Frosty, it could be huge for the side of Ascending Baseline. He gets himself that melee hurt. kill too quickly, going down for phase, Ascending Baseline doing a great job of holding on to the sword side control and eventually they want to turn into training side they are pushing up heavily right now two and no right now is by Tomic, but Hotshot goes and Squale hit the black screen. Yeah, honestly, they played real aggressive. It's Spy Tomic playing that back line. He's got the sniper, doesn't want to die with that power weapon. But FaZe picked him apart one by one, and Spy Tomic is all alone now. While we're sending base, are worried about what's in front of them. They should have worried about what's behind them, and that's Renegade with the flank. Now that flag is off base. Now you're drawing the attention of the opposition. Oh. Spy Tomic is going to have to make a play with the sniper. Something dynamic is going to have to happen. Body shot onto Snake Bite, but Snake Bite still gets himself that one. He had some great shots, but apparent, uh, essentially not the value you want to get out of that snipe rifle. It's going to go down. Royal Toon's going to pick it up and put a body shot into Hot Shot. Snipe in the hands of Royal Two, who's bounced right back because courtesy of that repulse from Burton. Still, FaZe have numbers right now, so they want to get aggressive. They want to continue to push that flag towards the long haul side. Ascending baseline is spawning on the opposite side of the map, and that flag has almost made it into the long haul. Yeah, I really like the patience here on a phase, though. It's Renegade pulling that flag, making sure to get his shields back. That's going to be a clean run. And with three dead, I mean, a really good job by phase. They do have two down, but that flag will go in. That's the first tap for phase. 1-0 lead. Phase showing us why they're the reigning world champions and picking up exactly where they left off. 3-0 on Quadrant and looking to do the same here to Ascending Baseline. Very important right now, Overshield and Rockets are coming up, and with two down for Ascending Baseline, it's gonna be very difficult for them to get control, especially when you got a flanker and the side is snake bite. so it's gonna be FaZe Clan in control once again of these power weapons. Ascending Baseline was almost able to get first hands on that Rockets, but snake bite with that flank, huge. Two to work with right now. The Overshield and Repulse, Whoa. not enough to send that Rocket back, and Snake Bite's gonna get the double kill because of it, and more importantly, takes down the Overshield. Yeah, the Repulse wasn't a factor there. Snake Bite able to get that double, a beautiful job by him. A Renegade's gonna capitalize as well, the spawn on the Squally. He's gonna have to live here. And you see the patience out of Renegade. This is one of the things from Renegade for me, is his patience. He's gotten real discipline as time has gone on in last season. Hot shot hitting one of those famous hot shots with that Ooh. sniper. Beautifully played by him. As you find yourself down 0-1 against FaZe Clan. Snipe Control is looking good for ascending baseline. They want to use it to get those kills. They want to use it to push forward, but once again, they drop numbers, and now you're in a 1v1 versus Frosty, and you are forced back. Hotshot Ghost is going to try to do everything he can to stay alive, but wow. Frosty, he will not be denied. Yeah, Frosty's a big part of the puzzle here if you're trying to break this setup for ascending baseline, but him staying alive, also picking up this sniper. Look how much ammo he has to work with, Tony, and he's going to hit the <laughs> shot on the Hotshot Ghost. Ascending baseline off their spawn nowhere to go. You give this man 10 shots with the S7 sniper, and you're gonna have a bad time. Frosty just sitting back, almost baiting his teammates a little bit with that sniper. He wants to get himself some easy kills, but off screen, Burn finds a kill on the snake bite. Renegade quickly pushes up and is able to at least clear out his side of the map as FaZe Clan wants to push back up, wants to claim control of the 50 again. Honestly, I love this, right? You usually see the lack of discipline when it comes to these top teams playing against these lower-seeded teams. You see them kind of play a little bit frantic, but FaZe is trying to play very dynamic. They're trying to play slow, and because of that, they're not going to push up unless they have the numbers advantage. I do see Burton and Squale pushing through long haul. The pings are going down. They have identified where the push is coming from, and they've successfully been able to handle it. Hotshot goes the only player alive for ascending baseline. Not for long. Frosty's able to deal with them, and now complete map control for FaZe. Ascending baseline are essentially trapped like rats at the moment. With World 2 at the top of tower, though, it's going to give ascending baseline to spawn inside a flag, but they've got to get past Frosty here, and that's not going to be an easy feat. Takes Ooh. out Burton, gets another one. The double kill on the hot shot goes. Frosty not missing a shot. Three dead and Squally, the last player alive. And he's already been found and actually already dealt with Snake Bite with the Rockets, able to take down Squally right as that flag is being pulled at the exact same time. The timing so well for FaZe. Three down once again, go ascending baseline. This is about to be 2-0. 
right now. Yeah, honestly, they've got to take Frosty out of this position. He just freely Woo! putting shots down. Squally and Hot Shot goes to hit the black screen once again. And FaZe look dominant here on Empyrean. The snowman, he's melted faces right now. Every time Ascending Baseline come off a of spawn, it just looks like they are trapped. It looks like they're trying to find a way out, but it won't happen. Three down go Ascending Baseline. The spawning player comes up. You're just a part of the killing frenzy that Frosty's about to have, and he wants to go for running wide. I just don't know if he's having enough time. This game's about to end. Yeah, this is absolutely insane out of phase. We talked about how dominant they ended the last season. They're continuing their dominance here. FaZe absolutely holding that sword side freely. This cat potentially will go in here. A last minute push though by Ascending Baseline. They were able to stop them just short. Another three down this time. It favors ascending baseline. Frosty with another snipe. Six more bullets to work with, and it had to be Spy Tomic to shut him down. Big snipe coming out of him. Yeah, unfortunately, it's only one dead, though. Squally ends up falling as well, so even numbers here, and you've got Faze spawning on their side, so Spy Tomic's in a position where he has to stay alive. He has to do maximum damage with this snipe. Faze are playing like monsters, but you know Spy Tomic, he doesn't fear a monster. His counter snipe goes towards him as he takes down Frosty, still holding on to six bullets as it looks like they're trying to move this flag forward. Flag makes it over toward the pit side. Spy Tommy just barely missing out on that shot. He's trying to stay alive, trying to work with Hot Shot Ghost, but eventually goes down. That leaves Hot Shot Ghost by himself. And you know multiple members of FaZe are now starting to collapse. Another body shot is gonna connect. World 2 goes in for a little bit more. Ascending baseline, they want to get this flag forward. But it looks like FaZe, they shut that down. Return should be coming in. Tony, what do you do when you got players on FaZe that are not missing shots? So this Frosty is not missing a shot. Then Royal 2 picks up the snipe. He's not missing a shot. It just becomes really difficult. And when you're sat back in the back of your base, if you're ascending baseline, you can't even get power weapon or power up control. You're just in a bad spot. Four minutes and 33 seconds on the clock right now. So that really puts ascending baseline behind the eight ball. You are down 0-2. Like it's a very good defensive team in phase on Empyrean. But also when they get their kills, they can get offensive. They can obviously up the tempo at every, any given moment. A great job by phase right there to minimize the damage of those rockets, right? They trap Spy Tomic inside a green. They make sure to take him down without a lot of damage being done. And because of that, they're not it. They're not gonna allow this flag to be pulled. But again, it's an aggressive push by ascending baseline. Unfortunately, it's just not enough damage is going out for them to clean up. Stay by trying to clear out the smaller side. The nades are coming in, he's not gonna survive. Multiple now going down for phase, sending baseline getting a bit of an advantage. Just plenty of time on the board to make something happen, but you gotta make it quick. Hot shot goes down to one shot. He has Burton and Squale coming in as the reinforcements. As I say that, they both go down, make it all three, and now phase are back in the base of ascending baseline. Honestly, it's crazy, right? Phase lead and slays 64 to 39 right now. That is just a massive difference, and you, you can't really do much about that. If you're constantly on the respawn screen, what can you do? Frosty, 18 kills for him, Renegade with 20, and then at the bottom is Snakebite with 17. Yeah, at this point, Frosty and Renegade are almost outslaying the entire ascending baseline <laughs> roster, and that's kind of telling you why they've seemingly struggled with getting phase out of their base and trying to create any kind of offense. It's really tough to watch for ascending baseline, but they've been working well what they have. They've been trying to keep it close. Three minutes on the clock, ascending baseline. What are you made of? I really like the, the, the aggressive play by ascending baseline. baseline. They're playing scrappy, which is essentially what you got to do when you're outslayed completely by the numbers we talked about. Unfortunately, it's not working out because FaZe Clan are always punishing them for misposition. Three members of Ascending Baseline are looking toward the long haul green side. Squale Ooh. has to try to keep Renegade away from the training side. He ends up going down, but Ascending Baseline are able to adapt. Sniper in the hands of Snake Bite is on the tower side. It looks almost like a full defensive effort, at least for now by FaZe. Right, and that's all they have to do, right? With two minutes left, leading by two caps, you just gotta play at the top of your tower with Snipe. And again, I talked about this discipline, right? They're not over-aggressing. They're not, you know, taking this team lightly. They're, they're sitting and playing their game, and that's exactly what's going to allow them to continue to play well in this tournament. With two minutes on the clock, you have to think. You're running out of time, you're running out of options. You need to get this rocket and overshield if you're sending baseline, but you didn't need to end up going three down and giving a free overshield to Snake Bite. Again, ascending baseline, find themselves coming off the spawn, and again, they're gonna find themselves in the reticle of a phase member who is punishing them for going down. I mean, we saw it 
Frosty pop off with the snipe. We saw Royal 2. Now we're seeing Snake Bite. This is a very versatile team. They can do whatever they need to do to make the plan happen. And it's Snake Bite at the top of ascending baseline's turret. A lot of damage gonna be done in a killing spree for him. Staying alive with a minute and 30 seconds, and every second that winds down puts ascending baseline closer and closer to going 0-1 in this series. Something has to change, has to change now. <laughs> I don't know what you can change at this point. Renegade is 26 and 15, having a phenomenal game himself. They finally get Royal 2 out of that sword side, and we talked about how important that sword side is. FaZe have had control of that pretty much the entirety of the game, but you got a minute left to get two caps, Tony. This is looking impossible. That is a great point. I mean, Frosty went on a killing frenzy by sitting over towards that sword side, and since then, ascending baseline haven't been able to create anything from that. They've been, they've been punished. They've been forced back to spawn time and time again. And at this point, time is a commodity that ascending baseline just don't have right now. We're about to go 0 1 in the series, at least going to game two, if you're looking at it from the side of ascending baseline. Especially when they're four dead. Yeah, I mean, FaZe have just looked really strong here. Ascending baseline, like you said, this is their first series here uh, today. So obviously, maybe a little bit of a warm up series. I think. You, you know, as the series goes on, you, you tend to play a little bit better, but FaZe just look on fire right now, and that th third flag will go in. Yeah, what is that icing on the cake right there? They didn't need it, but you know what? Throw a little insult to injury. That's a 3-0 in favor of FaZe, and if there's one player that I'm thinking of, at least that entire game, I mean, it was Frosty's killing frenzy, right. but then I look at Renegade. 29 kills, 9 assists on top of that. Clearly, his presence was felt the map. Right, and you know, back to Frosty, I think honestly the sword, like having that control of sword and forcing Ascending Baseline to spawn in the back of their base, it didn't allow Ascending Baseline to get those rockets, to even get their own snipe for that matter, so they just kind of played from the back and weren't able to make anything happen. Take a look at some of the stats right now. Again, like we talked about the 29 kills out of Renegade, but Snake Bites right behind him with that 24. And we talked about that frenzy. We talked about that control that Frosty had over toward that sword side. He's ending with a respectable 21 kills and 11 assists. Well, now we're going to Slayer. So to me, this is maybe a chance for ascending baseline to to, to bring it back just a bit. I mean, if you look at the Slay category, 88 kills to 53. So on the side of Empyrean, they didn't fare so well in terms of Slays, but <laughs> when we get to a Slayer, there's a lot less to worry about, right? You just have to worry about getting the Slays. You don't have to worry about any objective or any forcing of, of, uh, of, of those objective points, and you can just worry about getting those kills. So maybe that will relieve a little bit of pressure on the side of Ascending Base. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. It's a, a lot more of a simpler game type, and when you're able to laser focus on getting those slaves so you can more importantly slow the game down stay alive where if you try to slow the game on Empyrean right phase is going to infiltrate your base and you're going to end up going three down multiple times but I will say on the flip side of that yeah how many times do we see ascending baseline go three down right if you do that against phase on Slayer you're getting cycled and it's gonna end up getting spectacular season very soon so I will say ascending baseline Start valuing your life. 100%. And, and we got to talk about it too. FaZe are one of the best Slayer teams in the league. That hasn't changed as time has gone on. So you've got everything against you. It's Slayer Aquarius coming up next. I mean, it's going to be very difficult for the side of Ascending Baseline. We heard FaZe talk about the fact that they were trying to adjust to the changes that were made to live fire. Obviously, Overshield turning into a camouflage. Right. Well, on Aquarius, we're back to an overshield, but that's a big change. Overshield over toward the P side is going to change how their strategies work. Would that throw a wrench in their plan, or is this going too well? I mean, Ascending Baseline are going to play really scrappy off the start. I think FaZe are going to play that disciplined play style and maybe allow them to make the first move. When you have, again, a lower-seeded team like Ascending Baseline, they will come out and just, just go crazy. They'll come out and bring that aggression. Of course, like you said, that overshield being down at P1, that's going to be the first point of contention for both of these teams. The one thing I'm thinking about is uh, your starting strat. The mm. starting strats on Aquarius, they're, they're not all that coordinated, at least now. It's, it's kind of yeah. like a four-man push right towards that bottom right. feet, right towards that overshield. It, it, does that work in favor of sending baseline? Because that first overshield is going to be important. You said they're the scrappier team. It depends on the damage done, and, and we saw in that last game, damage done, uh, you know, they weren't able to do that amount of damage. They weren't able to capitalize on damage. So 
I, I think it's going to be, we generally see play, players go towards that P1 side and rush that OS, but you, you tend to see some other strategies as well. A flank towards car side, getting that top center control real quick. We'll have to see what uh, what Ascending Baseline has up their sleeve for this one. I will say, I was happy to see Squall Lake kind of laughing and smiling right there. When you, when you think of the experience on the main stage here in Halo Infinite, as far as who has the most main stage experience, right. it's actually Squall Lake. So I wanted to be confident. I wanted to be laughing and say, you know what? It's okay. We lost that game when we got dominated, but now let's go into a game number two, as opposed to hanging your heads low and, and, and getting down on each other. So I will say, I kind of like that there was smiles and laughter and hey, it happens. Let's move on to game two. Yeah, and it'll bleed into the rest of your team, right? You, you, allow, you, you allow your team to see that you're having a good time. You're smiling again, main stage. The lights are the brightest. It is, it is very uh, high pressure right on that main stage. So sometimes a little bit of a laugh allow you to just relax and get into that next game. Forget the last one ever happened and make something, make something done. Aquarius Slayer is coming up next. We talked about the overshields. We also talked about those BRs over on each side. Those long range engagements yeah. are going to get really fun. Don't forget about that plasma pistol. I may be terrible with it, <laughs> but <too>. somehow <laughs> the bros make it look crazy. <laughs> right. The plasma pistol does now spawn over toward the car side to map plenty of the sandbox to work with. Slayer on Aquarius coming up next. I'm interested to see this starting shot for the side of Ascending Baseline and how phase are going to counter it again. I, I, I said it a couple of times, but it's very important. The, the amount of discipline that FaZe is, is, uh, is bringing into their game is so huge. And you talked about this battle rifle. The fact that you can have that battle rifle and the bandit kind of as a, a secondary is huge. Faze taking the starting track a bit slower than I expected. I guess we're not having a four-man push right over towards the overshield. In fact, they almost dared ascending baseline to grab a hold of it. They almost gave it to them for free, it felt like. And now we see a bit of map control in favor of FaZe, but Hotshot goes with that overshield right towards the mid-map where you want him to be. He has overshield, thrust, heat wave. He's a little greedy. He's got everything. And honestly, all of these all these items in his hand, he could really make a swing in this game. It is only two to three thus far, but again, the patience coming out of these teams is so, so important. That, is, that overshield is pretty much all but gone, and a great job by FaZe to counter it. Down to one shot, his opponent goes, but Hotshot Ghost is not able to stay alive, and now you lost every single resource, every single, single bit of the sandbox, and you give it to Frosty, who obviously he knows what to do with it. Running into a bit of a grenade. Renegade does have his back here. It's a two-man push, both out of phase and ascending baseline. And Frosty's taking nades left and right. Three down, go phase, ascending baseline. They take control. That was great by ascending baseline. They catch phase inside of their base. They capitalize on that damage. Very important for them to do that. And because of that, they take the lead by one here. It's eight to seven. Switch gears over towards Bird. Wants to make sure his blue base is clear, but you gotta watch your back as you're pushing forward because you know Renegade is coming in quick. And the same for Frosty as well, the same way FaZe just went three down. Now the tables turn and FaZe takes back that momentum right as Overshield's coming up. And that's with the setting baseline, having that first Overshield, having that Heat Wave and the Thrust as well. It's still a tie game here for the side of FaZe. Neo West coming up in five seconds. Snake, Snake by giving up that top peak control. Drop right down for that overshield, combining overshield and heat wave. We saw Ascending Baseline do it earlier, but now State Fighter Phase is gonna do it. Three members of AB over toward the car side. Drops down low, puts damage onto two different players, but Snake Bite ends up hitting the black screen. Burton now is gonna push up. Squale trades out his life, but Ascending Baseline take a 16 to 14 lead. I am very interested to hear how FaZe sound against a team like Ascending Baseline. Let's go into it, listen it. Yo, your event, your event. Let's kill this guy, kill this guy. Hey, stop crying. Yo, 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 yellow event. Watch out, watch out, watch out, blue dead end. Yellow event backed up. I'm, I'm gonna clock some yellow. One bottom mid, one bottom mid. Yellow P, you just hold them. Yo, three, they're backing up to yellow. Three of them, three. I got a lot of damage. Try to bully these guys. I'm going P1, I'm going P1. Yeah, I have him trapped in yellow. I'm hitting Jen, I'm hitting Jen. I have him trapped. There's still yellow too. Two yellow streams right now. I'm weak, John. Take it at you. Peter weak, Peter weak. Two hit. Oh, one hit pistol, one hit pistol, two hit pistol, one hit. Another one, another one. Can we get thrust? Aye, Sean. Last time we get thrust. Alright, yo, let him spawn up again. Let him spawn. Yo, I'm gonna go for this thrust time. Yo, I spawn yellow. No, you can get it if you want. You can get it if you want. Alright. Blue, blue shoes, blue shoes. Yeah, and blue too. 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 Blue too.
Okay, he's from, he's from blue. Fire, blue fire, blue fire. In closet, man, weak. One in fire, one in closet. Hey, hey, hey. Watch this out, bro. Two fire, weak, two fire, weak. Heavy stack there. Fire, someone hit. I got one. We hit this, we hit this. Call it, yeah, two. So one fire. They're literally all one hit. They're literally one hit. I got it, I got it. Hey, closet, closet, closet. He's weak, John. I'm gonna leave him. 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 I'm gonna Watch out, yellow two guys, follow. Going window. Yellow peak, yellow peak, yellow peak. Yellow Peter, yellow Peter, yellow Peter. Nice fucking play. Keep it going. I'm looking for the ammo up now, guys. Thrust us up now. Yellow inside bottom. I'm looking for the base. One is the base. One is one is one. No one trail. No one trail. Yellow weak. Yellow power. Yo, John, I'm cutting off. What yellow? Yellow engine. You can switch it. You can switch it. You heard the intensity. But you also heard very clear and direct cons. They're talking to each other, not random call-outs because of that. Almost a double-digit lead right now. FaZe really started to take a full advantage here towards the mid-game, going to their closeout and ascending baseline, just like we saw before there. They're struggling to find some kind of momentum in their kills. Yeah, honestly, I gotta talk about the communication, right? Small talk is so important. Having that conversation that you mentioned, being able to let each other know, you know, I'm pushing behind you, I've got your back, give this space up, you heard that. I mean, that's so important for the success of FaZe. 36 to 28 leads, still in favor of FaZe at the moment. Frosty takes down one, gets two more to one shot, so maximum damage efficiency coming out of him. And you see Renegade, he's just going to capitalize on it. The moment that oh. damage comes in is the moment they're going to take advantage of it. And let me see, I'm seeing some tea bags here. Something <laughs> tells me it's by Tommy. He don't like that flavor. <laughs> I don't think he does either. Renegade making a statement. And so are FaZe, a 10 kill lead for them. A stick comes out as well, almost gets the second, but a beautiful job by FaZe. Four down for ascending baseline once again. And the moment they go down is the moment FaZe are going to continue to look for those spawns. And he just stick his, yeah, oh, oh. my, your state <laughs> fight just, he just do a nade check instead of the enemy spawning there, his teammate did, oh my gosh. <laughs> Got to be careful of the spawns. 43 to 34 though, FaZe still with a comfortable lead here. You constantly see the wolf pack coming out of ascending baseline, but you talked about it. The damage is just not enough. Still, 1v1s being won by FaZe, even though a triple push it comes out from B-side. 45-36, it's technically not over just yet. You know, you always say, perfect Halo is what's needed right now, at least if you're ascending baseline. And World 2 just got behind enemy lines, takes down Burn, shows a little bit of the skill jump, a little bit of the fancy movement, but Hot Shot goes, going to stop him real quick. And you only need four more to space. Yeah, setting baseline has the overshot, but as you can see, completely destroyed is that OS. And FaZe only need two here. And they'll get that first one. No long question who's gonna win this game now, but who's gonna get the final kill? World two, add another one to your amazing score line. 13 kills out of him, but Renegade once again. Showing off on the stat line, 29 kills to lead all slays in game number one, and that one, 16 to his name. I mean, Renegade is having a phenomenal term. I think he's only gotten better, and you know, under under the the wing of Snakebite and, and team, I think his discipline has gotten phenomenal. And honestly, you need a player like Snakebite to to reel you back when you're that confident in yourself and you're that individually skilled. It's really hard to not be that aggressive, but a lot of discipline in this game now, and that's a scary combination. And one thing I was noticed when watching a lot of snake bite streams is he's running a lot of duo Q, running a lot with Renegade. I feel like they want to just add that extra chemistry going into this tournament, going into this season. And I believe that's paying off really well for this new duo. Renegade, again, 16 kills, only died eight times. 9.3 KDA out of him. Quite impressive from Renegade, the main slayer. Reparation is key even when you're the best in the world. And we talked about this in the green room, Tony, being the absolute best, you've got everyone gunning at you, right? It's so difficult to keep that number one spot and phase come here, they come prepared, and that's all that matters. Yeah, I know it's tough sitting on top. You know, I am one of the best players in the game, but I, yeah, I've, I I've, I've, des that. I've decided to give everybody a chance okay. and pick up is? commentary and also analytical work. Smart. So this way, I, I don't want to embarrass phase. I love phase. Right, I right. Yeah. Base, I don't, I, it yeah, makes sense. It, it's tough on top, it really is. I, I, can, I can understand that. Uh, definitely, but uh, well, hopefully that translates to our matchmaking games come next week. We'll have to see, but regardless, it's FaZe. They're not playing any matchmaking. They're playing on LAN, our first Bandit LAN tournament, and honestly, I absolutely love this, right? 
The crazy thing is with the battle rifle, those first four shots are the more difficult, or first three shots, I'm sorry, are the more difficult ones, right? The last shot with the battle rifle was the most, was the easiest to hit because you just swipe across, one of the bullets hits, that's it. With the bandit, that last shot is the most difficult to hit. And that's where you see those turnaround kills, the kills where a player has no shields, a reversal, so to speak. So very, very entertaining, in my opinion, here coming into this new season. And there's one player that I thought was really going to benefit from Bandit's single fire weapon. It's gonna be Squale. How many times during that season one and season two did he end games with 65% accuracy, 70% accuracy? And that's with a battle rifle. So going into the Bandit, he was already one of the most accurate players in the game. Shout out Eli the Sensei for that one, but <laughs> I thought going into this season, he would really benefit from that bandit change. I guess we're going to find out because Phase, you already 3 0 Quadrant. Yeah. Are you about to 3 0 with sending baseline? That would be huge. It's a, it's a potential, right? They came out swinging, and, you know, the desk talked about it as well. Phase generally starting tournaments a little weaker, right? And it's not, not that they're... This weekend. Right, it's not that they're not capable. It's just that they decide when to flip that switch. They decided to flip that switch a little bit early, so be careful for that electric bill, Tony. <laughs> We're seeing Frosty on screen. He's been having one heck of a tournament. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking back to that Imperium game. A killing frenzy on any, right. on any professional team. It's... it's almost unheard of but yeah. the way they were able to dominate that sword side control when normally you know back in previous halos we talked about always pushing down long haul pushing down green my matchmaking teammates always yelling at me because I, I like going to sword and training side <laughs> once in a while too no get over there but the way they were able to hold on that sword and training side it worked out well at least for one or two of those caps yeah it's a really difficult place to be and you can see here with the k uh, the, the the phase duo that we're talking about right it's snake bite with renegade it just goes to show i mean that practice Practice in matchmaking really pays off, and it, and it has this entire day so far. The duo, Renegade and Snake Bite on the map, they're going to be a tough one to deal with. And when you have Royal 2 watching over you, you already know you have a recipe for success. So far, 5 0 oh in this tournament phase, starting off when everybody talked about how they don't start off too hot. <laughs> We're going into a bit, I believe, a stronghold on live fire. It's going to get live and it's going to be fire. I promise you that. We we'll always remind you. You got that sniper over toward the top mid side. Now a quantum translocator on the map. We saw a little bit of that in season two. Yeah. Now we're seeing it here on live fire. It's become one of the one of my favorite equipment to not only use, but also to watch. Because these pros, they take it up a whole nother level. Live fire. Potentially the final game phase ascending baseline. Yeah, we got to talk about that QT, right? The Quantum Translocator at the back of green, I think, is the best spot it's ever been in. And you're able to apply the pressure across map, but then QT back to safety. It's a beautiful place for that to be. So a shout out to the Pro Insights team for that change and all the other changes, of course. But here we go, hopping into game three. Don't forget. No longer having the overshield on the map. Now it's camouflage coming on a bit of a delay. So both teams will have to fight for any semblance of map control before they're able to move forward. Squale with the double kill off screen still ends up with a three down for ascending baseline. Phase taking a bit more map control, but taking a bit more presence and ascending baseline. They're going for a CA setup. Interesting, yeah, you gotta get that set up first and then kind of rotate into the more comfortable setup on to B and you'll see that potentially do that, but that camo comes up right now. Hot shot goes, no, he has to clear out his Ooh. backside before he's able to play for the camo, but can't quite find the kill. And with that, phase take over, snake fight, steals away the camo. He's already dangerous without it. Now he's just a sneaky snake. That was a beautiful flick right there. You see he was kind of just holding his, his aimer forward, right? He didn't want to make any left to right movements because it shows the camo. Flicks to the target, gets the body shot and the kill. Snake by wants to make his way over towards the mid-side. They already have Alpha and Bravo right now. They want to put down damage. Spytomic showed what he can do with the sniper earlier. He's going to steal that away from Snake Bite. And Renegade is going to chase away players. Has to get out of dodge with that Quantum Translocator. And Frost is going to pick up exactly where he left off. Yeah, I talked about the pressure that that QT causes, right? Renegade able to get a little bit of C, put pressure on the C. Then QT back towards B. But they were ready for it. Was ascending baseline. Early lead back in favor of sending baseline, but you see that Frosty go 
goes right after Charlie. Alpha Bravo setup. Enemy here for four. phase. And we see Frosty, he's not just happy with it. He wants to push up, take over that Ness Sives Wale. Trying to dodge the green gun. It connects. Multiple going down for ascending baseline. Only one for phase. That's a huge trade off because of that. It's still Bravo. Yeah, and it was all because of that uh, plasma pistol, right? You're allowed to kind of pl pl play patient with it, make sure you hit that shot, get the cleanup, and now a triple cap for phase. Ascending baseline have to answer soon. The flyers coming up in 23 seconds. Ascending baseline gonna work from Alpha. But what's their what's their twist? Did they go after Bravo? Did they go after Camel? Did they try to do both? Well, as of right now, you're not doing either because it looks like Phase infiltrate Alpha immediately. Back to a two cap setup for them. They're gonna push over towards Bravo, but it said the baseline was so close to taking it. <laughs> It's contested, but it'll be ascending baseline till now. Now they've got a two cap. They've got some points that are adding up here. 52 points though for FaZe and another camo once again for FaZe as well. Maybe a 52 to 23 lead in favor of FaZe, but ascending baseline are quickly putting points on the board. FaZe attack Bravo while Frosty clears out the bottom mid side. Skill jump right towards the top mid and clears out ascending baseline with the quickness. That means Bravo will change hands back to them and ascending baseline are spawning Enemy over towards the base AO. Cool. I love the aggression here by Frosty, right? A couple of seconds left on this camo, picks up the sniper, looking for an opportunity here to get this top tower control. We talked about how important top tower is and Frosty immediately going towards that as still it's phase with a double cap. Over toward the bottom tower side, Hotshot Ghost. He's juking without even knowing where Frosty's at at the <laughs> moment. Down to one shot. He will be chased down. The communication looking good, but Hotshot Ghost somehow do dodging a lot of damage there, but eventually three down, no ascending baseline. And this lead now starting to grow here for FaZe. Trip cap is in, and triple digits is the score for FaZe. Yeah, this just shows how individually talented a team like FaZe is. You see how scattered they are, right? They're players that are holding all sides of the map and it's ascending baseline trying to find a pick on a singular player but you gotta take out frosty who's got the sniper inside a nest snipes doing the hands of frosty no spytomic is here taking it spytomic using the environment to block that line of sight but too quickly end up going down for a b and phase they take back control for only a moment ascending baseline had the tower side control now phase are right in there yeah they just constantly keep going three dead as ascending baseline this is a bit scary though potentially get the, they get that spawn onto a but they've got to fight through it once again you see how quickly phase are pressuring the map that's one of the things that's been a problem for ascending baseline they go multiple down, they come off a spawn. Like you said, FaZe are quickly in their face, making them uncomfortable. Oh. Ascending baseline have no room to breathe. They have no space to work with. Because the moment they push up on the map, World 2 is there with a double kill and doing damage onto the third. Bravo Charlie still being held by FaZe. 181 to 33. This is a blowout. Let's talk about the general here. It's Snake by 12 and, th and 3 with 6 assists. Tony, I know you like that stat line. Oh, you already know, I love the assist. I'm like John Stockton, I'm giving, uh, giving dimes. <laughs> Renegade working over toward the power-up. Burton tries to challenge Snake by Snake by barely taking any damage, winning that gunfight, taking away Alpha, and Bravo stopped just short. Spytomic oh. makes his way out, but gets perfected by Snake by. There's still one more, nope. The reset comes in, another triple cap, and we're getting dangerously close to that 250 point mark. Ascending baseline after attack, two bases off the of spawn at the same time, and as of right now, they ain't getting much. Triple cap, going to be stopped short here, still phase with the points adding up, but I gotta talk about that peak shot that we saw from Snakebite, right? So strong on land, your ability to continue to peek out, shoot, go back into cover. The bandit makes that really, really easy. Ascending baseline, one last push over towards Bravo Squale by himself at the moment, but some cover fire coming from the players are coming off the spawn towards Sandbags, still not enough, and that's the way the cookie crumbles. It's been like that all game long. They actually really all series long phase. They're about done with this one. They have gone six and oh to wow. start off pools. That is absolutely incredible. And again, it shows their preparation. I absolutely love the fact that they come in strong here at this tournament, especially winning worlds. You've got to make a statement and they've done it so far today. Yeah, when you when you win a world championship, when you're that number one seed, sometimes you just put a target on your back. Everybody right. wants to be the best. You know, you got to beat the best. Everybody wants to use you as a stepping stone on their way to becoming a better team. But 
these players right there, they, they welcome the challenge. They, they, they won it, and they do well with it. 6-0, and again, to start off pools. They're undefeated. I love it. I absolutely love them starting this tournament that way. And like you said, that target on their back is large. Everyone gunning for that. We talk about those top three teams so often. So many team changes made to take out FaZe, to take out the world champs. We'll, we'll come to see if those changes are going to allow that de defeat for FaZe to happen. It's going to be real difficult. When watching that series, obviously it's only three games, so not much to work with. Right. But was there a player that stood out to you? Was there two? Like, what What exactly did you draw from this that said, that this is why FaZe are the most dangerous. This is why yep. FaZe are the favorites to win the tournament here. Versatility is the word I have to use, right? Their ability to all play with those power weapons, to all hold that sniper and just do what needs to be done. I talked to Snakebite, right? And he told me, there is no IGL. There, there is, there, everyone does what they need to do. Everyone play calls when they need to. It's a versatile team and it's your world champs, of course. A little bit of discussion coming in for the long time duo snake by the world too. It's funny, they just won that 3-0. They're probably still conversating. Oh, yeah. Become, but better. That one mistake that happened during one of the maps that really didn't mean much towards the outcome of the series. They're probably talking about that right now. Or maybe they're hungry. Maybe they're talking a little bit of dinner. I, I'm not sure. I, either way, I want to know what they're thinking. So you know what? Why don't we toss it over to Blaze on the main stage and find out what's going through their minds? Thank you so much, Tony and Active, for the cast. Texas, show some love to FaZe as they stay perfect today. 6-0 Renegade. How did you guys get this one done up against these guys? Uh, I mean, we're playing against these guys. You know, it's the land. They're not really known for land, so we came out hot and uh, we got the 3-0. Got the 3-0, okay. Now, as today has been a hot day, you know, 6-0 to kick it off, but earlier, I got a chance to give you your first ring and drop the banner down. How was that for you um, to, to have that moment in your career? Uh, that was amazing. That was the first, like, ring ceremony I've ever been a part of. I mean, I'm grateful for having the ring. I'm grateful for Halo, you know, giving us it and the opportunity to play for it, so thank you. There you go. And I know with this phase roster, you know, when they brought you onto the team, that was the goal, right? Yeah. To be champions again. And that's exactly what you guys got done. But now it's a new year. We got DMR start. Some of the maps are switched up. What's the goal this year? The goal is the, to win every single event this year and get the six beat. There you go and get the six beat. I ain't never seen a six beat in a long time. Only in gears I've seen six beats. But what do you want to say to these fans out here that's been supporting phase, you know, all throughout the day and at home? Uh, thank you guys for tuning in, for supporting us. Uh, we're going to come back tomorrow and Sunday even stronger, so uh, stay tuned. You heard it here from Renegade. Show some love to FaZe. And Lot, take us away. Thank you so much, Blaze, and congratulations to FaZe. A stellar job on that main stage today. A really, really clean pool play day one from them. And honestly, I think that's really set the tone for this team. I think a lot of the times we've seen FaZe kind of come in a little bit clumsy, uh, definitely not lacking skill, but maybe lacking a little bit of kind of zhuzh or just being awake at the right time. And that is not the FaZe we're seeing this time around going into this season. What a start FaZe have had, Clutch. Yeah, it looks like Frosty was on, on the money as far as getting their feet on the ground in that first series and now they've started to run and that was a dominant showing obviously it, the benefits of having the one seed in the tournament as well you're playing a little against a little bit less competition than maybe the, the two and the three seeds have in store for us later on uh, but phase taking care of business nonetheless and I'm looking forward to seeing what renegade and the company bring as Saturday comes around. Indeed, I really did feel like this last series that we saw there was a showcase of skill, talent, fun at times, um, but also being able to be versatile. You know, Tim and Tony talked about that versatility of this team. That's exactly what comes to mind when you think of them. And Walsh, what are you looking out for right now as this roster heads into tomorrow? Well, one thing I took away from, from Renegade there is he didn't just focus on this weekend. He's right. like, we are looking in the long run. We are looking for a six beat this season. So that shows how much confidence he has in this current roster and how well they're playing, that they're not as shaky just about this weekend. So one, huge amount of confidence in him and his team. But secondly, as we looked at that last match, it's just a, just a difference in, you know, those small little differences that each little play they make adds up to these score lines. You see a 3-0 in, in pit flag, you see a 250 to 33 on Stronghold's live fire. And that's because if you look at any single moment in time there, the members on phase, they're getting that extra shot or two of damage. They're staying alive that extra second or two. 
they're there to help their teammates just that little bit quicker. And that just snowballs into this massive lead that you can't overcome. It really does indeed. And I've got to say, in terms of the presence on the map, that was definitely felt, you know, by ascending baseline. They were really struggling to get anything going. Uh, FaZe just holding down the fort. And I think a prime example of that was honestly in map one, we saw Frosty just taking over terminal, taking over sword. It was his with the sniper rifle, literally just holding down their top sniper, watching over their base as well, and just letting it rip. The amount of snipes that happened with Frosty there was insane. And Clutch, when you look at moments like that where you see Frosty anchoring for his team, something is going very, very right for FaZe. Everything was going right for FaZe in this series. And if you took a look at the stats, I'm not sure we'll be able to pull them up, but Snakebite having an absolute dominant Friday is a great sign for them. Not traditionally your main slayer for this squad, but has been a great main slayer across his best Halo and uh, several other titles, but this squad is more of the support objective player. He came out in main slate today. I believe he has the best kill death ratio on the team for the day as well. So big shout out to him. We'll see if it continues against the top teams or if he's kind of flexed into more of that support objective role. Yeah, indeed. I've got to say uh, it lights out showmanship from all of the players on phase. Something that you want to see phase carry into tomorrow that you were really impressed with today? I mean, not really. That, that's tough to say. Oh. Like, they are just putting up insane numbers. They're playing Damn. well. It doesn't feel <laughs> like they're they're overextending or taking this differently compared to other teams. Yes, they might play a little bit different once they play against some other higher-end rosters, but end of the day, like, they're not over-challenging. They're holding down smart spots and just letting the work do itself. And maybe just, you know, KDs like that as well. You know, all yeah, of 2.04 kind of yeah. helps a little bit. You well, know? when you look at that, what sticks out to me is the 24 deaths compared to 33, 33, 32. Usually Snakebite is that, like, player First on phase that's almost creating space alongside Renegade. He's usually one of the higher in the deaths column. So for him to be able to slow it down, find his comfortability, maybe it's a switch to the bandit start as well. Playing a little bit slower seems to have benefited him greatly. 49 and 24 is a dominant series. Very, very dominant performance from FaZe going into day one. Day two, we'll find out what's in store for them later on. But on the other side of things, we actually do have some highlights from a game previously on one of our side stations as well. We had Space Station taking on Native Gaming. That ended in a 3-0. and oh. And quite frankly, I think with Native Gaming, this one was going to be a dread for them, right? After that Foe series, it just wasn't the team that they needed to bounce back with. This was a tough, tough match for them. And Wes, when you're looking upon some of these highlights here, we're looking at this, you know, interesting Slayer coming off of Recharge Space Station, just really rolling away with things. Yeah, Space Station, no surprise, taking care of business, especially after Native Gaming losing that series against Foe. You got to be extremely concerned about what is in store for this roster the rest of the weekend on the side of Native because, I mean, they have just showed no real signs of promise or, or the fact that they're going to get it together and make a run. I mean, those guys are veterans. They've been through several runs in different situations, different teams, but this team right here worries me. They need to find some kind of break in that open team. They need to be bad. Yeah, and you have to wonder, is it better for them in pools or is it better for them in open to I get thought those, it would be open. To get the, that, you know, those, those jitters out to figure out that on land chemistry, but you know, they've, they've already lost the two very important matches there in pool play. Now they're going to be fighting for that third spot place in pool play just to keep their, their run alive. Indeed, I, you know, got a question, uh, the opportunity that was given to these guys, uh, you know, coming in for business and taking their pool play spot. It was a huge opportunity for this team to not have to battle through open bracket. And I've got to say, a really disappointing result so far from Native Gaming. It's not over for them yet. They do have an open bracket team joining that pool. So hopefully they can get things together tonight, VOD review maybe, go over some of the mistakes and try and get those, you know, sorted out by tomorrow. But also a huge testament to the teams inside their pool, especially Foe. You think about in the past years of Halo, it used, you know, Quadrant kind of brought Europe to this whole new level. And now we're seeing, you know, a squad like Foe being like, guess what? It's not just yeah. Quadrant. This whole, this whole country over here, this whole continent can hang. Yeah, they certainly can. I want to hold the phone there. I don't think Native Gaming is a great team right now. I don't think they've showed any promise. I'm not sold on Quadrant or Foe yet. We'll wait until we see them play the likes of a Complexity or a Shopify to see if they really can still be a representation inside the top six. I'm not convinced. Well, something we won't have to wait much longer for is seeing your hometown team perform on that main stage because up next, we have Optic Gaming versus Bittersweet. We have the Optic boys getting ready to go. We have the Optic crowd in the arena. It is going to be an electric match. We'll see you guys on the other side of this break.
This is the world's most advanced processor. In entertainment, its rendering speeds render other processors obsolete. It drives the future of autonomous driving. Powers cloud services for billions. Helps change the course of climate change. Connects communities of gamers anytime, anywhere. And uses AI to accelerate disease detection and cures. We make the world's most advanced processors. But only with your vision can we advance the world. AMD, together we advance. Hey, guess what? New year means a new optic scuff design for a new controller. Check out this sexy design. It's a nod to the original OG logo and a great way to rep the green wall. Choose between the Reflex for PS5, the Instinct for Xbox, and the brand new Envision for PC gaming. Guess what? Scuff saw your comments and they're now selling the faceplates separately for the Envision and the Instinct for $29.99. Sorry, I'm kind of busy. Mm, kind of not. Leave a message. Yeah, the mega rev boys here, cinnamon. Flow tastes sweet like cinnamon. Open up doors, I'm a gentleman. View top floor, I'm still staying ahead of them. Running on fumes and adrenaline. Do what I do best. Huh? Can't rush in like a roulette. Huh? You can't name a better duet. Huh? Don't ask questions. Trying to figure out what sound. Don't worry about what next. Just know we got now. CS 2024 Kickoff Arlington Major is presented by AMD, Scuff, and Corduroys. Hello folks and welcome back to the HCS Kickoff Major in Arlington, Texas, hosted by Optic Gaming. And as you can see, Esports Stadium Arlington is looking beautifully green. And that is for one reason. Optic Gaming, they're on the main stage. Our first look at this illustrious team. And I'm really excited to be up here talking about it alongside, we got Active. Hello, Active. Hello. First time on the desk with me this major. And we've, of course, got Tony. Fantastic cast, by the way, boys. Thank Loved you. every second of that. Thank Absolutely you. exceptional. But we do have a match to set up now, which is going to be Optic Gaming going up against Bittersweet. 
Japan. I cannot wait to talk about this Optic roster because there's been a couple of changes that have come through for them, and I have a lot of questions surrounding it. So let's take a look at you know what's been happening today. We've had an incredible schedule, and we do have that main stage match. So let's see what's coming our way for the rest of today. We've had, of course, FaZe on the main stage twice so far in our World Champions. They have dominated Sentinels. They did get upset by Shopify Rebellion 3-1. And up next, Optic versus Bittersweet, Space Station versus Foe, and then Complexity versus Optic Gaming to round off the night. And then coming in with some of the results from Pool Play, because I'm just getting way too excited about this matchup that we've got coming up. But our Pool Play results have been very interesting, actually, especially in the uh, pool with Space Station Gaming in Pool B. We've seen Space Station take Native Gaming a full sweep for them. And Foe, they did manage to also get the better of native gaming. So Foe currently second in their pool. And Tim, that's exceptional for Europe, especially coming in with the history that this team have had, the changes that have been made in the offseason, and they're looking pretty damn good. Yeah, I mean, Jimbo, he talked about it. It's been a tumultuous, uh, you know, a turn of events for him as the offseason has gone on. And honestly, they've come out strong. And, and, and you know, Wutum's my player. He has been phenomenal this event so far. I can't wait to see what he does coming up. I know you love the mouse and keyboard Absolutely. players, Tim. I know you're one of them, and that's okay. I'm, I'm, so, I'm you know, I'm standing strong with you. Appreciate you know, that. Keyboard and mouse, okay, I'm here for it. Uh, and Tony, you know, looking across the pools here, any kind of shockers apart from what's happened in Pool B, but are you expecting anything else from, uh, from these pools today? You know, I don't know if I would say I was shocked, but I will say, you know, Shopify Rebellion yes. coming out with that win over Sentinels. I did call, I did say it was going to be a tough matchup. I knew a lot of people at home were giving Sentinels the immediately win, immediate win on that, but I knew it was going to be closer than people thought. And in fact, Shopify come out with a huge win on them. So I, I'm not going to say I'm shocked, but I'm sure they shocked a lot of people at home. I certainly think they shocked <laughs> an awful lot of people. And I just think it was the way that they managed to build momentum on that series and push all the way through for, honestly, an exception last game that they had against Sentinels. So big stuff coming out of Shopify Rebellion and hopefully Sentinels can make things up and get that second place in their pool heading into tomorrow. But back to the action because I was getting way ahead of myself. I was getting way too excited <laughs> about seeing Optic Gaming for the first time on their main stage. You know, obviously the tournament hosted by Optic Gaming. I'm just, you know, I'm happy to be here, folks. Very happy to be here. But Optic Gaming starting out strong with these guys and a big change in the win for them. Now, Tim, my big question for you right now is Dead Zone coming in for APG. Is it too early to tell if this is working? Is it too early to tell if this is an upgrade? I think it is too soon to tell. I think them coming in as the fifth seed, you do replace APG with a player in dead zone with similar accolades, but you know, honestly, it's gonna take time to get comfortable, obviously, for the side of dead zone. I did listen to the uh, the Optic Eavesdrop podcast and Dead Zone gave a, little bit, gave a little bit of insight on his name change, and honestly, he said that he's shedding the old him and getting into a new him, a new mentality. You know, going, he's been going to the gym, he's been working on himself, so I think, you know, over time, I think this roster is going to be extremely strong. You know, it's funny, I, th I think... I think what you started off with saying that, you know, it, it may be too soon to tell. Honestly, it, it may be a little too soon to tell, but I want to go on the limb. I'm going to say, I know you agree that you say they're going to get better over time. But I'm going to say we're going to see immediate success. I'm a big believer in the artist formerly known as Penguin now going in by Dead Zone because I know for a fact they brought him onto this team not really to... to for the stats, not really to be that main slayer, but to fill a role that won them a world championship. You know, objective-minded player, but can also slay out and help them in the slayer. So it, it, maybe it's too soon to tell, but you know, I like my hot takes. <laughs> I know, I do, I do love the hot takes as well. I, I think right now, anybody could be right. You know, we don't really know exactly how it's going to translate fully on land, but we're going to have a very, very good idea very shortly. I do think, though, in terms of Penguin coming on, excuse me, Dead Zone, formerly Penguin coming on, that's going to take a while to click, by the way, folks at home. She's going to have to bear with us. That's going to take a little bit of time. But Dead Zone coming on board, I do think he's capable of making better game-changing plays. I do think I will be seeing that with Optic Gaming, the game-changing plays from Dead Zone that we saw previously on SSG, and I think that's going to make a huge difference difference to this roster. And I think with Optic Gaming, they need a bit of time. They, they need reps. I think that's the most important thing, looking at Optic and likes of SSG coming on later on. They need some reps under their belt. And this first land, this first major is the best time to do it, Tim. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, Dead Zone talked about it as well. You know, with Bandit starts now, he, he was definitely a decorated player in Halo 5, bringing his skill here to Halo Infinite. He talks about the fact that he wins a lot of fights he's not supposed to win, but he also wins every fight he's supposed to win. 
win. So, you know, great confidence coming out of him and with the new mentality, I think he's going to be phenomenal this season. This event, we'll, we'll have to see. Indeed. Now, on the other side of the stage, though, dressed lovely in purple is bittersweet. The question is, will it be bittersweet? Are we going to be seeing a really good series from these guys? Are we going to be seeing a win against the hometown team? That is the question. And Active, will bittersweet be looking for success here in this series? Or do they want to get some confidence heading into the rest of the major? I mean, you got Optic's first match here. We talked about them maybe being a little uncomfortable coming in as that fifth seed. So. If there's any chance at all for Bittersweet to come in here swinging, it's right now, right? You, you've got very aggressive, individually skilled players in your team. Take advantage of that and, and try to get Optic when they're down. Indeed, that is going to be what happens. The mistakes that are being made, pick up on them, capitalize. Tony, for the side of Bittersweet, who are you looking out for? Who's going to be a game changer, do you think, on this roster? Well, it's funny because one, one reason why I love this bittersweet roster so much, I know there's a lot of players that people at home maybe have not heard of so much, you know, welcoming back Cherish to the main stage, but he was dropped by, you know, for Sab last year going into Wolves. There's one player that I know is a dynamic one that people are maybe just starting to get a hold of now. I was looking at him in previous seasons, and that's, that's breaking shot, man. The, Breaking shot is the real deal. And in fact, the last time they went head to head with, uh, against Lucid and Optic, he was showing off and showing out. I do want to temper it by saying they did ultimately lose the series, but tied with the most slays alongside Lucid, having the highest KD in the lobby, that's something that you can build off of and yes. that ultimately that this team can really lean on. If you have a player like Breaking Shot, Maybe just maybe anything's possible. You have a puncher's chance. Without question. And Tony, when you look at a, a player like Breaking Shot, you see what he's capable of doing. I mean, we saw the stats there. Uh, going alongside one of the world's greatest, which is Lucid. You know, what do the rest of the team now have to do to evolve around a player like him to be able to take what he is doing, the damage he's, he's dealing, and the openings he's giving his team, and really actually start to execute on those? Well, I love the fact that you use the word openings. That's what a player like Breaking Shot creates. It creates openings for your team. and that when, when that happens, I lean on my coach. I lean on my small talk because the moment that breaking shot puts one player down and puts two players weak, there needs to be communication. There needs to be a follow-up with that immediately. And that starts with the small talk, not just calling out locations, calling out when the timing is right for your team to collapse or sometimes when you have to pull out because, you know, your entry frag didn't do enough. Well, I'll tell you what, Optic Gaming, they need a hot start here in this major. I think they need to prove why the change was made and solidify themselves as a team in this major, especially in front of their hometown crowd. And then Bittersweet, they need to cool that off. They need to get the icebox out and make sure the fire doesn't start to catch on that main stage. <laughs> Folks, let's meet your teams. everybody and it's the first time we get to see the hometown favorite of course optic gaming on our main stage here in arlington a lot to talk about obviously a lot of discussion a lot of moves we know all about it but we get to talk about it now before we get into this series andy optic gaming make the move in the off season dead zone enters apg leaves and now we get to see how it works out for them as we get through this weekend you know, let's not forget the last time we were in an opener it was optic gaming that was getting the rings on the main stage how different things are now, how much can change in just one year's time. Optic Gaming now on the back foot in the Halo Championship Series, coming in not only 
failing to take last year's World Championship. Also coming in here with the fifth seed with their new addition. So a lot of question marks, of course, around this Optic Gaming team, but they would love nothing more than to silence the critics, put the rumors to rest, and to take a big win here on the main stage in front of a hometown crowd. Yeah, a lot of discussion considering that we haven't even had a game yet, right, for Optic Gaming. I think that's something just to keep in mind. Yeah, we've had some build-up and online tournaments, but this is where things start for real, and we're yet to see Optic Gaming even play in the LAN environment on that main stage. And the team they're going up against as we take a look at our series layout is going to be bittersweet. And this is a group of players who, if they put in a performance here, maybe our names are going to be talking about as we walk through the season a little bit further. Yeah, we'll keep a very close eye on exactly how they play here, of course. Those four, no stranger to high-level competitive Halo, but the Green Wall, they're out to reclaim the throne. They've put together this roster, of course, and as we talked about in the show open, any changes that took place over the past four months were done with one purpose, to take down FaZe and to take a World Championship. We'll have to see how they look at their first look here on the main stage. And of course, all eyes are going to be on Dead Zone, right? Because he's the new player, he's the new face, but I kind of want to take the attention away from him in the conversation a little bit because this is a team of four players who should have enough kind of history, ability, that it doesn't fall on the shoulders of one player, right? It's everybody who has to perform for Optic Gaming, and they have. Everyone forgets very quickly, like, their performances throughout the season, right? They, they were almost there in the Halo World Championships. They were almost there every single tournament if they weren't winning it. They just try and look to raise that bar a little bit higher, add that extra level of consistency, and maybe this is going to be the season where everybody's looking at Optic after Sunday and saying, hey, they're the team to beat. Exactly. They know how what it feels like to be the team to beat, right? They know what it feels like to be the most talked about team. Lucid especially knows what it feels like to be the best player in the world in terms of how the community feels. And I think Optic Gaming has the Let's Go Optic chant already erupts in the room. They're looking to get back into that place, not just in terms of placing, but even mentally as well, right? You have to think Optic Gaming, a lot of ups and downs over the final events of the year last year. Instead, you see smiles on Trippy's face. They're going to look to make it a very different 2024. They certainly are indeed. And I, I kind of respect the fact that they felt they needed something new and they went for something new, right? We've heard about it from, uh, from Dead Zone himself. We've heard about that move. But I want to talk about the other side of the stage a little bit, right? Because we know what everyone's looking at for Optic Gaming. But when you're looking at the other side for Bittersweet, you got Breaking Shot, Cherish, Mortally, Piggy. I mentioned how these are names, how who have kind of floated about some big series, you know, have had some strong performances, maybe in some online tournaments, some some clips that you will remember if you've been watching them in the build-up. But this group of four, I really like how they come together. I think there's a really good mix of not only ability, but I think just play style as well. I think they mesh together very nicely, and I think this is going to be... I would, I'm not going to oversell this as, a, you know, a, a series which is going to be a competitive one where they're going to run away with it, but I do think they can cause Optic some problems in some of these games if Optic aren't on top of it. Yeah. Yeah, it's a really big opportunity for them, because keep in mind, this is the first time this Optic Gaming roster is playing together on LAN. Let's not forget that. You have to think this team playing really with nothing to lose in a match like this. Yeah, and I think this is a potentially a group of players who could be next up, so to speak. You know, you put that in inverted commas when it comes to the Halo Championship Series. So keep your eyes on these players, see what they do in this series, see how they perform against some of the best in the world, and hey, maybe they're going to be in the shop window come the, uh, come the next event themselves. Yeah, it's a similar conversation to what we said about FaZe earlier, right? FaZe really needed to start this tournament just feeling like, okay, we're, we're letting the nerve settle we're feeling good face of course winning their first series that we saw earlier three to zero now optic gaming gonna be looking to do the same thing essentially making sure that it's a well-oiled machine everything they expect to be firing is firing correctly and they also want to exit here three oh let's not forget if this is a three one or a three two for them it's a pretty different result a different feeling i will say the new optic jersey is looking extremely clean, clean on the main stage as well and there is the new man there is the new pickup and boy will we, he wants to even in the first play that he makes on this main stage want to make an impact because i would say if you're making Making your debut as a new player, there's no better place to do it than your own event, right? Here sure, in Arlington yeah. with the hometown fans in front of you. You know, one big play and everyone loves Dead Zone. <laughs> it's as simple as that. And that breeds confidence for him going through the tournament. It really will. And I think uh, it's only going to build more and more. We already know just how confident Zane is and how talented he is. And to think now under the Optic banner, what this presents to him, right? It's a really a different stage in his career because I think we've always respected Dead Zone for what he's done over the years, of course, during the Penguin era, as we'll call it. However, <laughs> now an opportunity to even write a whole new chapter in his career under the Optic banner. It starts here in game number one. Well, I will say Optic Gaming, name changes. Hey, Lucid knows that it works pretty well if you get it right. And for Dead Zone, he's going to be hoping to recreate that kind of success on the new lineup as we jump into our first game of the series. We've got a little bit of Oddball to play on streets. See what he can do here off the rip. Some early damage here, and of course, Looking forward to seeing what this man could do as unexpected, excuse me, as expected, all eyes on him throughout the entire weekend. It all starts now 
Early grab on the ball as well. One thing you can guarantee is that Dead Zone never afraid to pick up that old ball, do that objective work. He will fill in any role that is required for Optic Gaming to have success. Breaking shot gonna get a little kill here as Dead Zone tries to just put his foot on the gas for a second, but it is gonna be the camo actually going over to Bittersweet, and this is their opportunity now Enemy to make a play. Ball. Ball. Giving up the trip here now. Able to spot up the camo. Needs to be careful here in this 1v1. This would be big. It gets taken down. It's a nice job by Bittersweet to eliminate the last two there. That's two dead. About to maybe be three. Last player's music. Three dead for Optic. And what a start here for Bittersweet. A yeah, really, really good start here. The camo has been the difference maker. They've got that ball back to tower as well. So this is more guaranteed time. And I've got to be honest, I kind of love how Cherist is just pushing this Kel out immediately, yeah. taking his time. And he knows that player is going to push. And if he's not pushing, he's not stopping that oh, up ball. A little bit of a trade coming in here, but. Early on, like you say, bittersweet with a very, very good hold of back tower. Yeah, really nice job. Of course, it all comes off of that camo grab. They're able to get the delayed camo ball. grab, and that really is, allows them to slowly one by one take down those players around tires. However, Optic Gaming answering back. Formal really, really patient ball. with the spike stairs push. They get two dead, but also enter back right away. One thing to, uh, to highlight, of course, is the fact that we're talking about camo, right? It's the first time we're going to see it, and Enemy how it influences ball. games, and you've already seen how it can influence one play, which turns into a setup for teams. So, Camo going to be one of the most valuable pickups you're going to see here on streets. And you can control it, you can make plays, and on Oddball, especially when you're trying to kind of thread the needle a lot of the time on setups, it can be the perfect thing to help you on your way. It really can. That opening battle was just a really good example of how a delayed Camo plays so differently than the Rockets did. It was, as you saw, a completely different opening to the game, and it really required a lot more coordination, a lot more playmaking, and just timing with your team rather than just simply grabbing two Rockets off the rim. By the way, breaking shot, what a start it's been from him. Eight and two, make it eight and three, of course. Sir. It will go down as soon as we start to talk about him, but Optic now in control of that odd ball and starting to pull this game back. Only two points between the two teams. It's been a little bit of a transitional setup. It's not been solid, but it's been good enough to keep this weight away from that ball. Yeah, interestingly also, the team's tied at 14 kills apiece, and also essentially the game tied right here at the 22-24 mark as well. So neck and neck off of the opening. The Big win though, coming in from Piggy there. Just got the jump on Lucy to get above him to hit that headshot. As Trippy tries to just run away towards his teammate Formal with that odd ball. Piggy trying to push down on the uh, the commando here as he jumps up on the pizza jump and tries to cut the angle. Oh, very nice. Should be able to get the trade in this position. Two dead on us either side, but as I finish my sentence, the other two players from Bittersweet will Enemy fall. Four dead for them, and there'll be more time here for Optic as they go into a lead. Really good timing. They were right away able to grab the ball yet again. As you said, still four dead. Lucid just going to get the pinks down on the spawners. Also, let's see what he could do from here with the Bulldog just holding down streets. Oh, it's a little cheeky angle there as well on the L. He's going to know about that player pushing. Still got that Bulldog in his hands as well. Only two shells to play with. It's enough to strip away at some shields, but Cherish and Piggy will come out of that, win that fight. Now Formal kind of trapped at the moment. He's having a peek, jiggle, see if he can get a trade in this position, but Morton, he plays that so well, and not only gets Formal, but also comes out of that situation with a double and the oddball. It's a perfect push, a perfect break, and now Bittersweet have a chance to put some points on the board. A really nice break, as you say. Now they're only trailing by 20. If that battle went a different way, this would be a very different second half of this game. Instead, they brought it right back. Now only trailing by about 15, with very good pressure coming in here for breaking shot. As he times the push back to beasters times the push back around to caution as well i was gonna say look at the aggression that's being shown here they're, they're walking so far up the map to try and get damage onto the spawners from optic gaming but it's coming the double-edged yeah. sword right yeah. if it doesn't work all of a sudden you give the off ball away and you're on the back foot so i like the idea i like that they're trying to take the fight to optic but sometimes doing something like that against a team like optic you fall into their trap as the camo comes up Let's see what Trippy could do he's gonna shroud maybe get away maybe be a burn here yes the hell but oh my he does get taken down by a second nade that came in from breaking shot that will mean three dead and they play the camo well four dead bittersweet does not get the camo triple kill in the feed for Piggy, but they will get the burn on the camo as well. And just like that, they're down by less than 20. So just when it looked like Optic Gaming was going to run away with it, Bittersweet is able to get the kills they need. Also, Staggered spawns yet again. Three dead. Back-to-back -back wipes coming in from Bittersweet as they now only trail by seven. And that's what happens right there. When you get aggressive and you get that first pick, you get the first info, and you turn it into two, into three, then you can force those spawns back. And look at the space that the Opal Carrier has right now in comparison to the rest of his team. Nobody can contest that Opal for a few moments here for Optic. They have to prioritize kill and working around it. But one way to do that is let Trippy go in and get a triple kill. The ball is down in PD. Interesting. Trippy gets a triple. They should be able to flush this one out of PD relatively quickly. Yes, they do. Morley was your last player alive, so now this should be a hold. Tie game for a second at 69 points. However, Optic scoring yet again. They only need 25 points to close out the round. And a let's go Optic chance starts in the room. Yeah, Optic fans, not surprising to hear them getting behind their team in these final moments. And that could be the difference maker. As Bittersweet has given it as good as they've got so far in this first round of oddball. Oof. 
The next set of kills could be massive to where this round actually ends up going. There's the repulse though. Formal has to back down. A little bit of help coming in through mid map. And it's going to be Dead Zone who punches the hole through the setup. Two dead hit for Bittersweet. Ball is down. Huge that Formal stays alive there. There would have been three dead for Optic. Instead, they maintain really good positioning here. Two players alive on the map for one team. Let's see if he can double get this one. Yes, he gets another. Good help as well. Opal still down. Lucid tries to turn his attention towards it, but there is a little bit of a flank coming in here from somewhere. Formal trying to keep his reticle trained onto where Lucid is with that Opal to try and help him stay alive in that situation and keep the bittersweet push away from the ball. Breaking shot will get that kill. Maybe picking up two here on Trippy as well. Lucid has the ball in his hands. Is anyone from Bittersweet in position to cut him down Ooh. on the cross? The answer is yes. And essentially that's three, four dead for Optic Gaming. And maybe Bittersweet might be able to steal this. Ooh, let's see. Was breaking shot's able to wipe out the back of Courtyard, which is good. Camel gets all the way. What the? We're here. Gonna slow it down. And we'll see if they can stay alive here. Lucid almost hits the drop side in a PD. If he hit that, I'm pretty sure they get the last points. I love the fact that the patience we Ooh, just saw though, no. but the grenade comes in. The camo is irrelevant. Cherish gets one though to keep the numbers close. Dead Zone gets one. Trippy gets one as well. Cherish last alive. And that push and that grenade onto the camo player to take him out of the game might have just secured things here for Optic Gaming. They have the ball in their hands. That'll be it. There's no way anyone's pushing formal in Red Room here. That is going to be the round and Optic Gaming closes it out with a strong set of late round plays to make sure that they close it out. Trippy, 15 and 12 in that game. That's why I love the camo, right? Because how big of a deal is it that Lucid pushes laundry and tires and actually kills the camo without trading? You see amazing plays, big swings coming out. Whether the camo succeeds or fails, you have a really interesting dynamic with the new power-up. Yeah, it's fascinating, right? If he stays alive for just a second there, Camo got all the information where the optic push was coming. He guarantees a back smack or a kill without being traded, essentially. And you, you could argue that Bittersweet get that round, but no. The kill goes in the favor of Optic Gaming, and the margins we always talk about, this round at least, go in the favor of oh, Optic. Bro. Starting off on the uh, second round, though, already you can see Dead Zone. He's got a red gun in his hands, and not only that, Optic have a ball in their hands, too. Talking about breaking shots and numbers earlier as well. He's continued that. He's 18 and 11 from that first round. Lots to talk about there, but they're going to need an even better performance as a squad if they want to get this second round on the board. Dead Zone was momentarily one of the last alive there. Lucid managed to get into position to help him, but you have to wonder if he's going to go for a play ball here or if he's going to try and bash some skulls in with a skull. Instead, it's kind of neither, as Cherish now has the red gun in his hands. Opal's been taken back towards Tram here by Piggy as well, and Optic find themselves three dead. It was a little bit of a scrappy push. It was a, almost unpredictable where players were coming from, but at the end of it, it looks like Bittersweet have actually won the battle. Interesting there, Lucid just has one shot into Arcade. That's going to let them know they're pushing from Tram on the flank, though, so Bittersweet might be ready for that one. Let's see where the first pick is here. All eight players up right now. Enemy has the ball. Lutz is going to get the damage. All dropped. Clean up the damage, I should say, that's being done by his teammates. That's going to be evened out, though. And another Whoa. kill comes in from Mortley there. And Mortley last alive. It's a 1v1 on the map at the moment with the Opal down back tower. Trippy and Mortley. Trippy has that first shot. Wow. But the last shot will be hit by Mortley. The 1v1 is won. But the time bought means that he's going to have to get his shields back. And it's going to be essentially another team fight before that Opal is scooped up. Three dead, dead zones, your last player alive. As you can see, he's top cafe. They're going to get ready for that push. If they can isolate the that battle. That's what I'm going to be waiting now on Cafe. As you saw, he came back just a bit. So they're able to isolate that. And the game will be really close here. Just about tied to the 25 mark. Just thinking there, how are they going to cross with this obble without getting cut down? Well, one way is just to roll it off to a teammate. Wow. Repulse is up. Gets the killing spree. Mortally really playing this strong at the moment. It's a 2v2 on the map. And with the close range weapon and the ability to serve that one up like a tennis player. He might keep that ball out of the hands of Optic for a few moments more. One thing they can't keep out of the hands of Trippy, though, is the camo. Camo and... Bulldog here, going to just hold front tram and really using the camo to take sight lines he would normally not be able to take. And of course, that's going to guarantee him the first shot as well. Be surprised if he pushes this cafe more than he needs to. Just like that, no reason to push all the way up there. Instead, he's just going to hold the angle and they'll continue to extend their lead. Yeah, it's a really strong setup here for Optic. Almost doubling the score that we've seen come in from Bittersweet here in the last few moments or so. And Trippy holding down the pink street at the moment almost single-handedly. He's getting one or two kills, a little bit of damage here or there. Mortally's last player alive, but Trippy knows he's somewhere as they watch each other's crosses. He doesn't know, however, that Mortley was just being a little bit sneaky in the cafe. Looking very, very good here from Optic Gaming. And 
Nice shot by Morley once again to get that kill really efficiently without taking really any damage whatsoever. However, the damage that's being done is all about the scoreboard. Dead Zone's actually your last player alive from Optic. And look how difficult wow. he's being. Finally, he gets taken down. He gets a momentary play ball, but it's not enough to make sure the play, to, excuse me, the ball doesn't get back into Tram. But after that hold, let's not forget, it was just 26-21. Now it's 64-31. to 31. Big lead here for Optic. Yeah, impressive hold, but at the same time, you got to think, Bittersweet now having to hold themselves, the same setup with Mortley hitting shots like this. This is a big opportunity for them to get back into this game and really get close to tying this round up if they can do what Optic just did to them. And at this stage in the game, Bittersweet is out slaying 66-33. to 33. But just like that, as those kills fall, it essentially becomes within one. We'll see if they can do it in this round, though. I think he lost the life. He'll be traded out, but does manage to get the trade before he goes down. However, numbers still heavily in the favor of Optic Gaming and Formal. He's going to be able to use that shroud as well to help his teammates maybe get that next camo. 66 to 47. Obo is down front tram at the moment. Next set of kills could be important here. If it goes the way of Optic, they'll be pretty close to getting the kills they need and securing the time they need to close this game out. Here's the man on your screen here. We talked about him a lot. We'll see what he can do with a camo bulldog here on the Neons push. Yeah, this is an opportunity here. Formal gets one to kind of clear a little bit of space with Zone to move through with his camo, but oh, bit sweet wow. with that ball back in their hands. And I tell you what, every time it feels like Optic are just getting a lead, and it's looking like the Optic story where they Ooh. just close things out. Bit sweet are given as good wow. as they got, but the play from Dead Zone might have just shut the door. 66 57 on the board, two dead for each side here. On board with Trippy, it's a big kill there to win that first one without taking once again much damage. It all should have got the wow. second. Cherish, though, has helped from Piggy. And that'll allow maybe the driveway push to still come through. Looks like they're going to try and flood this. Lucid is in red room, and Ooh. with the repulse, he's going to slow this push down for just a few seconds more. Lots of support from teammates as well, and with that obble down, they don't have to try and push for these kills. They just have to stop. Ball drop. Progress being made towards that odd ball. Has the ball. But they're not able to. Look at breaking shot. He somehow got that ball away back up to the tram stairs. And just like that, take a look. Now, essentially a tight game here at the 65 mark. It's a nice hold and breaking shot. If he wins that, that would have been huge. However, Lucid Stalker Rifle, not the easiest thing to go up against. Yeah, you ain't winning that. It's as simple as that when you're going up against Lucid and he's got that Stalker. Cherish, though, with a double kill is going to put Lucid under more pressure. Piggy's trying to fly through on the commando. But here's uh -oh. Lucid! Double kill from him, perfect shots again, put the Stalker to use. Breaking shot though now has it in hand as well, very nice damage, that's going to be cleaned up, that'll keep two dead for Optic, maybe opportunity for a hold here as well. Four points between the two teams in this second round. Plan coming in again here from Breaking Shot, can't clean up the kill on Trippy though, and how much will that hurt them? Trippy somehow just eating all those Stalker shots in the back, not able to finish that with the headshot. Piggy not able to get away either. Camo popping now. You can say this is a very big point in the game here. 68-62 with the camo popping now. Lucid's a player with it, and he's not going to pop it, I'm pretty sure. I think it's going to be down at the bottom of those B stairs. And while the distraction is going down, look at Dead Zone. Ball in his hands. He's moving towards spawners as you need to to keep that up ball away from Bittersweet. This is the last opportunity for them to push. Dead Zone. Doesn't get a dead slide though, throws that one out towards Formal and keeps that ball away. See if Formal gets some damage and maybe goes for a hold here. Wisely backs down just due to his amount of shields he had. And able to clean up the one shot. 64, to, excuse me, 84 to 62. See if they can lose it out, but they're gonna try to rotate this ball back to Tram if yeah, they, they can on the side of Bittersweet. The yeah, they might be able to just steal this one away. Formal gets the clean up on the kill. Formal is the player they need to deal with though. He's doing so much damage at the moment to create opportunity for Trippy wow. to go forward, for Lucid to go forward, and now he is anchoring for the team, but look at the kill feed. All of a sudden, it's turned around. Bittersweet find three kills in a row. Optic find themselves with one alive, and I tell you what, this round is not done yet. Ooh, Lucid's able to get one. He's gonna now sc just scout back to teammates. Finally, it's taken down. That's a very big kill that comes in for Piggy. If Lucid stays alive there, the push is gonna come in. However, despite all of this, you see the ball still sitting front tram. Not a lot of points on the board. It's been a lot of kills and a lot of chaos. Finally, Bittersweet grabs the ball. However, all eight players alive. Look at Cherish, though. He's playing that pillar. And he's playing Optic at the moment like a fiddle. They cannot get that kill. Two dead on either side at the moment. However, Cherish now finds himself as last alive. And he's in the zone oh of dead zone. Now you're seeing the ball taken away. This will be the final points. Nobody close enough from Bittersweet to really challenge. Trippy should deal with this pretty comfortably. And it will be Optic Gaming who got one to zero in the series. Wow, and can you 
ask for any better stats there. Dead zone with 23 and 18 with 18 assists and all the ball time on top of that as well. In the end, Optic Gaming, they will recover not only on the scoreboard, also in the kills category. They outslayed 95 to 89 across the two rounds. Yeah, pretty good uh, game overall, you would say, from Optic. But at the same time, you could say a pretty good game from Bittersweet. Really made them work for it. And like we said at the start of this, if Optic aren't on their game, if Optic have an off series, an off day here, then Bittersweet could be the, uh, the kind of team to, to hurt them in a series, take a game or two and really force them to up their game and see what went wrong. But for now, Optic looking pretty strong. It was the final moments of both rounds that went the way of Optic. And how many times do we say that, Andy? It's always the big teams that just seem to, in the final moments of games, in the moments of, final moments of series, for whatever reason, just find another level when they need it. Yeah, absolutely. Dead Zone's land debut with Optic Gaming, the highest KDA in the match, 11.0. Once again, 23, 18, and 18. Fantastic stats. Trippy also going 29 and 25. Yeah, you don't get better stats than that, to no. be honest with you, especially in the ball game type, right? We saw him a lot of objective time alongside it as we take a look back at some of these replays the, the defining moment was was here right in, in game number one i believe it was where or just after this excuse me where the camo player was taken down by optic just when it looked like he was in the perfect position to relay so much information the frag grenade came in took those shields off and immediately was cleaned up and they were able to scarper away with that obble towards the end of the game towards the red room once again, really nice stuff here just throughout the entirety of the round. I think each time it felt like Bittersweet was bringing the game back, you would find Optic Gaming just really applying the exact pressure that they needed to. I think we saw some really good moments of brilliance from Bittersweet here and there, some really good control, and also, as we said, some points on the board. For me, in the second round, one of the biggest moments was really when you had Bittersweet slaying about three dead, about back to back, and the ball just sat front tram. And really, because the last player on Optic Gaming was just able to keep them off the ball, you have to think we could be pretty far into a round number three if those moments played differently. Yeah, the, the, that's the thing there. Right, they, they don't play differently. There's a reason that Optic throw that ball out to the front of the trap. Yeah. There's a reason that they keep challenging it and keep contesting it because they know the spawn timing that they have. They're going to be able to keep get line of sight, keep taking players down. And in the end, they will get the numerical advantage and keep Bittersweet off that oddball. And that's exactly what happened as we move over to now game at number two, Slayer on a live fire. I, have to, I kind of fancy seeing some sniping work. You know yeah. what I mean? I, I feel like we've been a little bit devoid, uh, personally, of yeah. snipes today. We There's have. Pretty good ones in the phase series earlier, but I, f I feel like... Ah, do you know what? I'm going to pick a player. You are. I'm going to pick a player right now. Brave of you. I know. I think Formal's going to snipe some players and it's going to be nasty. I was going to say... If that it, happens, by the way, it's weird and terrifying, and I'm saying nothing else to be honest. <laughs> A lot of talent on that Optic Gaming side. You have to think, though, when you think of the sniper rifle, you think of one name on the Optic Gaming side as the standout. Certainly, Formal has put on a show throughout his years of competitive play across multiple titles. It would be a pleasure and a treat to see him sniping a little bit. But I have to say, I'm here on Live Fire, curious to see exactly how they play it, how the QT really changes. I think the QT in objective modes is, can be a lot more impactful because of how important green is in different objective modes and, and what it actually means in terms of points on the board in King and what it means in Stronghold and Slayer, the QT usage will be a little bit different. We'll have to see if either team can really take advantage of that. Yeah, one thing I love about the QT in Slayer, though, is it, if you're the team on the back foot, I mean, historically, we know the tower side is stronger because you have the height, especially yeah. if you have the sniper, you can get it back there, right? It's very difficult to push uphill, essentially, against a team with a full setup. But the QT allows you to overextend a little bit without giving a life away to sure, do so, course, right? Yeah, because yeah. you can retreat back to the port and players can play off of the damage that you manage to get down and then you can come in as the, the final player, the anchor, whatever you want to call it, to be the final player in that push. And I, I think it does create a, a little bit less of a standoffy game type because you have the ability to push. Of course, you also have the camo coming up, which is forcing player movement, player engagement. And if you're on the back foot, it's no longer a case of, hey, we can't do anything. Right. It's, hey, we can play for the camo now and we can try and retake control. We can play for the QT now, we yeah. can try and take control. The only worry is if you don't get either of them yeah. and a player overextends to green, forces your spawns over on scoreboard if you're on the back foot and then they QT up and QT out and then it's, it's pretty tough to it get is. out of, but you should be able to, if you're smart enough about it, you should be able to negate that. Yeah, you absolutely should. I'm curious, because of the placement exactly of the QT here on Live Fire, there really is a huge opportunity, as you say, to just poke pillars or poke sandbags, come back, a little bit of damage and just port way back to safety while your team floods. And I think you're laughing because I said pork instead of pork. Yeah, I am laughing because I'm a little bit hungry and you said pork sandbags. Well, it's because we have, <laughs> no, it's just, <laughs> It's just because we have Piggy on the other side, and I just wanted to oh, okay. it would be, be an injustice hey, not to give the hey, reference. The man's a genius, everybody. Give him, some, give him his flowers. Pork sandbags all round. We're into <laughs> game number two. Sign me up. <laughs> well, we're starting off with the point of view of Formal, and why wouldn't you? Probably for that reason. He goes down almost immediately, but... 
I'm interested to see how Optic play this and what pace this game type is going to be played out. Lucid with a target-rich environment, you could say, in front of him. He finally gets taken down. Had a lot of options there to shoot at as the team finally floods in. Two players still on scoreboard for the side of Bittersweet, as you saw. Four kills early on for Bittersweet. Make it five, Ooh, and there's the camo, but what a spot what? from Formal. And, and there's the QT, gets out of it. I mean, previously, Formal, camo is incredible, but probably gets traded out in that position. This time, he takes down the camo player, and because of the QT, stays alive to be part of the next push. It's four to six now, just two kills. Well, that is the equivalent of a fadeaway jumper there, to hit the shots on camo, and then right when you think you're going to get taken down, the QT vaporizes and just disappears. And now he's still doing damage here on scoreboard. Finally gets taken down. A bit of revenge coming in for Bittersweet there. Breaking shot now with the sniper rifle. Momentarily though, it's dead zone. <laughs> to sleep for just a few moments. That sniper rifle is going to be a point of contention though for both teams. And you can see that Optic want to flood. They want to get the weapon in their hands. Not sure if anyone has managed to scoop it up or if that ammo was depleted. But Trippy's got to be careful of standing on a landmine now. Those frag grenades that pop up on the pork sandbags. <laughs> Forever renamed. Very common to be shot at now in Halo Infinite. Everyone is going to be waiting for you to poke. Finally gets taken down, just like that. Now 13 to 9. Bittersweet continuing to apply the pressure. Triple kill, as you saw from Piggy. That'll be three dead yet again for Optic Gaming. Well, they do have the sniper rifle back in their hands as well. One other of his teammates has got the, uh, the big stick in his hands. As Piggy comes off the back of that triple kill. 13 to 9 the score. Make it 14, though. As it's going to be mortally, he was hitting some pretty crazy shots. I was with the bandit, but the flank from Dead Zone out of nowhere. All four players so, from Bittersweet almost holding hands there. Somehow just stays alive the entire time and stays alive long enough for the flank to come in through A. And just like that, as you say, it's a much closer game than you think maybe it should be. And it'll be 16 to 14 here. One kill between the two teams at the moment. This is a very, I would say, untraditional pace that we're seeing the game played at at the moment. Everyone's constantly kind of trying to pressurize. It's almost a, a 4v4, but only within one quarter of the map a lot of the time. Body shot comes in from Lucid as the camo comes up as well, and the attention from Optic and, of course, Bittersweet turns towards the power up. Gonna keep a very close eye on that camo to see where it goes. A lot of pressure here from Lucid on Rat Tunnel. He's Somehow. holding the whole team off. I was gonna say, holding down Rat Tunnel single-handedly for a second. Double kill coming in, a four dead zone, almost a triple as well. But the camo, most importantly for Optic, has been picked up. It's a tie game, but I mean, if I'm losing that position and we were in the listening, if he wasn't saying, you have a free camo, the whole team is on me yeah. and I'm holding them off. I don't know what he would have been saying. Really credit there because he pre-nades with the plasma and you thought maybe yeah, I didn't get the damage he needed, but that actual blast radius just aoe the entire rat tunnel and ensured, like you said, that they could get the camo. Two kills the advantage off the back of that camo. Make it three, make it four. It's four dead on a staggered respawn now for Bittersweet Optic. Starting to find a little bit of rhythm and Dead Zone already finding the spawners to put pressure on. 24 to 20 now in favor of Optic Gaming and sounds like we can go ahead and see just what their comms are like. Probably pretty cool comms like it now back in the lead by four. Enemy halfway to victory. Well, no listening for now, but Optic kind of doing the, uh, the listening for, the, for all of us at the moment with the scoreline, right? It's seven kills, the difference they have started to find form, and the momentum is heavily on their side. Yeah, absolutely. Just firing now, not only on all cylinders, but it feels like on every single piece of the map as well. He finally gets taken down after what was a beautiful spree. We're taking a look at the numbers here. It's going to be Dead Zone once again. He's 10 and 5 with nine assists. Dead Zone really, really impressing in this first series for Optic Gaming. Game is still close, though. The next few moments could be important, though. We always talk about, and we've mentioned it already on the first day here in Arlington of the new season, the best teams in the world are the ones who seem to close out games late. Optic Gaming looks to be picking up that story and running with it at the moment. 35 to 29, it's a six kill difference between them. But this is the moment where Optic have taken over and you can see the Bittersweet are just constantly fighting off the back foot. Yeah, it's a really different game than we saw earlier. Bittersweet really comfortable leading. We saw them leading by about four kills for quite some time, but Optic Gaming has turned the game around and right now showing no signs of slowing. Well, this has gone on a long flank here because he knew the camo was coming up, but it's Bittersweet who actually pick it up. 
And if ever you needed an opportunity to get back into the game, a camo is going to do exactly that. It's only a four kill difference. It's not like this is a 10 kill difference going in towards the end game here. And Optic just try and slow this game down to make this camo use as minimal as possible. Yeah, it's a great call by you, Mark. Look at this, just sitting right They're going to set scoreboard. They're going to sit all the way back in house and not make the push up. Here comes the start of a push, however. Look at the sandbag support on formal top middle. They're making sure the camo was not a factor. Camo has now timed out, and they still lead here by four. Formal has to reload, and that's going to cost him. Still such a close game, but that gap's still there on the side of Optic. Two dead for them momentarily as Mortley watches that jump up, and Trippy is going to jump into the, uh, the line of sight there of Piggy after the damage is done. So three kills now the difference. One team wipe away a bit of sweet from tying this up. Mortally still alive on the whole sequence. Now, sniper Ooh. rifle in hand, almost left without the prize, but now he has it. Now it's a two-kill game. And what looked like it was a going to be an optic home stretch as the flank comes around here on this is a big battle on cuts. Now a killing spree, and just oh. like that, it's a one-kill game. Make it a tie game here. One kill the difference as the trade came through to tie the game up. One more came through for Optic Gaming, but this is a position you want to be in if you're one of these players on Bittersweet, right? You're down by one, but you have the sniper rifle and you have map control. For Morley, he's probably thinking, this is my chance to go and win this game. This is a big, this is big. All eyes on him, not only in the room, but of course online as well. A big opportunity to shut down a team that's often referred to as one of the best in the world. We'll see if he can do it. Here comes the push, though. Pressure coming in. That's not quite getting the body shots. Moments away, it's inches away, it's a hair away, but it's not good wow. enough. And the push from Optic Gaming turns the sniper over to dead zone. He's 14 and 9 in this game number two, and he might be able to add a few more to the tally too. Also leading the team and the game in assists, as we said. You cannot ask for more from this man. As we said, his land debut with this team and games one and two have looked very good indeed, to say the very least. They're up by three, 440 left on the clock. Still just three kills though. Make it four. Lucid goes on a little walk and catches him off guard. Camo going to be the point of contention. That's why you're seeing Dead Zone and Optic Ooh. Gaming just slow things up. But look at that. He's out of there. He wanted to keep those deaths down. Still everything to play for on Camo. 47 44. We'll get an eyes on it really quick. Looks like it might have been grabbed right there. Now 48 44. Two more kills to go for Optic Gaming. Camo's still down. So it's going to be baited by Optic here. They know that. Bittersweet need it. It's their win condition to get back into this game, but only having two deaths to play with, that's going to hurt. But Lucid comes in to get the 49th. He's looking for the 50th as well. Cherish will find one onto Dead Zone. This isn't over yet. Not over yet at all. Had pings down on Rat Tunnel and a camo for Mortally Game in his hands. The only problem is he's got to go and make a play. His teammates are taking damage at the moment. The last thing you want to do is not get wow. the chance to make the play. Optic sees the opportunity and find themselves 2-0 to zero up in the series. Well, how about love that play from Optic because that camo gets popped on scoreboard. They may not have known exactly where and when it was popped, but Optic made the call. You could tell by the way it was executed to go. You do not let this camo player start to pick us apart and start to get our heads on a swivel. Then we get collapsed on. They went right away. Formal flies in, gets the last kill with the grenade, and they narrowly win. 50 to 47. Yeah, it was a big comeback in the middle game from Bittersweet as well. Seven kills they came back from to keep that one extremely, extremely close. But once again, it's the best teams in the world who get it done in the late game. 50 to 47 is your final score as we move over to King of the Hill on recharge. And I can't wait to see this, man. It's one of my favorite changes I've seen with the hill placements. I love the Batteries Hill. I love how the camo now isn't just a, a scrap bottom middle inside of that hill. It's, it just plays so much better. It really does. Also how the Shroud's going to be playing, of course, instead of the Repulse. A lot to look forward to in this next game type. And as you said, Bittersweet trailing at one point 30 to 23 in that game. They bring it back all the way to 39, 37 to keep things interesting. Here's the fadeaway from Formal. Picks that one up and goes right back to green. Those are the types of plays that we were talking about earlier. Can we talk about Dead Zone stats, by the way? I mean, mathematically, I'm always a little bit shaky. However, I've taken a few moments here and I'm probably still going to get it wrong, but he had 13 kills, 11 deaths, but 15 assists. That is absolutely a dream. Involved in 18, uh, 28 of the kills in the game. Over half of the game, uh, game's kills, Dead Zone had an involvement in. And that is ridiculous for one player. It really is. And it's also, it, how, there's a lot of examples where when we talk about Dead Zone, he's got 
Over 50% of the things in a game are accredited to his name. Like we talked about with flag runs last year, flag caps last year. He just had these outlier stats where you're thinking, it shouldn't be that way that a player can have that much impact in a game. So to be involved in 28 separate battles in that game, like you said, it's crazy. He's tripling the assists of a few other players in the game. Yeah, that's always a great thing about how a player's output and damage and positioning themselves in relativity to their teammates. It shows intelligence, it shows great decision making, but it also shows that Optic are listening to it, yeah. right? Because he's calling out where that damage is done and they don't need to be asked twice to move in and capitalize on the damage. What, that's why those assists are so high and it looks like he's the pivot for the team that everyone's playing off at the moment. Uh, certainly, and just uh, like you said, love to see what we're seeing from him. And you have to think for Dead Zone as well. We already know what he's capable of and there's no really no questions about his place in Halo history. However, a big opportunity for Zane on your screen here just because I think he knows as well how talented he is. However, if he's able to debut here with this squad at an even higher level, set a new personal bar for himself, it will mean a lot for the green wall, it will mean a lot for the squad, it will mean a lot for the fans in the room. And so far, he is two for two in our first games of the series, without a doubt. Yeah, I think uh, is one thing we talked about coming into the series, right? If you have a good couple of games, trust me, the crowd here in Arlington will be behind you for the entire tournament. And you couldn't ask for two better games really so far from him. We'll take a look at some of the head-to-head -head stats as well on our screen between but from the man we're talking about, of course, Dead Zone and Cherished on the other side. Uh, and I, the assist column is one of my favorite ones, I gotta say. It shows teamwork, but it also shows you up outputting shots for your teammates' benefits. I mean, absolutely. To also then have a 1.28 KD There's on top. There's nothing bad on the left side. On top to of say. 33 assists is wild. He's looked so good this series, and I think so far, if he keeps up, I wouldn't even say if he keeps up this pace, if he keeps up any sort of thing reminiscent to this, all weekend long, there will be no doubts about the team change. It's a great start, but a little bit more to do here in our first series on the main stage for Optic Gaming. Yeah, still some work to do, of course, just to close this out. And they want to do it in a way that says 3-0, right, at the end of it. They don't want to really let Bittersweet into the series. They want to close this out and say, hey, okay, let's think about what's next. If you let Bittersweet back into the series, they've already shown they're going to push you the long way, right? They're going to take the... Uh, the longest road to push you right until the end of these games, then that gives them the belief and maybe it starts to cast the doubt in your head a little bit and all these things start to play in and before we know it, we're in a game five, but Optic Gaming are very experienced and I, I don't think they'll be thinking too much about that right now. Yeah, I think it's really what we're seeing also, I think for Optic fans, is you're hoping that this team change just gives them kind of maybe an injection. You saw smiles there on the face of Lucid, just maybe an injection of just uh, excitement for this season, right? And something new and fresh. And so far, of course, they're looking very good. There's a lot more weekend to play, but I think for the Optic Gaming side, if you're an Optic fan, you're optimistic that this year could be really reminiscent kind of of year one in terms of the way that Optic Gaming looked and the way that they played. I mean, they'll probably be hoping exactly that because they yeah. won a lot of titles, a lot of trophies, and uh, a lot of money as well while they were doing that. So Optic fans obviously will be hoping that. I'm sure the Optic players themselves will be hoping that as well. And I tell you what, it'll be very good for the uh, the competitive environment, the Halo Championship Series, if we see Optic back at their best as well. Yeah, it really will. It, it, it does feel like uh, when we had Optic kind of at the Optic phase SSG battle at its height, right? Really, last season was one of the times where you really couldn't, if you single out moments in the history of competitive Halo, when there have been kind of three teams that are front running, there aren't that many examples throughout history. There's often a number one and a number two. However, in the middle of last season, there was every question to be asked and every answer to be found in terms of which of those three was the best. In the end, of course, FaZe closes it out there. Now you're defending world champions. And I think Optic Gaming fans are thinking, you know what? With the way this team is looking and, and all the hopes for this season, this could be a very different year. Yeah, uh, I think it's going to be interesting to see how these teams match up against each other. We mentioned how FaZe are kind of seen as the, the blueprint, so to speak, I think, for how teams want to approach the game and the team to beat at the moment. But you, know, you look at Optic and Space Station, they've made moves to beat them. It's not a case of making moves for the sake of it. They've made moves to win more championships. and. I think if we see the performances we expect from these teams and they're playing at their height, we're going to still be going into every event. You're going to ask 10 people who's going to win the event, and they're going to give you th different answers every time. Right, yeah, it's a beautiful thing. And I think the height that we saw last year in terms of the competitive level of the game, and we talk all the time about the small margins that we saw at the level that was played last season. When you look at weapon, a weapon like the Bandit, you're already seeing it. I mean, the, the battles that we've seen on screen, I'm sure everyone in the room and everyone at home is already seeing it, especially on land. These are clean battles. Players are getting turned on, they're getting reversal, they're getting just absolutely outshot, melee battles that are clean, you're seeing less trades already, you're already seeing just what this bandit feels like on land. That combined with the competitive settings really does set us up for quite a year in terms of small margins between the top teams. Well here we go then, map number three is ready to go. Optic Gaming 
on the cusp of closing the series out in a 3-0 fashion, exactly what they would have wanted in their first series on the main stage here in Arlington. King of the Hill was the game type we're going to be playing, and we've got some new hills. We're off to the batteries first. Yeah, and as we said, it, just, it really feels like this is where this map should kick off. When we talk about bottom middle and the old camo hill to start, it really was an entire mosh pit. And oftentimes, as you remember from last season, many will remember, you had a lot of time elapsed in the early game before the hill was secured, which created this semi-awkward, oftentimes exciting, but a little bit awkward battle for the final hills of the game because there had already been so much time lost on the bottom hill. Now that we have things moving instead over to batteries, it just feels like this is where the game should kick off. You have a lot more straightforward of a flow of the hills as well. Yeah, I, I love it, to be honest. I think the, uh, there's some of the simple as changing the position of the hills just makes everything more fightable, yeah. more, right? Uh, I think I mentioned we were, we were talking about this before the tournament. Like, I like the batteries hill because it's not a free hill, right? It's not a hill that, like the old elevator hill where you lock down your crosses, it's one First or two pushes, we good. give it up, yeah, we move yeah. on to the next one. It's, it's a, you're vulnerable inside of the hill, especially from respawners who can nade in that hill. We've yeah. already seen some really you know, GB style nades. I'm not talking about Golden Boy, because you don't want those, but oh God, yeah. no. uh, that's, that you can get into that hill and flush players out or cause damage before you even take damage yourself. Right. And I think it's, it, that's the brilliance of King of the Hill, right? It's, you control an objective when you're almost at a positional disadvantage. And I think it's great that first hill and it really tests teams to have to hold and have to break and it's the perfect start. It really is. And I think it's gonna just provide us with just a, a lot more of a competitive environment off the opening, as you said, in terms of recharge hill and also just in terms of the entire new flow of the hills just gives us not only something new to see and play for, but really new strategies developing as well. I also love the fact that the final hill in the rotation is the bottom middle hill. Right, it's, it's like, fitting okay, now is the bottom yeah, middle. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, all right, we're really close. So like, how about it, everyone? Yeah, <laughs> like, exactly. Let's see what happens the bottom middle, everybody yeah. in. And let's see who can close it out and who can clutch a couple of gunfights in that final moment. It's, it's fun. It I think is. it's a really fun way to end it. It's things. perfect because it feels like the referee comes in and says, all right, this has been a great battle now. It's two to two. You guys can just have at it and yeah. you just fly into bottom middle. That's when you want the mosh pit, not off the rip when you're tied 0-0. We'll have to see if the two teams can earn that, if we as viewers, of course, can earn that as well as the final hill of the game as we're getting ready to get into game number three. It's going to be King of the Hill on Recharge. You ready? I'm ready. I'm ready. Let's get into this, everyone. Ready. Bittersweet looking to start the comeback. Optic Gaming looking to end this series in this game. And we mentioned previously how that first hill is going to be around the batteries. Well, the first battle, of course, is still going to take place around that power up. The camo bottom middle is going to be picked up by Trippy. Oh, Trippy, going to get all the goodies as well. Take a look at this. It's not all the time that you see someone stack shock camo into the battery still off the opening. A little bit of a risk there. However, just going to get out and bait. I like this play here. As you see, they do lose the player. So why not sit back, wait, and bait? Maybe pick up a few kills of your own. I thought you were going to say, why not be reckless? No, that's uh, Tony would have been smiling. He would have loved you forever yeah. for that one. Couldn't even give it to him. Anyway, Trippy goes in with that camo, will be taken down. And Bittersweet did manage to kind of break through just a little bit there. There was a player who won an individual battle on their pipes to turn the attention away from Trippy. Lucy now breaks in. He's got the grapple, looking to find a few more kills himself. There's two players in the pipes, and Piggy will win the battle that he should. So two dead, making three dead momentarily for Optic. Bittersweet with the chance to step in the hill now. And just like we said, first of all, I just got to say, I think everyone watching at home is going to agree, right? There's just a lot more to this Battery's Hill. You're going to notice really just not only a visual difference, but in the feel of the game as well, that there's just a lot of uh, different strategies being employed here off the opening. As we say that, three dead for Optic Gaming. More points on the board here for Bittersweet as they cross the halfway mark on your first hill. Lucid last alive, just waiting for his teammates to get back on the map. Playing the uh, camo jump up at the moment. And now you're seeing those grenades come in. The Shroud goes in as well to try and keep the player alive or maybe just deny the line of sight as Opting make their play. Cherish will fall as Mortally tries to clean up some more damage himself, but it's bittersweet inside of that hill. Oh. Double kill here from Formal. Look Looking at this. to turn it into three, but not able to get there. And bittersweet will win that first battle, and they're up one to zero. Big heads up play there from Cherish, just sitting there on that back right bat. He knew exactly what he needed to do, just play the angle, and three dead again. Dead zone's your last player alive for Optic Gaming. He's gonna try to make some tunnel presence known and try to stay alive, but can't. Breaking shot picks up that kill as well. Kemo looks like a burn based on the animation should be. Burn does come in. Great shots from Lucid, by the way. This is not an easy angle. Only thing he's got to aim for is the head. And Piggy's going to be back down. Now turns his attention to the player in that hill. It's a little bit scrappy here around this underpass hill. And it's going to be bittersweet. You find three kills almost immediately, consecutively. Wow. Bang, bang, bang. Three players fall. 
And Formal now last alive, and Bittersweet inside that hill once more. Couldn't agree one more. Take a look, three players are alive there, so it's a really good timing push coming in for Bittersweet. As you said, they got all three kills at the same time, not easy to do. That will lead to another 50% completion on the second hill as well. Bittersweet's outslaying 22 to 15 in game number three. Very impressive start from them at the moment. By the way, I'm really struggling with Bittersweet, because I want to say bitter. Enemy team it's true, the and it's tricky. At least, you like, say, at least you didn't say pork. But I'm saying, <laughs> I have to say bitter. It makes me sound like <laughs> a little posh. I'm in a uh, high earner group. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> Molly on the camo jump. Lucy trying to cut him down. Doesn't need to do those. The help will come in from teammates. Breaking shots, trying to sneak around the back. But look at those shots. Snaps onto the head here, Lucid. And now slide into the hill with a G-slide. 2v2 on the map at the moment. But the players from Bittersweet have just come off respawn. And Optic with full map control. Yeah, that was four dead. Bittersweet's trying to get through tower as fast as they can. And just like that, we're just about tied on this second hill. A big moment. Does Bittersweet go up 2-0 to zero here? Or can Optic answer back? Looks like Bittersweet have tried to push through the back of blue. And buy the time for the players to move them through the mid bridge. But at the moment, they're just trapped. At the back of blue, and Formal might just be able to line them up and knock them down. There's one already for him, and the headshot comes in onto Piggy. Breaking shots next. Just the chest going to be tickled. It's the head that stays on for now. Breaking shots, last player alive. He's at tower. Look at the progress. This is going to be an optic kill. They do it. They tie it up one to one here. They answer back right away with still 320 to play. Look at that prediction there from Formal as well. Two players spawn on the pipes. And if he would have waited for just a second more, maybe he would have had an opportunity to hit some nice headshots, but instead, his teammates are doing it for him. Lucy gets that next camo in the game as well, and gonna get the info just by stepping in and stepping out of where every member of Bittersweet is. It's such a smart play, because now all of the attention of Bittersweet is taken away onto what Lucid's doing. Somehow they're taken down right away, though. It looks like maybe a pipes flank takes him down in the end, so it looked like Lucid was gonna have more opportunity there. Two dead for each side. This next kill going to determine who puts more points on the board next. This is a really tightly fought game at the moment. Neither hill has been conclusive. But we could say that that's been pretty synonymous with the story of the game so far. It's been back and forth, back and forth, and Optic just kind of getting the advantage in those final moments. But as we once again get a couple of kills here to give them numbers on the map, Trippy has to back down, but... With the timing, it looks like Bittersweet haven't had the opportunity to immediately jump in that hill. Now they turn the attention to the objective. Breaking shot flies in to deal with Trippy. And this is a good opportunity for them to put a little bit of a chunk of time on the board. Yeah, a little bit of answer back there from Optic as well. By the way, we got to talk about the kills category. Not only does Optic answer back in the hill, they also were trailing by nine kill deficit. They brought that back to just a one kill deficit. It's a good chance to get into a listen in with Optic Gaming. More here? Yeah, yeah. Two one two one guys. Look at top. Look at there. Pops one shot on an breaking. I know, like, two bottom tower. Bottom tower could be bottom tower. Two dead, guys. Last guy, bottom tower. Last guy. You need time. You need time. One tower. Just one tower. Pulling Top guy. Top tower. He's on commando. Commando. Two there. Two there. Two, there. two guys tower. Two guys tower. One guy. Two five to long haul. Is he weak? Is he weak? He's weak top tower on commando. Two five. Two five. Look inside plot. Top tower. Still weak there. Watching two five. Two five. One twenty. Two five. Still weak. Really bottom eight. Two bottom eight, guys. Two bottom eight. One top tower. Pushing tower. Look at that. Look at that. No, we need help. We need help. Pushing tower. Bottom tower. Bottom tower. Weak. Tommy. Bottom tower. Weak. Two shot bottom eight. Morley. Two one shots here. Two shot bottom tower. One shot bottom tower. Still here. Still here. Bottom tower. Bangler and bottom eight. Bottom eight. Last guy. Last guy. It was five guys. They're running at you. I just spawned long haul. Nice, Joey. Nice. Camo, camo, guys. Camo now. Camo, 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 Week two half off one's week. Two half off one's week. Or one, they back up to eight, man. Yeah, they think they back up. Coming to you, man. I have shot. Good bottom, man. Piggy's absolute. Two bottom. Another one's two boxes. Still got an A somewhere. Still got Kimmo to work with there. Stop A. Stop A. Stay last time. Stop guy. Stop guy. Stop guy half. I'm gonna go kill this guy. Bottom turn. Trying to look easy. I'm here, I'm here. Here, Tommy. Where, where? Bangor, 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 hit him once. Bottom tower, bottom tower. No, guys, I know. Bottom tower's weak. Two shots. Bottom tower, one shot. Big shot, buddy. C boxes, C boxes. Probably top tower. He's on the stairs, on the stairs. C boxes, boxes. Two guys tower, two guys tower. If I spawn gold on us here, one spawning. Back side, back side. Two guys tower, one shot. One shot, top tower. Back side, low, back side, low behind you guys. Here, back side, behind you guys. One shot, one shot on the tarp. One shot in tower, two tower. One shot's close to right. One C boxes, and one. Two boxes, kill two shields, about to push back side alone now. Nice three, that was three, last guy. Church week, church week, really weak, really weak. Keep milking if you can, man. Push you, push behind you, push behind you. Go, 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 go. That's my best. Slow up, slow up, You hit him with the air, he's full up, full up, full up. Tap shields, tap shields, elbow. Probably bottom there. Needles, needles, needles. Two guys needles, two guys needles, Joey. Weak, 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 weak. Nice, two dead, two dead. Nice shot, guys. One shot glass, one shot glass. He's just sitting in the, he's just sitting in there. One guy's out, one guy's out. Still top gold. Just try to lose. You jump long all the time. Two half shields. Two guys long all. They just spawned there. Spawn spot. Yep. One glass half. One glass half. They're needing you, man. Go. Was weak, guys. Bomb tower. Bomb tower. Bomb tower. 
I'm heading out gold. Yeah, I'm three, out gold. They're, okay, they're all, they're three uh, tower side. Hold on, hold on. Glass, only one guy long, only one guy. Tower's got a shot. One guy glass. I'm gonna kill glass. Tower's two shot, tower's two shot on the steps. Two and ill, two and ill, one guy left. I got needed, I got needed. I gotta drop gold. Glass is weak. Long ball, watch out long, watch out long, watch out long. Jump up, jump up, absolute glass. No, watch out glass. Yeah, that kills one shot, kills one. Glass is one. Looking, looking. He got into gold, he got into gold, I think. Drop back tower, two here. Yeah, top gold. Top gold, I see that, see that, I see that. I hear that, I'm holding, I'm holding needles right now. Back tower trying to kill me. Camo's up now. Weak, two shots on him. Play for camo, guys. Yo, double stack, double stack. Nice. Watch out, watch out, guys. Two dead, two dead. Three, last guy. Play for time, we should play for time. We should play for time. No, no, no. Cap, cap, cap. That's what I'm saying, sorry. Put a bond tire, bond tire, bond tire. Three dead, three dead. Make sure we get silos. Already pushed up. He was a mangler, guys. Mangler stairs. I'm getting through. Mangler pushed up. Mangler pushed up. I'm holding glass for you guys. I got bomb tower breaking, guys. You might go front. Up also. Gonna go gold. They're going to go gold. Two guys tower, one's glass. Yeah, three shots of glass. Look at one up to the church. Watch in. Ballage going glass. Ballage going glass. Stone's close. Try to guys. We got one. Stone me glass. Stone me glass, guys. One shot. One shot above you. One shot above you. Two boxes. You went towards Commando. Yeah, I'm coming back. Good time. Stone gold. Last round. Let's go, yeah. He's got a shock. But you can help him, Zane, if you want. Okay. Nice, Tommy. Need three guys? I cannot. I did batteries, 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 batteries. batteries. Bottom middle, bottom middle, finish it. I'm on, I'm on. I'll go for it, I'll go for it. Bottom middle, probably. We play time after we cap this, probably. Yeah. What's he got, glass or gold? He just got shot, he just got shot. Okay. Glass, glass is trapped, I think. Yeah, glass, yeah, he's still there, he's still there. Two here, two here, two here. I'm one shot. Yo, needles, 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 Joey. Two one shots glass, two one shots glass, two one shots glass. That's one. One shot glass on the left, on the left. Optic locked down that next hill, and they're up to three to one now. Just 30 seconds or so left in this game for Optic, but that was clean. That hill looked pretty much uncontested from them. Yeah, really. Hills have gotten cleaner and cleaner for Optic Gaming, without a doubt, as the game has gone on. With only 18 seconds left on the game clock, you can already tell they're going to play time here and wait for time to tick down. Up three to one, 14 seconds left. Lucid started to take over in the last few moments as well. He's 21 and 11 in this game, just cleaning up so much damage. Oh. And doing the damage himself, it's a killing spree for Lucid with another perfect shot from the shark rifle. Optic Gaming look like they're going to be able to close the series out in the next few moments. Just have to clear Piggy out of that hill and it's exactly what they are doing. But just in the last second, they stepped in for a second, but Denzo gets it done. Optic with a 3-0 sweep and Optic starting off strong. Start off very strong and let's not forget in a game where they were getting heavily outslayed, as we said, being outslayed by nine kills. They end up actually outslaying by 12 in the end. That tells you just how different the second half of that game was. As you saw during the listening, near perfect communication absolutely perfect timing pushes coming out from them in terms of the coordination as well that leads to a three to one back-to-back -back hills three to one victory and as you say a three to zero series victory and uh, all the questions about dead zone you're starting to get your answers this is why optic made the move this is why they wanted to pick him up the stat lines insane coming in from zane in that game and that game one and two was everything this player brings to the team it really is and you can just tell that he's been set up for success on this team and that's all the team wants to do is make sure that they let penguin play the best halo he can by the way he leads the game in assists yet again three games straight 13 assists to his name there leading not only the team but the entire match yeah fantastic stuff from him he is such a good player to play off of his communication is always on point his positioning is one of the best that you're ever going to see and let me tell you it looks like optic are looking pretty good at the moment i've been very impressed with what i've seen from them as well as uh as phase a little bit earlier today when we're talking about our big teams we've of course got to wait to see what ssg bring to the table a little bit later on as well but three to zero to optic it's what they would have wished for and it's sure it's what everybody who's watching right now in the crowd would want it as well absolutely let's take a look at some highlights from that game also got to mention formal 17 and 11 there we saw some really good sequences from here one of the most notable i think during that game was when he was needles just pressuring sea hill pressuring long haul keeping the team aware that someone was glass continue Continuing to poke damage at the players that were in hill and then also staying alive wrapping around pipes waiting for the damage to come in then after that he helps with another gold battle then they have two dead then they push and you can just watch kind of him telegraph the plays with the team like you said playing off each other with penguin great plays there that you just saw we ended early but coming off for trippy to make sure that that camo was locked down just really good it felt like optic gaming got better and better as the game went on yeah uh, by the way I, I think we're just gonna not quite catch it at the end of this game but the shock rifle shot we saw from lucid in the final moments where he just flew across long haul to big door and just just saw someone on batteries and they just went, oh, no, I don't like you, get out yep. of here. You're gonna Swat get and fly. Yeah, exactly, just just got rid of him. We're not going to see CTF Argyle as Optic have already got the job done here on the main stage in Pool D, and I think the biggest challenge is yet to come in this pool. It certainly is, and let's not forget, Optic Gaming in Pool D because of that fifth C. This is probably, very rarely do we see them as low as the letter D, or the fifth seed, of course, in a tournament, but now they'll have what we said was going to be a more difficult bracket. Instead, looks like they're going to be ready to play here. It's a 3-0 to zero victory for Optic Gaming. Optic Gaming looking very, very strong, and a man whose hair is always looking strong. He's on the main stage right now with Blaze. Blaze 
please, by the way, your hair always looks great as well. Lucid from Arctic Gaming is going to talk us through the series. Ah, uh, thank you so much, Onset and Brav. I tried to make it fire like a cast, okay? But speaking of fire performances, show some love to Optic Gaming as they 3 0 bittersweet in Lucid, you know. Oh my God, I just realized we were in the same frames right now. <laughs> uh, talk to me about this performance here, 3 0. How did you guys get it done here with the new team? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's kind of business for us. We got to make sure that we just stay locked in like we normally are. And um, a lot of what we're doing is just that composure aspect. It's been a big part for us, but it's that consistency factor of always staying locked in. And I think that's what we just showed today. I think it definitely did show on the stage and it showed there in the performance. Now, this is year three. It's a new optic gaming and it's a, you know, it's new game modes in ACS and DMR starts. Talk to me about how you guys have been gelling and what's the progress looking like on the squad playing with Zane Dead Zone and um, how have you been enjoying the DMR starts? Yeah, I mean, the gel aspect was already kind of there. I feel like the chemistry, just the out of game already starts out really well for us and uh, the in game was kind of already there. It's just a little bit of like a, he has his system with his previous team. So it's kind of like that, that gel factor took a little bit of time. I think we can keep developing on it. I think we've hit a good stride a few weeks before the event and in and now. So we're just gonna keep building on that. And uh, you know, the bandit starts has been good. It's been a lot of fun. There you go, it's only up from here, okay, for Optic, only up from here. The more series you guys are in on this stage, you guys are gonna turn into a beast. And I know all these fans here in the eSports arena wanna see this, talk to them, they've been cheering like crazy. What do you wanna say to these Optic Gaming fans here in Texas? Yeah, op the Optic fan base, you guys, showing up all the time, every event, whether it's here at home or elsewhere, you guys are incredible. There's no other word for it. Even on a Friday, you guys are getting loud, getting excited. It's very much appreciated. We can hear you, so thank you very much. All right. That's going to do it for me and Lucid on the stage. Lot, take us away. Thank you so much, Blaze, and I hope you guys are satisfied with the 3-0 for your team kicking things off at their major Optic Gaming, looking absolutely fabulous, as always. And we had quite a few questions coming into this series. How were Optic going to look on LAN with their brand new pickup, Dead Zone? And one, they looked phenomenal. Two, Dead Zone looked phenomenal. And I am so excited to see what this major has in store with this team, because right now, they seem to be gelling. They seem to be clicking. Uh, and you know, I think in terms of Dead Zone, talking about the game-changing plays we were hoping for out of him, he certainly had those today in this major. And that series for me, I was really impressed with not only how he held his composure, but he really did start to elevate his team's gameplay as well. That's exactly what you need to look for when you pick up a brand new player, and especially into a team who have seen success with a previous roster as well. But I've got to ask you about the team chemistry right now, because Active this team are looking like they're just about starting to gel, and that can be very scary for oppositions. Yeah, Lucid talked about it a little bit. I think it's going to take some time, but uh, one of the things that uh, Dead Zone had said is, with this team, he there are moments where he feels the most chemistry he's ever felt on a team, and obviously there are moments there he's disjointed, and Lucid talked about it a little bit. You know, he's got to gel with the new roster. I think he's done phenomenal in that series. I think what we're going to see out of him is going to be great as this season goes on. Yeah, I really enjoyed watching Dead Zone that entire series. When I was looking at the stats, I think I, I grabbed my eyes first, gravitated towards Lucid, who was killing it in, in the kills, and he definitely was slaying out. But then when I really dug into the damage and I combined the kills and assist, it was Dead Zone that was really standing out in that department. His kills and assists were definitely felt that he was literally right there as far as damage with Lucid. Dead Zone was a large reason why Optic were able to close out those very close games. Very close indeed. And we're seeing moments there in that last layer. And I want to talk quickly with you, Active, especially about Morsely uh, and the kind of the consistency we've been seeing from this guy. No bittersweet lost out 3 0 there, but there were some moments of brilliance coming through from this roster. And one was Mortally. I was just very upset with that last Slayer. Mortally had the camera in his hands, and that pressure that was applied by Optic Gaming just led to a complete fall short of that camo play and camo push, which could have been so different. Yeah, the pressure comes into play in game and out of the game, right? You're playing in Optic's house, you're playing against the former world champs. That pressure can really just get to you, right? You have 
camo. Unfortunately, your team plays a bit too forward, doesn't really let you cook with that camo. And because of that, they end up losing that game. It was very close, so it was bittersweet, but they ended up losing at the end. They certainly did. And, and Tony, I've got to ask you a little bit about what Lucid said on the stage as well. He talked about consistency, but not only consistency with winning series, but actually how they're playing in game, physically in a series, making sure that they're always on top, always locked in. And Tony, when you're looking across how that series went, for me, I've got to say the Opal was very scrappy. I didn't love the start that Optic showed, but I like the fact that they also transitioned into a much better, more reserved gameplay style, something that I think is a little bit more difficult to combat. I think scrappiness, I feel like Bittersweet were being able to kind of keep up with them. The second Optic got into a flow, it was ever so difficult. Yeah, I think consistency and teamwork is really what Optic are known for. Like, as the game starts to go further into the actual game itself, we start to, time starts to wind down, but other teams will tend to maybe drop off as far as their momentum, as far as their energy, as far as their speed. But Optic Gaming stay consistent that entire time. And lots of times when the games get as close as they did, I lean on the teams that have been on these moments more. I lean on the, on, on the teams that are consistent and have that experience. And I think that's one of the reasons why Optic, again, were able to close out, again, very close games. Now, Tony, you mentioned moments, and we're having a moment right here. Sentinels down 2-1 against Proton Gaming on a side station here. We're in Solitude Stronghold. This is getting awfully close, and Proton Gaming right now with a double cap. Getting real close. They're looking for just one more point for Proton Gaming. The final seconds are coming in. It's a last second push out of Sentinel oh. to try to take Bravo, oh. but... <laughs> What a time what a to steal. turn over to this Tony <laughs> Active. I mean, the final seconds there were catching live of this game. I would not have put any money, and no offense, Proton Gaming, uh, honestly, respect to you on that series going 3-1 in favor of Proton Gaming, wow. especially with the consistency that Sentinels have shown all off-season. Tony, what is happening? I don't know if my eyes deceive me, but that looked like a 3-1 series in favor of Proton it, it, Gaming. It was, yes. Uh, Suspector on the four, on his former team, Sentinels. How much have we been talking about Sentinels looking so good in these online events leading to this tournament? The places that they have... At uh, what what a steal coming from Proton. Huge steal. Uh, it's interesting because obviously we, we only get the last seconds there of that match. I'm not entirely sure what went down. We do have some highlights to have a look at and maybe we can actually analyze those as we go through. But Active, how much can maybe a really slow start kind of push into this kind of situation, this type of, I guess, energy with this team? Maybe yeah. it wasn't what they wanted against Shopify Rebellion and something has regressed in them going forward against Proton. Yeah, it's tough. When you have a slow start in a tournament, your mind starts to tick. You start to, you know, be negative in your thoughts and That'll steamroll and it'll snowball. And, and if you allow that to happen, you end up with a, a team like Proton Gaming who fully take advantage of that. And that's what they did in that series. That is an upset that we didn't expect to see, especially with Sentinels sticking with that roster because they were so confident in it. Yeah, I, I gotta say, I am very surprised by that. I think in, in terms of well-polished, uh, knowing exactly what you're getting coming into this new season with your team and, and having to adapt to the changes, but knowing how maybe your teammates might handle those, you think that ticks all the boxes for Sentinels, right? and you go up against Proton Gaming, who really are, are working, I think, actually previously stainers from uh, some of the qualifiers. You know, I'm very shocked by this, but again, you can never really count Gilkey out in his score, <laughs> to be honest. Tony Gilkey can come up and bite you at the best of times. I mean, he, he steps up when it matters most, but I, I'm, you know, I'm gonna take a page out of your uh, your book, Act. I'm gonna, I wanna talk about the emotions of the mental, yes. and, I, and I wanna lean on a for a player like, for example, King Dick. Longtime duo of Sparty, and took a lot of criticism over towards, you know, years past and even even the breakup between them wasn't really all that pretty to be honest with you and again you know another former teammate of the sentinels coming in getting a big win on it like i think that's huge i, I can only imagine that king nick he must be feeling good because i can imagine that win just meant a little extra for him. Yeah, I think it's all about the intangibles, right? If you have that extra reason to win, you will perform your best. And, you know, maybe that is what it is for King Nick. And he's proved that here, uh, that that roster change, or, you know, being a part of this Proton Gaming roster has worked out for him. Indeed, and I've got to say, with the uh, roster on their side, they're actually very, very talented. you got the likes of Suspector, who's always been a main slayer. Sab, who's been really coming forward as well. Really excited to see his gameplay this season. I mean, what an absolute shocker. Already upsets in major 
year one. Who would have thought it, folks? Who would have thought it? We'll see you looking ever so different with Sentinels on the back foot, hoping that that open bracket team comes in and are not ready to play a very angry and a very out to prove something Sentinels coming into tomorrow. But incredible scores coming across the board. As you can see, Pool A, 2-0 for FaZe Clan, topping their pool, waiting for that OB team to come on in. And we're going to be seeing Space Station Gaming up next very shortly from Pool B, going up against Foe, the European hopes and dreams on their shoulders and pull D complexity right now sitting pretty with Optic Gaming who they'll be facing later on on the main stage to see who will be topping their pool today but yeah incredible stuff across the board my goodness I love going to the side station every time I get told something crazy is happening on the side station I cannot believe my eyes with some of the upsets that are coming across the board what else could today hold for us I have no idea but what I do know is that coming up next we do have space station gaming versus foe it is our first look at the life with legend for SSG and I cannot wait to see how these guys perform on the stage foe they have everything to prove right now with multiple changes and multiple wins going out of Europe we'll see who is going to be taking this series right after the break Hey, guess what? New year means a new optic scuff design for a new controller. Check out this sexy design. It's a nod to the original OG logo and a great way to rep the green wall. Choose between the Reflex for PS5, the Instinct for Xbox, and the brand new Envision for PC gaming. Guess what? Scuff saw your comments and they're now selling the faceplate separately for the Envision and the Instinct for $29.99. Sorry, I'm kind of busy. Mm, kind of not. Leave a message. Yeah, the mega red boys here, cinnamon. Flow tastes sweet like cinnamon. Open up doors, I'm a gentleman. View top floor, I'm still staying ahead of them. Running on fumes and adrenaline. Do what I do best, huh? Can't rush in like a roulette. Huh? You can't name a better duet. Huh? Don't ask questions. Trying to figure out what sound. Don't worry about what next. Just know we got now.
AMS 2024 Kickoff Arlington Major is presented by AMD, Scuff, and Corduroys. Hello, Halo fans, and welcome back to the 2024 HCS Arlington Kickoff Major, hosted by Optic Gaming, and it was Optic Gaming taking a 3-0 sweep on the main stage just moments ago, looking formidable at the moment at their hometown. Really excited to see actually how the green wall progresses through the rest of the major and what they're going to do against, I think, putting it as respectfully as I can, teams that are around the same caliber. I am trying to be nice here, yeah. but you know, teams who are really gunning for that first place spot, teams who have the goal of it's either first, second is not good enough for us, that's a loss. So really excited about this Optic Gaming roster and what they're gonna be bringing to the table, but let's update you guys with the schedule to show you what is coming your way, what we have had, what you might have missed, because we've had some exceptional games. This clan started off the day with a 3-0 against Quadrant Sentinels. It was a 3-1 against Shopify Rebellion. Rebellion taking that upset. Unbelievable scenes. Baseline 3-0 then ascending baseline. Optic Gaming, we've just seen them on the main stage. 3-0, bittersweet, looking fantastic. And up next, it's Space Station versus Foe. And then after that, rounding off your night, of course, it's the hometown team back at it again. Optic Gaming versus Complexity on the main stage at 7.30 p.m. Now. When we come to Space Station versus Foe, really excited for both of these two teams. I, I think, you know, it's going to be a bit of a battle. I think mainly for Foe. When I'm looking at the two, I do think that there is an, a bit of an imbalance. That is not me disrespecting Foe in any way, shape, or form. I think they have done phenomenally well to go up against Quadrant in Europe, to take that throne from Quadrant coming in as the first seed for EU. I think they have done incredibly well so far. Now they find themselves against arguably their toughest competition to date, really, in this season, in the off season. Now, Space Station Gaming, roster change for them with Legend, I truly believe they have only got better with legend just in terms of the pacing and everything that this man brings to the table tim what do we need to be looking out for with this change what are you most excited about i mean legend's always been the number one player in the eu so bringing him over to na now under a roster who's de decorated and has their accolades i think he's only going to grow as a player and that's a bit scary because he's already really good I also think that Legend opens up Bound. I think he allows Bound to play freely, aggressively, and Legend kind of couples with him, and they just work really well together. This SSG roster is looking scary. I, I can't wait to see what they're capable of. They're looking very scary indeed. And Tony, with Legend, you know, he left Quadrant after a very successful year, a historic year. And I've got to say, you know, there's a lot of pressure on this young man's shoulders. Do you think he can handle this pressure well enough to be able to get a chip here with SSG? I mean, yeah, when I, when I look at Space Station Gaming, I see the second best team in the world, and who knows? I see, the, I see them winning a few tournaments uh, this year. I really do. But to play a bit of devil's advocate, this is the first time we're seeing Legend on a roster that has this amount of expectations on him. I think there's a, a big difference between a team that, you know, is a top six team and with a stretch goal of a top four and a top three, like Quadrant were last year, and a team with the expectations to win championships. When you look at SSG, it's kind of win or bust. Anything out of the top two is considered a disappointment. So I think it's a, a little bit of a difference of expectations. And I will say, I think SSG are going to be good, but just want to play a little devil's advocate. I give, like that. Give the other side of the coin. I like the other side of the coin. And speaking of, why not go straight to it right now, which is Foe on the other side of the stage, sitting pretty and hoping to create something here to have that magic to take down SSG right here, right now in the major in pool play day. And I got to say, friend or foe, right? I mean, you're looking at the foe roster, and for me right now, my eyes are going to Chick. We talked about Legend and their very familiar Chick being dropped by Quadrant post the Legend move. Things have been kind of a bit of shambles for Chick, but he's landed on his feet very firmly in Europe and looking phenomenal with this roster. And Tony, starting with you, you know, with Chick, it's going to be like a little bit of a rivalry up there. How do you think he's going to handle the pressure of knowing the familiar face of Legend and knowing he left to try and go to greener pastures? Yeah, I mean, speaking of two different sides of the coins, you have Legend that left that Quadrant roster to join the second best team in the world. And then you have Chick who was 
drop from that quadrant roster who was struggling after the legend moves. So I really wonder what Chick's mental is like right now when you're going up against your former teammate in legend uh, who was on a, you know, a better team right now, who's on a team that's destined to win championships. If anything, if I'm Chick, Maybe I'm, I'm playing a little angry, but I'm playing with a little fire under my belt. Maybe I'm going to have the best series of the tournament. True. And also, by the way, we, we heard you Lip. LeBound. We <laughs> heard Don't you. waste so many fun. <laughs> We heard you. And, and this duo is going to be just... I, honestly, I'm, I'm guessing unstoppable. This duo is a scary one. I think them running around the map together, being able to create openings and, and just so much space for this team, I, it's pretty terrifying with also partnered efficiency as well from SSG. It's going to be pretty scary, but active on the side of things for Foe as well. We talk about a keyboard and mouse player as well, Wutum. He's come into conversation quite a few times. What do you think this young man brings to the table? I think Wutum is the best mouse and keyboard player in the game right now. And honestly, I think he's going to prove it here this weekend. I, I think that he has just a phenomenal ability to put max damage in. I was watching him a little bit versus Native, and his ability to just shoot everything in sight is incredible, and it allows his team to just clean everything up. This, this, this player is just it's going to get tons better, especially under Jimbo. I can't wait to see what he's going to do. Yeah, speaking of Jimbo, actually, Jim has had a really good offseason. I do think that this team has allowed him to come into his own a little bit. Uh, and Tony, talk to me about the improvements of Jimbo on this roster and how he started to, to kind of push forward as a, as a different type of role and different type of player. Yeah, I'm loving what I've seen from Jimbo from a leadership standpoint. Right. And what he's been able to do with players. I, I think back of what he did with Mighty's, but giving him a shot coming from a different game, and Mighty's has been absolutely incredible. Then you do the same thing with Glory, and Glory did so well under that Jimbo uh, mindset, and that Jimbo scheme, that he was stolen by Quadra to try to replace Legend. And even the same thing now with Wutum, you know, a player that got top four Blackpool. I think that's impressive, but some others might say maybe some other veterans should have had that spot, but Jimbo has had to found a way to find young talent within the scene and give them a chance. Not enough just to recognize the talent, but give them a chance on a top team and succeed with them. Yeah, it's worked out so far in Europe coming into this major as the first seed, but it is their time to shine on a main stage against Space Station Gaming. Folks, the stage has been set. Our teams are ready to go. Space Station Gaming versus Foe. Let's meet them both now. Welcome, Arlington. We have a banger of a matchup in front of us. It's SSG versus the number one seed in Europe. I'm Wes Clutch. I'm next to a legend of Halo. You know who Dave Walsh is. Dave, how excited are you to see this new SSG roster play the number one team in Europe, Bo? I am pumped. I mean, we've already seen some Kings fall earlier today in the form of Sentinels. Twice. It's also the Ides of March, so <laughs> it's a day to King Slay out here. We're going to see what SSG is going to do, but to be real, when we looked at Europe last year, in the former quadrant, we saw this roster that could break in the top three, that could challenge the best of the best, that went further. I think we're kind of at a bit of a reset period now for Europe. They're kind of re-jostling for position. You now see Foe is that number one spot, but how high up is that number one spot in the globe? Big piece of that conversation is how much of that credit from quadrant success last year was on Legend's shoulders, and what does that mean for SSG with a pickup like that? 
I think this is a, a historic pickup. Many other times we've seen international players enter into a U.S. team. It's been to try to break into like that top four area. Not once have we seen an international player be brought on to a top two team to take the number one spot. And SSG scouted out Legend for that reason. And I think that that's what makes this opportunity, Arlington, so special. We get our first look at Legend in an SSG uniform. And let me tell you, I've been watching this kid stream since he's been in the States. He might just be the best player in the game, in my opinion. Can he showcase that skill set here this weekend? We're going to find out very quickly against some very familiar foes as he plays his old teammate Chick as well as Jimbo and the boys. I do want to take a second as we get into this Empyrean CTF to talk about a player that Bo picked up in Wutum. He's on screen. He's a mouse and keyboard player, Dave. But I got to see his movement. I feel like any other time I've seen a top M&K player, the aim can be there, but I've yet to see someone apply that halo knowledge, the actual movement, the position across the map to be as effective. So you we'll give him another chance more, to jump, you start watching jump me play a little bit more. <laughs> I'm a massive keyboard player myself, but this Wutum kid, I hear special things about. Stellar's got the overshield, the snipe, he's putting it to work. He's found Jimbo S1, and he's got a great position to be a thorn in the side of Foe. But look at this, Foe just trying to push through. They meet the resistance against Eco, and that's going to be three down for a moment, make it three down again. Jimbo, the only one lives trying to stop over at the first BR. A little bit of untraditional pull here as he's going to pull it towards the courtyard. Stellar blocking this courtyard. Hits the no-scope right before getting taken down. Jimbo's face is gone. Overextenders from Bo. Not quite here yet, but Bound's going to drop this flag. Off to Slay. He finds a perfect kill on the Wutum. The last player that Foe might have something oh. to say about is Mighty's. Mighty's wins a big 1v1, but this flag's still out, and it looks like Space Station are going to get the touch, take down Mighty's, and this is going to be Space Station going up one nothing. Look at Space Station just knowing what to do in each situation. They knew to run the flag towards the runway since they had the coverage there. They didn't have the spawns blocked over at Needler. Once they got over the training, bow. Drops the flag, turns around and helps Eco slay over at the training. Even though he got taken out by the second player, he took out one and got the damage needed to bring that flag in. Just a heads up play, but now that's giving map control over to Foe. Foe's picked up a few kills. Three down for SSG. They're trying to pull the flag cuts as well. Legend gets taken down. Nobody quite in a position to pick this flag up, however, as that flag carrier and Chick does get taken down. The return bound to come through here momentarily. That player S1 may have been able to get a touch, but because he gets taken down, flag will reset, map control will reset, space station up one nothing. And you have to worry about this trickling. This could be playing out well here for Foe. However, at the same time, they could be just going in on individual battles. So Wudum gets taken down. We saw Mighty's fall earlier over in the court, but this pressure has been nonstop here from Foe. And that's what happens when you get that mid-map control right. They've had the opportunities to push, but the kills have not come through. The map resets once again. Overshield and snipe are, and rockets will be coming up here momentarily. SSG are in a good position. Let's see how it plays out. Yeah, SSG just taking a little slower on their side. Here comes that push again from Bo. Clearly, Bo have control of the center of the map. They have rockets. Now we're going to see which one comes out ahead. Flag pole coming out of Bo. Rockets in the hands of Bo. Can they use it to negate this overshield? And Stellar taking little damage there, loses all his OS, but the damage has been done, gets a double kill, and this is looking not so scary here for Space Station. In fact, look how fast he's moved across the map. He's confident and pulling it through the hallway. Yeah, Stella knows those first two kills are his signal to go pull the flag as his teammates are getting taken down, however, that flag from Foe still on the move. That flag takes down Stellar. That flag through the camo hall at this point. Foe have got the slay. He's got the return, and they will tie this up momentarily. 1-1. One, one. Wow. That's why I was questioning a little bit on that pole, but same time, when you get two kills and you can grab the flag before they spawn. Tell me out, guys. It's your instinct is you pull that flag, and everyone's going to take care of anything else across the map. A little bit greedy of a play, we'll call it, from Stellar. Maybe, but, but like it's just in, it's in your Halo instincts. Nine out of ten times, that's turned into a cap. Yeah, nine out of ten times, somebody else on SSG is getting a kill in the 3v2 situation. However, what a phenomenal play from Foe's point of view that had to be to win that 2v3, to keep that flag on the move. And now look at this day, Wu-Tang oh through God. the camo hall, flying, soaring, taking down Eco, and that might be his signal with two down to pull a flag. Absolutely, he's got to get that grab. In fact, I almost wonder if that's a bit of a worrying play there. 
try and just challenge too much across needle and or across to training instead of just getting that pull and putting that flag pressure on. He's going to take a lot of damage if he goes for it, but yeah. his movement is so quick on that M and K. It's just something we're not as used to seeing here at the highest level of Halo since it's so controller dominated. And he's not in 0 and 7 right now. Obviously, being able to hang with SSG that speaks testament right now. 10 0 and 7 as he picks up another kill, made his way already into the Neewer as well. So you can tell he's being aggressive. You love to see that. The battle for map control is real right now. Foe contesting SSG every bit of the way. And are we just seeing some greedy play with zero assists? Or are we just saying this guy doesn't miss his shots and finish his own kills? Finishing his kills <laughs> is what I say. If I have zero assists, it's that way. If my teammate has zero assists, help me out. <laughs> Eco being aggressive, takes down Wutum. Knows that there's a player top tower. Chick's not going to peek him, though. Eco knows he wants one more kill before trying to pull this flag, but nobody from Foe actually pushes back to the flag. Maybe a core mistake because the fundamental is getting control of your flag. We'll see if they're able to get the kills, which it looks like they were on the training side of the map. That will shut this flag down. Well, it seems like what Foe have been opting to do is any single time they spawn on one side of the map, whether they're spawning towards Needle or Mauler, they're gonna slash, take that or side. towards... Yep, yeah, then they're just going to push straight through to their side. Rather than trying to fight at a disadvantage back at their this. base and potentially get it pinched. Look at this. Mighty's has overshook Chick has rockets. This is everything you want if you're a foe fan. Can you find the kill? Somehow Chick doesn't get the kill. He gets traded out. That's going to be the overshoot getting dwindled down as the flag does get pulled to plat. Mighty's going to play his life. Slays are what you need right now on the side of foe. Can they find a couple of kills? That grenade looked money, but no damage from it at all. And that's going to be foe getting taken down in the map resetting once again. No dice in that situation. It was looking good, like you said, Wes, but you need the kills end of day. Everything else can be they're good on paper. You can have someone there with OS, with the flag already, but you need to execute and get the kills. In fact, three members just down a moment ago for Foe. Stellar is going to be moving this one across the map. Now let's see how Foe respond. In the past, they've just continually pushed through with their own side. Stellar, scared of that snipe. In fact, wants to take it out of their hands and decides not to run the flag and goes for map control. Yeah, Stellar sees snipe. Stellar gets snipe. That's how he thinks. <laughs> Stellar takes down enemies with the snipe. Stellar takes down Jimbo with a nice body shot to the VR and the bandit rifle. A player's pushing him S1. A great kill from Wu Tum. Hopefully he can get that S7 in hand. You know you want to see it from the mouse and keyboard player's perspective. Eco trying to deny that from happening, but as he's caught out here in this overshield runway, it's going to be a difficult spot for him to fight on. But Mighty's with the snipe now looking to push. You know, we got to kind of flag that on the, the space station side, whether that was a mistake for to not run that flag or whether they just weren't able to execute and get the slays they needed to eventually move that across the map. Like we said, we had Stellar over there with snipe. Stellar also had the early option to run that flag through to Needle and try to get support there. But we're back on even ground again. In fact, Jimbo and Bo pushing all the way through. They have two dead. But Five kills answered. Remain. Oh, Bo's going to go three down here. Mighty's going to be your last player looking to try and push. Going to get some space on the training in his control. Takes down the sniper. That's massive. Gets word that there's a snipe down training pit. Finds a kill. Almost gets another. And that's going to open the door for Bo to get some map control and potentially a yep. power weapon in their hands. But Chick found the snipe and now. Top of the enemy's tower, where is SSG at? This yeah, time? they got the weapons, they got the position. One thing I also want to highlight from Mighty there was how he was able to space himself perfectly on the training to avoid the melee. Something you're not going to get away with as much online, but on land, these people are going to know the exact lunge distance and be able to dodge that and bait that out. SSG do a good job of getting the rockets, taking down Chick. Bound's going to end himself off the map right now. Not quite sure what happened with Overshield, but three down for Foe and a flag on the move for SSG. Foe are coming off respawn and need to act quickly. Bound just creeping. All right, my teammate's taking the last. I'm jumping off yeah. the map. That's what you're going to get. No, but we're going to see how Stellar's going to react here as that flag was moving across. And Legend going to be able to put that one in. Despite Bound falling off the map, Legend Space Station Gaming still able to get that second cap on the board. Yeah, you give Overshield and Rockets to SSG, they get a cap. Bo had that same opportunity the last time those power ups and power weapons came up. They were not able to transition that into a cap. That is the difference here in game one so far. Three minutes and 37 seconds on the clock. Stellar is 21, 10, and 14 starting to heat up. A couple of kills would be big for Foe as they need to act quickly. But Stellar, I like this, not just sitting back and playing defense, being aggressive, pushing all the way over here trading, gets the flank on Woodham, and now coming back towards his half of the map to try to play a little defense now that he's cleared out a couple spots.
I believe there's one more. Nope. Last player alive is Chick. He's going to be coming off spawn here. Snipes are coming up. Maybe that's the power weapon Foe will need in order to get something going. But for the past several minutes, Dave, it really feel like SSG has started to find their footing in this series and starting to gain a lot more control of the map. As I say that, Wutum breaks the door open with another camo hall push. You got to love the focus for the Needler and camo hall that Wutum has been per pursuing all game. Yeah, historically, throughout this map's life cycle, when it first was introduced in Halo 3, that has just been the better route to run the flag. It's just been quicker. You don't have to get more rounds of slays. You don't have to fight them back at your own base. It just works out to be the better spot to run the flag. And so you see those teams generally prioritizing and blocking that needler side of the map. They used to say it every day, camo and green, guys, camo and green, <laughs> over and over and over again. However, it's going to be Space Station running the flag through camo at this time. Eco with a snipe battle that does not matter because Legend will punch the third flag in off screen. And that's going to do it for our game one SSG will in three to one. About to make a bad pun, be like V five O done, <laughs> <laughs> and that's gonna Thank be three caps you for on the not board. Doing that. <laughs> <laughs> but that is gonna be tough right there because in many respects, there foe, they held their own as we looked through 75% of that game. But as Space Station started to get a hold, once they started to run those flags, it didn't even matter if a player fell and made a large mistake. They're still able to just cap that and put it on the board. Early game, back and forth, back and forth. But the big moment for me in that game, Dave, was we see Chick with Rockets. We see another player from Foe with the Overshield. They're both on the flag. I'm like, this has got to be Rocket the guy in the Mauler. Get the flag first. And we're going to get the, the lead here for Foe. Somehow, someway, Chick not able to get that kill. He ends up actually getting taken down. That forces the flag carry that has Overshield to kind of stall. That Overshield gets dwindled down from shots across the map. All of a sudden, all the power curve that you once had completely negated. That flag gets stopped. When you get an Overshield and a set of rockets against SSG and somehow you end up in their flag, you need to figure out ways to transition that into a score line. Because they weren't able to do that, we clearly saw what SSG were able to do the rest of the game. As we take a look at the stats, that's Stellar has got to be the man to talk about. There he is. My Stellar just going off. 23, 16, and 11 assists. By far the most positive there on the board. Um, everyone's playing. And kind of just no surprise is the weird thing to say. Like, uh, yeah. it's not like we Business went on as usual. Business as usual for Stellar. Yeah, I mean, you, you start to look at his screen. It's just, okay, yeah, he's not missing shots. He's always in the right spot. He's making the correct decision on where to push. And one of the things I want to point out with this stat page that we were able to see was Bound. And I had an opportunity to talk to Bound yesterday, and he said, don't be surprised when you see me going negative. I haven't touched a power weapon in months. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, they don't let you snipe anymore? He's like, like, he's like, Stellar and Legend there. get the snipe. Yep. Like, Eco and, and Legend get the rockets. He's like, I hadn't seen it. I just pushed with the bandit out. I go, so you're a bandit specialist. He's like, yeah, I, I go neg every game now. So those Bound fans out there, he is still an elite player. He is still looking to make the right plays. He might just have a few he's less power weapons. He's the playmaker, though. I mean, like, that's one of the reasons why he was picked up for this SSG roster you just saw how much space he always created for his team he was always at the front line he's always the one kind of doing those entry frags the staying alive for an extra two seconds or so and his teammates are right behind him to you, help him out you called him the playmaker I call him the space maker because he creates so much opportunity for the rest of the guys creating space at all times with how quick he plays the game how much damage he typically deals down game two is going to be Aquarius Slayer, and this is probably Foe's biggest opportunity to extend this series to a game four, I'd have to say, after watching game one. You gotta figure out a way to get that new overshow that spawns bottom middle, Dave. Do you think that Foe showed us enough individually that if we remove some power weapons off the map and just had an overshow that they can contest in a map like Aquarius? Um, individually, I did see those moments. I mean, if I had to highlight what went wrong throughout some of those times in Empyrean, I felt like there was hesitations once Foe got onto SSG side of the map. There was times where they needed to just pull that flag instantly just to put that added pressure. Space Station, they're not going to overextend. They're going to play it calm, cool, and collected until you force their hand. And yeah. so there's a lot of times where they had somebody behind enemy lines like, well, until you pull that flag, like, I'll just challenge yeah. you. I'll fight you across map. It's fine. It's adding another thing to the equation that yes, they have to yes. try and weigh in their head, right? Their decisions are all made off of all the information they know. They add it up. That's the equation. If you add the flag on the move to that equation, all of a sudden, your decisions get a little bit riskier. It's like, man, where'd this other variable come from? Yeah. I'm not trying to do calculus here. Exactly, this is yeah. tough. I'm a plus-minus guy, plus-minus guy. 
Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, when it comes to, uh, like I said, Empyrean as well, like a lot of your decisions and routes are kind of predetermined ahead of time. Where did you get your spawn? How how long is it going to take for you to get all the way across the map? And so a lot of those pieces kind of of that puzzle come together later on. Whereas Aquarius, you can get in the action kind of at any point. If you ever want to get towards top car or top pink, you can be a factor in probably any single fight across the map. And so there's going to be less difficulty in some of these equations. We're going to have to see if that plays in foe's favor. I think it will. But the big question to me, I think where we have seen upsets so far today are the teams that were underdogs that dominated the power-up stories. This is an opportunity to really dom take advantage of a power-up in the overshow that now spawns pink one. And we're hopping into this. It's going to be Legend on screen, and he's made his way to pink already. Yep, and here comes the charge short P2. Everyone's focused on this side. Mighty takes down Legend. Chick falls down, and that is going to also be another death in the form of Bound. So it looks like Foe able to win that opening break, but it's not a commanding victory. No, the overshield gets wasted, so that's okay. If you're on the side of Foe, you'll take it. Up three to one right now. Eco spotted out. Front blue, front yellow brick. He sits taken down. Good teamwork from Foe there as they get three down for Space Station. Bound is pointed out. Thrust, Heat Wave make it an easy kill for Mighties as they take the seven to two lead. Look at this, Mighties has these players stuck inside yellow, and they know this now. Now, how does Foe react? They know at least two members of Space Station are inside of yellow base, and they can put this crunch on if they position correctly, but look at that. What a push out to clear out the utility from Bound. And if you're Mighties there, you know that there's several players waiting around this corner. If you peek, you take too much damage, that's exactly what's gonna happen. They're gonna kick the door open on your setup. Bound forces Space Station's way out of the base successfully. They've now made it a more contestable game here. As he finds a player front to base, he's gonna be able to take him down. It's not the easiest kill he's ever gotten, but he acquired it nonetheless. He's been able to cycle the thrust as well. Nine to seven, the lead for foe still. It's been so active, but also look at how quickly these players optimize and how fast they're moving on. So the reason you saw Bound kind of struggle with the last shot is he thought he got the finish. He was already looking over towards bottom middle or bottom car and realizing he can get the finish, gets that kill, and he's like, all right, back to same old, and just go sprint across the map. So these players are just down to the millisecond when it comes to how quickly they're moving around and making sure that they're being difficult targets. And you gotta be so careful with that because the bandit can do so much damage so quickly. Overshield coming up now in three seconds. The battle looks like it's being won by SSG at the moment. Two players down there. The reinforcements for SSG make it their overshield. Legend now with the overshield. You know he wants to fly. Let's see what he can do. Legend clearing out of the util, and now we have a one-kill game. Looks like Space Station's likely going to tie it up here very soon, but there goes all the OS. Legend one shot. Wootum and Mighty's clear out the front courtyard, and Foe still holding on to their lead despite losing that last OS. So kudos to them to not let that fall apart all at once. Stellar with the double kill as he ties this one up. I'm going to go to a listen in here with Space Station Gaming and hear how they treat this mid game. Still, as we cross the halfway mark right now, Foe with the lead, in fact, giving you everything you can handle if you're SSG here in this game, too. A must win, I would say, if they want to extend this series far. And right now, SSG tried to compete for that overshield, but Stellar couldn't get there in time. 
Dave, what are you seeing out of Foe that's making this game so much different than game one? Hard to say because I did feel like we saw plenty of equal fights or exchanges from Foe over on Pyrian TTF, winning battles. Right here, I feel like there's just no hesitations, like I said. There's no times where someone's saying, all right, should I push this way or should I do this? Like, it's just a bloodbath back and forth this entire, entire time. And so that's why we're seeing it so equal. And yeah. I also don't see our don't see Space Station ever really having gotten the control, unlike we did see in Imperium CTF. There's plenty of times in Imperium CTF where they got three or four down and they got to move across the map and take control, get a setup. I'm not really seeing any longevity of a setup here from Space Station. Instead, they're just trying to fight off the spawn. They're trying to get any little semblance of control they can, whether it's at pink or util. And as you've said that, it's blown up into a seven kill lead now for Foe. Wu Tum leading the pack at 12, seven, and 10 right now. The mouse and keyboard player is showing out against some of the world's best. We call it Legend Europeans best. Looking to say something about that as he tries to tie this series up. It is now just a five kill game, however, kills Several kills go into Space Station's favor, I'm sorry. Enemy team and right now, Stellar with the Heat Wave can make a difference in this game and in this series. If he can find a few kills, he uses the thrust easy to pick up that kill on the Wu Tum. Check no shield as well. Plays his life so oh. perfectly. Great shots from Stellar. The movement was perfect. And now, all of a sudden, just a three kill game. That dodge back and forth there is just such the difference maker. And those are the sort of battles that Stellar just coming out ahead when he shouldn't. He has no business winning a fight like that. No business. No business at all, but gets the job done anyways. I guess that's a lot of the times I watch Stellar. I feel like he has no business <laughs> doing half the things he does, but he pulls them off so flawlessly, so fluently, so consistently. Mighty's, however, found himself another overshield. It might have gotten melted, but a win condition removed from Space Station. Kills go in the favor of Foe as they capitalize on Mighty's distraction, 47-42. Yeah, acquisition is as good as deletion when you're ahead like that. You just don't want something that can massively swing in your opposing team's favor. Right now, Foe, they just want to trade damage, trade kills, and close this game out. Chick gets a nice stick on the bound. Stellar eventually taking Chick out. We're down to the final two kills here for Foe. It's now a three kill game, and that's going to be Foe walking away with game number two, 50 to 46. I wondered if Foe was going to be able to win a game. I doubted that Foe was going to be able to win a game, and they proved me wrong. This Foe team is the number one seed in EU for a reason. And that was a very strong performance from them. Dave, I think you pointed on it just, just a tad bit when you were talking about how it never really felt like SSG had multiple members of Foe down. Like there was never three or four down for Foe, which is a testament to the last two players alive, having the awareness and the space to be able to stay alive long enough for respawners to help. Do you think that that can transition to an objective now that they've taken game one? We're going to pull up the stats in a second here and take a look at him. Great job by Foe here, but I'm very interested to see, do you think that this can build momentum into an objective game type for game three? 100%. I mean, when we looked at game number one, it was even 70% throughout that game. It was tied one to one. In fact, Foe had more opportunities to get flag poles and try to turn that into potential caps compared to Space Station throughout the first three quarters of that game. However, when we got to those last few minutes when Space Station got control, you just saw it all fall apart for Foe. You saw Space Station keeping control the entire time, bringing a flag back, bringing back a second flag and to, to close out the game. It was just once they got that full control. And so I don't know what Space Station has to do to get that full control besides distracting, you know, getting the right kills, putting on the right spawn trap. Ultimately, it just feels like when they do get that control, though, that they're just fine. They're efficient with the objective. We've seen that in game one, but game two, not the case, however. What an impressive performance. And Dave, I want to point out one thing I really feel. I don't know the statistic, but I feel like we saw almost every single overshield go into Foe's hands. The first one went into bound, but it got immediately deleted and erased off the map. But just about every other time, it felt like Foe was on top and had a numbers advantage for every overshield other than I would say one that I specifically remember SSG getting, but it even got deleted. A test of map like live fire, let's transition this thought process. Can you control the power of some power weapons? Because a lot of time when you're trying to create an upset, you have to. Yeah, there's there's a bit much on live fire now to control it all. Yes. But there are enough of those small advantages that add up, whether it's grabbing that camo, whether it's grabbing that QT. There's just so much going on across the map, so it's going to be divided attention. What 
will be interesting to me is to see if anyone can replicate that old quadrant style of play on strongholds they were known as the number one strongholds teams last season Unbelievable. but now that information is being it's spread scattered. out yeah, yeah. now, legends now got the yeah, is legend able to, yeah got the exactly recipe. everyone's gonna put their own little take on the recipe add a yeah. little thing here take something out a little pepper over exactly. in exactly and so we're gonna see how they how they mesh or how they take some of these learnings because that was one big takeaway we had from quadrant last year is like they they clearly were such a top squad but they had just something to it that I never even got articulated to me before where like whether they saw a specific moment happen and they'd make a correct decision. There was just something special to their Strongholds gameplay that Complimentary just... play styles, something yeah. going on there, but they had the recipe. Exactly. Because <laughs> I, that was honestly the wildest thing in 2023, the entire season, was the fact that this one team was so dominant at this one mode. I'd never seen something like that in Halo. I don't know, like maybe from your days where you guys ran every single game type <laughs> for about three years, maybe there was a record where you guys hadn't lost an oddball or a flag or something like that. But that was one of the most impressive things. And the fact that that's now gone, like that yeah. record can't be extended because this roster doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, I think the other impressive part about it is like you said, is it was across every map. So yes, I've had a moment like that. Like <laughs> there's like 07 final boss. Like I don't think we ever lost a Battle Creek Team Slayer. Uh, you like, had Red Side. <laughs> <laughs> we had we had some some cool things going on our side. But, we had Host, but Red Side. <laughs> I'm not going to go there. <laughs> but the whole point being is that that was one map, one mode. This is what, four maps, one mode, that they were just able to beat every single and, top team. And, and they also weren't the, they the, weren't the number one team in yes. the world that time. Yes. So it's just super impressive that they will do that. And we're going to have to see what sort of learnings take place here across these three different rosters with X quadrant members from 2023. You got to think that an, a team like SSG probably already has their own recipe for success. But Foe probably could benefit from a lot of the information that Chick's able to bring to them about how successful that quadrant roster was on, on Stronghold specifically. Legends obviously like, hey, we used to do this, and SSG's probably like, yeah, 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 like, no, we're doing yeah, it. Yeah, so here's what we're gonna yeah, do. This, we're is gonna how, <laughs> this is how we're actually gonna do it. Uh, but I'm sure they actually listen to him as impressive of a player as Legend is and how dominant quadrant was. Game three is going to be live fire. And we haven't talked about one of the things that are on live fire that will dictate the winner of this game three, and that is going to be the snipe. Stellar, legend, bound. I mean, even Eco. He said he's not allowed to touch it. Yeah. It, 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 uh, when he does get it, does I'm he actually, have to drop it now? I'm actually rooting for bound to get the snipe. And if someone ever told me to drop the snipe back in my day, I'd have dropped you. <laughs> <laughs> I've been dropping something else, so yeah. and it wouldn't be the weapon. I did not drop power weapons for nobody. <laughs> Cloud, I'm absolutely. actually glad that that feature did not exist yeah, back then. Because I'd have been asked to drop it a lot. Like, yo, yo, we're in a safe spot right now. Like, no, no, I'm pretty sure they're about to push. Everyone get in their positions. Go, scatter. I got this weapon. I had a, a long story uh, where I was running games with Ares back in Halo 2, and he actually told me to uh, kill myself to give him the sniper <laughs> <laughs> in, in the middle of his scrim. And uh, I'm sure he's in the back laughing right now. But <laughs> needless to say, I did did not do that. <laughs> I actually got a couple of kills and told him to shut up. So, <laughs> so funny enough, thankfully, we didn't have that as an op our opportunity for our teams to use against us. Yes. And we got to touch the snipe a little bit. But I would be pretty upset if they asked Bound to drop the snipe. He can peel with the best of them. Game three is loading up. Live Fire Stronghold is the name of the game. Space Station, one of the best stronghold teams, maybe the best stronghold team we have now. The Quadrant is no longer the roster it was last year with the record they had last year. That S7 is going to be an important piece to the puzzle. You can best believe it. I'm very interested to see how folk can get off the break after the momentum from game two. Yeah, it's hard to imagine uh, Space Station's recipe not being so strong after they take the special sauce legend onto the roster. We're going to have to see what he brings to this team here on Live Fire. And look at that. Just being a huge distraction back B. That's going to be Woodham and Mighty's falling. Space Station going to be grabbed in strongholds and I like this actually I like just going for a when I look at you have two options to grab on the board do you take the one up away from your teammate away from the opponent Enemy. or do you take the neutral objective I always choose the opposing objective you're also playing spawns there if you're eco right you're able to say I'm blocking house they're gonna spawn dummies and back tower they're able to get a perfect start any momentum from game two immediately erased it is six straight kills for space station before folk can find their first 
No headshots for Stellar just yet, but you know they're probably coming as this man does nasty things with the snipe. Bound now with the camouflage in hand, looks to push tower. Yeah, I mean, they have the weapons, they have the power-ups, but look at the score right now, Wes. Like you said, they got like first six of the first seven kills, but it's now a tie game. Also, they were able to take out the camel player right away. His snipe's almost empty at this point. I feel like you're not seeing the value you need on Space Station for how big of an advantage that they got. Let's hold the phone, however. That map control still being added right now. Can Foe get out of this situation? This is the situation underdogs find themselves struggling in so much. Is after this opening break, you've subsided a lot of the power, but they still have control. Stellar finds a double in the kill feed. That gives Space Station a 3-2 man advantage right now. Pressure on the B, Eco trying to deal with it. Mighties takes him down, and that is a big kill by Mighties to relieve some of that map control, and now they've done it. With only 37 points being scored, Dave, that point stands true. Yeah, still looking so good here for Foe. Yes, they're down, but you always got to take a look at the snapshot of the game so far, and if the other team is out slaying you heavily, they have better weapons, they have better position to start off the game, and they only got a 15 or so point lead, I'll take that loss anytime. You always have to, uh, I always look at the game in different states. How much are you gaining when you're significantly ahead and have a major advantage? How are you doing in the neutral game where you're both on even footing? And how are you doing when you're behind? Objective efficiency, Space Station struggling a little bit with it right now, we'd say, as the slaves do favor them. Foe doing a good job of trying to set up for this overshield, but here comes Eco trying to deny it. Gets the player to no shield, but the reinforcements from Foe are there. The camo player stays alive, and Chick with the camo has an opportunity to make a play and get his team the lead here in game three. Yeah, let's see where he decides to prioritize and somehow gets spotted over in the tunnel. Three dead. That is difficult, but somehow still living there. One thing that's always still so impressive here from all these top pros is just watch at how often when they get caught off guard somewhere and they get shot, how they're able to react, how how long they're able to stay alive. That's one of the difference makers between top Halo pros, I would say in that next level, is how are they able to position, how are they able to make themselves a more difficult kill, and how are they able to get out of situations when they are unexpectedly caught off guard. Look at this push from Chick. He's not gonna sit tower. He's gonna flank the scoreboard, jump up, take down Eco, and push the three cap, force the spawns over a tower, flip the map, and this is perfect execution from Foe right now in this stronghold, now with the lead and continuing to build. And look at that deduction, Chick. Looks over towards dummies, looks over towards Silo, doesn't see anyone, knows that they could spawn Grosh, and he has already eliminated essentially three quarters of the map and says, well, guys, you know where they're at now. So you much know they're Tower of Mud. So much information spotting given to Spotting where team somebody budget. is at can be sometimes equally as valuable as spotting where people are not at. Yes, absolutely. Deduction skills right there. Let's see if Chick can hit another couple of shots. Two go down for Space Station still. Legend does not expect the repulse. Unfortunately, Chick narrowly misses that shot behind the head. Whizzes by Legend, but look at the aggressiveness once again from Chick. He is not sitting back with the snipe. He is pushing forward, and with that, he is taking strongholds again. And there is a trip cap there for Foe. They have control. They've now doubled Space Station score. And look at this. They're not even running over to get that B reset. There must be something to the strategy, or they just didn't have the numbers across the map. But in short, they were just saying, hey, don't, don't panic on it. Don't force yourself over there. Try to keep this sort of setup. And look at this, up by 60 points. 60 point lead right now. A couple members from Foe did just go down, however. They're gonna come off respawn. The push to seize should be obvious on the side of Foe, but can you deal with it? Do you have the resources in a place where you can stop it? Bound is hopping into the stronghold. He's gonna let his teams push forward. And as they rotate around the map, SSG could take control here. Here we go with Bound, holding on to that nest, knowing that some people are gonna push over from B. Uh -oh. QT's out, but we're gonna have to see if it comes out to anything. Goes right back into his repulse and bound doing so much damage, taking down the original player, taking down a double kill after that. And you know Space Station are gonna take advantage of that and look at that, a triple cap on the board. Bound making a play somewhere along the way. Eco got this camo, he almost gets taken down. That would have been a massive kill from Chick, but an even bigger kill now from Eco. The trip cap in effect, that 60 point lead is getting deleted right now. A C is the focus for, for Foe, but they have so many players from SSG here to deal with it. They chose the wrong stronghold, they go back to respawn.
And look at that eco just realizing, you know, misses a couple times, says, all right, I need to be able to hit this. He also realizes it's Friday as well. He needs to be able to hit those sort of jumps instantly as it comes towards Saturday or Sunday. Still getting their, their feet on the ground here. It's the first time we're seeing Space Station on the main stage. They might miss a jump or two, but shots they typically do not. Right now, though, two on two. The battle for B is ensued, and Bound able to make it a numbers advantage from Space Station. The reset from B from Legend doesn't quite come through, but he's got his eyes set on C. Unfortunately, too many members of Foe to try and deal with. Maybe an overstep from Legend. Let's see what Foe can do with it now with a two-man advantage. Yeah, Mighty gonna try to reposition with a snipe. Gonna take a while to get to a more powerful spot, or we're gonna see if he tries to get up close to a person like Chick, but no dice with that snipe. No real damage on the board this there from Mighty's. Right Balestia Woodham does, has sniper, has the mouse and keyboard, and he's gonna go for some flick shots. Hits the shot on Legend, gets the melee, and starts the cap onto B. Mouse and keyboard is a buff for the F7. Can Wutum give us something special here? His team's gonna need it. A lot of pressure. Can't hit the no shield. Stellar tries to hit him with the bandit shortly after, but Stellar now gets that kill, and that could be the most punishing kill of the series because Stellar was no shield. Now he's got the S7 in hand. Yep, and we've noticed so many times where those no shield versus no shield fights, some of them be coin tosses. And whoever comes out ahead, you have this lasting effect, this butterfly effect on your team because you now roll that advantage into the next fight, which rolls into the next advantage, into the spawns, into the power up control. There's so many what ifs when different fights go a different way. SSG now 180 to 119, continuing to keep the advantage in the map control. A is going to get finished. The camo does come up. Chick trying to get away with it, does get out with his life momentarily. He's going to make his way bottom middle here. It's actually Mighty's that picked up that camouflage. Eco is going to be able to spot him, but not enough damage onto Mighty's there to get that kill. He's going to be able to take down Eco, help his teammate out top tower, finish this kill, cut potentially a big set of damage and kills from Mighty's. Yes, he does get taken down, but finally, foe back in control of B and C. Yeah, gets that all or nothing right there. That's essentially a 130 point swing there with Space Station's last control. Yes, it wasn't unanswered 130, but regardless, they were able to swing that from being down by 60 to essentially being up by 70. How long can Bo hold on his control? And that answer is about four seconds right there during that last setup, unfortunately. They are gonna be able to flip out over A. So it's an untraditional AC hold. Obviously, you wanna make your way to B at this point. Jimbo has done just that. Spots a player alone by the tower. This is a kill you need to get quick, Jim. They pushed back green. Does Jim have any help? Yes, he does. Great teamwork out of foe, and now they get to choose. Do we want A and B, or do we want B and C? However, both starting to be transitioned is going to force foe's hand. They get taken down, and Jim gets caught with his Enemy pants down over at green. Scored. That's a tough one to be in because Jim's looking over at C, seeing he doesn't have teammates help over there. He looks over at A, see his teammate falls, and it's just, okay, which one can I actually get to? And at that point, when you're looking back and forth, you, you don't really have many options. The fights have already transpired. They've already taken place. You are now looking for any sort of cleanup that you can do, and he didn't see any good options to take advantage of there and had to wait for his teammates to spawn and fight another day. Yeah, a bit of a misplay there. Foe needed to choose A or C, not try to defend both because they chose to try and overextend for both. They find themselves now just with B control. Honestly, maybe not the worst if you're able to get a couple of kills here because B is by far the strongest hold, stronghold to transition. It's not going to help that Mighty's just fell off the map, but Chick does pick up a kill on the bound. Stellar with the snipe back in hand, back green transitions it. It's going to be an A-B hole for SSG, yeah. and Stellar anchoring this green spot. Essentially, he's going to try to close this one out, but one thing to note as this game is continuing on is a slays are essentially equal. These teams are about even. Stellar making sure this doesn't turn into a trip cap, just putting out a couple kills on the board, making it easier for when his teammates spawn, to know they have the numbers advantage, and now they're gonna be making a push towards A or C. It looks like C is the priority as everyone's more over there. Stellar decides to go on the defense as teammates are getting C. Chick with camo. Final play coming up right here. This is so important. Eco spots him out. That is so frustrating. Again, he spots him out. 247 and climbing three. Go down, make it all four down for foe. And SSG will close out game three just like that. What? 
unbelievable camo wise Eco has. Spotted him pillars earlier in the game, spots him on the flat there. Eco. I, had, I had bifocals back in my day. I could only see a couple different spots, but looks like these guys can spot camo from everywhere across the map. It's gotta be the glasses. I'm like legally blind, <laughs> but I've never worn glasses. Uh, don't tell anybody. That makes sense. Uh, but yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, but obviously, Eco showing that maybe glasses would be a good thing for me because I can't see camo players at all when I play this game. Eco, however, spotted several camo players and honestly changed the outcome of games by doing so. Taking a look at the stats, it's another stellar performance from, you guessed it, stellar. 25, 13, and 4. On the side of Foe, however, Jimbo dropped 16 assists. That's a lot of assists, but unfortunately, 12 and 17, not going to get it done, Dave. That game, almost a 100-point victory from SSG, but it did feel like Bo had their opportunities. Yeah, they absolutely had their opportunities. I didn't do a totaling of the all, all the kills on the board. Actually, looking over at our Prowler here, it was 65 kills for Fo, 70 kills for Space Station. So even with those numbers, that's not that drastic of a difference to account for about a 90-point different game. Clearly better objective efficiency and a better start there out of Space Station. Yeah, you got to wonder how many times Stellar ended up with the snipe in that game. And just by looking at the highlights here, you can tell a lot of them involve Stellar with the snipe. And usually when you see that, that means SSG probably won pretty comfortable. Also, I think too is when Stellar gets that snipe, how often are you seeing that get pride out of his hands before he uses the ammo? Very infrequently, he's positioned himself to make sure that he's not pushing towards the very end when he has a couple bolts left. So he's making sure not only that he's using the weapon well, hitting shots and getting kills, but he's never giving it back in the opposing team's hands. I feel like that happens a lot when you don't miss. <laughs> but, but yeah, obviously positioning such a key part of that, knowing when to waste ammo and whatnot. Stellar, one of the best snipers in the game not just positioning wise, not just skill wise, but knowing when to use that ammo and how frequently to have that weapon out as opposed to the bandit and, and hitting those shots. There's a reason why these guys are former world champions. These guys are current infinite, or won an infinite major last year in SLC. Game three is ranked oddball on recharge. We do have a couple of power items there. I would say those are must gets on the side of foe in order to kind of spin this series around, potentially push it to a game five. You find yourself in game five. You're ecstatic as a foe player or fan. But on ranked recharge, on ranked oddball and recharge, this has got to be one of the most difficult games to try and beat the better team at. And why is that, Dave? Uh, similar to Imperian, as I was highlighting before, a map like recharge in Imperian, they just have such long routes to get towards anywhere. And anytime you give those extra seconds where it takes this long to flank out somewhere, your decisions, your correct decisions and your incorrect decisions are favored magnified. and punished. Yeah, they're absolutely magnified and amplified. There's just so many times where you make the wrong route, all of a sudden your teammates are left out dry. They die. They're now maybe getting an unfavorable spawn or somebody still has the, the cross map shot that you need to clear out like on recharge, like maybe you need to clear out glass and you went the wrong way and all of a sudden, now you have to go deal with that again before you actually make your next push. And so it just kind of expands upon any of those those errors. And it's not as simple as just listening to a call out, reacting and charging there. You have to think a couple steps ahead and you have to say, okay, well, when they have the ball here, where could they potentially rotate to? All right, let's go, let's push towards here. I'm gonna make a push on this side, teammates push. And, and the coordination is just much more difficult on a large map here like Recharge. That's the word I was looking for, coordination and your cohesiveness, it sticks out. I should just type that in the beginning of my essay. <laughs> I, know, I could've got full credit for that answer. You get an got A, a lot Dave. quicker. <laughs> Who am I to not give Dave Walsh an A in his knowledge of Halo? But nonetheless, I couldn't agree with you more, a map uh, a game type like off ball, I feel like the knowledge of when to rotate it, when to drop it, all of that decision making comes really into the impact on how your team's able to efficiently score. Usually the best teams in the world are the best at also doing that, which is why I feel like off ball is the least game type we see upsets occur in throughout Halo's history. For foe right now, you're still in this series can you push it to the game five as an underdog that's what you're always begging for right like if you told me just I was, give us the game five yeah. and let let you know let the big dog eat. let the game roll yeah <laughs> let the big dog eat in game five is what i would say just give me the 50 kills <laughs> but right now i mean how are you feeling on the side of folk you had the lead at one point in that game three 
and then all of a sudden you you look at the final score and you're wondering where did it become a blowout yeah it feels like it becomes a blowout whenever space station gets a full control so i do feel that when we've watched here with foe versus space station when they're in the neutral game foe are doing fine foe are many times getting the advantage and getting control from there but it does feel like once things start to fall apart for foe space station know to how know how to hold on to that full setup a little bit longer they know how to extract a little bit more value out of that they just do that a little bit better and so when i look at here on game number three i or sorry game number four recharge oddball unfortunately it's inevitable both sides are going to have full setups at some times yeah. and when i'm looking at these two teams so far throughout the series space station I would expect them to get longer ball holds out of their full setups versus Foe getting longer ball holds out of their full setups. To me, yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more that we've seen more efficiency, more done with the power when SSG is able to acquire it, the map control that when SSG is able to acquire it. When I'm thinking of recharge on, and ways to mitigate that and, and ways to like deny uh, an opportunity for a counter setup or for a counter map control getting that ball to the back blue and being able to play it has got to be something that foe have have got to focus on I, I think if you're trying to set the the oddball up in either top elevator or over into pipes like ideally that's not that's not your most ideal setup because you want to when we go four down we want to have an opportunity to like not have to worry about ssg not only acquiring ball time but having that full setup and us dealing with that at the exact moment, like limit that that time in between, or I guess extend that time in between they get the setup and they get those kills as well. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. I think there's many times on this map where in an ideal scenario, if you're able to have the ball over at Hydro and play ball at the end of a of a sap you have, that would be that would be most ideal. I think the the unfortunate reality here on recharge is there's a lot of times you can't choose that you're going to have that setup there. There's going to be a step or two in between where you first bring that ball towards pipes and then you eventually maybe rotate it over towards hydro. And this is also one of those maps too where it can be tough. You want to fight as a full roster. There's a lot of times if one or your two of your teammates are fighting, you aren't just going to sit back and say, all right, those two die. We can, we can hold and stay alive here. Like you're trying to fight and generally revealing your positions. And that can, like I said, start that snowball effect of your whole team dying. But yeah, at some point, staggered. you got to yeah. yeah, you got to fight together ultimately. And like I said, it's it's inevitable for both these teams. There's gonna be times where all four are down for each of these teams at different times. When you're playing at this level of play, it's just going to happen. Here we go, game four. Can Fo get this to a game five against this new SSG roster? Can they rattle? Their bones a little bit before SSG can really get off the ground here at this tournament. They might find themselves in a very highly contested series. This game four is going to decide whether or not that's the case. Shock rifle, obviously at the top. Camo in the bottom middle. Mighty's right now 37 and 20. So that, was far. His, that was his oddball score yeah. against Native Gaming when he played them in oddball. So can Mighty's replicate that here against SSG? Chick getting the first kill. Legend also falling down. And how are foe going to take advantage of this? And look at that target switching. That was so sick. Realizing that he wasn't going to win that fight against that person in control does a little damage to someone who's unsuspecting, forces that player to panic and jump out the front window. Anytime you can sometimes disperse that damage across other players, it just creates opportunities for your teammates to take advantage of. Jimbo finds himself a double. He's got camo and shock in hand. A much different start to game four than game three. As Foe off to the early lead. Space Station just two kills to their name. Foe have six, but more importantly, 21 seconds of time. And let's see what they can do now that the pressure once again is back on from SSG. Oh, and Legend able to get those two kills down there, I believe. Looks like that was a friendly nade taken out, Legend. Someone from SSG has to explain themselves after the series, but no worries as the elevator setup is now broken. Bam, looking to be aggressive bottom elevator. A trade with Wutum. You'll take that if you're Wutum under that much pressure. Three go down for SSG right now. Legend, the last player alive, trying to play it, but the grenade knocks the ball all the way down to bottom elevator. And Legend reacquires that off ball, tries to throw it out the front door, does get it to the mangler, but doesn't get it into the pit. So that's not a real play. Let's be real. Like someone who's going over there putting that pressure on can easily just bring that right back into elevator. And it looks like it's gonna be someone from Space Station as they now have three dead. Wutum's the last one alive, and he's over at the 
sneaky ledge. He's been spotted by Stellar. He doesn't lose those fights. Stellar, a big pick as that ball gets rotated to blue. SSG now with their first blue setup of their own, starting to come back in this game, 23 to 12. Look at that, Mighty has to back down there from Stellar. Not sure where this extra help's gonna come out from the SSG team. But he's just gonna continue to be this thorn in their side. Stellar just laying down shots on these players. And it's gonna be difficult for anyone here from foe to push easily across the map while they know some like Stellar's over at glass. And yeah, Stellar just created so much space for this camo that's up right now. And he even gets to pick up the camo himself after getting a couple of kills, some damage down. SSG do such a good job to control that back ball back fluid. They do end up being forced to play it. Stellar gets that camo. He gets spotted out as he clambers up towards that grapple. He has gotten the shield back, the shock rifle in hand, putting it to work, Wu Tum down. And multiple players from Fogo down. This should be SSG getting the ball and getting the lead. Yeah, Stellar continually putting the space in Space Station. It's just been nonstop over here on this side of the map. This entire time, every single time Fo calls him out, he's just adjusted slightly. So it's not like he's just being static. Yes, he's been over here on this long haul side, but look at how he's done these rotations. He's gone from here to sneaky, to push back towards batteries, to back to pipes, to glass. It's just all still been around that area, just being a constant force, but never just standing in one spot, waiting for them to set their trap. A big kill by Legend is going to get a reset on the ball. Three go down for Foe. Only two members alive for SSG, so the battle for map control is about to be about where is everyone spawning. Legend notices all of his teammates spawning towards glass. That means Foe have got to be towards elevator and pipes. Legend trying to play this front bridge. A little bit extended get, does get spotted out. He's going to be able to play his life if he drops back to back blue. And angle on these players pushing top middle, but multiple members flying at him. The Shroud is going to buy him some time to try and stay alive here. He does turn the corner. If he can get into white, he may be able to get a shield. There is a player hot on his tail. Well done using that defensively. I'm excited to see also as this weekend transpires how these teams are going to be using it better when it comes to offensively shrouding off an area like glass as they just want to cross the map. It'll be very interesting to see how she uses his highest level. And there's three down. Woodham, last one alive. I'm not sure if they've spotted out where he is at, but Legend and the SSG crew have the ball set up in pipes and have their options where we want to rotate. Eco thought he was going to get the back smack there. He gets spotted as he can't win the melee because of it. That camouflage now off the map. It's a 3v3. Stellar with the shock. But look at what Space Station does. They saw all that pressure coming in from Needler and from Elevator side. They say, OK, sounds like that's a free rotation through long haul if I've ever heard one. They tried to make the rotation. Woodham gets the cutoff. And we get the ball moving on back towards pipes. That's so difficult here on recharge against one of these top teams. You could have everything go right on one side of the map, and a good objective player is going to rotate that ball away towards their team's advantage. If you want to split up your resources, SSG just handled the left side and said, hey, bring it back. They're all the way to the right. Great information, great play. Heads up, perfect objective rotations here from SSG. Stellar with this shock rifle is starting to become a problem as he rips Jimbo's head off. He kills Wootum as well with the bandit. That was unbelievable that he is still alive. Spinning in circles, trying to find another player, but everyone from Foe is taken down, and this round is over in SSG's favor. That was so impeccable. One thing that's just mind blowing to me from like someone like Stellar or some of these top players is I never see them have like the shaky or panic shots. Like there's times where like I'm one shot back in my day, even at my peak, like if I'm going against someone weak, I'm just like panicky sometimes trying to get the extra damage out there. His shot is just still so perfect and so steady. Gamers these days are a different breed, they say. The amount of hours this man has got to put in to be as good at this craft as he is, is something special to watch right now. Stellar with a great first round, 15, three and seven, no ball time, but it looked like, looks like Legend has been ball able to pick drop. that one up. Eco with a little bit of help Enemy has the ball. to help win that first round. SSG have ball started drop. off so hot to the second round already with the control and Bound with top elevator control is gonna allow this setup to be so strong. Also, I love this just angle from Bound, the way he plays this. Do you notice how when he was holding top elevator, looking across towards long haul, He's not fully revealing himself towards mid-bridge or towards controller and these other locations. <laughs> Instead, he's gonna be able to pop out and double team one of those spots as soon as the call-out comes in. The so these players from Bo, they're gonna push across these mid-bridge. They're gonna think they're safe. They might just have a one-on-one -on -one against glass or something like that. And all of a sudden, 
you're gonna have bounce shooting him in the side. Yeah, great. Uh, less than a half a second after. It's that min max that he's able to play from that angle, and he's so good under pressure. He gets to no shield. He made slight work of that player top catwalk, and although it's only a 16 to zero lead, SSG really starting to make individual plays that make you think this series is over. They are, and I, I know I said at the beginning of this match, I said there are guaranteed going to be times where Foe has all four dead from Space Station, or Space Station has all four dead from Foe. However, I don't know if I'm seeing any of those times yet where Space Station are all going down. Are we going to see one of these for the first time here as Stellar is the last one standing here for SSG? Stellar's going to play his life, and I think that that's a veteran play, especially in these objectives, right? Not giving up that staggered death to where you're well, allowing the setup to last a little bit longer. Now that his teammates are up, Stellar pushes across Cat, finds himself the first kill. Jimbo looks like you found Stellar, and you know what that means. 22, 4, and 8, Stellar finds another. But two down without taking any damage, and some of those, those hits come into play. Uh, when you look at these top, top teams, like a space station, a phase, as an example, you'll notice every single time when they get a chance to trade out a melee, they're trading out that melee, and there's two missed opportunities there to at least slow down Stellar, make them not be able to just poke out with full shield and be confident right there. And like I said, just a slight miss there from Chick or Jimbo's side to not trade out the necessary damage to slow down that superstar. Yeah, it seems easy when we're watching it from third person, but I'm sure playing against Stellar is something neither one of us wanted it as far as I want careers. none of that. Now, I, I'll tell you, there's a lot of things I don't want to do in my life, and that's at the top of the list. Yeah. Playing Stellar and Halo, not fun, especially not for Foe right now. 23, 5, and 10, extending the performance from round one to round two as he picks up his 24th kill. Eco controlling the ball. top red right now, just falling back. The lead not too far away here. Round two is not over this game. The series is not over, but Foe have got to find ways to make some individual plays. And losing two members before the other two are up in order to push is not how you get it done. Look at this, we're gonna have Eco rotating over and looks like they're gonna try to hold over towards this blast, but they're getting pitched in. This is such a great push coming in from Bo. They just now have to execute, but somehow able to focus over on the long haul side, get the two kills they need. Now they can rotate that ball over towards Hydra if they want, but looks like they turn their sights onto pipes, just going for the kills and the control. So despite a great position from Bo, the kills go in favor of SSG and Foe back in the spawning screen. What a wild situation. It looked like for sure those two players on SSG, Eco and his ball carrier, were going to get sandwiched by two on two on each side. Somehow, some way, the push doesn't come through from pipes. And with that, he has the ball. they're able to deal with the long haul players and blow this lead up to 20 points. Well, some ways that, oh that can fall apart for some teams is if you're trying to both continually push towards the oddball and not know which side should be aggressive, which side should be holding. Sometimes it can be very helpful to know, all right, this side's gonna be defensive. We're just gonna make sure this ball never rotates in this direction. We're gonna give you some crossfire for when they're helping there. But it felt like both those sides just kind of individually pushing through pipes, individually pushing through long haul. And when you get into individual fights against someone like Space Station, they'll happily accept those fights, try to find the best one and to charge in, and they did that exactly. They didn't charge the, they didn't challenge the pipe fight. They challenged the people in long haul, got the fights, got the shields back, and then went back and fought. It's that cohesiveness that we questioned at the start of the series that's coming back once again here in game four that are allowing, or that are not allowing Foe to try and stay in this one. They do get three down. Bound, the last player alive, he's stuck out top batteries. Jimbo knocks him to no shield, and this is the first opportunity for Foe. Yeah, we're gonna see the first kind of full setup here for Foe. So let's actually go to a listening with Foe to hear how they're gonna take advantage of the situation. I'm bringing the ball in blue. I'm watching. I'm watching. Watch out. 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 Watch Press 
Fighting, Enemy fighting the ball. Fighting an out. Mangan, Mangan cat, Mangan cat. Top, top tower is one. Maybe you camo jump, maybe you camo jump. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Maybe two tower, one mid bridge. Camo stacks, camo C steps. One shot needles. Camo B box, camo B box. B box and bottom tower shots. Bottom tower shots is going bottom tower still to bridge to stacks. Stacks, stacks, stacks. Still bottom tower shots. Yeah, B box. Mid bridge, mid bridge. Watch out, watch out, watch out, watch out. Out, out, on the on the wall. Last two, last two. Last two, last two. Forty-five seconds. One shot, Spam. Too long. Oh my, reset. Reset. Forty seconds. Incoming. Come on, I'm gonna try and get in. Come on, come on, jump, come on, jump, come on, jump, come on, jump. Jumping, guys. I didn't trade. One shot, one shot. Gold steps in, gold steps in. One deeper, one more, one more. Last game was one power, one power, one. Right, one shot, 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 and that's going to be game number four going in favor of Space Station. Take the series three to one. SSG get the job done in their first showcase of the new pickup. He had a lot of objective time, maybe not the KD that he probably wanted to showcase for himself, but I'm sure they're very happy with how that series went, knowing that Foe is a very strong opponent after taking down Native Gaming, after getting the first seed in Europe. This was going to be no pushover, but SSG make sure this series doesn't go any farther than it needed to. Yeah, I was actually overall impressed with Foe, how well they played this series. Uh, we, going into the series, I would assume there's been a 3-0 or a 3-1 in favor of Space Station, right. ended up being 3-1. We ended up seeing a lot of great moments there from Foe. They held their own, own in many situations. Yes, they did do so well on the back foot. Anytime all four of them were down, they kind of got ran over a bit by Space Station. However, every other situation, I felt like they were near equal, sometimes ahead. Competitive, for sure. Yes, absolutely. So when, when you're thinking at the big picture here, Foe in pool play has won, has beaten Native, assuming that they're going to beat the open bracket team that they play tomorrow and advance as a second seed in their pool. What are your kind of ambitions as far as where you think this team lands by the end of the weekend? I mean, if you're in their shoes, you still have your heads up high and you say, hey, we could have taken that series against the team that's one or two in the U.S. Yeah. So you, you're you walking down that team saying, we can still we can still do we can our make a run. run. We can make a run. We just got to catch fire. We need to do things right. Now, what do they need to adjust or where are they realistically going to place if I'm coming in from an outside perspective? It's, I still have to see them play against someone else. We're seeing them play against the absolute best, yeah. some of the space station. And then, like you said, when you're talking about Native, I, are they our best of the best of like open side? I think Native, we need to still see where they're kind of placed within this current world. Very fair. I think there's a lot of teams in between SSG and Native. And as we continue this bracket on, as pool play concludes and they go into bracket play, we will see foe in bracket play, guarantee who they match up against, how they stack up against, I still think they have a lot to show us and determine on what we believe is the strongest team in Europe right now. But on the side of SSG, what did they show you as far as promise for their ambitions? You know that championship is what they want. Absolutely, yeah. I, I do think that they maybe didn't have as strong of a showing today as someone like FaZe, but at the same time, Played better teams than FaZe. Yes, they played They played stronger squads than FaZe. Um, also you saw someone like Stellar just like, you're like, all right, I guess Stellar's just going to still be absolutely nuts of the game it every turns single out he, game he plays. He didn't get any worse. <laughs> Bandit Stars didn't Somehow make Stellar Somehow he just still worse. stayed amazing. Yeah. Um, he might be better with Bandit Stars, actually. Yeah, he's just absolutely ridiculous. And so just seeing that and just saying, wow, you can kind of count on Stellar doing that all the time. Now what's going to happen when you have some of these other members of the team just having on fire games you know we see it off every single player on the team eco is going to have that time we've seen it from legend when he was playing on quadrant yeah I, absolutely i mean this ssg team their ceiling is going to be unbelievable when all those players are playing at their best i hear that blaze is on stage with eco for an interview i can't wait to see what eco has to say about his new teammate Thank you so much, Wes and Walsh. Give it up for Space Station Game in Texas as they just got done for the day 2-0. They look forward to tomorrow.
And Eco, you guys take down foe 3-1. They took y'all out in the Slayer. Some of the objectives was kind of close, but what was the game plan coming in here that the squad and coach had in play? Uh, you know, game plan's pretty uh, standard. You know, just come up here, perform, uh, just do what we do. Uh, not, not, not really overthinking anything. Um, they're a great team. Um, you know, we're just trying to build some momentum going into the weekend. There you go, building up that momentum, okay? It's been about a month since this squad has been able to really get that practice in that they wanted to, and it's just climbing up from here. How has it been like playing with Legend? You know, you hit a core squad for a long time. I know it's been a while since the switch, but what is it like? How is the newness feeling? Uh, I mean, yeah, Legend's obviously a god. Uh, a breath of fresh air, I would say. Um, and yeah, just kind of like, you know, we, everyone gets to reset, just uh, find our like motivation again and just like, get better as a team, just like kind of start over basically, right? Because, you know, we've, already, we've been at core for a long time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, we're just building momentum for this year, starting this event, starting today. So yeah, just trying to get better every day. Just getting better every single day. Now, Space Station Gaming has a lot of dedicated fans that is committed to you guys and watching you get better every single event. What do you want these guys to know? Uh, shout out to SSG, shout out to our fans. Uh, we love you guys, uh, we hear you, uh, it means a lot. It means a lot to them, okay? Show some love to Space Station Gaming. We'll see them tomorrow. But Lottie, let's get to the next one. A god, a breath of fresh air, words coming out of Eco's mouth about their brand new roster change legend. And my goodness me, is it converting into dubs for a series? Amazing, amazing things to witness on that main stage with SSG versus Foe. I've got to say, with both sides of things, were really exciting for us to watch up here. Uh, some serious competition that has been happening all throughout today in pool play. But SSG, they are looking fantastic. And I think they are right exactly where they want to be. I think in terms of this roster change, the momentum that Eco is talking about building, this is exactly the position they want to be in on pool play, heading into the championship bracket tomorrow. What did you make of space? Station gaming, Tim. Yeah, one of the biggest things for me was Eco, and he's saying, him saying, fresh start. It's so right. important to, to get that mentality shift where you start to get more motivated to win. You start to want to win more. And maybe we're seeing that out of SSG. Obviously, this is just the start of the weekend, but to have that mentality going into this weekend is great for me. They certainly do have such a fantastic mentality. And honestly, it's been the mentality of really all top three teams that we had seen last year as well. Space Station, Optic, and FaZe have all said they're just trying to get a really hot start. It's a brand new season. It's a brand new type of game that they're playing now with the Bandit starts and all the equipment changes. So they're really rolling on into that next day. But right now, Tony, is Space Station Gaming taking the cake for you in terms of who's looking really good heading into Championship Bracket? Yeah, I mean, as of right now, I'm looking, I'm still looking at SSG and FaZe, the top two teams in the yeah. world right now. And obviously, we got to see what happens when they match each other. But I think it's a great point about the mentality. You know, you, you, you obviously want to respect your opponent. You don't want to go in overconfident, but you also want to keep improving, keep getting better. Because when you go against the other teams that are in the top three and the top four, that's when you're really going to be tested. So, love what I'm seeing out of Space Station Gaming. They look like they're ready to win championships and we'll see what happens later on the weekend. Tim, when it came down to the series Space Station, they just look really efficient on the map in so many different avenues. What was really coming out and sticking out to you in the series? Honestly, it was the power weapon control and what they did with those power weapons, right? Power up weapons, power ups, utilizing them to get that objective, uh, to get the, those slays, to get positions on the map. I think that it's so important and they're just so good at it, right? We didn't see that so much on the other side with Foe. It wasn't so much, a, you know, of getting value out of everything. It was a lot less. So think SSG did a great job of getting value and I mean they're the number two team in the world so that's the reason. Indeed and Tony can we just talk about Stella for a second because I'm flabbergasted up here at what this man is able to do so early on in this tournament you know he really seems to have you know just excelled with the bandit stars and looking at the stats across here this guy is uh, one of the main reasons that they won with such ease. Yeah, what's crazy to me is that when I, when I look on the side of Thoa I, I think of like you did so many things right and if SSG didn't have a Stellar on your team, maybe you win this series. I feel like you got outslayed by uh, what, maybe about 32 kills and only lost the assist battle by three. Like, you played so well if you're a foe. It's just the fact that Stellar was a slaying machine. Whether it was with the Bandit, whether it was with the Shock, the Sniper, there was nothing slowing him down. If SSG didn't have a Stellar, 
maybe for a win. <laughs> <laughs> i got to say, yeah, he was an absolute demon on that main stage, and I think he's only just beginning, so that's pretty scary for other teams as well. On the side of Foe, though, Tim, we kind of discussed some of the problems, uh, some great stuff coming out from this team, things that they can definitely take away with them, but there was just a couple of mistakes, and I think it was not being able to handle the mistakes, not being able to kind of rewrite things and the paths and avenues they were taking, um, but i got to say the direction from Jim was right there, and I, I personally think that's why they excelled so heavily against Space Station Gaming, was having somebody there as a core, and Jimbo was that guy. Yeah, Jimbo as a leader, obviously has been in the game for a long time, knows what plays to make and when to make them, and I think we saw that in the series. I think the other members of the team are maybe a little bit disjointed, and I think over time, we'll start to see that clean up just a bit. Jimbo as a leader, we've talked about the players that he's brought through and, and gotten better in, you know, glories, etc. so I think he'll do a little bit of that here. It might just take a little bit of time. Yeah, I gotta say though, on the side of Foe as well, Tony, some really, really nice takeaways. What do you want to see more of that you saw them bring to this series against Space Station? I want them to bring that same energy. I, I, like I said before, you lost the slave battle by quite a bit. Well, a lot of people are against the likes of Space Station Gaming. They're one of the best teams in the world, but keep bringing those strategies. Keep bringing that coordination, that teamwork. Because I promise you, you keep that same energy today, again, going into tomorrow, you're going to beat out whoever comes out of open bracket. You're going to end up as the number two seed in this pool. You're going to go into the winner's side of the bracket, and you're going to look damn good. Honestly, I, I'll be, I, I thought Fo were good, so I don't know. They're knocking on the door of greatness. Watch out for foe. <laughs> they're definitely knocking. They have the door number for sure. And they're right there <laughs> ringing the doorbell. I'll tell you what, though, folks, we have more coming your way. A couple of really exciting things. Of course, we do have more main stage action for you, which will be once again Optic Gaming, our hometown team, going up against Complexity, our front runner in the Dark Horse competition here. And we also do have a very exciting balance update for you guys coming on the other side of the break. Guess what? New year means a new optic scuff design for a new controller. Check out this sexy design. It's a nod to the original OG logo and a great way to rep the green wall. Choose between the Reflex for PS5, the Instinct for Xbox, and the brand new Envision for PC gaming. Guess what? Scuff saw your comments and they're now selling the base plates separately for the Envision and the Instinct for $29.99. Sorry, I'm kind of busy. Mm, kind of not. Leave a message. Yeah, the mega red boys here, cinnamon. Flow tastes sweet like cinnamon. Open up doors, I'm a gentleman. View top floor, I'm still staying ahead of them. Running on fumes and adrenaline. Do what I do best. Huh? Can't rush in like a roulette. You can't name a better duet. Huh? Don't ask questions. Trying to figure out what sound. Don't worry about what next. Just know we got now.
The HCS 2024 Kickoff Arlington Major is presented by AMD, Scuff, and Corduroys. Hello, folks, and welcome back to the HCS Kickoff Major live from Arlington, Texas, of course, hosted by Optic Gaming. On the desk, I do have two very exciting people. One is Wes Clutch Price, of course, and I do also have Unishek, and you guys may know that when I do have Unishek What's on the desk, something very, very exciting is about to happen. And that, of course, is because we do have an update coming our way on Tuesday. Really excited to break this one down. And I've got to ask you, Uni, What's the first thing up your sleeve? Because I can't wait. I know the fans at home are really eager to know what the update is going to consist of. So what can you share with us? Yeah, so Tuesday is our March update for Halo Infinite. It's going to have a lot of great stuff, but the key features are a whole network overhaul. Woo! We're changing it up. It's going <laughs> to feel a lot better when you jump on and you play online. So I'm really looking forward to that one. We had a lot of feedback around the online experience. Oh, yeah. Fans should Huge. love it. Uh, and then we also have easy anti-cheat coming, wow. really improving the security of the game. And you, you should be able to trust that you're playing in a match that's fair, right? And have no concerns when you're playing those match made games. That's absolutely incredible, John. I just want you guys to realize that was a network overhaul and an anti-cheat coming, okay? To all the players in here, that is <laughs> exceptional, exceptional yeah. stuff for an update, John. Absolutely incredible. And you know, what What else have you guys been working on in terms of fixing things for players and really, you know, listening to feedback? What else is in store for us in this update? Yeah, there's also a weapon tuning update, some awesome forge features, uh, bug fixes, crash fixes. Of course, we're always trying to do that. Make sure the game is stable as well as secure. Uh, so you can have a long game session if you want it without having any issues. Uh, but when you jump in and play on Tuesday, I also wanted to shout out, we have a ongoing Women's History Month uh, activation in game that you can go in, you log in, and you get an awesome coding. I think we've got a, a picture of, yeah, we, oh, wow. we also released some women's history artwork featuring some of the Spartans Very cool. in the game, as well as the personal AI. Uh, I love this piece. But if you log in, you'll get a coding completely free. You can log in today even. But if you happen to be checking out the update on Tuesday, I wanted to make sure you knew you'd also have a brand new coding in your inventory that looks uh, its inspired by Rosie the Riveter, which is really, really cool. And I love to see that. That is absolutely incredible. And obviously, I know that all the girlies are going to be very happy about that one for sure. Yep. Uh, and I've also got to ask you, Wes, in terms of the, the weapon balancing, what can you tell us specifically detail-wise about that? We're getting a, uh, a little update to the bandit. The reload speed's being increased to uh, make it feel like we're not reloading the musket, as we say on the competitive <laughs> insights team. We're, we're back yep, in action yep. quicker, and I think it flows with the game a little bit better there. There's also a update to the spawn influencer. I know players are calling out spawns are pretty wild right now in the live game. Well, that's going to be updated to a more of, it's not exactly how it was with the BR, but it is very like it in a similar fashion. So I do believe that that will improve the integrity of some of our matches. So very, very excited for the bandit reload speed and that spawn influence improvement being made to that. We have uh, we have updates to the heat wave, which will make it a little bit more difficult to use uh, for longer ranges. And I think that that's ideally a good thing for the competitive scene. The heat wave, a shotgun-like weapon, you want to make sure that we keep the close range story for its success and not let it act as a uh, potential sniper rifle, as we see Lucid do <laughs> <Yeah>. so often <laughs> some of the pros on some were of the best maps. Really good with the heat wave at that range. Uh, so making sure they're not sniping people necessarily with the heat wave is, is going to be fun. Definitely. It, when, you, now it's more skill when you hit that shot. It right? will be it will be possible to still do damage. It just will be more difficult. Yeah. And I am always for making the game more difficult, especially. I, I'm well aware. I'm well aware. Especially <laughs> for our hyper competitive players, yeah. because I think it's just even more of a margin for for air, for ceiling for these players to showcase their skills. Yeah. Because yeah. these guys will still be heat, hitting some of those heat wave shots. Themselves. Makes moments more hype, actually. Yeah, it does. You get to showcase your excellence, right? Yeah. And what else in terms of weapons have we got? We also have a couple of updates maybe to the pistol as well. We have the sidekick and the commander that have... Uh, mm. uh, the plasma and pistol. The plasma oh, pistol. The plasma pistol, okay. So the, the single fire is going to overheat your plasma pistol a little bit faster. We're seeing the single shot excel in competitive play. I, I know you're, you've brought up, Wes. Uh, but we've also, on the flip side of that, buffed the charge shot by making it take a little less time okay. to reach that charged up. 
uh, speed uh, and state. That one is, I think, like a lot of our more casual players have wanted a buff to the plasma pistol. This is one of those steps that we're going to take to help make sure it feels better there. Overall thought process. Overall thought process here is we wanted to make the plasma pistol more valuable with the charge shot, less valuable with the single shot. I feel like predominantly in the competitive scene in today's game right now, you'll see that plasma pistol being used as the single shot, knock him down to no shield, swap to the bandit, or go for a melee. We want the charge shot to be the story of the plasma pistol as it has been traditionally yeah, throughout years, historic years. Halo. Yeah. And so I feel like changes being made to that weapon specifically are towards that legacy behavior. I think players will like that as well. Yeah, I, I also think that it's such a big thing, uh, you know, in competition. The combo is massive here. So I love that. I love going back to the roots for the plasma pistol for sure and, and seeing the combo kind of being used and utilized how it should be used and back in the day as well. What other changes do we have to weapons? We have stalker rifle changes? We do have stalker rifle changes. Yes. I actually yep. am very excited for this one. The stalker rifle, very powerful weapon. What we did here was we changed the overheat from seven to six, so we made it a little bit more costly for your misses when you're in a fight. You get to that six shot, you will overheat. The overheat, I believe, is a little bit more punishing as well. So making that overheat mean more as well to the player to, to swap weapon that extinguish, I believe, lasts longer to where you're not just able to rail off shots. I remember a clip from Lucid at uh, last year's World where he made like nine players no shield without like ever kind of switching weapons or whatnot. And it yep. was just so, so, so like uh, seamlessly done by him and unbelievable plays by him. But I was like, that is a problem. He just made nine players in no shield without <laughs> having to reload a gun or reposition or anything. Uh, so we believe that these changes make it more difficult to have larger success over time with this weapon, although remaining the weapon's power in and of itself. I love that. It's influential, but depending on the execution of who is, you know, in charge of that weapon, which is fantastic. I love the Stalker Rifle. love seeing it in action as well. And you did talk about the Commando. So yes. what is going on there? This thing is a heater now. <laughs> it is now a valuable weapon that should be sought out on the map. It was very difficult to balance this thing with Bandit Starts because of how successful the Bandit is, and it's lower kill time than the battle rifle so our challenge here was to make the commando rifle a weapon worth sought being sought after but not too powerful to where it can take over games because it is a respawning weapon on the map it's not yep. a power weapon this gun here is now more dynamic as far as the bloom now will hit faster it'll reset faster yeah no it it will it will peak its outer bloom faster oh, but okay. if you are to uh if you're able to trigger the recoil, you are able to acquire a kill faster because the bloom is less harsh. So gotcha. I really yeah. like what we were able to do with this weapon, and I do think that players will find a lot more success with this new update. I mean, I feel like these changes, Uni, are unbelievably detailed. They are yes. tailored in a specific way, and, and the changes will make a huge difference for uh, viewers at home who are either brand new to the HCS or just picking up Halo Infinite for the first time. What is the meaning behind these changes? Actually, how much do they affect the outcome of gameplay? Uh, I think they're going to have a tremendous impact with these. their fine-tuning ch fine changes, though. Uh, like Commando, I think we'll see a lot more people want to go and actually pick up the Commando. When you watch more casual players play, they're kind of avoiding the Commando right now. So we added a little more friction to it when you use it, as well as that change to the Bloom, so you can excel with it and not have to worry about controlling the recoil and the Bloom and then having to worry about people challenging you with a bandit that is currently pretty strong. So it, it should really change your gameplay, but not the entire flow of things. It'll just make it feel a little bit better. I've got to say, the these changes are huge. These are massive, and there's a ton of them so far. Surely there can't be anything else, right? Uh, I think we have one more cool little surprise okay. that we wanted to share. What is uh, it? I love a surprise. Yeah, there's there's nothing like dressing your best or having the best gear. Uh, we were talking about weapons. You want your weapons to look the best. And I think we have a video that we want to showcase. So let's roll it.
wow. It looks good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the first thing I did was mouth a wow to yeah. you. Yeah. I mean, that is incredible. I, you never you never fail to amaze me up here when we do see any kind of it's, aesthetic It's, it's all the team. I just show up and talk <laughs> about it, you know? <laughs> hey, John, you got to give yourself some credit. Come on. <laughs> uh, i got to say, though, absolutely stunning. You're looking at, you know, the aesthetics for in-game, and you know that players absolutely love to look their best, to perform their best. And actually, that is so true and so real for all of our pro players. They love skins. They love to look good because it makes them feel good up there. And that's taking weapon wraps to a whole new level because they literally are quite frankly wrapped yeah, these, it's gorgeous yep. these young kids are all about the swagger right so they have <laughs> to have their spartan looking queen to look good feel good play good mentality carries through and you got to have your spartan matching matching the drip on the outside <laughs> right so uh love the new cosmetics making it even more rare what you're individually rocking i think is what's special and uh the biggest opportunity as we continue to add to the suite that's absolutely incredible and uni this is all coming our way tuesday on tuesday and as a reminder these sales will support the teams, right? So go buy your favorite team skins, show them some love and support, and just look better in game. You I'd know? love to hear all of that. We Thank you so much. Skin. I know. Lottie West team skin. Yeah. Oh, support okay. us. Yeah. The desk. <laughs> yeah. The desk. Yeah. I don't the actually desk want the team skin. Team skin. <laughs> I know. That would be quite hard to design, I feel like. We'd probably get a, uh, a gun show for, for yours. For a designer. That's for a designer. That's not our <laughs> exactly, job. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. For the but models. Absolutely amazing. <laughs> and this update is going to be so, so big for the competition. So thank you so much for sharing with that with us, Uni West. That's absolutely amazing. And everybody here in Serena, just a quick note. You guys can actually play this this weekend. You can test this out, which is going to be amazing. So stay ahead of the curve and make sure you do, do go and grab uh, a spot to test all of this update out. It's going to be absolutely amazing. I can't wait to get home and play it myself. Absolutely gorgeous. But Thank you so much. We're going to head on into our schedule to take a look at what we've got coming your way and what you guys might have missed today because it has been so amazing. And Wes, as we look across the board here for what we have seen, could you honestly have guessed some of the upsets that have happened today? Because it has been off the chain. I saw Sentinels potentially losing the series to Shopify, but to lose the next series to Proton, that was absolutely insane. The fact that Sentinels at best can be in the elimination bracket starting Saturday, that is terrifying for that elimination bracket. Shopify and Proton playing for that number one seed here tonight is a very important series for both of them. But I mean, I was just giving them their Sentinels, their flowers uh, uh, about being in the top four, about being part of the big three. Well, they just erased everything I was able to say there. I know. They have been so consistent for so long, they were probably due for a downfall. And they got their downfall here in that pool C, the pool of death. Honestly, I'm very shocked, though, about how that really kind of worked out for them because they had been very consistent in the offseason. We, we talked about that coming into this weekend, and I am shocked of them falling short. Is that a mentality thing? Is that just something not working out for them against Shopify Rebellion when they had a completely different game plan for the weekend? Maybe? I mean, that's why this was the pool of death. It's because all of all three of these teams, Shopify, Proton, and Sentinels, are good at Halo. They have veterans. You're trying to win a best of five. Anybody can win a best of five when you're that talented. And Sentinels had two major mistakes, both in the strongholds of each of those series that slipped away. They were up 100 points on Shopify and lost the game. They were up 60 points with 249 against Proton and lost that game. You cannot afford to lose games that you have that big of a win, like of a, of a margin of victory yeah. in. They let those two games slip out of their fingers, and when that happens, you are going to lose series to these teams. Well, I'll tell you what, Rebellion certainly know that because they're up 2-0 and in their series against Proton right now. So they're smooth sailing currently for that first place position in their pool. And i got to say, we called it, right? Pool C, pool of death. I can't believe it. We called it. Absolutely cool. Good job, that. team. Good job, guys. We need to skin. Good job. <laughs> we need to skin up here, folks. We need to skin. You're in on it. Uh, so excited about obviously the next match coming our way. We do have Optic Gaming in the house once again on the main stage and all the fans that come with them going up against Complexity. And I'm very excited about this matchup. I think this is going to be a really, really strong matchup. Um, I, I want to I know your feelings and thoughts about Optic currently. Uh, Optic didn't 
that they got the job done earlier today, but this is the real test, right? This is the best series, in my opinion, in pool play. Optic versus Complexity. Complexity is going to be coming for the throats of Optic. Optic have got to take this series serious. They are the better team, but this is a very losable series, especially if they play anything like Sentinels was playing, a little sloppy, a little lazy. I think Optic are gonna have to come out playing very good to make sure the job gets done here. Now, Wes, talking about that in terms of Optic Gaming, does the comfortability of this roster worry you about Optic going up against Complexity, or are you happy with what you saw from earlier on? Yeah, that's a big question, right? Uh, is this team ready to go to war? Because this will be a war, and a lot earlier in a tournament than they're probably expecting to have to go to war. And, that, and I mean, like, are you going to be truly tested in your setups and having to break setups, playing from disadvantageous spots? You better be ready for it, Optic, because it's coming. Complexity is no pushover. I will say, if I am going to go go to war, I want to go to war with my brother in arms. And I will say, you know, Dead Zone was playing absolutely lights out, reunited with his best friend in Trippy, and the way he was playing. And the last time we saw, obviously, Lucid was really demanding the spotlight when it came to the kills. But when you added the kills and the assists, the damage as well, dude, Dead Zone had a yeah. really good series. So, uh, your brothers in arms, watch out for them. He certainly had an incredible series. He's throwing up the heart right now, I'm sure, for the Optic fans that he is very quickly getting on his side because that performance was phenomenal from this young man. And Tony, when it comes to the comparisons, though, of Optic and Complexity, in terms of their game types, how are things kind of shaping up for this kind of matchup? Are we looking for a close game here? Yeah, I think the game types and the way that they uh, have the philosophy on how to play Halo are pretty similar. Like, when it comes to Optic Gaming going multiple down, when they want to spawn up, and push out of their spawns. They have no problem gathering numbers, 3-1 splits, sending three players, or even sometimes four players in one lane to flip the map. Complexity do that as well, so they also feel really comfortable when the game gets slowed down and being defensive. Like uh, One of the reasons why the game types are so similar this season when it comes to optic and complexity, when it comes to mapping game type records, is because they're similar philosophy teams. They play the game a similar way. Now, on the other side of the stage, we have Complexity waiting in the wings, waiting to capitalize on any little mistake they can. And you know they will. We've seen what they're like in the off-season, but Wes, you've said it many times before, and I've heard this name flying around when we talk about Cole, and that's Precision. What do you want out of this guy in this series? Precision has to match the output of Lucid in this series if he wants to create this upset. Now, I know that that is probably an impossible task, or you're asking a lot from a young gun, but. If you want to create an upset of this magnitude, you got to play better than their best. And right now, Lucid, obviously one of the three best players in the world or has been across the first two years of Infinite, Precisions has got to reach that level. And I think he has it in him in a short window, right? Can he consistently play as good as Lucid? I mean, nobody in the world really can do that outside of the names we already know, but this kid is an up-and-comer with the individual skill that can take over a series like this if given the platform, the opportunity with power weapons, and and he's on, right? He's got to find his flow. The big question for me is, can he find his flow, and will his teammates be ready to back him up when he does? Tony, complexity, they're already showing a lot of promise, and that's in the off-season. So what are you looking for right now for complexity to really show us what they are capable of, to show us what they are made of? Do you see them going far in this major? I do. I think they need to keep the same energy that they've had literally so far online and bring it to land. You have the makeup of a successful team. You have a main shot caller and a player like Ryan Noob, and then an emerging great co-IGL with a player like Huss. You have Precision, who's been a consistent slayer on this team, and then Descended, formerly known as Carmea, is coming in, and he's that dynamic X-Factor player. I think you have the makeup of a great team, and so far the results have showed Lily just that. Hey, you just mentioned a name there, and some people at home may not realize this, but we've got a couple of new names in the HCS, formerly known as Penguin and Carmea, <laughs> new tag, who dis? Descendant <laughs> and Dead Zone. And Wes, when you're actually looking at the two, not only just changing their names here, but you know, being on teams that are really trying to make something happen, to make something happen this season for their rosters. You know, what do you think of both of them in, in comparison? Uh, in comparison? I think you got to take Dead Zone as a more consistent high-level player. What what the old Penguin was able to do 
was some of the most impressive feats that we've seen uh, across the first two years of Infinite, right? That SSG roster he was a part of, Cloud9 at first, they were special. He knows what it's like to play in big series. Descendant is an up-and-comer with a ton of individual skill, loves to play fast, has a phenomenal shot. When he's, found, when he's in his flow, he is a problem on the map. The problem is, the consistency for me. When I watch him, he's either on fire or he's selling his team short and being the first one dead. I need him to remain calm and fi find his actual opportunities and not the false ones he believes are his opportunities because that will cost complexity if he is caught out and is the first one to go down. But he is also known for taking openings and winning those pivotal fights. And when he does that, he gives complexity the extra leg they need to create an upset this big. I do know that Descendant has been on record with Complexity saying that he is basically Thanos and he is going for Infinity Stones yeah, I, this weekend. I believe it. He plays like he's Thanos. So he's going for his green one currently on this main stage. That would make Optic Gaming the Avengers. Now, can they avenge their Infinity Stone? That is the question. We're certainly going to find out in just a moment. Optic versus Complexity. Let's meet both your teams. It is our hosts, Optic Gaming, up against the hometown rivals in complexity. And this one's the Battle of Texas. Dan, this one promises to be a tasty one. Yeah, we think this one could go all the way based off what we've seen so far in the qualifiers. We've seen three twos, we've seen a few three ones here or there. Complexity matching up really well against Optic Gaming. And when I look at this series layout, yes, it does teeter towards Optic, mainly because of their efficiency during Slayers. They've dominated Complexity when they have gone up against them. I really think the defining moment is going to be that game three, Strongholds Live Fire, because it's one of Complexity's better game types. But we start things off, as we have done a couple of times today, with CTF Empyrean, and we didn't see much of it during the qualifiers. In fact, Complexity didn't play it once during the entire qualification process. We did see more of Optic, though. In Optic, we know how good they are at this map because it means Formal gets a sniper rifle. And last season, this was one of Optic Gaming's best, and it looks as though Penguin is fitting onto that APG role pretty nicely. We can expect their playstyle to be pretty similar here. Definitely, you've got to play around the sniper, allow Formal to get in control, and then when he does that damage, bounce off that damage and make sure you get aggressive at the right time. The green wall up against Complexity, who are here to spoil the party. Optic Gaming have already begun their title challenge. Shields up, weapons hot, we're underway. And Formal prioritizing the rockets here and will have assistance. And it's a very easy grab, so it's going to be complexity leaning towards the overshield. And they are going to be able to grab it. I think Descendant going to be pushing with that overshield now alongside teammates. But Formal just waiting to do the damage and will catch out Ryan Oob. Got to keep an eye on Ryan Oob throughout this game as well. He's very sneaky, will try and go for that sword play, try and get behind enemy lines. Formal, still one rocket to play with. Precision, not living up to his namesake with that first shot. It was a swing and a miss. Does connect to the second player dead zone instead though, and Precision looking to, to get the challenge going, but fortunately for him, he's challenging one of the best in Formal. Knife rifle to play with, body shot will connect. No more shields for Ryan Oob. You spoke about keeping an eye on him, particularly through that sword. That's exactly what we've seen. Yeah, I think Ryan Oob maybe assumed that Formal had gone back up into sword with his first repulse. 
But now we've got Formal with Sniper Control in the sword. This is what you don't want to see if you're a Complexity fan, because if he starts popping off, it will allow the rest of the team to push up, gain map control, and start to think about a flag pull. Formal with eyes top tower for a second. Here we go. Being pushed by two members here. Precision down to no shields. Huss now has the Bulldog to play with, and it's going to be a one-for-one -one trade for Formal. As Huss continues to hold forward, but now forced backwards. Pops the shield to two players, but not good enough to connect and get the kill. So at the moment, both teams with no real advantages to talk about, and the map split pretty even. Trippy at the moment just kind of listening, probably hearing what his teammates are saying, just so he can try and make his way around the map and finish off a little bit of damage. Trippy is the guy who gets in the base for Optic Gaming as well on this map. He's the one who's been leading in flag pulls, leading in flag captures. Even though Dead Zone, we know his objective work is incredible, Trippy is the one who gets in the face of his enemy, so they will often lead from his damage as well. Oh, Ryan Hill, letting them know. Nice and early here. That will... Not too much to upset the Optic Gaming players, but perhaps the fans, they never like to see a little bit of Tito, a little bit of Baggins, a little bit too soon, Dan, it must be said. We'll see how it shakes out from Will Karma come back to bite him. And they're starting to descend on the opposing base here, and Formal will win that one. Four dead for Complexity, and Optic can push out. Yeah, it was an interesting time to go for an aggressive push like that with Rockets and Overshield coming up, because it's going to allow both to go into the hands of Optic Gaming now. In Complexity, they felt like they had the advantage because they had a player down, but maybe could have just stood back a little bit. And now it's going to allow Optic to really get aggressive with this push. Dead Zone with the Overshield, has to lead the charge, needs support though, because you can get the initial damage, but you are going to be the focus point. Ascendant taking under no shields did quite a bit of damage to the Overshield player though, and Dead Zone realizing that He's down in shots, faced with two members of Complexity, but enough damage has been done elsewhere. Huss will continue to jiggle peak. Beautiful nade, will back up dead zone for a moment. Look at this, Lucid's got flag on the move and over towards Sword. It's not a traditional route. It can certainly work out well if you can control those spawns. I mean, he has a sniper to work with as well and does get a shot onto Descendant. And now they keep on moving because three are dead for complexity and this should be a comfortable cap to get Optic Gaming 1-0 up here and they take the lead. And remember, Optic coming into this one as the lower seed. Complexity coming in as the higher seed because of their placement in the latest NA qualifier. It's not often we see Optic coming in as a lower seed and they'll want to prove that wrong. They want to regain that seed off of complexity. Optic with a little wobble in the qualifier. And like you say, looking to right that wrong here. They top the pool. Of course, it's important to remember both these teams unbeaten in the pool, and this one could decide who finishes top, barring an open team oh. coming in to disrupt things. Oh. Trippy rips the face off of Huff's shoulders, and Lucid also gets another one onto Ryan Noob, so map control is there, and an option here for Optic Gaming. And Trippy locks in yet another kill. Instead, Ryan Noob has made that flank once more. He's going to constantly be a thorn in their side. Yeah, but Trippy spotted him out, and Trippy's well aware of it, and he will be calling that out. But Ryan Noob, he gets some assistance from teammates. But sadly, uh, Ryan Noob's life does not live much longer because now Formal has a sniper rifle to play with. I think he's just run out of ammo, but the sniper has made such a difference in the early stages as that nade hits hard, and it's going to allow two, and it could be three here for Formal. Descendant backs off into green, but Formal carries on going, and it's all four dead now for complexity. And Optic can start to think about a second flag run. Formal just does so much damage. Rocket's about to pop up as well, and that can make this flag run all but locked in now. Lucid's has made it all the way down long haul and received no damage. Kills getting picked up around as Trippy and Formal will get a couple on the board. And that means 2 0 oh now for Optic Gaming. One away from winning the game. It doesn't look like things have changed too much for Optic when we look at VR starts to Bandit starts when it comes to this map and mode. Controlling it in a very similar way. And even though a lot of it can stem from aggression from be a sniper rifle or an overshield, they just know how to work together. Targeting the same enemy at the same time. As Lucid just needs to be careful here. Of course, we know the Bulldog can really make a difference in Sword. Ascendant playing off his heels with the Bulldog. Precision and Rhino will get a couple of kills, and that means they can push forward. Sending, sending a few of the frag grenades back from whence they came. Formal the last man alive for a moment. As position top tower with two 
teammate spawning over towards the flag. Krippy has made it out, but not for long as he's cut down. But Formal will relieve some of the pressure by getting a kill on tower. The trouble with these constant pushes from complexity to lower sword over towards snipe is when that player gets picked off, it then gives Optic Gaming the extra player on the map, and they're able to then just overpower complexity and continue to dominate and pressure. So I think Complexity probably have to start looking towards a plan B here, maybe controlling a little bit more of Long Haul and Green if they're going to get any flag balls. Normal with Snipe. Lucid may have remnants of the opponent's Snipe as well, as Huss did fall over towards Sword. Lucid's going to take up the position over towards Banana. Looks as though Optic Gaming are pretty happy with what they have in the bag so far, and Lucid does have that Snipe, and he's finding them faces. Three dead with Ascendant last man alive over towards the tower. Yeah, the kills come through and it just allows Fubal to push up because they know this could be the final flag cap. If Fubal gets in the right place at the right time, he could be hitting several heads alongside Lucid here. And this is a massacre. And this is going to be game. All four dead. Huss spawning over towards the Mangler. And Mangler's the name of the game right now. It's complexity, you're in a blender. Desperately trying to get down long haul, but it's all for naught. Off the gaming, take game one. So much control towards the end of the game. It was all leading up to it. It was a build up throughout. Of Optic slowly but surely just pummeling Complexity into the ground. And even though there was small amounts of fight back throughout, Complexity couldn't wrestle back that control. A couple of attempted little flanks here or there, but Optic were wise to it. They always had eyes on, and that's because they know the kind of players they're going up against. They know what Rhinoop's gonna do when he's trying to make that sword flank. But it really was a perfect setup at the end when they have both sniper rifles in their hands. Taking a look at the stats, 19, 9, and 10 for Formal, leading the lobby. Stellar job from him, massively impressive. And look at Trippy as well, putting up the stats in dead zone along with him. But it has to be said, Dan, you spoke about how Rhino likes to play the sword side. It looks as though all of Complexity were playing the sword side. I'm not sure they know if a call-out came long haul where that is on the map. And I think maybe that's just naturally because Optic dominates so much of long haul and green that Complexity were forced to try and go sword. How many times were they caught in that courtyard spawn? And the only way to escape Optic is by going into sword. Whether that's going down or whether it's going through it, it's the same old saying, if you can't go under it, you can't go over it, you've got to go through it, but they just couldn't do so because Optic had so much control. A very well played Imperian CTF. It's what we would expect from Optic Gaming, and maybe this is kind of teasing us as to what we could see for the rest of this series. I think what's most impressive, you spoke about how they held the map, but it was the control that they had. Even you see this courtyard spawn, all four exactly where they want them. This was orchestrated perfectly by Optic Gaming on beautiful execution. I mean, the communication between Formal and Lucid just to watch those certain angles. And this could have gone wrong at the end as well, because notice after they get these kills, there was the spawn over towards the Mangler. And you could kill the flag guy from there and then suddenly stop the flag. But Formal had eyes on. He was ready. He was waiting. He heard that call out and that shot there guaranteed the flag yet again. And sadly for complexity, they were in that blender. They were never going to be able to escape, but they just have to start thinking now about map number two. Map number two, Slayer Aquarius. You spoke about how good Optic are in the Slayers. This is not good news for Complexity. Yeah, seven and two in the qualifiers in Slayers in general, and they have taken down Complexity twice on Slayer Aquarius. One was closer than the other, 50 to 47 in the most recent, but they did also 50 to 36 them during qualifiers as well. So it, it's something we would expect Optic to be winning, but at the same time, if Complexity can kind of get a little bit of momentum, get the ball rolling and maybe disrupt Optic's process here, there's still a chance. And you know, we heard on the desk, they were talking about can Precision kind of step up, can he be that big slayer? This is the game for you to show what you're made of. And we spoke about Ryan Oob in the past, how he finds himself on these rosters that excel. He manages to build them every single time. Speaking of the man, Pillars of Halo, and that's absolutely fitting for him because he's found himself on this roster with some absolute demons. And Ryan has been trying to build something throughout the entirety of Halo Infinite, it feels. He's been there, he's been been there, done that with, it seems like so many different players throughout the community. 
But there's something about this complexity roster that I think is just maybe a little bit better than others that he's seen before. And there's that belief that they can go on to cause upsets. And yes, okay, game one really didn't go their way, but it's not one of their better game types. You just have to sometimes accept you're going to have your good, you're going to have your bad. And CTF Imperium is one of Optic's best. So you move on, you start to think about Aquarius Slayer, you start to think about those starting strategies. It was difficult in the early stages. We saw both teams went for very different objectives on CTF Imperium. One for Rockets, one for Overshield. There is only one objective here. It is the Overshield now on Slayer Aquarius. You have to get it off the go. We have seen many different strategies on how to acquire that Overshield right off the rip. Is it a full four-man push or do you try and play the baiting game? And more often than not, you need to try and have resources in the right place because you can't seem to pick it up from the P side. You have to almost take alternative angles. If you can hit the slides right, you can get there very fast and maybe pop it into your chest before you die when you're online. On LAN, you're going to be picked apart from someone who's watching it. So you have to be more precise with how you approach it. And you really need to be controlling the map and thinking about what happens after the overshield is grabbed as well. Because it's not just the overshield. Of course, there's other things you want to be able to pick up as well. So you just need to make sure you've got that in the back of your mind when it does happen. We spoke about these players having unbelievable talent on either side of the roster. Who is it on these teams that you think will be the difference maker in this layer? I think that you have to look at Formal. The damage output that Formal has been doing throughout not just qualifiers, but at previous events as well. I feel like he's really in his element with the latest meta changes, with the Bandit now coming into the equation. Formal just seems to be even better than he was with the Battle Rifle, which I think is a scary, scary situation for those that are going up against him. On the flip side, I mean, I want to see something from Precision or maybe Descendant as well. Uh, the new name change that they were talking about, does it kind of affect your play style here or there? No, of course it's not going to. But we know what these players can do when they get into individual gunfights, and I'd expect both of them to be playing pretty hot here. You speak about Formal. Rightfully so. You watch his streams, you watch his POV, and he has one of the steadiest shots in the game, Dan. Doesn't matter if it's a bandit, if it's a sniper rifle, a shock rifle, his shot, his pre-aiming, it's always on point. Yeah, I think that Formal is a player that a lot of people can learn from. I mean, when we come into an Optic Major, there's always going to be that extra expectation, that extra pressure on your shoulder as well. But we know that Formal is not really a player who is affected by said pressure. But it was here at this Major last year when we saw Optic had one of their worst placements, right? So we need to see now a bounce back from Optic for the fans. Well, that's what they're going to feel like as players, that they almost owe the fans that. So I think we're going to see a different look, Optic, at this tournament, especially after the most recent qualifier being, again, a bit of a dud for them. Top six, not used to what we're seeing for Optic Gaming. So I'm expecting them to try and prove a point here. When we spoke to members of the Complexity team. They spoke about how the top four is a dream, top six is an expectancy, and anything below that, you're starting to be disappointed. And when you think about this team, what they've been through, you think about, okay, we're, we're gonna build this squad. What is it we're trying to achieve? It's to beat the likes of Optic Gaming and to do it in their own backyard. What a story that would be. Yeah, no one wants to just be a top eight team, right? Or a top six team. You wanna win the whole thing. And you were talking about Slayers. You asked me who I thought might be big Slayers. We didn't mention Lucid. A lot of talk about Formal, but Lucid was an MVP for a reason, right? Unbelievably, talented at this video game and yes there's been meta shifts that have kind of nerfed him a little bit here or there but he constantly works his way back up to be at the top of his game also wearing the same glasses as blaze which i think is very interesting but an amazing player and if he is firing on all cylinders then again optic gaming they're gonna be in the driving seat and you mentioned complexity they've been boot camping for about a week so it's not like they're underprepared coming into this yes they don't have the same history the same kind of chemistry as optic gaming but they do have the practice they have the reps under their belt. I just feel like they need one. They need one game here just to say, okay, this series is on, this is doable. If you go 2-0 down, then that's when your heads may start to drop. It's all about planting the seeds of belief. Game two underway. Thanks for sticking with us, folks, as we dealt with some technical issues, but we're rocking and rolling now. And two members of Optic Gaming have immediately gone towards the overshield as Lucid tried to hold the lines. He's rewarded with two kills and a fresh five shots. Triple kill for Lucid and a heat wave to play with. And you could almost see it in his gameplay. He was kind of searching, he was saying, is there more? But it's 4-2 in the early stages. And Optic Gaming, they were rewarded with that overshield. Formal misses a couple of shots, but of course can just lunge in and ensure he finishes off the kill. But it was an interesting starting strategy from Optic. They knew how they wanted to get the overshield, and it was almost as expected. As long as you've got one player to watch that cross, you can do so much damage to those players who are just kind of 
deer in headlights trying to get towards that overshield. Rainu tries to slip away up the shroom stairs. That will not be an eventuality for him as he's sent to the respawn screen, rejoins us now. Descending over towards car three, will drop down. And settles for a trade. There's two members of complexity now, making three in blue. Dead zone's gonna be the first point of contact, and he's good for one, but that's all. The score currently sitting at 12 to nine. The early innings favoring, favoring after ga after gaming. You need to have complexity stay competitive in this game. They have to get to the latter stages and still be within five for me. And if it does get to the later stages and we start to look at like a 48-48, for example, I always back Ryan Noob's side. Ryan Noob always seems to have a great game plan when it comes to those scenarios, but you've got to get there first. And if Optic could just contain them, if they can keep this kind of pressure going, if they can keep these spawn traps going where they pressure them at each base, it's going to be difficult for complexity to stay within five. Precision now. Stands up two. Kills go in their favor. Overshield's gonna be popped into the chest as well. Now Complexity can push forward. Descendants looking for those fresh spawners who are gonna be over towards the closet area. Almost stand still, baking in the overshield. Player has gone straight into a brawl. Good double. It's good for two though. Three go down, lucid last man standing. And you saw that that was a kind of ambush attempt from Optic, but Descendant was able to get in from an angle where they weren't really expecting it. If you can go two for one with an overshield, you're pretty happy about that. As now at the moment, it's Optic who are kind of forced back into a base, but a great defensive hold. If you can get one player to kind of sit back pillar, you can do so much damage to those players that are trying to chase the no shield. So good awareness there from Optic Gaming. Bodies continue to hit the floor. Ryan Noob down to no shields. Ultimately hits the ground at the hands of the trigger of Dead Zone. It'll be interesting to see how they're going to navigate these next few passages of play. Let's go to an Optic Gaming listen in. Watch out, card jump to car. Red card, one card, one card. It's with Dead Zone. And behind me. Fighting hard block. One key jump. Card jump, two of them. Watch out, three one. Two card two. Two card one now. Two card one now. Look card one. Enemy have together, put 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 Hey, right, right, Michael, don't bottom mid, don't bottom mid. That's fine, blue. up when OS comes. Yeah, watch the yellow doors. Watch the yellow doors. Blue gen, blue gen, blue gen. And P1, P1, Joey. Three shots, P1. One shot, one shot on OB. Front blue is in, front blue is in. Blue P, I think. Blue P street. Yeah, blue P street. Blue shot. Blue fridge. Job, P1. Go for Joey, go for Joey, go for Joey. One shot. Nice. Two here, two here, Zane. Two here. P1, go on. Oh, one shot. One shot. No one blue street. Always a pleasure to be a fly on the green wall, getting a sneak peek into those comms. They only need four more kills down, but this has been textbook. Yeah, and one of the major takeaways was let's keep trading out these kills. They already had like a six kill lead and it just keeps getting better now. As there's no way back into this for complexity. It's far too far away at this point. 49 turns to 50 in Optic Gaming. They make it 2-0 and it was in a very commanding fashion. Dominated the overshield, dominated the entire presence of the map. Complexity, they never got a chance to get going. It was clinical. Greenwall double their lead. 
complexity just didn't look at the races in that game number two. And you spoke about how games one and two were going to be a struggle for complexity, and game three was going to be that difference maker. Yeah, game three is their last real lifeline, and we'll get into that a little bit after some highlights. But complexity, they never were able to break out of a base with any real control. It was usually when it was a kill that was traded out. They, they never got that player advantage that forced Optic back onto a spawn themselves. And you at 50 to 35, it's not a terrible score. We've seen a lot worse on the main stage, but at the same time, it was never really going to be Complexity's game. You'd have to feel like they had to get that one overshield, maybe two overshields, just to push them over the edge and stop Optic from the massacre that happened at times. But it was Trippy with 17 kills who led the way for Optic Gaming. There's a reason why he clutch calls and big game trip. When Optic need him, he shows up, he answers the call. Dead zone as well, registered an impressive tally of 12, 7, and 6. All this talk heading into the tournament, upgrade, side grade, downgrade. He'll not be putting too much weight into anyone's opinion. He's here to play the game. And then you look at Formula and Lucid, the two damage dealers, 11 assists apiece. If you're playing with Formula and Lucid on your team, you are going to have such a fun time on Aquarius. You don't even need to call out. All you need to do is listen to the damage that's being done by those two boys, and you will pick up kills. You will have a fun time on Aquarius. And that certainly seemed to be the case for the rest of Optic Gaming. And they find themselves 2-0 up, but they go into Stronghold's live fire, which, as I mentioned earlier, is one of Complexity's better game types. In fact, they did beat Optic Gaming during the qualifiers on this exact map and mode, 250 to 233. Still pretty close, and I still think a 3-0 is somewhat on the horizon here for Optic Gaming, especially with the confidence they seem to be playing with. And if we could even put ourselves in the headspace of Complexity, they found themselves 2-0 up in the qualifier against Optic and they got themselves reverse swept. Is, is there something that one of the guys can Ash just turn around and say, here, listen, lads, we've had it done. There's no reason we can't do it to them. Exactly. That's what you need to be saying. You need to be saying to each other, it's completely doable. If they've done it, then we can do it too. And it's one of our better maps and modes here that we've beaten them on before. It's the perfect way to start a reverse sweep. We've seen reverse sweeps started on bad maps. It's more likely, though, to happen on one of your better maps. And Optic will have that in mind. Optic will know it's going to be one of Complexity's better maps. But at the same time, Optic would have been able to do the VOD research, right? Optic would have been able to look at why Complexity were winning that. It's not just starting strategy. It would have been control later on in the game as well that maybe they weren't able to wrestle back. I fire once upon a time. It was Optic Gaming's home. That oh, was it really was. I mean, they didn't lose for, it felt like, months, maybe years. I don't know. But all I know is they were very, very good at that map. And typically now, as time has started to roll on, they've improved in other maps, but maybe you've neglected Live Fire just a touch. Well, they almost pioneered the way to play Live Fire back in the day. And it's been an evolution ever since with meta changes, kind of spawn shifts as well, weapons changing here and there, power-ups changing. Optic started everything. The whole reason why we probably saw changes to said power-ups was because Optic were too good at one point in Live Fire. But now they have just to continue to learn and develop their own meta. And they seem to be doing pretty well. It is maybe one of their weaker game types from what we saw in qualifiers, strongholds on Live Fire in particular. But Live Fire as a map, they still know how to play. They are still going to be good at it. I just think if we're going to see any game go in favor of complexity, it would be this one. I think we can talk about, obviously, we mentioned briefly complexity being the fourth seed, Optic being the fifth seed, and what a statement it would be from the green wall. If they win this 3-0 convincingly, that they're here to play and they're here to threaten the big two. I think in Optic's minds, they probably still feel like they're a top four seed. You know, uh, it was diff difficult for them because when we look at the qualifiers and how they worked, the top four teams from the latest qualifier became the top four seeds. But if you look at the accumulative points of Optic Gaming from all of those qualifiers, they still would be ahead of complexity. So I'm sure in their head, that's how they feel. And they just need to kind of reassert their dominance here in this series. Well, you spoke about right and the wrong. If they top this pool, they managed to steal the fourth seed anyway. So that qualifier is irrelevant at that point. So they'll be looking at this as we get a 3-0 here, we end the day, play the open team tomorrow, and then we can really want to run. Very interesting to see what happens on the start of this one as well. Optic tend to lean very heavily towards the green side. They usually send two players to pillar, one up on nest, and then one will go tower. And they want to get that sniper rifle in Formal's hands. That is their first task, to ensure that they get the sniper to him. And Formal on this map gets sniper and usually plays for the camouflage as well. You give him both of those two things, he is going to be a Terminator, right? He is going to be someone walking around that map, destroying everything. So complexity, they need to shut that down. Optic Gaming one game away from taking out the sweep and brush and clearing complexity to one side and getting on with their tournament. 
we go. It's gonna be formal the player to sit top tower, play for formal, play for the sniper rifle, and good things usually happen. Oh. The Senate pops like up the challenge, gets the trade. Well, that's the way they've tried to counter it. They've just tried to send someone up through bottom middle so that it's not gonna be an easy grab for formal. But unfortunately, the other players who went green and towards pillars did their job. So Optics still have control and they still have the sniper. And if you can't have it in formal's hands, you'd like to have it in Lucid's. But good comeback from Complexity to ensure they don't allow him to get going either. Sniper rifle will be down on sandbags. Be interesting to see if Optic can close in and scoop it up. Rhino just delaying this fight. He's gonna have a shield advantage now as well, forcing Trippy all the way back down to bottom middle. He's got towards pillars now and touch tight with his teammate dead zone. Zenith sitting back green, they're trying to capture B, but Ryan Noob's there. It'll be a thorn in the side, three down momentarily for Optic Gaming. And this is a similar tale to what we saw at the very start of the day when we were looking at two different teams, structure versus a little bit of chaos. Complexity do thrive amongst the chaos, whereas Optic, they like to play a little bit more structured. If we see Optic take control, they can probably dominate this game and really close out this series in a very impressive fashion. But if Complexity can kind of keep this close, keep them bouncing between C and A, make them second guess themselves, they can definitely make it competitive. <laughs> Well, done a wonderful job just delaying that fight up against two guns, but ultimately he wasn't long for the world. Three dead once more for complexity. A and B remain locked in for the green wall. Descendant gets force pushed off the map by Lucid. Tapping into his inner Obi-Wan Kenobi. And a triple cap unofficially in effect. It's not quite locked in, it is now, and complexity could be in big trouble. Yeah, big, big trouble. You have to win a couple of fights here, which they do. Three go down for Optic Gaming, so it's not the end of the world here. But complexity, oh. and that's what you need. You need someone to be hitting those shots to give your team the chance. Sending wobbles the brain of one. Precision's good for two. Dead zone challenges on Nest. Ryan Oob's grenade will get the job done. Sniper rifle now with one bullet to play with for Precision. It's a swing and a miss, but he gets the stick and gets the trade. Yeah, great play for the stick there to ensure you get that trade. Camo's coming up now as well. We'll have to see if anyone was able to actually get their hands on it. No one yet. It's still going to be up on its platform. So Descendant going to go for a little flank to try and help the rest of the team. But a complexity still in control whilst they play for this camouflage. So it's also timed pretty well as four now go down for Optic Gaming. And complexity, they have a bit of control. You spoke about how in the qualifier the game finished 250 to 233 in favor of Complex, and you can see why there's very little between them. Descendants looking to push the envelope oh here. Dear. Formal shuts the camouflage player down and scoops up a repulsor to play with as well. Very little things like that from Formal, where he's just got a bit of an unsurprising strafe. Sometimes he'll just crouch, stand still. Sometimes he's trying to go for a, a merry dance. And other times it will give you the jump. Always keeps you on your toes. A very difficult player to challenge in a piv. As now A, B, and C going to lock in for Optic Gaming. And this could be a chance to get a good position to score quite a lot of points here. Formal peeks in. Doesn't like what he sees. The distraction was enough, though, as Lucid picked up two and dead zone another. Snipe rifle still in the hands. Could be another triple cap if they're not too careful. Ryan Noob challenges over towards Nest. Loses his shields. Precision almost loses his face. Formal is shut down. And Optic Gaming still remain in control and are now just taking the lead. Formal just trying to hit bodies there. You notice he connected with the first shot. He didn't even think about that player he's just hit. He trusts that teammates might clean it up or he might be able to get another body shot to help teammates elsewhere. As Lucid gets the trade with Ryan Oob. Complexity still in control though, but only by a few as they finally break out of that trip cap. And Huss and Descendant work together to shut down the player who was over towards Camo. So now Optic Gaming need to break the setup once more. Lucid on Nest, Jiggle peaks. Hits five fresh shots. Teammates were there, there were three dead for the green wall. Complexity looking to try and put some breathing space between the two. Formal's got a pick though. Precision's on big door, dead zone. Flights with his back to the wall. Loose it's there, on scoreboard, soars forward, gets one. Might get Ryan Noob as well, he can't do so though. As Ryan Noob prevents the cap, the reset comes in. So Optic will score for the moment. 
Scoring at the moment, but still behind. And I guess one of Optic's biggest criticisms last year was that they played a little slow at times, and it did allow those teams who were quite quick thinking on their feet, they could take them down in games like this. But Optic are doing very well to kind of wrestle back that same speed that Complexity have been throwing at them. Just need to be careful they don't allow Complexity to get too far ahead here, because you don't want to give yourself too much to do in the later stages of the game. But the camouflage has gone in favor of Complexity quite a few times now. Have to keep an eye on that. See if it starts to pay dividends. Oh, wow. An unofficial double kill. Like, actually, an unofficial double kill. The medal was awarded for Descendant. Just wanted to take it off him. I did. They can't have it. No one can. Lose it on scoreboard, though. Looking to attack towards Jail. Get control of A. A couple of spike grenades go down. Just to scare off any would-be push over towards the big door. Lucid's forced to step out to get a kill, but unfortunately for him, it's going to be a reset. Well, how many times do you see a team go towards A and the other team will say, all right, well, whilst they're at A, let's go towards C. Complexity not playing that way. They said, let's actually challenge them at A and send one player over towards C so we can just keep Optic on their toes here, keep them guessing. It's a temporary trip cap for Complexity. It's a good amount of score for them. 174 to 113, and it could be yet again another trip cap. Optic are caught in a split spawn at the moment. Two up, two down, two up, two down. And this is where Complexity can really take advantage as Precision gets another stick. That was a real knuckleball. Sent the plasma grenade off the ground into the air again and stuck to the kneecap. Four dead for Optic. Much of everything that's been going well here for Complexity. Many ways thanks to Precision. 22, 8, and 14. He's been the difference maker here. Descendant also putting up some very respectful numbers. Three dead for Optic. Trippy the last man standing and he's trying desperately to convert B. This is where you can leave them at B here and maybe hope for a B spawn, but there is going to be a player at C at the same time, so Complexity don't have that luxury. Instead, they just have to fight at C. So it's not going to be another trip Whoa. cap, but Huss stays down towards his knees, gives him the wiggles, and Complexity still firmly in control. Sure, Optic get A, but now they're going to get B back in their favor, and they can once more push them over towards that camo side, force them to try and take C, and as soon as they do, they then go into A. So frustrating to play against. Just can't seem to get the numbers on the map. Ryan Noob's going to be a pick, though, for Lucid, who has the camouflage. This could be an opportunity back into the game. Enemy team scoring. As Complexity only need 18, but how many times have we seen this slip through the fingers of the players and the teams in the lead? Well, we've already seen it once today, a 100-point comeback right at the beginning of today. Can we see something similar from Optic Gaming? Can they take a leaf out of Rebellion's books? What they did against Sentinels. Well, they have a trip cat. That's certainly a way to start things. Uh, trade comes out, though. Shutting Lucid down. And this is where Complexity just need to not panic. Yes, OK, you are so close to winning. And yes, you are being put in a trip cap. You just need someone to say, let's breathe. Let's work together. Let's focus on one. Get that back first. And then we begin to move together. A was the focal point. They get it. And now you just start to work to your, towards your next. Formal sacrifice is life. Yeah. Get the reset on B and the trade. They can ill afford to give up too many more points here. Lucid tries to fight against the Senate. Expects oh. the reach out, had to reload. And the fadeaway shot will connect. Precision gets two elsewhere. This could be curtains. It's A and B now flip back towards complexity and they're closing in on victory. Yeah, that was a big win in the 1v1. Had Lucid yeah. stayed alive, this could have been very different, but now they only need four points. Complexity moments away from getting themselves right back into this series, yeah. and they will. 2-1 now the score, and we're going to a game four. It was one of their better game types, and they prove why, and it transitions from online right to LAN, as this was a far more effective way of playing than they did online. They were able to shut down Optic a lot easier. So they're back into this series, and they can start to think about game four. As for Optic, again, it's not the end of the world. They are still leading, but it is that kind of seed being planted of, okay, well, what if they do what we did to them back in the qualifiers? And as that game en ended, Dan, you gave me a little look, a little smug smile, as though you knew exactly what way that script was going to go. Well, it's funny, because I have little stars next to which team I think is going to win each map, and it has gone that way so far. But... My star goes to Optic Gaming for the next one, so we'll have to see whether they are able to win Oddball Recharge, but for now you can see the statistics on your screen. Clutch wanted Precision to match Lucid. Well, he matched him and then he doubled it.
30 kills from him. And if he can keep playing like that, they still have a chance in this series for sure. The set and pocket pit putting up very good numbers as well, it must be said. But the damage as well for Precision, nearly 7,000. And as we look at the highlights, some beautiful shots were on display, as you see from Descendant, but now a lifeline in the series, Dan, going to the oddball. I know you put an asterisk beside Optic Gaming claiming that they're going to be the favourites here, but that score, 250, 250 to 165, you speak, we speak about planting the seed of belief, it's well and truly planted. planted. Can they now add some water to it? And they can certainly give it a good effort, but Oddborn Strongholds, very different game types, and it does lean towards the playstyle of Optic Gaming a little bit more. You get your setup, you hold, and you have your structure. There's a reason why they're six in one on this game type map and mode throughout the qualifiers, because they know and love how to play Oddball. And not only were they good at Oddball back in the day with APG, but now they have Dead Zone, who is again one of the best ball players you can have on your team. APG, Dead Zone, and Snakebite, three of the best Oddball players you will see in the HCS. So I'm looking forward to seeing what Dead Zone kind of does with the ball. Where's he going to go? Where does he move with the team? And sometimes the team will move around him. It's not necessarily him listening and saying, okay, where should I be going? He dictates where that ball's going to be going. And the rest of the boys will say, all right, well, now we're playing tower. Let's get to him. Let's make sure he's got the support. And it's what the best oddball players do in the game is they almost see ahead of time. They know exactly where to rotate the ball, when they're getting pressure applied to them, when is the time to go, when is the time to play the ball. And few do it better than, Pen than Dead Zone, excuse me. Lottie said it's going to keep happening all weekend, and she, she was right. And what I love about this team, Optic Gaming, is that they don't rely on Dead Zone to do all of it. Trippy picks up a lot of the slack when it comes to Oddball as well. He'll make sure that he's grabbing it. He'll put himself in the danger areas so that he can put some time on the board. They're not afraid to pick up that ball. There's so many times we see teams that are kind of like, well, you know, we've got two dead. Maybe we should look for the third. Optic will be like, all right, we've got two dead. Let's get that ball and we'll find the third as we pick it up so we can get some time. But you are right, complexity, they have momentum on their side now. They've got that map under their belt. They have that belief if they can do it. This is going to be a great game four. I can't wait for it. As we load in, Optic Gaming in a very similar situation. They were just a game ago, still one away from winning the series. It will look a little less dominant than when you look at the stats. People will say, well, 3 1 was a close one. Importantly, it was Complexity who took an objective game type. Keep an eye on the grenades here from Complexity as well. They did fantastic during the qualifiers at shutting Optic down immediately with grenades. But it looks like Optic are trying to play things a little bit different. They're wise to it now and not allowing the same thing to happen. But you can see one nade gets off from Precision, but Optic were able to get a couple of picks of their own. Another nade falls to the feet of Forma, which made the kill for Precision far easier. Lucid gets a double kill, but will fall down as well. Trippy's got gold in control. Dead Zone's gonna be the support player over towards Pipes. Send it down to half shields. And we really see the entrance to the red pipes area. Gonna be a nade fest. Two players now gonna make the push. It's the waiting guns, but the push has been successful so far. Lovely plasma grenade goes down. Three trade for three. How many sticks is that now for Descendant? That's at least four we've seen so far this series, right? Really has the precision of it, and that's just a coincidence, but I think there's one thing that Complexity could take away from the previous game. If I was kind of listening to them chat, they're probably saying, well, how did we win against Optic? It was a little bit of the chaos. It was disrupting that structure. How can we replicate that in a game of ball? Well, it's keeping that ball moving. It's keeping Optic on their toes as Ryan, who gets the kill onto Trippy, a big one as well, because it means he keeps the shock rifle. As you say it, Lucid takes control. Ryan who relinquishes the shock rifle. The Possibly one of the worst players in the lobby you could give it to. Second shot finds a home. Precision was in trouble as well, but for that little D-scope at a very vital time. As Lucid threatened to drag it onto him. The Senate goes down. Enemy has the ball. And it looks as though the call has come to try and play out A, create some space. Lucid has done that. And now, Optic Gaming hold the gold pipe set up. Puss has gotten a kill over towards Glass, but has to back away. Ryan Noob down to no shields. Shock Rifle will find a home, but only enough to take away his shields. Killing spree, locked in, and a 29 second to two lead. Great aggression there, losing a lot of people would sit back with the shock, but he recognized he only had one bullet left. 
Alongside the grapple, so he says, right, I can maybe do a little bit of damage and cause a little bit of chaos here as now Raidu with the camouflage does get spotted out, but it was off the back of a double kill. He'd done enough to allow the team to push up. Three dead on the side of Optic, so this is going to be Complexity's first chance to maybe get some ball time, and that's a great grab from Descendant there. Descendant falls. Well, it was. Lost two members. So no real setup. They threatened for a moment, that's all it was. As they've relinquished ball to Optic Gaming. And how do they now break the setup? Let's have a little listen in with Complexity and see how they manage things. Enemy has the ball. Five, says, huh? the got out of hell. They're gonna be tower probably. Okay, Kat. Yeah, tower to see. Tower to see. Tower to see. Bottom tower gonna kill me. Bottom tower. Dead. Nice, good kill. Bottom tower, bottom tower. 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 Watch out, Bella, Joe. Or Nori, Zach. Bigger, bigger. I'm gonna G-Sit, Bella. Bigger, bigger. bigger. Yeah, yeah. I G-Sit, Bella. Nice. Two dead, two dead. Two dead, two dead. Nice, nice, nice. Watch out, watch out. Stay ready to play ball. Stay ready to play ball. They have a shock. They have a shock. Game on. Game on 15. Do they have a shock, guys? I don't know. I'll go, I'll go. I'll go. I'll bridge. Yeah. Come here. Game on 10. Yeah, they have shock. They have shock. I pull. I pull. Play the late. Play the late. Incoming. I'm not pulling. I need to celebrate us. Game on 5. Grab me, I think. Fire right, I'm here. Fight it out, fight it out, fight it out. Nice. Gonna be more pipes, gonna be more pipes. Oh, Tyler, turn out. Watch out, Bella. Kill him kill him kill him Kill that. Last guy, Tyler, shoot him, shoot him. Shoot him. I'm going for ball at you, going for ball at you. Shooting now. I'll be one shot. 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 I'll be one pipes. I think we're good. Nice, Jason. Two pipes. One on me, I'm dead. Two pipes. Yeah, two turbo, two turbo. And one bottom me, two bottom tower. Bottom tower on this. Me? Needles in hell. Watch out. Last guy, needles in. Out. He's one shot, needles. One shot, needles. Other needles. Other needles. Yeah, we have money. I have money. Nice, good job. Right here, right here. Right here, right here. Don't die beneath. Good, good. 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 Good, Watch out, 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 you're here in passion you're here in comms fast paced these players recognize just how close they are to winning the round as they've now just taken the lead. Remnants of a Let's Go Optic chant are heard around the crowd. Lexi have a two second lead. A minute and 25 on the clock. Something I've been so impressed with from these Complexity players is how difficult they are when they're down to no shields, just making sure they can Enemy milk their life for as long as possible. They're slippery, aren't they? They are. They seem to be oiled up, and Optic just can't grasp them in the moment. I do feel like those chants, they might need to be there for Optic. They kind of need that fifth player at the moment because this has been a bit of a rut. Whilst we were in that listening, Complexity really gained control of the game, and you could hear the screams. Complexity starting to feel themselves, and they were getting confident. They're winning individual fights, and they're only 12 seconds off of winning this round. Winning fights, Enemy and at the moment, the winning the round. 10 seconds oh. required. Ryan Noob locks in one. Uh-oh. Two players spawn over towards uh -oh. Pipes. Uh-oh, Ryan Noob! You filthy animal! Complexity claim round number one. And a cheeky grin on the face of Ryan Noob, because he enjoyed that one. But the job's not done. 1-0 up, they find themselves. Nade's now likely to go to Whirlpool here from Complexity to try and shut down the Optic push over towards Camo. But again, Optic are doing a similar thing. They know what Complexity try and do off the start. So they're going for something different. They're trying to avoid those grenades, but they don't 
quite get hold of the camouflage, and it is again Complexity winning the starting strategy. It was happening in qualifiers, and it's happening here on land. It was three dead for a moment. Lucid desperately tries to live over towards Grapple. Ryan Noob down to no shields on Whirlpool. Formal soars forward and locks in that kill. The damage was done. The great start the Complexity had. They've given the ball over. The ball. And now Optic have the setup. Formal's got shock rifle sitting bat ledge. And he's ready to do it for Gotham. And it shoots between all three of the players there, just not quite able to get the timing. It does allow Complexity to cross over towards blue, but Trippy and Lucid were there with the ambush, just waiting in control room. And now Optic have got the desired setup. This is where usually they're at their very oh, best. Bro. Not only have they got players in the right position, but they've got all the tools they could want. You just need to hit the shots. And there you have it, Formal hits the first. But Complexity do do well to respond here. You've got to send two players at the shock rifle sometimes, especially when it's Formal who's holding it. Ed's out holding the ball. Slips away. The ball will fumble down the triple stacks in a little bit of no man's land. 21 kills at the moment for Lucid. On average, throughout the qualifiers, he was around 26 kills every single time they played on Oddball. There's just something about the play style of Oddball and how it works that really plays to Lucid's kind of style of the game. It's quick movement around the map. It's being unpredictable. It's using every tool in his arsenal to get kill after kill, whether it be grapple, whether it be repulse, whether it be a shock rifle. Hell, he probably gets kills with a ball every now and then as he tries it, but only gets the initial beat down as precision gets the kill. Lucid started sand walking. I had to stop myself from saying, listen, Al Gaib. The use of that grapple, able to change trajectories, camouflage up now. Dead Zone continues to put down cover fire. Trippy's gonna be able to be on hand for the backstab. Formal's got camo. And he's moving into pipes. He's got a few eviction papers to serve, and precision and descendant are the names on the headers. Well, this is an interesting play. He's just hoping to go unseen. But now he pounces, now he strikes. So he emerges, but only able to get the one. Very dangerous when you play a game like that with camo because you can so easily get spotted out and get punished for it. But it seems to have worked out in Optic's favor. They were able to get three dead from Complexity, temporarily, I think, four. And Optic have come out swinging in this round. It's almost like that first one really pissed them off. And now they want to show that actually we're not going to allow Complexity to get back in this game. Let's show why we are good at Oddball, why we were so good in qualifiers, and it's setting up properly. Dead zone. Leading complexity on a merry dance. Manages to play the ball and stick a little furry mess onto the forehead of a complexity member. Ball will go back in towards elevator now. Complexity of hands on. Precision over towards trippy corner is dropped his back down towards C steps. Huss is gonna try and make the cross. Two kills go in their favor, and they can build Enemy has the and they can close the gap on that lead. Important that Ryan was shut down there. We saw what he did with the shock rifle towards the end of the first round. Dead zone listening to that call out and making sure he falls. Precision kind of caught on his own at the moment. Just needs to get back to full shield, but doesn't even get the chance. Again, communication on point for Optic Gaming to shut down these no shield players. It's what you said in that previous round that complexity were escaping on no shield far too much. I think Optic are now saying we cannot allow these no shield players to get away because then they bite us in the ass. You've got to take them down. Camo in three. Ryan Noob's down there with eyes on. Enemy has the ball. Precision gets dead zone. Numbers advantage then. Favoring complexity. Ryan Noob's got camouflage popped. He's gonna be crying out for help and he needs it. It comes, but unfortunately for him, Enemy has he loses his life. Lucid pays the price, but manages to take down the camouflage player. Two players now positioned over towards long haul. And here comes the boom. Huss take, gets taken care of. Precision. Fights from the back foot down to no shield, continues to jiggle peak. Ryan who falls as well. And Optic Gaming are but moments away from tying up this game. Dead zone, by the way, still scoring heavily with the ball, but 23 kills alongside it. Naturally, when you're playing the objective, you can get into more fights just because people are going to be pushing you. You take those 1v1s, and Dead Zone's been winning them. And it looks like they are going to be very close to taking this round number two. One last push, though, for complexity. Dead Zone drops the ball to fight with Trippy, and they try and get these kills, but there's been three down on both sides here. But Formal wins the last. Will Will the ball stay on? Yes, it will. A chance still for Optic to win it here. No need for VAR. Ball stays in play. Formal's got it in his hands. Smoke screen goes down to add and provide even more cover. 
1 1 the score. It brings life back into the crowd and belief back into Optic Gaming that they can get this done in four. You don't want to go into a Game 5 Slayer. Even if Optic, very good at Slayers, have been good against Slayers, against Complexity, you don't want to give them the chance. But these two teams, this is what we saw in qualifiers. Very difficult to separate the two. Game 5s we saw so often. So Optic, they have to get it done here in four. Camouflage now in Trippy's hands. So this starting strategy has worked out a little bit better for them. Can they get an early lead to work off? Has that round loss just taken the air out of the complexity tires? So they were moving and grooving not long ago. Descendant pushes the ball towards Pipes. He's got teammates around him, providing cover. Ryan New, particularly from bottom elevator, he's been able to watch the cross. Descendant not feeling too comfortable and opts to toss the ball out towards batteries. It's going to be a reset the ball, but they have a 10 second slender advantage. I think we have to give credit for complexity here, going toe to toe with Optic Gaming. Of course, previous world champion, some of these guys. I mean, if you ask Descendant Haas Precision, the one day you're going to be going up against world champions and being able to actually take them down and take them to game fives, they would have bit your hand off. But now they're here, they're riding with the big dogs. And there's no reason why they can't win it, but maybe Formal wants to put this one to bed. How is Formal still alive on Whirlpool? Now they've got ball. Does Formal know? Enemy has the ball. This player's position towards long haul. The information looks as though the answer to that question is yes. Precision will drop on the C steps and Formal will get him. Trippy's got ball. Played it towards bottom middle. And it's now Optic who have that 10 second advantage. It's Complexity's turn potentially with the shock rifle though, but Rhino trying to get in and out with this skull and will do so, has the ball, and now they can try and get a blue setup on the go. Formal's already fallen, so they do have the player advantage, but a couple of trades in the kill feed with Lucid and Hus falling. It is getting scrappier in this third round. You can understand why is that one is whipped oh. away, but not quite in time, or is it? Oh, Rhino doesn't get the chance to pop it in. So Camo's going to be down and Trippy's going to have the chance to grab it. Oh! Camouflage. And a back back to boot. Commando in hand. Trippy looking to clear out tower. Baiting and switching with Lucid. They've been a duo for such a long time. They're always on the same page. Doing so much damage. Is Lucid going to be able to Get those kills. Descendant down to no shield. Will continue to reach out. Three dead for the green wall. Formal's going to try and milk this ball for as long as possible. Yeah, good milkage. Will allow Optic Gaming just to maintain a 30 point lead. And Trippy's already in pipes. Good trade though. You have to shut down Trippy. If he had won that fight, then Complexity may have struggled to wrestle back control over towards the ball side. Again, Lucid just doing Lucid things, manipulating the map in any way he can. Three minutes still remain, so it's no real rush for Complexity just yet, but it is Optic who have control as all four dead on the side of Complexity. The question now is, how is your composure? Do you start throwing bodies forward needlessly here? Enemy has the ball. Descendant's got the opening pick. Make it two as dead zone falls with the ball in hand. Descendant moves towards glass. Enemy Three dead for Optic. And Trippy can only watch as his teammates fell around him and he joins them. So this is going to be Complexity's first real chance now to get an actual setup because they had four down on the side of Optic. Lucid though, off spawn, does take down Ryan Noob. Four more follows up so they don't get set up in the way they would have liked. Ball is going to have to be tossed out into more open area and Optic get three dead and Lucid wants to get more. Lucid gets what he wants. And that's the shock rifle. As he haunted that player down. Precision will make the cross. The ball's back in pipes. Precision gets dispatched. Enemy team nearing victory. Lucid has quite a lot of ammunition to play with. As I say that, he falls. Trippy with the plasma pistol. Ryan New on stick old steps will get one. They try to play the ball. Enemy has the ball. They haven't done so successfully. At least they haven't thrown it too far. When the weapon updates come in, that plasma pistol probably would have hit. But at the moment, it's still a slow charge time. 45 seconds on the board for Complexity. Still life in it for them. But Optic are 
agonizingly close here to winning this entire series and putting themselves in the driving seat for this entire pool. I mean, albeit a miracle coming from the open bracket to disrupt things, it would be like the Optic would top it. But we know that nothing is a guarantee here in the HCS, and we have seen crazy things happen from that open bracket. Complexity sent two players chasing formal. An Optic have got hands on ball. They close in on victory here. They sent too many resources away, and Lucid claims the game. 3-1 the series score to Optic Gaming. It might not have been a flawless series, but it was still an impressive one from Optic Gaming. And in Dead Zone's first tournament in an Optic jersey, he looks pretty comfortable to me. And Optic are looking like a real threat and looking like a real challenge to the big boys at the top. What a series we had. We thought it could go to game five. Unfortunately, we fall just one shy. And when you look at the stats, Dan, there was one man on our screens for Optic Gaming. That was Lucid. The Senate try as he might to keep the pace. Lucid was a menace. And even though, you know, the stats will lean towards Lucid at first, you've got to look at Dead Zone. Not only does he get 30 kills, but he also had the majority of the bull time as well. It was... Yeah, he's got neg three with 30 kills. He died 33 times. He's in so many engagements there. He's taken so much damage, but also dealt so much damage at the exact same time. And I just think he fits exactly the position that Optic wanted him to be fitting into, like a glove. And now Optic Gaming find themselves at the top of the pool and looking pretty good going into the rest of the weekend. Optic Gaming, like you say, sitting atop of Pool D. And firing an open team entering here and causing absolute carnage. They will claim that fourth seed as they push forward. You've got something to tell me, Dan. It was 10K damage for three of the Optic players, by the way. Lucid and Formal and Dead Zone all putting up 10,000 damage during that oddball game. It's almost like they wanted it to go to round three just so they could make the numbers look better. But I think that on complexity, the takeaways for them is they were very competitive. Okay, yes, they were the higher seed technically coming into it, but I think they know that they are competing with these guys to try and push themselves into that top four. And if they can be this close to Optic Gaming in pool play, how are they going to look when we get into Saturday, when we get into Sunday? Could we see complexity upset one of the bigger teams? We got another look at Dead Zone on this team. And it must be said, Dan, I like what I've seen. I like what I've seen from Dead Zone. I think that we expected this to happen. It's not like it was a risky pickup, right? Dead Zone looked amazing when he was on the SSG roster, and it doesn't look like he's out of character whatsoever here playing for Optic Gaming. He hasn't had to change his play style too much. He hasn't tried to fit in in too many drastic ways for Optic Gaming. And I think he looks like a player that is going to be a real threat when we look at how Optic progress in this tournament. But we're gonna have to see what happens when they go up against the likes of FaZe, the likes of SSG, because that will be when the true test, I feel, comes for Optic Gaming. Confirmation of what we've seen then. CTF Empyrean 3-0, pretty comfortable. Slayer Aquarius, much of the same thing. With Stronghold's live fire, where complexity roared back to life. But Oddball recharges, how it finished, and it went the way of Optic Gaming. And almost the way you predicted, Dan, it was gonna go. A 3-1 run out for Optic Gaming. And Blaze is on the stage with H4F. Take it away. Thank you so much, Shers. Esports Arena, show some love to Optic Gaming as they move on to Saturday. And what a day it was, Formal. Man, you guys had two series. You just wrapped this one up, 3-1. Talk to me about how the day was as a whole for the squad getting this land play. Uh, it's um, It's been good practice playing with Zane because it's our first tournament together. So obviously, we're just going to get better and better and better. Um, the first series was like a little rough. Uh, I think we should have won probably a lot more convincingly, but like I said, we're still new. And that series was like, we lost the game three, but like, I don't know why Ryan, Ryan was shooting bodies. That guy's just fucking ass, so. Um, but yeah, we beat him again. And I'm excited for the rest of the tournament. There you go, excited for the rest of the tournament. Still a ways to go now. You quickly touched bases on playing with Dead Zone. You know, it's been a roster change. Talk to me about where you feel like you guys can go playing with him on a squad and what he's been bringing to you guys so far. I mean, like, our, like, peak is, like, really, really good. So I hope that you guys can see that this weekend at some point. Um, we're really good, so I'm really looking forward to the rest of the weekend. All right.
And now lastly, I'm going to just let you talk to the fans, okay? Because they came out here to see you guys rock out today. They're trying to see you rock out all weekend long. Talk to them. As always, bro, we guys appreciate you guys. You guys are amazing. We can hear everything when we're playing, so keep it up throughout the weekend. Thank you guys so much. You heard it here from Formal. Keep it up all weekend long. That's going to do it for us on the stage. Lot, take us away. Thank you so much, Blaze, and well done today. I will see you tomorrow, including Optic Gaming folks, because they will proceed into tomorrow looking very, very good indeed. Uh, choice words there from Formal on the stage, but I think he has a point with being the confidence behind complexity at certain points in that game where, uh, you know, they did manage to wrangle it back and take it back off of them. Uh, but maybe some false confidence happening for complexity because that was a really difficult series for them. Optic only got better from when we saw them earlier on. And Clutch, I, I got to know what you kind of make of that entire situation, that entire series, and how that one unfolded. Yeah, big question for me coming into this series. Are we going to learn more about Optic Gaming, or are we going to learn more about Complexity? I think we learned more about Optic Gaming in this series. That Complexity team is good. This Optic team is great, and you heard it from Formal. He hopes that they can play at their ceiling. That was not their ceiling. This team, when they are on fire, has the potential to do unbelievable work on the server. So I'm excited to see even better Optic as they continue to improve with the newly acquired Dead Zone on their roster throughout this weekend. Yeah, Tony, I've got to say Dead Zone has been lights out today. Uh, and that's actually testament to the fact that he's still very brand new on this roster. This roster is still working through things right now. They're still trying to gel together and figure out exactly how they want to kind of strategize and take on certain series and maps and modes as well, to be quite frank. So the fact that they're in this position right now looking this good, I think that speaks volumes. I mean, it really does. You know, look at their first two games against Complexity, who technically were the higher seed going into pool play, and it didn't even look it didn't look competitive, to be honest with you. Going into that game three, we did see complexity obviously wake up, but Optic were looking dominant towards those first two games. And like you said, shout out to Dead Zone. Him and that oddball was a few times where I watched him. He was, he was leading in slays and also leading in the ball time, at least in the early game. Dead Zone's been doing this thing all tournament long and clearly he fits in to this former World Championship roster like a glove. Now, Wes, we're seeing the moment here that uh, Formal was talking about on the main stage. I've got to say that triple was nasty with the shock rifle. It was pretty disgusting. Although I do want to talk to you about Ryan Noob, aside from his triple kill here, about the team, right? And, and the team he's trying to kind of bring together and what he's trying to achieve here because I do feel like he has a fantastic Halo brain. He knows what he's trying to do, but the execution time and time again hasn't been there. What in specifics do you think is missing or needs to be done or worked on? I mean, one of the hardest things to do as a competitor is to be prepared for every single game at a tournament, especially in these big series, is to show up in every game, to consistently play at such a high level. Complexity, we're sleepwalking through those first two games. Optic, we're dominant. You cannot afford forward to let those first two games slip out of your hands the way they did. It was free for Optic in those first two games. Complexity have got to figure out ways to replicate the three and four games. Even though they lost four, it was much more competitive. They need to play at that level throughout an entire series. You can't just start a series slow, especially when you're the underdog trying to create an upset of this magnitude. Every single game counts. And to give the first two to Optic the way they did, I mean, Optic, credit to them, they dominated though so they kind of took it but complexity you got to find ways to start series better I think that that is something that you kind of learn as a player on how to prepare how to like load into the server and be ready to play against the world's best because I guarantee you players like formal and lucid are not taking games off they certainly are indeed I've got to say as well a note looking at the stats here formal 1.24 uh, honestly got so much better throughout the day it was really nice to see him kind of come back into his own uh, show the fans exactly what they wanted which was dominance from formal and on the other side of things Wes while I still have you here precision a 1.14 I know you know we tend to not love to see a seriously good KD or a positive KD on the side of a losing team but we saw some really big moves from him in that series how did you think that he had performed because we did highlight him earlier I think he played great I think he was winning his pivs he he was playing well enough to give complexity a little bit of life that game three he really popped off that game four he was playing very well as well and that's why it was competitive players like precision can be difference makers in these games even against the likes of optic gaming you're gonna need more consistency from the team 
and I'm talking like not individuals on the team, but collectively as a whole, our teamwork and getting execution on objectives in order to have success. It cannot be done by one individual or just individual plays even. At this level, everybody's got to be on the same page and your execution has to be flawless if you want to create an upset. It certainly does indeed. Well, I'll tell you what, pool play has been just wild today. I, I honestly, do I go as far as say it's been one of the craziest pool plays we've ever had in mm. Halo Infinite? I mean, what having Sentinels lose twice, thats yeah. that was unheard of. Yeah, that was that was a lot. And Tony, when you're looking and glancing across these pools here, you know, things have gone to plan for a couple of our teams. Uh, things have certainly gone to plan for Shopify Rebellion. <laughs> On the other hand, in Pool C, Sentinels not looking so hot right now. How are you feeling about Sen? I know we haven't actually seen uh, the entirety of their match against Proton Gaming and how that one went, but we got a taste of that with Rebellion. Do you think that they can re set things going into tomorrow do you think that there is a fundamental problem or is that just maybe friday shakes coming into this new season to be honest with you i feel weird saying this but i'm worried about sentinels i i think i think the loss of shopify rebellion you know that you can kind of brush off your shoulders but to go zero two in pool play the way you did against a very, a very talented proton gaming team but a team that you're supposed to win at this at this stage of pool play I, i'm a little worried about them uh the one thing i, I do have going in front of me now obviously starting tomorrow they'll go get an open bracket team and I don't think there's a, a way that they lose to an open bracket team, especially after Lethal's tweet saying, hey, look, we threw. Like, they, they understood they played terrible Halo. Like, he said, we threw. We're going to come back tomorrow with that fire. So at least they're able to admit that and just come into tomorrow in the right mentality. Yeah, personally, I'm not too worried about Sentinels. I am very worried about Native Gaming. Mm -hmm. They have shown no promise. I think Sentinels with a couple of different plays and two different Strongholds games are looking at a 2-0 at the top of their pool. But unfortunately, that's not how the dice rolled today. Those decisions were made, those plays were made, and they were bad plays. So you can regroup, you can recover. That team has been consistent for long enough for me to trust them. Native Gaming, however, have not showed me anything up until this tournament. And it's no surprise to see them 0-2. I don't know what amateur or open bracket team is going to fall into that pool, but Native Gaming better come to play or they might not make it out of pools. They might not make it out of pools, and that's a really harsh reality for them to kind of have to sink in tonight, especially after the gameplay that they have put across their stages, their screens today. So hopefully they can regain, uh, regain some trust in each other and their skill level and what they've been practicing and putting towards all in this offseason. So crossing our fingers for Native Gaming that they can show up tomorrow. We do, in fact, have a KD leader board coming out of today of course pool play and wow my oh my do we see the general right at the top here with a 1.51 then we have stella second place which actually that honestly shocks me because stella had an absolute highlight reel of a day but it just shows you the versatility on phase clan the fact that also renegades on this roster as well as cycle and lucid cycle is the new name on board there. Everybody else you're kind of used to seeing up there, right? Yes. I know Snakebite might not be your favorite for main Slayer, but when he turns it on and he's on fire, yeah, Snakebite can be the best Slayer in the game. So it's good to see a newcomer up there. Cycle, welcome to the top five on Friday. He's going to give Shopify every opportunity to compete along the sides of every name that's up there because you have SSG, FaZe, and Optic all represented. It's good to see someone from Shopify matching that level. Tony, what do you make of this top five leaderboard? Who are you most impressed with today after what we've seen? I'm going to say Snakebite at number one because a lot of the series that we watched from him, it was the, his teammates that were actually out slaying and getting the most kills in the actual lobby itself. But it was Snakebite's least amount of deaths that raised his KD as high as it was. How many times did we talk about Renegade with that 29 kill performance in, 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 uh, in that one oddball match? There was the uh, same thing with World 2. There were so many players that were slaying out, but Snakebite's ability to stay alive is what led him to that high KD. And considering he's been playing most of the objectives, that's pretty impressive to me. It's very impressive indeed. I think every single person on that KD leaderboard has shown some amazing skill today and talent. And I'm sure that will chop and change as we head into tomorrow. Of course, our championship bracket. And for you guys, we do have a schedule lined up for your day two here in Arlington. We're starting things off in Pool D. We've got Complexity versus their open bracket team, Bittersweet. We'll find out who they're going up against. And Optic Gaming will have a chance to top their pool as well. So amazing things to start.
start your morning. Make sure you guys are tuning in. We'll fill in the gaps as we go along throughout the day. And we're going to finish things off with the elimination quarter final. So we will be losing two teams tomorrow on the main stage. And I wonder who those are going to be. Are we going to see some big regains coming across the board here? Because some of these teams, they need to pick it up, Clutch. Yeah, I think we, we have to for our expectations, for their expectations sake. But that's the beautiful thing about this is new season, new teams, new placings, new positions in these tournaments. So I'm excited more for the upsets rather than can teams get it back. I'm excited for the ones that have taken what they've already taken and how far are they willing to go? How far can they go? I'm looking at you, Shopify. That's the questions. Well, folks, that's going to do it for day one of the kickoff major. Arlington has not disappointed this far. We have seen upsets that have gone off the Richter scale, folks, and hot starts from our top three teams of the tournament. Who is edging out the pack right now? Honestly, we have no idea, but that is up Good for day two tomorrow in the championship bracket. We'll see you guys bright and early. Thank you so much for for tuning in and we'll see you for more of the Arlington kickoff major.